Umbra. A journal. Of the. Unconscious. 2009. Editor. Joan Kopjek. Special issue. Joan Kopjek. Siji J. Sixth Gand. Associate editors. Nathan Gorlick. Lydia Arker. Art direction and layout. Lydia Arker. Editorial committee. Kevin Arnold Ian Logan. Phil Campanile Megan McDonald. Ryan Crawford Minanimi. Pete D. Gabriel Keiko Ogata. Alex Deng Sol Peles. Amanda Duncan Matt Pionic. Sarah Edelman Matt Regi Lano. Stephen Ellen Stephen Russ Chicky. Kyle Fetter Andrew Sirwita. Richard Garner Michael Stanish. Joel Goldbach Guy Witzel. Nathan Gorlick Tyler Williams. Ryan Anthony Hatch Hiroki Yoshi Kuni. Lydia Arker Steve Zoltansky. Faculty Advisors. Tim Dean. Graham Hamill. Stephen Miller. Introduction, Islam and the Exotic Science Joan Kopjek. 5. Dying for Justice 13 Fevi Benz Lama. Of a Renunciation of the Father 25 Fevi Benz Lama. 5 Years of Psychoanal Wysis in Cairo 35 Mustafa Safwan. Psychoanalysis, Islam, and the Other of Liberalism 43 Joseph A. Massad. Soul Choking, Maladies of the Soul, Islam, 71 and the Ethics of Psychoanalysis Stephanie Apondolfo. Fanaticism as Fantasy, 105. Notes on Islam, Psychoanalysis, and Political Philosophy Alberto Toscano. The Death of Epiphany 125 Christian Jamet. The Paradoxical 1 139 Christian Jamet. The Censorship of Interiority 165 Joan Kopjek. Dialogues 188. Fevi Benz Lama and the Translation of the Impossible in Islam and Psychoanalysis Nathan Gorlick. 9-11 Dramatically Reconfigured the World Map, Thrusting into Relief the Whole Ubiquitous, Populous, Discontinuous, Pressing Matter of Islam. The vertiginous suddenness of this focus shift calls to mind, for a variety of reasons, a scene from the Cold War Phi LM, Kiss Me Deadly, Robert Aldrich, 1955, in which the consumerist, self-absorbed M.I.K.E. Hammer is abruptly brought face to face with the limits of his imagination and with his own insignificance in a larger world to which he had until now remained oblivious. Noticing the radiation burn on Hammer's arm and realizing all at once the depth of its owner's shallowness, Pat M.U.R.P.H.Y., a detective friend, flanked by government agents, addresses Hammer as if he were a child. And now listen, M.I.K.E. I am going to pronounce three little words. They're harmless words. Just letters scrambled together, but their meaning is very important. Try to understand what they mean, Manhattan Project. Los Alamos. Trinity. For many of us, 9-11 happened L.I.K.E. that, only the words pronounced as ash fell over the financial district, turning it into a modern-day Pompeii, were not, as we imagined them, English, the scrambled letters of our own destructive ambitions, but Arabic, Jihad. Shahida. D.A.R.A. slash Harb. Words in a foreign tongue that had in that first moment little to no meaning other than the destructive ambitions of the other. Such an analogy would no doubt attest to the insinuation into our thinking of Samuel H. U. Eddington's notorious prediction that the clash of ideologies which had defined the Cold War would surrender to a clash of civilizations between the West and the rest one. In the words of Bernard Lewis, whom Huntington quotes, this latest clash would be precipitated by the perhaps irrational but surely historic reaction of an ancient rival Arab Islamic civilization against our Judeo Christian heritage our secular present, and the worldwide expansion of both. To the most glaring, first-order problem with this ancient rivalry thesis is its wholesale neglect of the historical porosity of the two supposedly self-enclosed civilizations. This neglect is responsible for allowing the Islamic world to be defined as our perpetual outside. Against this background, 
one reads Stephen Wasserstrom's admirable religion after religion with a great deal of interest and relief. Point three: The book gives an account of the intellectual exchanges of three religious scholars: the Judaist Gershom Scholem, the comparativist Mircea Iliad, and the Islamicist Henry Corbin, who were members of the Irinos group that met in Ascona. Switzerland to debate religious questions every August from 1949 to 1978, or from the beginning of the Cold War until the Iranian Revolution ushered in a new program of Islamicization that would function as an efficient antidote to West Oxification and spread swiftly throughout the Arab Islamic world. Point four. What fascinates us most about Wasserstrom's account is the apparent permeability of the borders between the religions which is evidenced by the conceptual sharing and borrowings that cause the dividing lines among the three monotheistic religions and the civilizations they represented not to disappear, but to slacken and zigzag. Wasserstrom isolates a number of concepts around which the Irinos debates turned, elevating one in particular, Ergriffenheit, to paradigmatic status. Ergriffenheit, a term in vogue in philosophical circles in the 1920s and 30s, refers to a primal experience of being gripped or seized by an emotion and seesawed between being descriptive of religious experience and designating hypnotic captivation by a strong, political leader. This concept surfaces, among other places, in Levinas's early work, on SKP, 1935, where it appears as the experience of being riveted to something that is as inalienable from the subject as it is impenetrable to him. I in this context the or concept of the Irino's meetings verges on the psychoanalytic concept of anxiety. S. Wasserstrom does not mention Lavinas, however, nor does he elaborate the differences between the religious and political trajectories of the term, for his theoretical investments lie elsewhere. Thus, although we learn from him that the varieties of real IGES experience represented at the Irino's meetings each found in Jung's notions of archetype and imago something to respond to, something intrinsic to its particular experience, we do not learn very much about the differences among them. It is anecdotally interesting to discover that Corbin's theorization of Persian Islamic angelology had a profound influence on Skolem's well-known essay on Walter Benjamin and his angel, but this information raises questions about the differences between the Persian Fravarti and the angels of Kabbalah, to say nothing of the Christian angels for which Saint Paul famously had a kind of contempt. The title, Religion After Religion, discloses the book's true investment, its major thesis that while the three religious scholars on whom it focuses privileged mystical traditions of thought, which they used to bolster their ARGU meant that the religious experience is irreducible to any other, their notions of religious experience all ended up sounding suspiciously individualistic and secular. The three monotheistic religions fell prey in the hands of these thinkers to an antinomianism that transforms them into a phenomenon less traditional than modern or, to put it more bluntly, less religious than post-religious. This thesis is mounted and supported by copious references and argument, but one historical coincidence, however briefly mentioned, seems effectively charged as if it were being enlisted to serve as the capstone of the entire argumentative structure. For three decades one of the most prominent of the Irinos scholars, Corbin, divided his time between Paris and Tehran, living and teaching in both places each year, in October 1, 978, however, he died, effectively bringing the Irinos discussions to a halt. Coincidentally, Corbin's death took place just weeks before Ayatollah Khomeini, who had also traveled back and forth between the two capitals during this same period returned from his Paris exile to Tehran in order to head the ir Anayan revolution. Point six. These two men, both champions of the ir Anayan soul, in Wasserstrom's words, obviously had radically different ideas about what constituted that Suel. But Wasserstrom goes beyond this observation of their difference to treat the death of the one and the triumphant return of the other as a happenstance with symbolic import, as figuring the historical eclipse of the Cold War era, in which the Irinos discussions were allowed to flourish, and the dawning of a new era in which a more authentic religious expression would assert itself. In his words, the Iranian revolution was an implicit repudiation of Corbin's idiosyncratic version of ir tradition in the name of an authentic indigenous religiosity. So, 
while the attention paid to the Irino's discussions promises a respite from the clash of civilizations thesis, it ends by lending some credence to it insofar as Wasserstrom characterizes the discussions as time-locked, as a mere product of the Cold War period that held, while they lasted, the inevitable clash at bay. With Wasserstrom's conclusion we cannot agree, for what it fails adequately to credit is how thoroughly Corbin's non-indigenous version informs the tradition itself, reaching back to its beginnings and including, for example, Saravardi, martyred in 1191 for the heretical claim that Godi's creation is not an accomplished deed, but a perpetually recurring event that continues to I introduce new prophets into the world. Not all martyrs of the Islamic cause are, it seems, on the same side. What Corbin's work exposes better than anyone else's is an internal split that runs throughout the Oriental tradition, a split so deep as to throw into question any claim regarding the Iranian revolution's ability to cancel or heal it. The charge of inauthenticity is premised not only on a time-locked claim, that the Iranos scholars were constrained by their historical moment to think religious experience in secular terms, but also by a landlocked one, the deep-seated differences between Western ideas and I indigenous thinking were bound to flare up again when the ideological struggle, capitalism slash communism, fought entirely on the astroturf of the Western notion of universalism, finally ended. By these two premises is Corbin condemned, despite the fact that he spent the majority of his life photographing, cataloging, translating the works of early Islamic philosophy and writing volumes of studies on them, he is unable to shake the adjectives, modern and European, that qualify his thinking, reduce it to site-specific conditions. The philosopher responsible for introducing Heidegger into French thought, Corbin also avowed that Heidegger's work provided him with an essential key to understanding Islamic philosophy, a claim that would seem to confirm the accusation that HIS was an ahistoricist misappropriation of that philosophy. Yet what his avowal should bring home is the fact that the Greeks to whom Heidegger wanted to return in order to restore philosophy to its proper destiny were unavailable in any direct, uncontaminated way. Nothing that remains of them is untouched by the Syriac, Arabic, and Persian translations by which they were preserved and transformed in ways that are irrevocably lost to us. For this reason the fact that Corbin's copy of Being and Time contained notes handwritten in Arabic in the margins is not as peculiar as some think. Our purpose in isolating these moments, the Irino's years and the long period of the 8th and 9th centuries when Greek thought was transposed into these languages and absorbed by Muslim culture, is not to try to homogenize Oriental and Occidental thought and culture. The fact that the activity of philosophy did not have an institutional status in the Muslim world, as it did in medieval Europe, is, of course, a difference of great significance and redounds on the respective philosophies themselves. That the temporality of the Quran, non-linear and non-narrative, is unlike that of the Bible clearly has repercussions that need to be assessed, as does the fact that Islam is without a notion of arig i n al sin and thus of the culpability of the body or the flesh. Point eight a myriad of differences beyond these arbitrarily chosen examples could be cited. The point is that despite these differences, Oriental and Occidental thought and culture have been entangled throughout history. Regarding the questions raised by the current conflicts troubling our relations with various parts of the Islamic world, the premise of this special issue is that psychoanalysis offers a unique, powerful, and even necessary approach. We anticipate that certain historicists and culturalists will protest that the discourse of psychoanalysis is entirely inappropriate to this task, that its categories for analyzing or rendering transparent the Arab mind cannot be transported to foreign soil and that the bid to do so is just another example of the West's ambition to occidentalize the WORLD, to market its franchise worldwide. This supposes, first, that the task psychoanalysis sets itself is indeed one of objectification, of the Arab or any other mind, which it is not. The history of psychoanalysis is not without episodes in which its fundamental concepts were distorted in some way or bodlerized by their forced association with a program of mental hygiene that tended to substantialize processes such that the mechanism of repression, for example, was invariably translated into the unpsychoanalytic idea of a repressed person or, worse, a repressed people in need of cure. In the U. 
s. Especially during the Cold War and the decade leading up to it, among professionals and in Hollywood, an expurgated, unplague like Freud came into being. Critics of universalism almost surely have something like this Cold War version of Freud in mind when they stigmatize his science with localizing adjectives and caution that its transmission to the Islamic world seeks to assimilate that world into the Western fold. T.O. contest these charges, which, aimed at a straw science, miss their mark, we will propose for psychoanalysis a different adjective, one that will help less to qualify than to dequalify or deregionalize it. Psychoanalysis is, we suggest, an exotic science. In physics the existence of an exotic force accounts for the phenomenon in which objects that are close are pushed slightly away from each other. Psychoanalysis is that science devoted to studying the exotic force that operates in the subject to push her from herself, opening a margin of separation between her and parts of herself she will never be able to assimilate. The existence of this force is an unsimple fact with ramifying consequences for the conception of the subject and her relations with others. Only a few of these can be mentioned here. First, the exotic nature of the subject renders her resistant to objectification, because the margin of separation cannot be liquidated, she can become limpid neither to herself nor to others. At the same time this otherness is not absolute, for the subject's self-distance, her self-prolongation is the ground of her encounter with others, the incitement to find outside herself, in others, a mirror that will reflect back not an image with which she can identify, but one that will formalize and thus lessen the anguish of her uncertain identity. Psychoanalysis refuses to rest content with historical reminders of the porosity of the divisions between Occidental and Oriental cultures, for the simple recourse to the fact of cultural hybridity has the effect of underestimating the force of the cultural attachments by which subjects are, precisely, gripped and thus fails even to formulate the problem that needs to be addressed in dealing with the question of cross-cultural encounters. Nor do these historical reminders stop to problematize the nature of this phenomenon of cultural ergriffenheit, of the subject's interpellation, let us say, a bit against the grain, by her culture. This problematic is the domain of psychoanalysis, its unique and indispensable contribution. Proposing that the experience of being seized by one's culture has an exotic effect, psychoanalysis recasts the debate regarding the viability of Western values and judgments and the role they ought or ought not to play in territories outside their own, which has left universalists, on the one side, and relativists, on the other, deadlocked. T.O. stated in a, two, summary way, against the universalists, who believe that certain values have managed to shake off the soil of particularity in which they sprouted in order to assert themselves abstractly, as universals, psychoanalysis maintains that we do not really know what values we hold or why we hold them. Our task is thus not to divest them of their particularity, but to create particular forms in which they can be recognized, by ourselves and by others. This entails not a process of making concrete what is abstract, but of making visible a darkness that penetrates us, thereby transforming slash displacing our culturally inherited values. Against the relativists, who assume that everything that comes from outside is a threatening intrusion, psychoanalysis maintains that some intrusions are salutary and necessary for cultural and individual survival. Because psychoanalysis developed as a critique of many liberal Western notions, the accusation that it seeks to export these very notions hardly makes sense. In this context, the notion of freedom is often cited as an imposition to be rejected. To oppose the liberal Western notion of freedom is one thing, but to oppose freedom is simply self-defeating. The expressed perplexity of Spinoza, why are people proud of their enslavement? Why do they fight for their bondage as if it were their freedom? Is not PQLIAR to him, it is a perplexity tout court point nine that there is a capacity of the subject to extract himself or herself from situations that are intolerable is amply verified in the East and in the West. It is especially significant in this context that Foucault saw in the Iranian Revolution an opportunity to theorize this capacity, while problematizing the Western notion of freedom. Yet the fact that this capacity is so readily surrendered suggests that there is a relation between it and the experience of bondage that needs to be examined. 
What is peculiar about Mike Hammer's deliverance from his self-absorption is that it awakens him to a world that is itself shrunken and self-enclosed. Notice that he recognizes immediately the strange words he is made to listen to, they tell him nothing he does not already know. This world has reached some ultimate limit, has nowhere else to go and nothing left to do but burn in its own fire, to go fissio n, in the words of the film makers. The way out of this impasse, the impasse of empty universalism, is not a retreat into self-enclosed indigenous experiences and loyalties, but a more subtle conception of the exotic. On this ground Islam and psychoanalysis may be able once again to encounter each other in a way that is productive. My title, Dying for Justice Agonie pour fa Justice, is an expression I borrowed from an article by Ernst H. Cantero is entitled Pro Patria Mori in Medieval Political Thought 1. The quotation comes close to the end of the text, where the author evokes the moment when, around the 13th century, a mutation occurs in the West in its relation to war and death, the Western Christian world moves from the holy war of the Crusades toward a secularization that touches upon the essential point indicated by the preposition for in the expression to die for the fatherland. The for effectively condenses in itself the what for and the for whom, the cause and the end, in short, the whole order that needs to provide a reason for the war, to justify it, and to make it appear just. Let us note that in French the word just combines at least two aspects of meaning, one referring to justice, the other relating to conformity to a rule and slash or to reality. In the first case, the opposite of just is unjust, in the second case, it is false and erroneous. These two meanings have converged only in contemporary times, when justice has come to designate conformity to the positive rule of law. There are languages, such as Arabic, in which these two courses of signification are designated by different words, ADL or NCF for justice as moral value, and Yahid or Hak for the conformity to rule, to reality, or to truth. I was interested in this article by Cantoroas because for several years I have been trying to understand the recent change in the Muslim world in its relation to war and death, a change that made possible on a grand scale what we call suicide attacks, according to Farhad Khosrakhavar's expression, motivated by a mass martyropathy too. More precisely, I have been trying to identify the mechanisms in the order of discourse which authorized the development at a certain moment of the type of act designated by the expression suicide attack. Let us emphasize that this expression is quite problematic in so far as, on the one hand, we are talking about people who kill themselves not only to put an end to their own lives, but also to take the lives of others in an act of war. The goal of autocide is heterocide. On the other hand, they are convinced that they do not die but remain alive beyond physical and apparent death. Perhaps a name like auto hetero putting to death would be more precise even if it is more complicated. Putting to death signifies here the will to stage a destruction turned simultaneously against the self and the other. I have come to this research because, although the cause is often invoked to explain the recourse to suicide attacks, namely, situations of oppression and humiliation, are not false, they appear to me to be insufficient, and not only with regard to comparable historical situations. For example, the colonial regime in Algeria practiced a fierce oppression that caused tens of thousands of deaths, instituted the humiliation of the natives over a long period of time, and during the end of its rule utilized torture in a systematic manner. Nevertheless, in spite of the disproportionate forces, the armed branch of the FLN never had recourse to such suicide attacks even if numerous random bombings were committed at its instigation. The same applies when Islam is invoked as the theological corpus authorizing these acts. The fight for Algerian liberation was also conducted in the name of Islam, but this name did not allow suicide attacks. It is a fact that, in general, the liberation movements in the Muslim world during the first half of the 20th century did not practice this form of attack. Even if the theological corpus of Islam contains passages that make it possible to justify the recourse to suicide attacks, we must ask why it was only roughly in the last two decades that these attacks have become possible and frequent outside zones of open conflicts. 
I have thus gradually been led to hypothesize a historical change in this civilization's relation to death and war, and to an attempt to grasp its new configuration in the medium of discourse where we often find the trace and trauma of such changes. The relevance of the article by Cantoroas lies in the fact that he follows a similar path in a different context, and shows us the linguistic operations at work at the time of a historical change, operations whose pivot is precisely the question of the just. The article begins by evoking the pastoral letter that Cardinal M. Rassier, the primate of Belgium, addressed to his flock on Christmas, 1914, when Belgium was occupied by the German army. The letter bore the title Patriotism and Endurance and established links between F. Atherland and religion which appeared unacceptable to some of his colleagues at the Sacre College, such as Cardinal Billet in France, who was as much a patriot as Cardinal Mercier. In his letter, Mercier undertakes a response to the question he was asked, namely, whether or not the soldier who fell in service to a just cause was a martyr. He first responds that the soldier who dies in battle is not a martyr since he dies with his weapons in his hands, while the martyr gives himself up to his executioners without resistance. With this, Mercier recalls Christian theology's strict position concerning the status of the martyr. Let us remark here that this is not the view. Ben's Lama Of Islamic theology in accordance with the text of the Quran itself, the soldier fallen in combat is a martyr designated by the term Chahid. Having recalled this doctrinal point, Cardinal Mariser nevertheless introduces a but. But if you ask me what I think of the eternal salvation of a brave man, who consciously gives his life to defend the honor of his country and to avenge violated justice, I do not hesitate to reply that there is no doubt whatever that Christ crowns military valor, and that death Christianly accepted assures to the soldier the salvation of his so ul. The soldier who dies to save his brothers, to protect the hearths and the altars of his country, fulfills the highest form of 10 ve. We are justified in hoping for them the immortal crown which encircles the foreheads of the elect. For such is the virtue of an act of perfect love that, of itself alone, it wipes out a whole life of sin. Of a sinner instantly it makes a saint. Quoted in Cantoroas, 472. A few months later, Cardinal Bil Lot formulates the following objection, T.O. say that the mere fact of dying consciously for the just cause of the fatherland suffices to assure salvation means to substitute the fatherland for God. To forget what is God, what is sin, what is divine forgiveness, quoted in Cantoroas, 473. Reading this introduction to Cantoroas's article, I was struck by the fact that this divergence between the two cardinals at the beginning of the last century resembles in certain aspects the debate that still takes place today among Muslim theologians concerning the question of whether or not those who perpetrate suicide attacks could be considered under the name Chahid. It is useless to dwell on the importance of this disputatio, since the issue concerns, on the general level, the theo eagle and moral justification of auto underscore hetero underscore putting underscore to underscore death as an act of just war, and on the individual level it concerns its consequences, either paradise or hell for the candidate. In the case of Cardinals Mercier and Billet, the debate already contains the whole movement that will unfold in the West, which will be explained by Cantoroas, resulting in the transition from holy war to its secularization. In fact, Cardinal Mercier's position consists of passing from the church to the fatherland and conferring on the soldier who died for the one the same value and status as on the one who died for the other, that is, the status of martyr, the remission of whose sins implies salvation and saintliness. For Cardinal Billet, even if the fatherland is a just cause, it is not sufficient to guarantee the salvation of the soldier who died for it, and he renounces the substitution of fatherland for Godi. But, to tell the truth, this substitution is not the only significant moment in the process of secularization. For Cardinal Mercier introduced a signifier that did not exist in theological language before the change when he wrote, the soldier who consciously gives his life to defend the honor of his country and to avenge violated justice. 472. This signifier is justice, capitalized in the text, which will subvert the meaning of both dying for and justice. In fact, in Christian theology, 
the soldier who embarks on a Christian war, as in the case of the Crusades, goes off to war for the love of God and his brothers. A love that has the value of caritas. It is charity and not justice that justifies and sanctifies war and death. I depart to die for the love of my God and my brother, such is the internal watchword of the Christian soldier according to the church. I indeed, what Cantoroas shows in this text is that the passage from the church to the state accomplished the move of Western humanity from the just as holiness to the just as J. Eustace. This passage starts when the king becomes H. I. Myself the saint, the carrier of justice. From then on, the anguish of death suffered by his subjects for justice is suffered on behalf of the sovereign and his kingdom. Thus, the kingdom of heaven is replaced by the earthly kingdom, that is, the territory. And, as Cantoroas remarks, in Jean d'Arc's cry, those who wage war against the holy realm of France, wage war against King Jesus, we have already passed from church to state, 484. But there is an even more important element of this move, at the same time as the displacement of God by the fatherland and of holiness by justice occurs, a transference, and this is the author's word, of the same emotional values and moral emotions also takes place, 491, 487. This expression, moral emotions, has arrested me for a long time. T.O. What do these moral emotions refer? According to our author, and we are approaching here the thesis of Cantoroa's magisterial book T.H.E. King's T.W.O. Bodies, published a few years later, they reside in what he calls corporatism. That is, what is transferred is the body. Point three we move from the church as the mystical body of Christ, the tortured and sacrificed body that has known the agony of death, to the body of the state by way of the body of the sovereign. He shows through a number of examples how the state effectively becomes a political body, or, if you will, that the body of the state is merely a laicized corpus Christi. I quote, D. Eth for the fatherland now is viewed in a truly religious perspective, it appears as a sacrifice for the corpus mysticum of the state which is no less a realit than the corpus mysticum of the church, 487. Shortly after this, he adds, humanism had its effects, but the quasi-religious aspects of death for the fatherland clearly derived from the Christian faith, the forces of which now were activated in the service of the secular corpus mysticum of the state, 487 to 488. In other words, what did not change in this movement from holiness to justice is the need for there to be a tortured body, for someone's, or one's, sacrificed body, the body of those who died for. In order to constitute the body of the human community. This is where the transference of moral emotions would reside. The JUST person can move from holiness to justice, he nevertheless remains anchored in death or, more precisely, in dying for, pro mort. I die for us, I die for you, I die for the other, the other died for me, beyond all possible variations, such is the formula of the moral emotion at the root of community and its sharing. We encounter here a traversal of the impossible, since death is the absolute limit of sharing. It is impossible to substitute someone's death for the death of another. The other, in dying for me, at most only defers my death, or the reverse. The proper, what is mine, mineness in general, consists of this limit. Moreover, this is the Freudian point of view, the death drive is appropriating and not only destructive. We are reminded of Ulan's popular poem cited by Freud in Thoughts for the Times on War and Death, I had a comrade. J. A. Bullet flew toward us, slash is it for me or is it for you, for you or one, this is the role of the D.I.C.E. of death, it's real that separates, while I for you and you for me is love, the sacrifice and community of a we, the fantasy of a libidinal amplification of the self. This would be the hyper-paradox of community, death as the absolute limit of sharing becomes the place of sharing. The Moral emotion would be that we share what cannot be shared. What does this mean from a psychoanalytic point of view? Simply put, we place at the heart of our lives a dead person. In the Freudian myth, this is called the dead father, 
the spring of symbolic identifications. The consequences I have drawn from my reading of this stunning text by Cantoroas have helped me greatly to move forward with the difficult question of auto-hetero putting to death as an act of just war for those who wage it and those who support it. In order to summarize succinctly the previous developments, I would say that the historical mutation that occurred in the West corresponds to a double modification with regard to what is just in the language and the guardian institutions of the community, the fatherland for the church and justice for sanctity, along with the transference of the same corporatist moral emotion. T.O. put it differently, the same signifier refers to new signifieds while carrying the same religious affect of one body for LL. We know what such a change cost Europe in the First and Second World Wars. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Examining the testaments of candidates for auto-hetero putting to death in the Muslim world, I was first struck to find in their discourse a justification of their acts that mixes fatherland and religion, sanctity and justice a justification that their families resumed elsewhere in the same terms after the act. Although this mixture in itself already subverts what is understood in the theological tradition by holy war, designated by the term jihadi, the most decisive change still lies elsewhere. Until the 1980s, the lexicon of jihad contained two principal terms, that of mujahid from the same root as jihadi, which means warrior, and that of jihad which corresponds to martyr. Let me recall LL in general terms that the Arabic language, the language of the Quran and the liturgy, is based on consonant roots that are declined with vowels to generate words. With six vowels and three or four consonants, we have at our disposal hundreds of potential combinations which are not all exploited since language use and syntactic forms establish what is acceptable or not at a given moment. For example, with the root jh, d, among other possible words, we can generate jud, effort, jihad, holy war, and even mujahith, warrior, since mu is a prefix that indicates an agent. In general, the image used for the functioning of the language is that of a body formed by consonants and animated by vowels. These considerations are important for understanding the rest of this analysis, mostly for the important point of the emergence of a new signifier that subverts the discourse of war and death in this context. While the Mujahid is a combatant in the register of the warrior, a soldier in the service of the holy cause, the Chahid whose exact translation is Mardir belongs to another register. It comes from the root chh.d which refers to the fact of observation, of being present at and being a witness to something. This root produces chhid, witness, makhad, scene, spectacle, mujahid, spectator, chahida, witnessing and attestation, as well as chahidi, the martyr. It is as if the testimonial fact could take the path of speech or that of sacrifice. But this sacrificial potential of the attestation to the truth alone does not make comprehensible the present recourse to the already mentioned suicide attacks. We can find the same link in the Greco-Latin context, since the term martyr, borrowed from ecclesiastic Latin, comes from the Greek mart euros, which means witness. Hence, for Christian authors the martyr is the one who attests to the truth with his sacrifice s. Therefore, on this level, there is no Islamic specificity. In the Quranic text, Shahid refers to the Muslim fallen on the battlefield, which confers on him an extraordinary status mentioned in several surahs among which the most EXPLICIT is the following, do not believe that those who are killed while fighting on the path of God are dead, their recompense is pardoned by their Lord, and gardens with streams of running water where they will abide forever. 3, 135-6. 6 to put it differently, the Chahid is only dead in appearance, he survives, receiving no urishment just like earthly nourishment but of a paradisiacal nature. There is a strange passage in the Quran which says, do not say that those who are killed in the way of God are dead, for indeed they are alive, even though you are not aware. 2. 154. In a certain sense, the martyr would be the sight in the unconscious of the absence of the representation of death. It would represent the immortal in each of us. And, we should add d, the child who never dies. It is clear that in Islamic discourse the two terms mujahid and shahid do not coincide until the 1980s. 
the mujahid is not necessarily a martyr, and the martyr, jihad, is not necessarily a warrior, mujahid. The mujahid, by going to war, is certainly ready for sacrifice. He can become jihad if he is killed, but becoming a martyr is not the intended goal, he wants to fight and survive. Besides, the verb ch. H.D can only be conjugated in the passive form, which relates it to the unknown astushhida. No willful act corresponds to the chahid, which is accidental and unforeseeable. This is why the term chahid can be used for someone who dies in an accidental manner, outside battle, particularly when he is young, and especially if he is a child. In short, if the subject mujahid is active, the subject chahid is passive. But around the middle of the 1980s an important event took place, an event in the order of discourse in the Arabic language, to which neither political sociology nor the usual analyses paid attention, and I would say that one needs to lend it an analytic ear to detect it, it is the invention of a new term that did not exist before and did not have any currency during the 14 centuries of the history of Islam. We are dealing with the creation of a word that is certainly consistent with potentialities of the Arabic language I described above, but this word was unheard of in the usage of the language up to this point. Based on the root ch. h.d, the term istikhadi will be forged, a term constructed in such a way that it corresponds in the canons of the language to what is called the urgent demand for something. It is a question of the substantive by which the one who carries out the suicide attack will be designated. To put it differently, what is invented through this name is the candidate for martyrdom fa demandur de martyr. There is here a historical turning point which transforms the world of meaning of chahid from the order of the passive subject, suffering his fate accidentally, to that of an agent in quest of death, under the mode of wanting to key ll and be killed at the same time. We understand why experts of terrorism cannot take into consideration such an invention or mention it only in passing as a secondary fact. The concept of demand does not have the same significance that we confer on it in psychoanalysis, namely that it is through the demand that the hold of the other over the subject constitutes itself. By making possible in the world of discourse and in the Arabic language the urgent demand for martyrdom, a niche of deadly address opens up toward which certain subjects will orient themselves. But who opened up this niche? How does it become actually attractive? Words such as kamikaze or suicide attacks, with all the horror that they possess, have obscured this event in the language through which the desire of the other announces itself as the desire to see the subject kill itself while killing others. This explains, in my opinion, how at a given moment the demand for martyrdom could spread like a plague and martyr candidates could appear everywhere, even there where there is no front, no war, no situation of oppression. We know that the first so-called kamikaze attacks claimed in the name of Islam appeared with Hezbollah in 1983 during the Israeli occupation of South Lebanon. The word kamikaze appeared with reference to the massacre at Lod Airport in Tel Aviv carried out by members of the Japanese Red Army on May 30, 1972. TWO of the three terrorists killed themselves with their grenades. One might think that this act inspired Hezbollah. At the same time, however, the word and the self-destructive slash destructive act concealed the most important fact, without which we would not comprehend the expansion of the phenomenon, namely that Hezbollah was not merely a laboratory where dreadful human bombs were prepared using a technique that would spread all over the Middle East, it was also an ideological laboratory where the infernal discursive machine I am describing here was invented. In order to grasp what derives this invention, we have to provide here a few historical facts concerning the creation of Hezbollah. Hezbollah the Party of God in Arabic, was founded in JUNE 1982, and it is a Shiite Lebanese political and religious movement with the military branch from which it began at its disposal. It was created in reaction to the Israeli invasion of Lebanon. Shia Islam is a minority branch of Islam that, nevertheless, brings together 15 to 20 percent of Muslims in contrast to the Sunnis, who represent the Orthodox majority. This conflict corresponds to a major H.I. historical fact at the beginnings of Islam. 
it is a result of a bloody civil war over the succession of its founder. After the death of Mohammed, one group of Muslims thought that sovereignty and power should remain within his family. The First who ought to inherit it was the Prophet's cousin, Ali, who was at the same time his son-in-law, the husband of his daughter. Another group of Muslims believed that, without the instructions of a will directing this, succession should be decided by a conference of Muslims and not necessarily by the Elinig of the Prophet. This disagreement led to a civil war marked by the assassination of Ali and the torture of his son, Hussein. When I say torture, I refer to the fact that the body of H. Hussein, the Prophet's grandson's body, was dismembered. It appears to me that this dismembering of Hussein's body, considering the position that it will occupy in the history of Shiite Islam, is not alien to the explosion of these kamikazes' bodies themselves. H. Hussein's body was, in fact, ripped apart and dispersed by his enemies. Hussein's torture constitutes the originary sacrificial scene, the foundation of Shiism. It gave rise to stories in every tradition of Islam as well as to impressive rites of commemoration in Shiism during which the believers inflict acts of autoflagellation on themselves in remembrance of this torture and as a sign of repentance, they attest to the intense sentiment of guilt inherited by the followers. The story that leads up to the torture as well as the story of the torture itself was of great interpretive stab by LITY in Shiism until the Iranian Revolution. UN till 1979 that is, for 14 centuries, this story had almost always been the same. In general terms, the following are its principal components, Hussein, in his fight to reclaim sovereignty, which is supposed to return to the lineage of the Prophet, receives from the inhabitants of an important city at the time, called Kaufa, 170 kilometers from Baghdad, the assurance that they are HIS allies. When he leaves with a few supporters to meet them, he encounters along the way his enemies who greatly outnumber him, a ferocious and unfair battle thus ensues. The inhabitants of the city do not come to Hussein's aid as they had promised. He is massacred. The symbolic core of Shiism constitutes itself out of this torture and the shameful desertion by the inhabitants of Kaufa, whom the Shiites even today consider to be the descendants and heirs of the crime. They did not kill him directly, but they contributed to HIS murder through their defection. After Hussein's massacre, the inhabitants of Kaufa respond by waging what will be called wars of repentance which, as the name suggests, were wars of revenge and expiation. We can find all this in the commemoration of the Battle of Karbala, in the rituals and spirituality of Shiism. Thus this faith is marked by a certain dolefulness that in some way resembles what we find in Christianity, and for good reason, since we are dealing with the killing of the son whose father was also killed. There is, then, at the heart of Shiism a whole genealogy of martyrs, which will, moreover, continue since many of Hussein's descendants will come to know a tragic fate. But it is Hussein who will occupy a predominant position in the martyrological institution, since he will be named the Prince of Martyrs. His sacrifice will eclipse that of his father, which remains an important point for the rest of my argument. Until the Iranian Revolution, the sacrificial story of Hussein is organized by the classical schema as I have just described it, Hussein is a warrior, Mujahid, killed at Karbala by his enemies and becomes a martyr, child. The faithful gather around the memory of his torture as a community of the guilty. His martyrdom is considered to be inimitable. But with the Iranian revolution a new figure of the Shiite revolutionary emerges, and with it a new reading of the scene of Hussein's torture. This reading will provoke a decisive change, of which one of the consequences will be to open the discursive niche of the suicide attacks. It is based on an interpretation proposed by an Iranian intellectual, close to Khomeini, named Ali Shartat, 1933-1977. We are dealing here with a thinker who played a very important role, he was the translator of Franz Fanon, he held a doctorate in sociology from the Sorbonne, he had so much influence that the Shah's secret service assassinated him, in theorizing the encounter between Islam and Marxism. He was the inventor of what he high M.S.E.L.F. called Red Shiism, 
red like the blood of the martyrs and like the emblem of the proletarian revolution. The new interpretation of the sacrificial scene of Hussein that he will propose relates to the following points. 1. H. Hussein is not only a warrior, Mujahid, who met a death he did not wish for, rather he chose to go toward it with full knowledge of what he was doing. He knew that he was going to die, and he was there in the determination to overcome himself for the cause. Therefore, he is not only a warrior martyr but a martyr martyr. It is in this sense that he was a candidate for martyrdom, Istishhadi. Two the Shiites are not only collectively guilty, as heir to the community of Kaufa, of having abandoned Hussein to his death, as the traditional interpretation has it. They are also individually and subjectively guilty. We witness here something like a privatization of a collective sacrificial neurosis, similar to what Freud described in the case of obsessional neurosis with regard to religion. 3. This individualization or privatization implies that the revolutionary Shiite subject is no longer merely the one who communes with others in guilt, now he must identify totally with H. Hussein, imitating his demand for martyrdom. He is no longer simply a member of the community remembering the event, but a making present of the consciousness of this event. To put it differently, we are not dealing with the commemoration of Hussein's sacrifice but with its reproduction. It is not remembered but repeat d. The subject must repeat it for himself as if he were Hussein. Hezbo LLA capitalized on this new interpretation of the sacrificial scene by Ali Shartat. It is, therefore, not only a matter of an organization that invented the practice of suicide attacks and which conditions some of its members to auto hetero putting to death, which is possible, but also and above all a laboratory in which a new signifying agency was put to work to reopen the trapdoor of the originary sacrificial scene. Who is unable to see the enormous significance of this modification which alters the relation of the Shiite subject to Hussein as an ideal? No longer inaccessible, the ideal is henceforth what he must become. H. Hussein becomes the place of an incitement to come to him in voluntary death. The ideal calls on the eye to absorb itself in him, and this is what leads to self-sacrifice. Each candidate for an attack makes H. Hussein's torn body emerge from his own body, and not only as a martyr of the faith but also as a revolutionary. From now on, the moral emotion of the tortured body circulates between God and the revolution, and the candidate for the attack incarnates the circulation of the corpus mysticum from one to the other. I propose here the following hypothesis, through the new signifier is Chayadai, by taking on himself the absolute sacrifice that founds the community, H. Hussein no longer guarantees in this culture the guardian function of the dead father. We could even say that he no longer mediates, to mediate means to make the thing non-mediate, or, in a Lacanian idiom, he does not bar the other, which opens the confrontation with the ideal father. I remind you that, in psychoanalysis, the dead father is an inaccessible point of origin, the anchoring point of the symbolic that tempers the demands of the ideal father, who is a menacing, cruel, persecuting figure demanding sacrifice. We encounter here a modification of what Freud called the cultural superego, a notion that has remained insufficiently elaborated, although it would be worth reconsidering in order to think in particular these periods of change du ring which the obligation to give your body to the community becomes so pressing that the sacrificing and the sacrificed are confounded in an interminable bloodshed, as if the blockage offered by symbolic substitution at the moment of foundational violence were no longer efficient. What happens, then, is that the role of the so-called intercessor, Caiaphae, is conferred on the martyr candidate in this new order of the signifier. We encounter this name in the testaments of those who carry out these attacks and address themselves to their mothers, primarily, to their fathers, and to their brothers, telling them that I leave to intercede for you. Similarly, in the D.I. scores of the families, the son receives the title of the intercessor. Moreover, the authorities of Hezbollah make this into a criterion for authorizing a candidate to become a martyr. THS is what Said Hussein Nasr Alaih, the head of Hezbollah, one of whose sons also committed self-sacrifice, says about HIS encounter with a candidate, I asked from him one single thing, 
and this is in fact the only condition that I impose formally to facilitate the arrival of the candidate for martyrdom on the field, to obtain with the others his intercession. So what is this intercession? The term, chafi, comes from an Arabic root which means amnesty and pardon. The title of intercessor is accorded to someone who can intervene to obtain pardon for another before a sovereign or before God when the intercessor is a holy man. It is, therefore, a function of the third who lightens the debt and the guilt of a subject, averting his sanctions. It cannot turn a candidate for martyrdom into an intercessor, if the one before whom he appears were not a menacing figure capable of reprisals, and if these young men were not sons who send themselves to their death in order to circumvent the terror of the ideal father. Thus, in the current situation of Islam, just as once in the West, the H.I. Storical mutation of the relation to war and death is a correlative of a modification of ideals, which cannot be grasped without the new orders of the signifier that emerge in the world of discourse. The shift from one term to another, the emergence of one word in an age-old system, accompanies new forms of putting to death. To die for the fatherland, for God, for the revolution, people certainly do not die only for words, but nor do they die without them, that is to say, without what comes before the cause that is accurately represented by the preposition pour in French and pro in Latin. What comes before the cause wants to orient death, trace a trajectory of meaning for it, give it a site, a destination, a place. In short, it wants to refer death, which amounts to giving it a name. For this name, people kill, kill themselves, and kill each other, as if the worst would be a death for nothing g. Translated by Roland Vegso. Would Islam have attempted to produce, I and the interior of its spiritual edifice, a reduction of the nostalgia for the father and a renunciation of his figure in order to constitute a faith in God? I pose this question as a result of research that has led me to an exploration of the texts and symbolic constructions of the Islamic religion in relation to the hypotheses of psychoanalysis.1. At first sight, this formulation appears to contradict Freud's consistent thesis, which locates, as the root of gods and religious formations, a sense such knock dem va ter tu but does psychoanalytic research on culture have to content itself with the application of the Freudian interpretation with iconic fidelity when the facts complicate such an extension of the resources of individual psychology to collective life. This is especially the case since, in his arguments on monotheism, Freud has left aside the example of Islam. Mentioning it only briefly, under the heading of difficulties in Moses and monotheism, Freud proposes an interpretation of Islam's spiritual system around the question of the father, an interpretation which proves to be very problematic upon a detailed examination. Point three. Let us recall Freud's evocation of, and extensive commentary on, Leonardo da Vinci's beautiful expression, he who appeals to authority when there is a difference of opinion works with his memory rather than his reason. For he proposes the hypothesis that one of the sources of the freedom to which Leonardo's work testifies with regard to his times resides in the fact that he had learned in the first years of his life to do without his father, 123. Thus he did not need to rely, throughout his entire life, on the transfiguration of the father into God I in order to conduct his audacious research, even going so far that he distanced himself from the position from which the Christian believer surveys the world, 125. Fruity, nevertheless, does not turn D. A. Vinci into a faithless person, as he emphasizes that there is no lack of passages where he expresses his admiration for the Creator, the ultimate cause of all these noble secrets, 124. At the same time, he also points out that the renunciation of the Father had opened up a space of play and gap for his imagination, these are Freud's words, which leads the mind to turn nature into the place of its own research. Freud concludes his study by attributing this character trait of da Vinci's to the fact that he mentions, in his Milanese manuscripts, having adopted the MU Slim religion. The point here is neither to pretend that the spiritual edifice of Islam does without the question of the father, nor to attribute to it a capacity for freedom whose limits have been demonstrated by its actual history, a history which follows the example of all religions and all dogmatic constructions. Rather, 
The hypothesis that I wish to propose consists of exposing a conjunction through which it appears that the founder of Islam, in the 6th century, having seen the treatment that Judaism and particularly Christianity reserved for the relation between God and the Father, attempted an overcoming which led it to produce an unbearable imperative comparable to that of the Christian love of one's neighbor, a commandment whose sublimity rendered it unbearable for the human psyche. In sum, the radical separation of the Father from God would have an anti-psychological character that returns as a demand for man to hold on to the impossible. But would it not be at this limit that a symbolic order contains the possibility of a spiritual liberty capable of engendering moments and works of s sublimation in civilization? I inversely, we could also ask ourselves whether the assignation to the impossible, under certain historical conditions, namely, when the hermeneutic forces are absent, does not lead to a whirlwind of desperation? I. I the figure of the father does not enter I into the dogmatic constructions of Islam. From the very beginning, the Quran takes special care to distance the reference to God from the representation of paternity, even in a metaphorical or elusive sense. The proclamations of the unicity of God radically banish every notion of divine generation or birth. In the surah called Pure Faith, divine nature is proclaimed in the folloing abrupt terms, say he is God the one the most unique, God the imminently indispensable. He has begotten no one, and is begotten of none. There is no one comparable to H.I.M. 1121-4. Commentators present this passage as a refutation of the Godfather of Christianity. The word plenitude, which used to be the title of the surah, aims at accepting God from the order of sex and generation. It is a translation of the term kamad, which designates what is full and complete, and therefore impenetrable. The latter meaning has prevailed in a number of translations. Point five, in fact, divine. Completeness formally opposes itself to the open nature of the HU man, open because sexual, sexual because split, since sex is the far J, which is gap, I and terstice, whole point six. Certain versions of the myth of creation turn sex into the inaugural element of the formation of the human being, what God first created in man, writes A.I. Korchubi, was his sex for I.J. He says, this is my deposit, I entrust you with it, since sex is a deposit emanatum.7. The word deposit here assumes the meaning of an inestimable object that marks the extraordinary dignity of the human. The Arabic term comes from the same root as the Hebrew Amen. It designates a primary yes or let it be and it is the correlative of the reception of the originary lack in human conformation. But this amenity constitutes, at the same time, TM source of the central ethical problem of man, which the Quran indicates in the FOLLOing terms, we had offered the trust, of divine responsibilities, to the heavens, the earth, the mountains, but they refrained from bearing the burden and were frightened of it, but man took it on himself. He is a faithless ignoramus, 33,72. Thus, the originary yes to the sexual contains a singular presumption. Other versions of this myth also exist that represent the primitive body of man as a body full of holes, delivered to demonic circulation through its orifices, when God created man from clay, while waiting for God to breathe a soul into him, Satan mocked Hime by playfully penetrating Hime through his mouth and leaving him through his anus, and then the reverse. He used the other orifices I in the same manner, the ears, the nose, etc. Obviously, this fragment stages the irony of the drive which is consubstantial with the topology of the whole as originary sexuality, and it would belong to the soul or psyche to try to circumvent it by covering it through its three fundamental functions, perception, imagination and, and understanding by reason. All the treatises on the psyche, Like Avicenna's de anima, move within this paradigm, regardless of the philosophical sophistication they achieve over time. S sex appears as the blind spot, one of the metaphors for sex in Arabic, of the encounter with the psyche. The separation is, therefore, radical. On the one hand, God is outside sex, outside generation. On the other hand, humanity, formed around the whole, is on the verge of an abyss that is itself the mark of humanity's transcendence. 
humanity uses imagination and reason to reduce its dangers and to establish legal sexual enjoyment, Nika. The whole spirituality of Islam will hold tight to this separation. IT proposes that there where there is God, there is neither paternity, nor maternity, nor engendering, nor sexual relation. No metaphor can transgress this impossibility. INHIS translation of the Quran, Jacques Burke reconciled the passage on pure faith cited above with one of the first definitions of the One God in Parmenides' poem. M. A. Conscious translation of Fragment 8 effectively shows a troubling proximity with the verse in question, being unengendered, it is also imperishable, whole, unique, immovable, and without end. Nor was it ever, nor will it be, it is now, who lly together, continuous one o. Conscious commentary indicates to what degree the completeness of this unengendered one God establishes the idea of a God radically different from all existing beings, a God who is being from which one cannot subtract, to which one cannot add d. Being fully saturated, he is the impossible. Whatever the results of the research on the Greek sources of the Quran might turn out to be, which might one day allow us to clarify the exact nature of transmissions and translations, the fact remains. That the last monotheistic religion, born I in the 6th century, immediately presents itself as an objection to the theology of divine paternity, thereby installing a genealogical desert between man and God. This has multiple consequences on all levels. First, on the level of historical development, we recall Hegel's thesis which attributes the rapidity with which Islam becomes a universal empire to the elevated degree of the abstraction of its principle and the highest eye intuition of the one in its consciousness. Point 11 On the level of philosophy, Christian Jamet has demonstrated how this content of faith leads to the birth of an ontology that establishes an equation between God and being, between the one and the identity of the REA slash point 12. Concerning the question of the subject, our research has barely begun to glimpse certain implications of the faith in one God who is being and real. Under these circumstances, upon which I cannot linger, cutting short the possibility of adoptive paternity that existed for the Arabs before Islam, the Quran excludes even the founder of Islam from the status of the father, M. Muhammad is not the father of any man among you, 33.40. If the prophetic mediation does not assume paternal attributes, it is because the first Muslim is immediately placed I in the position of a son and an orphan, one of the very first apostrophes God addresses to the prophet is that by which he calls him orphan. Thus, God's relation to man does not pass through the mediation of a paternal prophet. Paternity will never be, as it is in Judaism, at the center of an alliance with Yahweh as the God of fathers. In general, the sacralization of the father does not exist I in Islam, neither at the moment of the foundation of the new religion, nor in the exegetic H.I. story of its transmission. Moreover, the father is an object of a distanciation, of an insistent critique to which the Quranic text itself testifies. First, we encounter only a few rare occurrences, on seven occasions, where the Quran evokes favorably what it calls the first father's AIMA slash dash A whalen. Several commentators have noted judiciously that the Quran and the word of the Prophet, Hadith, do not use the term Father I in the singular but always in the plural, as if there had not been Thef either as a principle or essence. This primarily concerns Abraham, and secondarily Ishmael, Isaac, and Jacob, whose evocations as fathers are put in the mouth of a biblical personage rather than as direct nominations. In the great majority of cases, the plural fathers refers us back to negative facts, figures, or judgments. The fathers are I in error, I in unreso n, they succumb to temptation, they are idolatrous and forgetful, they are questioned, denounced, called on to believe in the one God, and sometimes they are forgiven for their fa ULTS. Besides, Abraham, who is the central figure of paternity for Islam, is presented as the very example of the foundation of monotheism through a disobedience to the father, since Abraham will refuse the polytheistic cult of his father T. E. Ra, and he will leave it in order to accomplish a spiritual migration. This assumes the sense of a liberation from the law of the father, from his clan and his customs, 
in such a way that the spirit of monotheism for Islam resorts to an exile through which the son encounters the one outside the father. Nevertheless, even Abraham, whose renunciation of the sacrifice of the son is commemorated every year by Muslims, is not exempt from the errancy attached to the figure of the father. For the Quranic text presents a version of Abraham's temptation to sacrifice one of his sons, without determining whether it is Isaac or Ishmael, that is different from the one in Judaism and Christianity, I inscribing itself in the perspective that has just been described, and thereby turning the error of the father I into a major spiritual resource. In fact, in the Quranic version of this episode, Abraham does not decide to sacrifice his son by a premeditated act. Neither is it God who suggests or orders him to make the sacrifice. The father's sacrificial desire is localized I and the dream, and it is under the effect of his dream that Abraham addresses his son in these terms, Zero my son, I dreamt that I was sacrificing you. The text thus stages a son submitting to his father's desire, Father, do as you are commanded, then, a father preparing to commit infanticide. When they submitted to the will of God, and, Abraham, laid, his son, down prostrate on his temple, then, God I interrupting the act at the last minute, zero Abraham. You believed your dream. 37, 102-105. 13. We can hear in God's cry, which halts thei infanticide, adi saprivil of Abraham's adherence to the images of his dream. Relying on this I interpellation, ibn Arabi, one of the greatest spiritual figures of Islam, from the 13th century, proposed a very elaborate theory of interpretation of the Dream and the sacrifice, which gives us the possibility to think in a decisive manner the spiritual roots of the question of the father in the Islamic version of monotheism. Ibn Arabi effectively shows that God's di saprival cannot have any other mean ing than the failure of Abraham's interpretation of his own dream. It is because the father commits the error of not interpreting his dream that he comes to the point of wanting to kill his son and that God intercedes to substitute a ram. One for the sacrifice, therefore, would have the function of making up for a missing interpretation by the father. But what is the cause of the father's failed I interpretation? Ibn Arabi puts forth the folloing expli katayan, the child is the essence of his generator. When Abraham saw in a dream that he sacrificed his son, I in fact the dream was about sacrificing H.I. myself 15. Thus, if we consider that essence, Ain, contains all the possibilities of being, as Ibn Arabi states, we you understand that Abraham evaded the I interpretation of his dream in order to subtract himself from the L imitations of his omnipotence. The father's dream to kill his son hides the desire to sacrifice the generative essence with which it remained confused. According to Ibn Arabi, to sacrifice essence is to accept the odor of existence, Araiha slash wujod, or to put it better, to consent to the determination of essence in one place, who io. Ceasing to occupy all possible places, this would be the becoming of the father. There is father only as existing, Ma'oyodi, since the generator results from the essence which is being, the one, God H.I. myself. We can draw three consequences. First, the concept of essence is the equivalent of enjoyment in the sense of absolute enjoyment. Second, interpretation would have the function of bringing to existence what the dream H.I. in its manifest content, namely, that desire is the desire to step outside of essence. Finally, what we call father is an existing thing that differentiates itself from the generator, the creator, kh8.lq, or being. In this regard, the father is a procreator who cannot coincide with God, the creator, except in the fantasy of the omnipotence of the father. Ibn Arabi writes, the dream is about an imaginative presence that Abraham did not interpret. It was, in reality, a ram that appeared in the Dream in the form of Abraham's son. Also, God redeemed the son of Abraham's fantasy, Wam, by the grand sacrifice of the ram, which was the divine I interpretation of the dream of which Abraham was not conscious, La Yachur, dot 1. 6. 
In sum, the fantasy of I infanticide by the father D.I. simulates the desire to kill the father of omnipotence, but since the father misses its interpretation, it is God who re-establishes it by the substitution of the ram. We should note here that I.B. and Arabi proposes a theory very close to the Freudian interpretation of the sacrificial animal that Jacques Lacan recapitulates when he emphasizes that the ram is a figure of the father of absolute enjoyment Why? The process of the father's failure would then be the F-O-L-L-O-ing, the father desires to be essence, I and so far as he remains confused with the son, but when he seeks separation, he misrecognizes its symbolic significance and wants to show off by inflicting the real murder on the son. Following I.B. and Arabi, Islam thinks the father from God and not the other way around. The latter appears as a god who makes up for the father's imaginary misappropriation of Alderite through the re-establishment of a hermeneutics of the dream that brings about the emergence of the Mising symbol in reality. It is in this sense that he is creator and procreator of the son, in contrast to the omnipotence of his procreator father. For Ibn Arabi, the procreator father is, according to its primordial nature, an animal. More precisely, from the perspective of the logic of procreation, the father of man is the animal. This is why, lacking an interpretation, the sacrifice allows the separation of this origin, that is to say, the advent of the odor of existence by the immolation of the animal. This development might allow us to respond to the question posed by I.B. and Arabi at the very B.G.I.N. Ning of S. text, How can the bleeding of the ram and human speech be the same? 18. We can now make the F.O.L.L.O.ing shortcut, it is in death that the voice of the ram becomes speech. It is by the I interpretation of sacrifice that murderous desire can be reoriented. I, I, I. As we stated at the beginning, this inquiry into the father was initiated by one of Freud's rare reflections, penned in Moses and Monotheism, about Islam. He writes, the recapture of the single great primal father brought the Arabs an extraordinary exaltation of their self-confidence, which led to great worldly successes but exhausted itself in them. Allah showed H.I. myself far more grateful to his chosen people than Yahweh did to H.I.S. But the I internal development of the new religion soon came to a stop, perhaps because it lacked the depth which had been caused in the Jewish case by the murder of the founder of their religion 1. 9. Iwill not revisit here the details of the D discussion that I have initiated with this proposition, 20 I will merely underline that the preceding developments seem to contradict the hypothesis of the recapture Wiederge Winyung of the single great primal father Ulvater. Rather, the separation between a creator god and a procreator father, between the latter, in opposition to the figure of the father of absolute enjoyment, and the former, in the position of a hermeneutic god who is gu guarantor of the failed symbolic function of the father, indicates that Islam thinks spirituality from a divinity that withdraws itself from the imaginary father of the origin. If Islam is really a religion of the son, it is because the son is saved from his own father, who does not succeed in separating H.I. myself from an animal father whose dream is a portent. Certainly, the dream also contains the desire of freeing itself from animal desire. From this point of view, it condenses two desires, one from the side of the animal, the other from the side of a terrible liberation, since it consists of cutting the flesh of the son. The God of Islam appears as a critique of the father, as an interpretation of his desire, I in order to elevate the son. God consents to the murder of the animal in the father, moreover, he proposes the murder of the father of enjoyment by symbolizing H.I.M. with the ram, which is then not a substitute for the son, as is often said, but for the father. With the sacrifice of the animal, the father gains access to the symbolic truth of his desire. He suppresses H.I. myself as origin. I am thinking here of Hegel's expression, for the child, the parents are the origin that suppresses itself 21. From this perspective, the being of the symbol is neither on the side of the father, nor on the side of the son, even if it saves the latter from the cruelty of the former. It is the capacity for transposition between image, word, and thing, that the ram can be the animal and the primitive father, the symbol, and the bleeding thing, the dream, of Abraham, and its, divine, 
interpretation. What I call here transposition, Ibn Arabi tried to turn into a theory of the creativity of forms as an intrinsic property of being or of God. While the latter is conscious of the multiple forms that it can assume in all things, man has only a restricted consciousness of transformations. He writes, we cannot even see our own spiritual form 22. It is in this sense that Abraham, though a prophet, does not see the spiritual form of the father and he must pass through so many metabolas. The fundamental reason for Ibn Arabi is the following, because God is never unconscious, by la chur, of anything, while the subject is necessarily unconscious of such a thing in relation with such other 23. Also, the hum and subject is always surprised to see the transposition of things into other things, including hi myself. Such is a brief account of Ib and Arabi's theory of the father, which radically separates the father from God, who is then thought as an energy of the transposition of forms to which man does not have full access since there is a an unconscious. Ib and Arabi's un conscious is not the Freudian unconscious, even if it often comes close to it. It is the condition of the spiritual veiling and unveiling of the multiple forms of man. 4. Ibn Arabi did not invent this theory from nothing. He deduced it from the Quranic text and from the discourse of The Founder of Islam. The hypothesis that I have previously proposed is that the Founder of Islam I inherits a genealogical situation exposed in Genesis, where it appears that Abraham's filiation by Ishmael is the fruit of Hagar's natural impregnation, while, with Isaac, God must I intervene in procreation since Sarah is older than 70.24 the same operation will be repeated with Mary in order to engender Jesus. The real father for Islam is, therefore, Abraham, while the creator God remains distant from procreation. I and Judaism and Christianity, God is simultaneously creator and procreator since Abraham and Joseph are symbolic fathers. This genealogical positioning in the first writing of the father of monotheism explains, I and my opinion, that the god of Islam is not a father. Curiously, comparative studies of monotheism have never revealed this essential feature. The other major fact of the biblical story is that Abraham sends his son Ishmael and his mother back I and to the desert, exposing them to death, from which only divine I intervention saves them. The figure of the father is thus marked within Islam by the question of abandonment, which redoubles the temptation of the sacrifice of the son, even though the Quranic text stages a reconciliation. Between Ishmael and his father at the time of the reconstruction of the Temple of Mecca. It appears to me that this situation has led the founder of Islam to renounce the idealization of the father in order to immediately disengage the concept of a god who is being, the source of a separated and separating symbolic function, from the father and from the son. If the God of Islam re-establishes the paternal metaphor in the sense that it reintroduces the missing interpretation between the father and the son in place of the narcissistic violence of the former, it escapes the ontology of the father, not only because it is forbidden to call it father, but because it is impossible to properly name it. In fact, Allah is not a name like Yahweh or Jesus. It is the contraction in the Arabic language of the indefinite article Ainlia, which means God. Allah means they God. This is why Joseph Chelhat writes in his Les Structures du Sacre Shale Arabs, if the Jews ended up giving to their God a name which is not a name, Yahweh, the one who is, the Arabs have practically left their God without a name 25. The negative theology that has constituted itself within Islam since the 9th century, with the founding of the Mutaza Slasha movement, founds itself on this impossibility of naming God that is to say, on the fact that language does not have access to the essence of being and went so far as considering the Quranic text as a metaphoric tissue which is not the work of a direct revelation of Godi, as Islamic dogma stipulates, but of a divine inspiration written by human hands. Translated by Roland Vagso. For five years I practiced psychoanalysis in Cairo, from the beginning of 1954 to the end of 1958. My patients were teachers, students, psychologists, doctors, lawyers, journalists, and artists, I in short, people already imbued with the idea of science. 
They were mostly Muslim, but a large number of them were Copts, Egyptian Christians. The whole of the cultivated class from which these patients were recruited probably comprised less than 1-0% of the population. The rest lived mainly in the countryside, and I imagine they had their own therapeutic methods, they did not address themselves to psychoanalysis, any more than requests for an analysis come from B.R. Eaton fishermen or shepherds of the southwest in France. Of course, the fact that the great majority of the population continues to alive outside the contemporary world, if not seemingly outside time, calls for an explanation. I will return to this, but for the present, I would like to emphasize that the fact itself of requesting an analysis, be it in Cairo or in Paris, implies that the candidate admits the existence of a part of H.I. myself that escapes his knowledge. He admits this to the point of imagining the existence of a subject, God, or eventually the specialist, who knows or can know about this part. But a feeling of the R.E.A.L.I.T.I. of the unconscious, in the sense of realizing an autonomous order of truth, which is truth only by dint of hiding itself from knowledge, is gained only with the completion of an analysis. In short, analysis begins with the admission of the unconscious, slash, in su, the unknown, and aims at attaining this realization, but one might just as well speak of a point of escape, which Lakin pinpointed in his formula of the fall of the subject supposed to know. This axiom of analysis goes beyond religious differences. Moreover, I see no difference between my patients from Cairo or Alexandria and those from Paris or Strasbourg, with respect to the problem of meaning in the unconscious, or of defense mechanisms against unconscious desires, or with respect to the eminently phantasmatic character of these desires. The only particularity that I recall is the prevalence of the mechanism of identification with an idealized person in patients with an obsessional structure, as many cops as Muslims, as a defense against the threat of castration. During these five years of work in Nasser's Egypt I was able to measure, I in all its depth, Freud's claim that the threat of castration is the bedrock on which analysis is broken or can be broken, insofar as the subject prefers his fellow narcissism to his desire. Indeed, we are dealing here with a mechanism we can describe as a voluntary servitude. This subjection, on which the absolute power of the monarch rests and which La Bodhi interrogated as insoluble enigma, appears on the contrary to the analyst as a position that I would call natural with respect to the libidinal economy. What calls for a distinguishing historical explanation is rather the appearance of regimes that constrain the power of the monarch and hold him responsible to those he governs. Now, we know that the ancient states that arose in the Middle East at the dawn of history were despotic, theocratic states that drew their legitimacy from religion. Even though it had no basis in the Quran or in the sayings of the Prophet, the Islamic State, I will return to this later, was, indeed, constructed on that model, more than on the model of the Sasanid or Byzantine. It is therefore not surprising that, despite the zeal and creativity with which they translated and assimilated the philosophical heritage of the Greeks, the Arabs, overly satisfied, no doubt, with their regimes since they were on the ascendant, did not think to translate Aristotle's writings on politics or Justinian's institutions. Their political writings, despite their abundance, exhibit a depressing poverty, the Arabs limited themselves to describing, to their heart's content, the qualities and virtues with which the Caliph must arm H.I. myself in order to govern his subjects well and gain their voluntary obedience. This had to do with a political culture marked by the kind of idealizing madness, from which the ego draws a narcissistic gain, that Freud described in his group psychology. Of course, with its yabusk tang, absolute power has its comic side, which lends itself to satire, but things remain at the level of witty words. We know that, through its relations with the unconscious, the MOT d'esprit makes you laugh, but between laughter and action falls the sword of the despot. Another striking phenomenon in my Cairo patients, especially the Muslim ones, was the frequency with which they suffered from a hopeless love. Here, it was also a matter of the effect of a culture that was not political but erotic, and that goes way back. 
I refer to the tradition of so-called virginal love that certain authors consider to be one of the sources from which courtly love originates, and that constituted one of the major themes of pre-Islamic Arab poetry. The most famous example of it is Mawainun Lai Slashi, Crazy for Lila, explicitly evoked by Aragon in his Le Fudi Elsa, Krazwai for Elsa. In this poetry, it is a question of singing, of enjoying the privation of a love forbidden by social impossibilities. These impossibilities were linked to intertribal marriage laws. Doubtless the forms of social life in Egypt were entirely different then, but the laws in Egypt from a half century ago regarding the separation of the sexes were still strong. Enough to create apparently insurmountable differences, even without the additional problem of class and the prerogative families accorded themselves in the choice of their future sons-in-law, of which the subject did not fail to make use. His desire finds itself thus reduced to its simplest expression, an appeal for the impossible, while his narcissism finds itself exalted by dint of the affirmation, desirer that he is, of his worthiness as desirable. This stems only from his identification with the phallic image. Thus, once again, we are dealing with a cultural condition that particularly favors what Lakin calls the trumpery fraudulence of transference but which is no less rooted in the passion for being that appears to be most widely shared among humans. I am reviewing my male and female patients who were situated on the hysterical slope of neurosis, I cannot help recalling what Freud says in a letter to Flyus on the subject of the prehistoric other, that none arrives to equal and to whose account the hysteresy chalks up everything that happens to her. I would say that it is starting from a partial identification with this other, that is, one that does not exhaust the possibility of objectal investment, that the hysteric happily places herself in the position of the bel aim, beautiful soul, denouncing the cowardice or weakness of men, not to mention their hypocrisy. We have never found a family structure solid enough to resist the power of a hysteric to transform family life I into a hell. A colleague working I in Cairo, Dr. Hussein Abdelkader, explained to me that today one observes a greater frequency of perversions in hysterical women. I th I n k that it is a matter here of a contamination by men. I indeed, it is the stronger sex that is, as Lakin remarked, the weaker sex with respect to perversion. Presently in Egypt, barriers between the sexes have become practically non-existent. Mixed class rooms exist, women work in all the domains once restricted to men, administration, banks, media, and so on. Even differences of class have been reduced to the difference in income. To this is added the fact that, according to a certain FATWA, a decree coming down from a religious authority, in this case certain faquins or jurists who without question fashioned it to satisfy the caprices of caliphs, a form of marriage called a marriage of jaurisance exists. In such a marriage, a man and a woman each need only declare their choice of the other before a witness in order for the marriage to be a done deal and sexual relations to be permitted, ha slash a, even if it means that they may divorce with the same ease. One can imagine the vogue that this formula has had in a country where the cost of living, the modesty of income levels, and the crisis in housing have rendered the project of marriage practically unrealizable for the vast majority of young people. Barriers between the sexes having thus been largely de-ismantled, a woman need only project the image of the unequal other onto her partner, by means of a mechanism comparable to that of hypnosis, to place herself in the service of his perverse import unities. Point two. One will argue that it is unlikely for Islam not to have had consequences for the eye inflection of neurosis, if only because this religion interferes in the determination of family structures by preaching polygamy. I would reply to this remark by asking the reader to take into account the difference between the laws of religion and those of custom that, alone in the long RUN, have the power to prevail over divine commandments. It is true that, without dictating it, Islam authorizes polygamy. That does not stop a mu slim girl, belonging to the middle class, not to mention the upper class, from being unable to accept giving her hand to an already married man. It is thus not surprising that I treated Annalie Sands, male and female, who came from monogamous families. The question remains, 
how is it that the GRE majority has remained outside the contemporary expansion of scientific culture? Is it not the case that Islam played a decisive role here? I will respond that it played absolutely no role. The fact is that Islam did not prevent, but on the contrary, provoked the miracle that one language, Arabic, which was, after all, a language of the desert even if it was not without admirable poetry, became in the space of a century a language rich enough to open itself to the scientific and philosophical heritage of the Greeks. It did not block the split I and Muslim thinkers between, Ashab al-Razi, conservatives and, Ashab al-Hadith, innovators, any more than it stymied the development of an authentically critical thinking, in the sense of a thought that takes its distance from the narcissistic complacence so characteristic of human collectivities. Better yet, it not only tolerated but sharpened the appearance of a thought that can, without exaggeration, be described as revolutionary, especially in the areas of theological reflection and mystic contemplation. I and truth, we find treatises on the soul in Arabic works that evoke the Freudian division among the parts of the personality, id, ego, and superego. Closer to our time, Islam has not prevented the enduring success enjoyed by Freud's works, most notably his masterpiece, The Interpretation of Dreams, which I translated into Arabic during my stay in Egypt and which continues to be disseminated in Cairo, as in Beirut and other Arab capitals. The response to our question is instead located in the policy slash politics of the ancient Middle Eastern states where writing is concerned. Let me explain. We know that the launching of city-states I and the Greek world LED, in the 4th century BCE, to a critique of the technology of writing, which stripped it of its sacred character. In return, the appearance at the dawn of history of the ancient states in the Middle East was characterized by the deployment of writing for the aims of prestige, power, and exploitation that was responsible for the tendency to consider writing the side of truth, that is, to sacralize it. Point three This practice consists of teaching the GRM -er of the venerated, if not sacred, language in school, to the exclusion of the Vulgate or everyday language, so that those young children gifted enough to become writers are raised with a love of this language, the only one they know how to write. The result of this policy, which aims not only at preventing the objects of faith from becoming objects of thought, but still more at immuring the people in the unique belief from which absolute power draws its legitimacy, is that Arab writers have never played so minimal a role in the political H.I. story of their country. Nor can we find a single Arab writer whose name became constitutive for national identity, such as Pushkin was for the Russians, not to mention Goethe, Hugo, or Shakespeare. I and short, writers have become, like the scribes of yesteryear, an elite without any contact with the people, who in turn find themselves isolated from the whole field of culture and critical thought. One will tell you that, at any rate, thinking is not a preoccupation of the people. An argument that, without implying the existence of professional thinkers, is perhaps just, but beside the point. It is true that the people, whatever the meaning of this word might be, do not read Darwin, Marx, or Freud. But at least they find themselves concerned with new beliefs, promoted by all sorts of popularizers not to mention the media, that man descends from the apes, that economics is everything, or stll more, that sex is, and so on. Let us add here ideas, such as those of proletarian revolution and the constitutional separation of powers, that become the compelling ideas on which the social edifice rests, without anyone's having to read Marx, Montesquieu, or Locke. Love is blind. Love of language is no less so. Why oh you will not fail to hear one of our scribes proclaim that vulgar language is made for the needs of daily life and not for literary creation, an argument that misrecognizes that creativity does not consist in reproducing the language of the street, but in exploiting the creative potential inherent in all human language. Topping it all off is the insistence that the language of the Aran, Arabic, is in fact a sacred language, as if God had chosen his prophet because he spoke Arabic, and not Arabic because it happened to be the language of his prophet, and as if he had not previously spoken Hebrew with Abraham and Moses. Since ridicule does not kill, 
I will end my commentary with the argument that only, Nawaitel, grammatical Arabic unites the Arab W world, while it is obvious that the Arab countries have simply become the theater where international conflicts are played out. The present situation nonetheless turns tragic when our scribes ward off, with as much energy as their despots, this simple invitation, that everyday Arabic and the few masterpieces it has inspired be taught in school not in the place of our Aranic Arabic, but alongside it. Everyone operates as if they knew that the adoption of a humanistic linguistic principle, which had incalculable effects i and the history of science, religion, and politics in Europe, would mean the end of a world with which they are, willingly or not, in solidarity. The unconscious, it, does not speak the language people learn in school, but, as Dante said, the one they learn at their mother's breast and from their nurses. It is therefore not surprising that analysts confirm as a group that they are in favor of this principle. After all, is it not in the nature of the analytic process to cause the downfall of the basis of a fraternity that goes beyond the miseries of difference? 4. T.R.A. Enslated by Juliet Flower McKennell One of the difficulties I in analyzing what Islam has come to mean and to refer to since the 19th century is the absence of agreement on what Islam actually is. Does Islam name a religion, a geographical site, a communal identity, is it a concept, a technical term, a sign, or a taxonomy? The lack of clarity on whether it could be all these things at the same time is compounded by the fact that Islam has acquired reference and significations it did not formerly possess. European Orientalists and Muslim and Arab thinkers have begun to use Islam in numerous ways while seemingly convinced that it possesses an immediate intelligibility that requires no specification or defy an Aishan. Islam, for these thinkers, is not only the name the Quran attributes to the Din, often, mis, translated as religio n, though there is some disagreement about this, that entails a faith iman in God disseminated by the Prophet Muhammad, but can also refer to the H.I. story of Muslim states and empires, the different bodies of philosophical, theological, jurisprudential, medical, literary, and scientific works, as well as to culinary, sexual, social, economic, religious, ritualistic, scholarly, agricultural, and urban practices engaged in by Muslims from the 7th to the 19th century and beyond, as well as much, much more. What kinds of modernist projects, intellectual endeavors and critiques, types of politics, forms of political life, spirituality, and economic and cultural practices do the new meanings and referents of Islam enable and what kinds do they disable? Some of the new meanings and referents of Islam had a significant impact on political and social thought as well as on national and international politics in the 19th and 20th centuries, and may have even more of an impact in the 21st. The implication of these meanings for politics and society results from their transformation of Islam into a culture and a civilization or a cultural traditio n, a system, to a manhaj, way of life, a method, three a program, four an ethics, a code of public conduct, a gendered sartorial code, a set of banking principles, a type of governance. Moreover, Islam has also come to be deployed as a metonym, FIQH, problematically rendered jurisprudence, and Kalam, theology, a guy n, problematically, which were traditionally sciences established by Muslim thinkers, or Sharia, sacred law, also problematically, a term loaded with different connotations and trajectories, often referring to a body of opinions and interpretations come to be conceived as constituent parts of Islam, for which it can metonymically. Substitute point 5. While the easiest transformation to identify is the one that makes Islam over into a culture and a civilization, g. Ivan the centrality of this meaning among Orientalist thinkers and their Muslim and Arab counterparts since the 19th century, the production of Islam's many other new meanings and referents may not be as clear. Yet a history of the multiplication of the meanings of Islam is necessary for understanding what Islam has become I in today's world, both in those parts of the world where peoples as well as political and social forces claim to up hold one kind of Islam or another, 
and in those parts of the world where peoples as we ll as political and social forces see Islam as other, whether or not they oppose it. I indeed, the current ongoing war is itself not only part of the productive process of endowing Islam with new meanings and reference, but also part of the related process of controlling the slippage of the term towards specific and particular meanings and reference and away from others. In this way, Islam is being opposed to certain antonyms, the West, liberalism, individualism, democracy, or freedom, and decidedly not to others, oppression, dictatorship, or injustice. Two central religious and intellectual strands emerged in the 19th century among Arab, Muslim, and European Orientalist thinkers who argued for the compatibility or I and compatibility of Islam with Western modernity and progress. The word, or, more precisely, the name, Islam itself began to conjure up immediate comprehension and significance in ways assumed to have always been the case. This project of rethinking, about, Islam in new ways, while often passing itself off as a return to old or original ways of thinking, was situated in the political context of the rise of European imperial thought and territorial expansion as well as in the corresponding decline of Ottoman political and imperial power. Yet the Islam to which these European and non-European thinkers referred was a more expansive concept, encompassing phenomena that had h either to been seen as extraneous to it. I indeed, Islam had never been the catch-all term the 19th century would make of it, but was, rather, something more specific, more particular. Another of the more interesting aspects of post-19th century uses of the term Islam is not just its accretion of reference, nor that the accreted meanings were deployed by different thinkers or different intellectual or political trends, but that they were employed differently by each thinker and each trend. European Orientalists, Arab secularists, Muslim and Christian, pious, and later Islamist, thinkers, post-colonial states defining themselves as Muslim or Islamic, and their Western and secular. Massad. Opponents, all seem to use the term Islam in a variety of ways to refer to a whole range of things. The productive multiplication of reference that Islam would begin to acquire would ultimately destabilize whatever meaning it had had before or even after this transformation, in that in modern writing about Islam it is not always clear which referent it has inag in text. Rather, it often seems that all of them are in play interchangeably in the same text, as well as across texts, thus rendering Islam a catachrisis that always stands in for the wrong referent. Psychoanalysts and psychoanalytic THINKERS working more recently on the object called Islam have been active participants in this process of multiplying significations, reference, and antonyms with elital self-questioning or analysis of what they are doing. Historically, psychoanalysis did not take Islam as an object of study, as a concern, or as a problem. Except for Freud's passing comments in Moses and monotheism about the founding of the Mohammedan religion seeming to be an abbreviated repetition of the Jewish one, of which it emerged as an imitation, little was written on the topic. Point six indeed, psychoanalytic studies on religion have been remarkable for the absence of any mention of Islam. This includes, for example, the early study by Eric Fromm on the topic, which makes no mention at all of Islam, while attending to Christianity. Judaism, Buddhism, and H. Hinduism. I, in addition to Arab clinical psychoanalysts trained I in France and the United Kingdom, who began to practice and teach in Egyptian UN universities during the 1930s and after, and to translate works of Freud and other psychoanalysts. Eight Arab intellectuals showed an early interest in psychoanalytic knowledge, especially in studies of the unconscious. Point nine. Yet those who employed a psychoanalytic method were not interested in applying it to the Aaron or the biography of the Prophet, or I.S. Lamtout. Court 10 but used it rather for cultural analyses that took as their subjects secular historical figures such as the medieval poet Abu Nuwa's 11 or modern Arabic literature, especially novels, 12 or the group Neurosis said to afflict contemporary Arab intellectuals working on the question of culture and modernity. Point 13 The Moroccan I intellectual Abdelk Berkatibi once noted in this regard that in short, one could say that Islam is an empty space in the theory of psychoanalysis 14. While psychoanalytic works, 
especially those of Freud, were translated into Arabic and engaged with seriously by Arab intellectuals from across the Arab world, those works of Freud's that dealt with religion and civilization, the future of an Elephian civilization and its discontents, and Moses and monotheism, as their Arabic translator Jur J.T.A. Rubishi states, were latecomers to the Arabic library on account of the very topics they discuss. Point 15 T. A. Rabiash I, in his 1974 introduction to the Arabic translation of The Future of an Illusion, does add that Freud's Western readers had also fought I.L. to appreciate the importance of these works because of the topics they engaged. More recently, however, there have emerged a number of psychoanalytic attempts to evaluate critically not only Islam as religion, its scriptures, and theological tradition, but also contemporary Islamist movements, often conflated with slash as Islam. Arab psychoanalysts and psychoanalytic thinkers, including M. O. Ustafa Safwan, Egyptian, Fethi Ben Zlama, Tunisian, Adnan Haubala, Lebanese, Katibi, Moroccan, and T. A. Rubishi, Syrian, to name the most prominent, who are without exception male and living in France, and whose psychoanalytic writings, except for de Rubishi, who is the only one writing in Arabic and who writes on Arab intellectuals and Arabic li literature, 16 are mostly written in French and focus on Islam, started to write on the linkage between Islam and psychoanalysis in the context of the rise of Islamisms, the phenomenon of which seems to have triggered their intervention s. 17 Katibi is the first to have broached the subject, initially in a text he wrote in 1984, and published in 1988, on the prophetic message. Point 18 He later revisited his article and its conclusions from a more expli sitly psychoanalytic angle in a 1987 lecture at a colloquium organized by H. I. Myself and Ben Zlama on the question of psychoanalysis in the area around Raza Bords de Islam, held at the College International de Philosophie in May 1, 1987. Katibi's paper, as we ll as the other colloquium papers, were published in 1991 in the first issue of the journal Kaya slash Entersigns, edited by Ben Zlama. One of Katibi's more interesting points has to do with the Prophet's sacrifice of his signature on the Quran as book to God. This sacrifice, Katibi claims, is the condition of Muhammad's becoming a Prophet. 19 Katibi has nothing to say about contemporary Islamisms or Islamists in these texts. 20. The approach of the other writers, however, as we will see, is characterized by a perception on their part that Islamism is a return of the repressed, of something that should, according to these thinkers, have disappeared long ago. Ben Zlama, for example, states explicitly, this generation of Arab and Muslim intellectuals, which opened its eyes at the end of colonialism and the beginning of the establishment of the nation-state, thought that it had fi and I shed with religion, that it would never again be a question in the organization of society site. Two. One Algerian anthropologist and psychoanalytic thinker Malek Chibel, who also lives in France and writes in French, states without equivocation that Islamism, as theological awakening, constitutes the return of the repressed and what is repressed is always related to childhood and what Islam is experiencing at the moment is a return to the period of childhood. 22. Havala speaks of Islam's waking up to face possible dangers. Point 23 What is not thought in these propositions, though, is the possibility that the return of the repressed is a feature of these thinkers' own anxiety and not only, or necessarily, that of other Muslims or Islamists. This return reopens the scene of the trauma, for these thinkers, of the persistence of Islam as not only religion in the LIFA of Arabs and Muslims, and this causes some of our psychoanalytic thinkers embarrassment and shame before their European counterparts and, more importantly, before their Europeanized selves. Point 24 Indeed, much of their writing on this question d displays a deep narcissistic injury suffered by these writers, who as Arabs and Muslims, as Europeanized Arabs and MU. Slims who grew UP in modernizing times and sought Europeanization as the telos of modernity, now found themselves inhabiting an era in which the project of Europeanization had failed as a result of the return of Islam in the form of Islamisms. The most ambitious of these thinkers, in terms of dedication, 
serious attention to detail, depth of thinking, and passion, is Fevi Benz Lama. Given the importance of his analysis, I will address his work in more detail than that of the others in an attempt to examine the intellectual and psychic mechanisms at work in his thinking on this interesting but uninterrogated conjunction of a reified psychoanalysis and a reified Islam. Ben Slama's book, La Psychanalyse I Eprivate I Islam, published in 2002, is perhaps the most serious engagement with one possible relationship that a certain psychoanalysis could have with a certain Islam, namely, one in which the psychoanalysis is put, or puts itself, to the test of this Islam, in which it stands before the test or crisis of Islam. Ben Lama proceeds as if he were writing a corollary to Freud's Moses and monotheism along the lines of Muhammad and monotheism. This is, in fact, his second attempt to do so. His first book to deal with Islam, La Nuit Breezy the Shattered Night, published in 1988, was less explicitly presented as such a project. La Sikana slash I Eprivate I slash M is a more profound. Second attempt, a repetition, at an engagement with that very same project, and intensifies Ben Slama's dependence on Moses and monotheism as the main psychoanalytic and Freudian scripture guiding his project. One of the more brilliant achievements of Ben Slama's book is his exploration of the role of Abraham and I.S. Hamel as the grandfather and father of the Arabs, coupled with his argument that the Quran, following the T.O.R.A., imposed T. He figure of non Arab Ishmael, whose mother is the Egyptian Hagar and whose father is the Hebrew Abraham, on Arab lineage A.L.I. Neg, which was never resisted by post Islam Arabs, even though neither Abraham nor Ishmael had any presence in their cosmological lore. Prior to the Quranic moment. Here, Ben Lama seems to ignore the fact that, in contrast to pagan Arab tribes, for Jewish Arab tribes, perhaps not considered Arabs by him, Ishmael and Abraham were indeed present. Unlike Freud's Moses, who is exposed contra the Jewish scriptural and theological tradition as an Egyptian outsider to his chosen people, Ben Lama's Ishmael, who is not the main prophet of the Mu Hamadan Kalel, is not revealed to be non-Arab, since his non-Arab lineage is clear enough in the Quran and in Islamic theology. Rather, what Ben Slama aims to do is consider this non-Arabness in relation to the question of identity and maternalism in order to argue that Hagar is repressed in Islam and Islamic theology in favor of Sarah without much deviation from the Judaic story. To some extent, Ben Slama's discussion corresponds to Edward Said's important reading of Freud's Moses as an anti-nationalist call that rejects essentialism and group homogeneity as necessary founding myths. In other words, Said concludes his D.I. discussion of Freud's Moses, identity cannot be thought or worked through itself alone, it cannot constitute or even imagine itself without that radical originary break or flaw which will not be repressed, because Moses was Egyptian, and therefore always outside the identity inside which so many have stood and suffered and later, perhaps, even triumphed 25. But Ben's Lama, in contrast, wants to read the repression of Hagar as informing Islam's views of women and the figure of the mother more generally, Islam was born from the stranger at the origins of monotheism, and this stranger remained a stranger in Islam, 171. Ben Lama does not limit himself to a D.I. discussion of paternity and maternity, the question of origins in the Aaron, and subsequent theological exegesis, but brings H.I.S. conclusions to bear on the contemporary situation. It is clear throughout the text that the entire archaeological project Ben Lama is engaged in is an at MPT to respond to the claims put forth by many contemporary Islamisms and their enemies about Islam and Islamic origins. It is in the context of discussing contemporary Islamisms, however, that Ben Slama's book shows less engagement with psychoanalytic thought and concepts and moves to liberal critiques concerned with the individual, freedom of thought, tolerance, and the separation of the theological and the political from each other. Definitional slash why, Ben Slama is aware that Islam is mul tipple and that it is always already Islam's, Yet at key moments in his narrative these multiple Islams converge into one which is conflated with a singular Islamism, as both an utterable name and one that should only be used under erasure suriture. My concern is the ideological context of these slippages, conscious and unconscious, 
and the political philosophy and psychic processes that inform them. While he does not define Islam in his book, Ben Lama provides two meanings in a later article on the subject, in which he claims that the word Islam has been fixed by a theological connotation I and to an abandonment to God unabandoned you, and that its etymology designates this act as having been saved after abandoning itself. 26. The latter, in fact, may be one possible connotation of the word, though not necessarily its immediate one, since the most common meaning of Islam in Arabic is deliverance of oneself to Godi, and not abandonment, or the more common Orientalist translation as submission to Godi, which Ben Lama problematically cites as the theological meaning of the word in Islam, even while mentioning its other meaning, s, of being saved, but curiously not its meaning of deliverance. 27 While he claims that it is only Islamists who want to render the meaning of Islam as submission, he participates, if ambivalently, in the same project with his endorsement of the Orientalist meaning of Islam as submission when he insists that the Islamism of groups and institutions today is submission sonmiz Zion to the religion of submission 28. The word for submission in Arabic, however, is kudu, a word that has no etymological or other connection to the word Islam. Ben Lama is certainly not alone in his problematic translations. The question of translation and language is essential for psychoanalytic thinkers in general. The major thesis of Safwan regarding what he constantly refers to as Arab B awkwardness is that it is a problem of language. Like Ben Lama, but with less erudition, Safwan often seems to confound Arabic and Latin etymologies in ways that exoticize modern Arabic, as he does, for example, in his D discussion of the difference between the Latin-based word sovereignty and its Arabic equivalent siyata.29 Safwan objects that the Arabic word, siyata, unlike sovereignty, means mastership, whereas its true meaning, at least according to Carl Schmitt's definition, is the RI to take decisions in the last resort. The translation leaves us only with the primitive, dual relation of master and slave, whereas what is at stake is a political conception of decision. 30 Safwan, however, seems not to know the Latin meaning of the term sovereignty, which comes from over above, in Latin super anus, nor that the traditional English use of the term, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, is sovereign lord, and one who has supremacy or rank above, or authority over, others, a superior, a ruler, governor, lordy, or master, of persons, etc., and that sovereignty means supremacy or preeminence in respect of excellence or efficacy. It remains you and clear whether Safwan would consider the original Latin meaning of sovereignty, and the later English one, as primitive or if only its Arabic rendering is so.31. The answer Safwan discovers in addressing his own question, why are the Arabs not free? is found in what he considers to be the division between literary and vernacular spoken, Arabic, the former is a sacred language and slated for the use of elites, while the latter is the language of the masses. Safwan reifies the two uses of Arabic as completely separate and even splits them into two languages, showing utter unfamiliarity with their actual imbrication inone another. He is under the impression that li terror Arabic today is the same Arabic of the Quran when in fact it is as different from the latter as are the contemporary vernaculars. While contemporary educated Arabic speakers have the ability to read texts from the 7th to the 18th century with varying degrees of difficulty oust as contemporary educated English speakers are able to read Marlowe, Chaucer and Shakespeare with varying degrees of difficulty, it would be next to impossible for 7th century Arabic readers to read contemporary li terror Arabic, since the script itself has changed. Much less comprehended, given the changes in syntax, structure, and vocabulary. This reification of modern li terror Arabic as fossilized in the language of the Quran is not unique to Safwan, but is a common Orientalist claim that has no substantiation in fact. I indeed, neither contemporary li terror nor spoken Arabic could exist I independently of one another, so integrated are they in their very syntax, structure and vocabulary that any attempt to disentangle them would require a project of social engineering of the sort that Safwan attributes to the pharaohs, 
whom he claims first instituted the division between the L.I. Terrorit and the spoken in order to rule the masses unhindered. Yet it is he who calls for such a project, namely that the state institutionalize the split he thinks already exists between L.I. Terrorit and vernacular Arabic and that it teach the vernacular in its schools as a precondition for democracy. 32 This view of L.I. Terrorit Arabic, which also equates it with Latin, harkens back to Orientalist assessments and to debates among Arab intellectuals in the colonial times of the 19305 and 19405.33 Safwan, however, presents it not only as a sane rational fact, but also as one that, if denied by any Arab, would expose an anti-democratic position, it is often thought and said that Arabic is one language, but I in fact the distance between classical Arabic and the Arabic of Egypt, the Gulf states and North Africa is analogous to the relation between Latin and the Romance languages Italian, Spanish, and French. The failure, or rather the refusal, to acknowledge these differences is the refusal to allow the uneducated Afu LL say in their future 34. Since cultures achieve modernization through language, Safwin wonders, who could imagine the destiny of Europe if Latin had remained the language of L.I. Terratur, science, philosophy, and theology, 35. But one need not spend much time imagining, since Safwin offers the Arab world as the answer. Ben's Lama, like Safwan, locates the crisis in Islam in language, it does not have to do only with a lack of modernity, as is often said, but rather with a modernity that has ignored its subject, one that had to do with a progressivist ideology, in which had to be included the imperative of economic and technical development without taking into account the work of culture. Or, if you will, a modernization without the L.I. and Gistic foundations that constitute the work of civilization, something both Christianity and Judaism, in contrast, had obviously done. 36. It is clear that the two meanings of Islam Ben's Lama posits are not the only ones he employs in La Sikana slash Isa slash Epravada slash M. While Ben's Lama explains at the outset that the many Islams he posits are diverse, various, and sometimes unconnected, even though they may all hide behind the singular name Islam, 23, he soon abandons this multiplicity in favor of a singular Islam whose signifieds and referents remain multiple but unspecified even as they are presented consciously and ideologically as singular. It is rarely made clear, for example, when he uses the term is slash m, whether he is referring to all Islamist movements and individuals or just some of them, whether is slash m refers to the history of Islamic theology from the 7th century to the present, or to the H.I. story or present of states that call themselves Islamist, or even those that call themselves Muslim, whether it refers to the Quran, the Hadith, the Sunnah, or all combined, and so on and so forth. While Ben Lama sees the attempt to homogenize Islams into Islam as not only an Islamist project but also as a superficial European attempt to deal with the rise of many Islamist movements in different geographic and social contexts, their reduction by a European political sociology to one Islam, Ben's Lama declares, is nothing short of our assistance to the intelligibility of Islam on the part of Islamologists, a resistance that, he maintains, also applies to European psychoanalysts. 24. It is remarkable that Ben's Lama would insist UP on such intelligibility even as he insists upon the proliferations and I and commensurables of Islam's invocations that he would call UP on this intelligibility under the heading of a resistance to it by others, thus situating intelligibility negatively, through its failure to re I stir, while making, it would appear, the intelligible uniquely available to him. 37 Leaving this aside for now, Ben Slama's astute understanding of the multiplicity of Islams as signifiers, whose signifieds, however, remain obscure in Ben Slama's own text, falls by the wayside through his constant invoking of Islam in the singular as a subject with a self that expresses itself and whose meaning is readily intelligible. Ben's Lama speaks of the actuality of Islam, 26, that imposes itself on him, of the tradition of Islam, 27, within which people grow up, and how he had realized Uem Apir Siva simply that, in the majority of cases he consulted, 
Islam was always the effect and the cause of subjective and trans-individual structures, 27. INs telling slippages, and there are many more, what is most interesting is that the perception of the singularity of Islam and its effect on Muslims belongs not to Ben Zlama alone, but is shared by many, though not all, Islamist thinkers. I indeed, Ben Zlama identifies the reaction of many Islamists and Muslims to Salman Rushdie's the satanic verses as occurring within the singular world of Islam. He states that the shock in the case of Islam came from where we did not expect it, from L.I. terror fiction that put on stage the truth of origins as a trick, 43. In doing so, Ben Zlama follows a L.I. viral secular tradition, which often seems to recognize e. the Islam of some Islamists as the one Islam, even though he is well aware, and curiously adds a footnote to the Arabic translation of his book clarifying this point, that what is at stake in contemporary debates is the meaning of Islam, and what is unfolding is indeed a war of the name, or a nominalist war. 38 in his book, however, and despite his noted vigilance, Ben Zlama opts not only to analyze the terms of this war between the different protagonists, but, and herein lies the contradiction, also to join in as a party to the war. In this light, the battle over the Islamist notion of Islam, which Ben Zlama and many secularists often oppose as the one Islam, is, as many Islamists correctly claim, between those who want to up hold Islam and those who want to uphold anti-Islam. I in fact, Ben Zlama ambivalently posits the singular Islam, whose meaning, as we have seen, he often shares with many Islamists and Orientalists, as the other, or is it the other? Of liberalism.39 he does not do so explicitly, but his invocation of freedom, tolerance, and individualism as the values or key ingredients, absent from the one Islam but necessary to the Islam he wishes for, structures his polemic against Islamists. Moreover, his insistence that Islam be transformed from a din into the Christian and secular liberal notion of religion, la religion musulmane, 40 as well as his attack on Islamists who, unlike him, regard Islam not only as a religion, 25, commits him to a hegemonic form of liberal epistemology whose aim is the assimilation of the world in its own image. For 1to make his point unequivocal, he titles his recent pamphlet Declaration de Insubmission, that is, Declaration of Rebbe el Elion or more precisely of Insubmission, to the religion of Submission 42. But if Islam for Ben Zlama means submission, then his declaration is essentially and consciously a declaration of UN, Isla M, or, to be more precise, a declaration of anti-Islam. But there is an important ambivalence in Ben Slama's project. While this Islam seems, according to him, to be opposed to the individual freedoms of writers of the caliber of Rushdie, he also criticizes European Islamologists for not recognizing that another Islam, whose referents again remain multiple, the Qur'an, Islamic theology, Islamic culture, and so on, upholds individualism. Ben Zlama insists that Islam rather deploys one of the extremely powerful dimensions of individuality, a dimension of great conceptual abundance. This dimension could not have developed without being compatible with the reality of the culture. This is indeed a culture of individuality, but one that is essentially governed by an identification with God, 302. Ben Zlama is very critical of those Western psychoanalytical pronouncements on Islam and Muslim cultures that represent it as the obliterating of the individual, and which see the Western achievement that gave birth to the individual as the ultimate achievement of civilization tout court. He declares that those who insist that an alleged absence of individualism in Islam prevents Muslims from being accessible to psychoanalysis are simply ignorant, adding, I will not cite anyone's name so as not to privilege those who are in the order of ignorance and carelessness, 302. Ben Slama's ambivalence here is not necessarily and only a conscious one, but more likely the effect of an ideological commitment that imagines different audiences differently. The reference to multiple Islams might be said to be an ideological position, the position of political correctness, and slash or an expression of a wish, 
while the references to one singular Islam in the many slips seem to betray what Ben's Lama actually fears to be the case. This could indicate his own unconscious resistance to the claim, his own claim, that there are many Islams, or his conscious recognition that his claim is a mere wish and not an acknowledgement of observable reality, and that what he does notice or realize, as he tells us, is that there actually exists only one Islam and therefore that this Islam must be opposed, hated, for not pluralizing itself as it must and should. I in this regard, he announces at the outset of the book that the origins of his own interest in writing on Islam emerged in the early 1980s, elsewhere, he would tell us that his interest started in the mid 1980s 43 or in a critical historical situation marked by a fanatical surge, as a decision to explore the gap between a terminable Islam and an interminable one, 20. While Ben's Lama cautions us, and perhaps H.I. myself, to use a new vocabulary and to adjust to a new epistemology wherein we, he, must hear Islams when we say Islam, it would seem that he often remains deaf to his own warning, 76. Perhaps, then, the singularity of actual Islam is itself the scene of the trauma that one cannot but revisit and whose claims one, or Ben's Lama, is compelled to repeat at the very same moment and in the very same text where he insists that he, and we, must resist. La Sikana Slashes repeats many of the same scenes, and discussions, in the biography of the Prophet M. Muhammad that Ben Zlama had conjured up in La Nut Breezy. It remains unclear if this act of repetition is merely a self-repetition that revisits his first, inaugural, text, child, on Islam or a revisiting of the prophetic scenes themselves as the site of trauma that compels repetition. I indeed, one of the main scenes of La Nut Breezy, repeated I N Sikana Slashes, the one in which Khadija, the Prophet's wife, reassures Muhammad that the angel Gabriel who had appeared to him was I indeed an angel and not a demon, is a scene Ben's Lama borrows, and therefore revisits, from the inaugural article by Katibi, the very first psychoanalytic visit to that scene. Point 44 La Sikana Slashes surely is a repetition with a twist. It is a more comprehensive, more elaborated second attempt by Ben Zlama at producing a psychoanalytic reading of Islam. As Ben Zlama's youngest child, and d as we know books which carry the names of their authors are always reproductively connected to them, just as children carry the name of the father, La Sikana Slashes seems more privileged and more celebrated by critics, just as the younger male child in the Torah is always more privileged, Abel, Isaac, Jacob, and others. It is unclear if an unconscious wish on the part of Ben's Lama is at work here, one of preferred NG, once again as God and Abraham did, Isaac to Ishmael. Before I indulge I in further speculations, let me cite Ben's Lama's own statement of his task in his important book, to translate the Islamic origin in the language of Freudian deconstruction. J translation is not application or annexation, but through a signifying displacement, conveys the very texture of a tradition in its language and its images, in order to give access to what is unknowingly thought, inside it a son in Su, 319. I am un persuaded by this assertion, mostly because translation of Islamic texts into European languages often seems to mean retrieval of dictionary meanings of words and their etymology without much attention to the intellectual context and historicity of the uses and significations of words and how they change over time, the links that Mohammed Arkhan has juxtaposed as Iyanguage History Thought 45, something all contemporary interpretative exercises of the texts of the past must attend to in order to avoid projecting contemporary meanings and values onto them. It is clear that Ben's Lama is concerned that translation can be a form of annexation. But he wants to insist that translation in this case gives access to the unconscious of the tradition, B. Sun Insu. While this may be so, it does not do away with his initial concern. Translation in this case is not annexation but assimilation, in that Ben Slama's Freudian deconstruction, whether it uncovers an Islam that is individualist or anti-individualist, can only do so in relation to a modern liberal European value that Ben Slama posits as universal, namely, individualism. 
This assimilationist move is presented as useful for psychoanalysis and as useful psychoanalytically to the extent to which it secures the intelligibility of the logic of repression, which subtends the foundation of a symbolic organization, 319. There is some tension in this assimilationist project, however. On occasion, like the Orientalists, Benz Lama insists on not translating Arabic words, including the one for God, Allah, into its French equivalent, Dieu, when translating an Islamist text from Arabic, but he seems invested in exoticizing it as the specific and exclusive proper name of the Muslim God, when in fact it is the name that Arab Christians had used for their God before Muhammad and Stl use after him, 59. On another occasion, he insists on using the Arabic word Ura, whose etymology he provides, without translating it into the French, and English, Piyutendum, which has similar etymological origins, which would render its equivalent meaning to HIS French readers, 197.46. Ultimately, however, Ben Lama wants to present his Islam as assimilable to the liberal notion of the individual, even if it is so with a difference. It is possible here that Ben Lama is engaged in deploying this Islamic individualism as a way of passing his Islam off as European, and that this passing off is indeed a form of resistance to Orientalist liberal accounts of Islam as lacking in individualism, while simultaneously condemnatory of Islamist resistance to this passing off, which he brands as pathological or as suffering from some form of group delirium deliri collective j. 49. I and another related but earlier text, he makes a policy recommendation for Arab pedagogy by cautioning that if Arabs were to fail to introduce Kant's critique of pure reason into their educational curricula, they would be committing a horrendous error. 47. Ben Lama is engaged in a project of simultaneously othering the Islam of the Islamists and identifying his own wished for Islam with Europeanness. In this vein, he is partly mimicking Freud who, in Moses and Monotheism, insists on assimilating European Jews by declaring that they are not Asiatics of a foreign race, as their enemies main in, but composed for the most part of remnants of the Mediterranean peoples and heirs of the Mediterranean civilization. 46. Said wondered about Freud's move, could it be, perhaps, that the shadow of anti-Semitism spreading so ominously over his world I and the last decade of HIS life caused him protectively to huddle the JEWS inside, so to speak, the sheltering realm of the European, 49. Unlike Freud, Ben's Lama, it seems, is caught between the scylla of Orientalist hostility to all Islams and the Charybdis of his own hostility to the one, Islamist, Islam, which leads him to the, in, decision of identification and othering simultaneously. Herein lies the importance of the DI scores of scientism and rationalism, with which Ben's Lama identifies modernity, the West, and psychoanalysis, to which he opposes Islamism, in the singular, despite his own assertions that it is a plural phenomenon, and the one Islam, 24-25. He consecrates a series of binaries to make this opposition clear, this line does not only pass between those who are tolerant and those who are fanatical, between rationalists and believers, between the logic of science and the logic of faith but also between the position that thinks it can find the truth of Arig I N in the texts of tradition, and this position thinks that this could be done through rational procedures armed with the valid DI scores of the historical method, and the position that considers these same texts as a fiction or as a legend, 36. I in this regard, it is perplexing that Ben's Lama discusses some Islamists' attempts to make the Quranic text correspond to scientific knowledge as a sort of neurosis or, more precisely, as I interpretative delirium delire interpretative j, and not part of their rationalization of the Quran, 70. He adds that examining these Islamist documents leaves one with the impression of an immense interpretative delirium, ushered in from a destruction anxiety and guazda de destruction and constituting an attempt to repair from the outside that which has collapsed on the inside, 70. This is ironic. G. Ivan Ben Slama's commitment to rationalism and the fact that he chose the non-ironically named Association of Arab Rationalists, of which he is a member, 
to publish the Arabic translation of his book. Point 50 Ben Slama's use of these taxonomies of rationalism and irrationalism, science and faith, knowledge and ignorance, is in fact shared by many Islamist thinkers. If the Islamist thinker, Sayyid Qutb, referred to his contemporary Muslims and non-Muslims as still living in an age of ignorance, echoing the Quran's description of the pre-revelation period, Ben Zlama, aside from using post-enlightenment descriptions of darkness and obscurantism to characterize Islamists, insists that Muslim men of religion live in great ignorance 51. The opposition of science to religion, and the correlate characterization of psychoanalysis as a science that is opposed by Islam as religion, is shared among many of Ben Slama's psychoanalytic colleagues, including Tarabishai, Safwan, and more recently, Haubala. Safwan, for example, offers two theories to explain the nature of the relationship between Islam and science. On the one hand, he contends that the Arabs were open to learning from foreign science and building on it when they were in power, but upon losing power, they henceforth refused to learn from a science that came from colonial powers. Point 52 On the other hand, he offers an analysis that does not fully cohere with the first, namely that it was the Turks who destroyed science in Islamic civilization. 53. He also asserts that Islam was the victim of the nations it invaded because they themselves were the victims of political regimes and administrative apparatuses whose sole purpose was to ensure the state's domination over all the aspects of life. 54 Yet Safwan makes a sweeping and disconcerting generalization that in the contemporary period, the West has accomplished great things on account of the separation between religion and science, while the Islamic world has produced nothing as a result of their generalization of the idea that scientific DI scores is the product of infidels and therefore should not be adopted. 55. The angry and contemptuous tone of this last quotation may be due to the fact that the text is in Arabic, which renders it a private address to Arab Islamist audiences, an auto critique, to which most Europeans would not have access. Safwan contends that, unlike the Church in Christianity, the church in Islam is the state, specifical ly in the form of a dictatorial monarchy that eliminates the possibility of civil society. This produces in many Muslims and Islamists an excessive normopathology of conformity to practicing religious rituals. 56 Safwan refuses essentialist arguments that privilege Christianity's alleged openness to science and democracy over Islam's. Yet, his materialist analysis leads to the same conclusion, namely, that whether Islam or the Arabs are essentially hostile to science or democracy, or have become thus on account of socio-economic reasons and foreign invasions, they are today hostile to them, which accounts for their state of unfreedom. Haubala, to take another example, is concerned with the relations among science, religion, and psychoanalysis, a theme around which he and other psychoanalysts convened the Third International Conference of Arab Psychoanalysts in Beirut in 2007, as well as with the inhospitable reception that psychoanalysis is said to have received in Arab intellectual circles 57. Haubala is most interested in the lack of democracy in Arab countries, to which he credits this inhospitality to psychoanalysis, as the latter cannot be imagined to exist in a repressive country, for psychoanalysis is the acting out of one's freedom of thought 5b. Haubala insists that democracy has failed to conquer Arab thought. The concept of the individual is eclipsed before El Aurelia, the community, where the power of the shepherd, the caliph, is imposed by divine order, an order to which all the people cannot but be subjected at Rasonmis. 59 What is remarkable here is how Bala's understanding that the concepts of the individual and democracy are European concepts, while Araiwa, El Raiya, which means subjects in Arabic, as in the king's subjects becomes an Islamic concept. How Araiwa becomes essentialized as an Islamic concept that cannot be conquered by democracy and that must eclipse the individual is key to understanding how Bala H.S. approach, which insists that the subject of science has not made an entrance into Arab culture 6 How Bala, who uses Islam in all the same ways Ben Zlama uses it, without specification, 
argues in his opening address to the Third International Conference of Arab Psychoanalysts that Islam in the Ottoman period remained removed from these scientific developments that had unfolded in Europe, and social revolutions, the French Revolution, on account of geographic limitations. Now, however, as the gates have loosened and opened wide, Islam no longer has a choice but to confront the scientific wave of postmodernity. In my opinion, the violence exploding everywhere constitutes a primitive phenomenon as a first defensive reaction which will have to be followed later by an intellectual wave that can absorb modernity and interact with it. 61. The question he poses is why did Islam experience modernity as a danger? 62. The answer he offers is that Arab slash Muslims, who are used interchangeably in the very title of his essay, have not been subjected to two surgeries since the emergence of Islam, namely, the separation of religion from authority, for there did not occur a revolution like the French Revolution, and the separation of religion from science 63. Here, the reification of psychoanalysis as a science and the elision of the important debates within psychoanalysis about its own scientificity, let alone Freud's own overdetermined and ambivalent relationship to science, are never acknowledged or referenced by any of these thinkers. Perhaps Ben Slamas, as well as Safwins and Havala's, resistance to, or anxiety about, the possibility of many psychoanalyses. Rather than one true psychoanalysis parallels HIS anxiety about the one Islam and the many. Still, these thinkers differ among themselves in certain respects regarding the nature of the relationship between Islam and science. This opposition, which they consecrate, however, is not new but continues a tradition inaugurated by Orientalist Ernest Rayan's infamous debate with Jamal Aydin Ai Afghani in the 19th century about this very question, wherein Islam and the Arabs were castigated as hostile to science, a debate which none of these thinkers cites or seems to be familiar with. 6-4. Ben Slama has a major concern with the liberal notion of tolerance, which he finds lacking in the one Islam propagated by the Islamists, all of them, but which he seems to think is in abundance in European rationalism and secularism, all of it. Here Ben Slama's commitment to liberalism is also a commitment to the Freudian equation of individualism with phylogenetic and ontogenetic maturity, to which Freud opposes group solidarity and organicism as primitive and regressive, and a commitment to Freud's consideration of tolerance as the highest achievement of liberal politics, which is essentially synonymous with the highest degree of civilization. Freud's accounts of these questions, as Wendy Brown has shown, can be read in two different directions, both as the way men overcome primitive asociality through forms of social life free from strife in a social contractarian manner, civilization and its discontents and totem and tabu, and as the overcoming of primitive solidarity and organicism in the achievement of civilized individuality, group psychology and the analysis of the ego. In contrast, Liberal notions insist that civilized individualist liberal tolerance, as Brown put it, is only available to liberal subjects and liberal orders and constitute the supremacy of both over dangerous alternatives. They also establish organicist orders as a natural limit of liberal tolerance, as intolerable in consequence of their own intolerance 65. Thus, while Ben Slama chastises the one Islam and Islamists, always seen as deploying one singular meaning and interpretation of the one Islam, for lacking any rationalism or tolerance, denying them any tolerance on the grounds of their own alleged intolerance, he extends tolerance to the individualist Islam he rescues from, all, the Islamists and from the Orientalists as one that features this important civilized value. I in this sense, his liberal valuesdi for a little from the general understanding liberalism has of societies that insist on different forms of sociality and which it thus considers other. As Brown maintains, organicist orders are not only radically other to liberalism but betoken the enemy within civilization and the enemy to civilization. Most dangerous of all would be transnational formations imagined as organicist from a liberal perspective, which link the two. Judaism in the 19th century, communism in the 20th, and today, of course, Islam 66. 
Here the historic links between liberal anti-Semitism and Orientalism and liberal anti-Communism are shown to inhabit the very same politics of identity and othering. I should note, however, that Judaism, having emerged after World War TWO within the liberal Western dyad identified as Judeo-Christian civilization, replacing the earlier pre-war formulation, which Freud referred to as our present-day white Christian civilization 67, now mostly escapes such descriptions, except for those Judaisms that resist their inclusion in this liberal order. Indeed, Ben's Lama himself is implicitly so impressed with the Jewish achievement of Western liberalism, that is, Jews having reached Western liberal individual maturity, which he would have MU Slims emulate, that he exaggerates the scientific achievement of Jews by endowing Christian thinkers with Jewish identities. In his rush to demonstrate his defense of the Europeanized and therefore liberal, mature, and enlightened Jews against a fantasized primitive of obscurantist Arab anti-Jewishness that would explain what he sees as an Arab or Muslim rejection of psychoanalysis as the Jewish science, a European notion which in fact has elital resonance among Arab or Muslim thinkers, Ben's Lama responds thus, I feel some shame when I find myself having to draw attention to the fact that he who thinks like this must also deny the theory of Gravity or the theory of relativity, which were both the res ult of the work of Jewish scientists, Newton and Einstein 6b. It seems Ben's Lama is not only unfamiliar with the fact that Newton was Christian, perhaps Nuto N's first name Isasi led to Ben's Lama's confusion, but also with the latter's major exegetical contributions to Christian theology. H.I.S. exaggeration of Jewish achievements and Arab failures recalls his preference for Isaac over Ishmael noted earlier. In reading Ben's Lama, one gets the general sense that psychoanalytic studies of Islamists, seen in their entirety as upholding the one illiberal Islam, replicate ego psychology's method of looking for neurotic mechanisms in the childhood of a person to explain his or her inability to accept authority and respond to the call of normativity. Islamist and MU Slim resistance to Western secular and liberal, read Christian, normativity is seen as psychic resistance to maturity and adult authority, as a rebellion against normativity. Like American imperialism, a liberal civilizational psychoanalysis of the sort Ben's Lama promotes seeks to bring recalcitrant and sick elements back into society and nurse them back to good health. Jacques Erreda worried about what Freud once termed the foreign policy of psychoanalysis, and complained about the silence or equivocation of psychoanalysis, as institution, on the question of torture and violence in the rest of the world, which he feared was a form of complicity. Erreda maintained that Psychoanalysis may serve as a conduit for these new forms of violence invisible abuses, ones more difficult to detect, whether in Europe or beyond its borders, and perhaps in some sense newer, alternatively, it may constitute an IR replaceable means for deciphering them, and hence a prerequisite of their denunciation in specific terms, a necessary precondition, then, of a struggle and a transformation. Inasmuch, indeed, as psychoanalysis does not analyze, does not denounce, does not struggle, does not transform, and does not transform itself for these purposes, surely it is in danger of becoming nothing more than a perverse and sophisticated appropriation of violence, or at best merely a new weapon in the symbolic arsenal. Point 69. Psychoanalytic interventions, however, in the form of translation in the direct or indirect service of power might also be accomplices of abuse and violence. Ben's Lama does not seem to share Urida's concern about certain forms of psychoanalysis and the way they approach an object they name Islam. He fortifies himself behind the liberal language of individualism, freedom, and HU man rights. But as Urida maintains, these are not psychoanalytic concepts, Shelter is taken behind a language with no psychoanalytical nature. What is an individual? What is a legitimate freedom from a psychoanalytical point of view? 70. Ben Slama's answer might very well be more translation. TWO trends are juxtaposed I and Ben Slama's text, Condemnation of a Static Islamic Theology, which he sees as fossilized by centuries of immobility. 43 and a break with Islamic origins, 
ushered in by modernity via colonialism, which brought about the one Islam in reaction to this break. Based on his research, Ben Slama diagnoses the situation today as follows, what has happened in Islam in the last 20 odd years emerges from this conjuncture, it proceeds from a break which cuts through its H.I. story and opens inside it another possibility of history, 31-7. The findings he arrives at while researching the transformation of the figure of the father and of the paternal function in a Tunis suburb in the mid-1980s were sufficient for him to recognize that there was a deeper and more long-standing disease malaise afflicting Islamic civilization, and not merely one suburb. Point seventy one. It is unclear if this is the result of Ben Slama's or his Tunisian subjects symbolic conflation of the father and the paternal function with Islam as one and the same. This is significant because Ben Slama argues, correctly, that unlike in Christianity, in Islam God has no paternal role at all to play, indeed, such a role is explicitly repudiated in the Quran. Ben Slama blames Arab and Muslim intellectuals and the political elite for the DISEs from which Islam seems to suffer, an elite that did not know how to translate the modern to the public, nor how to deploy the interpretative and political possibilities to moderate the public's excesses, 317-18. His conclusion that, in the Arab world, modernity was nothing but a simulacrum of the modern, 31-8, betrays a belief that modernity in the West is a fact, rather than an interpretation. Even though Ben Slama insists that again, seen as a single phenomenon does not sum up Islam but which Islam? 31 9, 72 He maintains that analyzing the destructive effects of the break say sewer should not serve an essentialist process, which would in turn ignore the contemporary historical and material forces that have led Islam to be out of joint, 319. The work of culture, he continues, has difficulty thinking through this deracination of Muslims from their own history in their encounter with the simulacrum of modernity. It is this transgression, without words, that has determined here the task of the psychoanalyst, 31-9. Yet at the end of the book, and after he presents the reasons why Islamism should be read under erasure, we are reminded that one cannot exonerate Islam of this ideology, of Islamism, 318. This tension between the one Islam and the many informs Ben Slama's D.I. discussion throughout. There is, however, a resolution to this tension. Believing that the only way out of the one Islam is the way into liberal secularism, Ben Slama has more recently co-founded the Association of the Manifesto of Freedoms and is signatory to, author of, its founding declaration. Point 73 It is noteworthy that the vocabulary that I informs the declaration, including the alleged totalitarian nature of Islamism, is borrowed wholesale from American Cold War anti-communism. The declaration affirms that its members who are holders of the values of secularism and of sharing a common world are linked by our own individual histories, and in different ways, to Islam which the declaration defines as a place where many of the dangers of a globalized world crystallize, identitarian fascism and a totalitarian hold, civil and colonial wars, despotisms and dictatorships, inequality and injustice, self-hatred and hatred of others, amidst political, religious, and economic extreme 74. Islamists, all of them, are said to constitute forces of destruction that must be opposed through democracy and the institution of the political, which cannot be imposed militarily but must target the internal structures of Islam but, which one? and modify its relations to its geopolitical borders. Sevens while a singular Islam, which seems to be the only state in which Islam can exist at present, according to Ben Slama's reading, is being singled out in the declaration for this transformation, the signatories insist that they will fight and resist what they call totalitarian Islamism 76. This Cold War language is sometimes ironically compounded with Christian anti-Judaism, wherein the loving and forgiving God of Christianity has always been compared to the angry and vengeful God of Judaism. Ben Slama, unconsciously, adopts the same description. What Islamists offer to the subjected Muslims of today, he tells us, is nothing short of a vengeful and rewarding God und die Avengerate Remunerator. 77 The latter term remunerator, mainly a business term, 
implies further that Islam's God is profitable in a financial sense, suggesting more connections to anti-Semitic notions of Jews and money. Ironically, not all Isiamists oppose psychoanalysis, and some of them are in fact open to IU's unlike Ben Slama's full-scale rejection of Islam as Islamism, both seen as singular, as signifiers and signifieds, Ahmed al-Sayed Ali Ramadan, an Egyptian professor of psychology teaching in Saudi Arabia, is not only tolerant of Freudian psychoanalysis but offers an Islamist assessment of the positive and negative aspects of it from an Islamic perspective. After reviewing and commenting on the oeuvre of Freud and the psychoanalytic method, as well as the history of Western critiques of psychoanalysis and the H.I. story of its practice in Egypt, Ramadan concludes with a list of the positive contributions of psychoanalysis, including Freud's concept of the unconscious, the method of free association, releasing the patient's anxieties, giving confidence to the patient, bringing unconscious struggles to the surface of consciousness. Reducing the resistance of the patient, the discovery of the OEDIP US complex, and more.79 Ramadan takes psychoanalysis so seriously that he compares it to the Auranic notions of the psyche and shows where they converge and diverge. So, my point here is not only to cite the openness of Ramadan to Freudian psychoanalysis, but also to show that Ben Slama seems not only intolerant of the intolerance of Islamism, s, but also of its tolerance. Ben Zlama, then, like some of the Islamists he decries, but certainly not like others who do not exist in his epistemological framework, wants to fix the many Islams he identifies in one form. For him the only tolerable Islam is a liberal form of Islam that upholds all the liberal values of European maturity and is intolerant of the Islam of the Islamists whose values are said to oppose liberal values even WHE and they do not. This seems to be the Islam that is intelligible to him but not to others. He also wants to fix the meaning of Islamism as one that upholds the illiberal Islam, which he cannot tolerate. In Ben Slama's work, psychoanalysis becomes a handmaiden of European liberalism and demonstrates neither internal ambivalence nor ambivalence toward its projected other. On the contrary, the certainty with which Islam is christened the other of liberalism and the West aligns it with the figure of the primitive and the pre oedip al child in the cosmology of Freudian psychoanalysis. Ben Slama is not alone in effecting this transformation but is rather part of a large group of European and Arab thinkers who are insistent on these representations. While he has brilliantly analyzed the figures of Abraham and Ishmael in the Aaron and, along with Hager, in the Islamic theological tradition, neither Hager nor Sarah are in fact mentioned in the Aaron at all, when he deals with contemporary Islamists his psychoanalytic insights are transformed into I invocations of liberalism. Showing an ongoing concern with the horrors that are committed in the name of Islam, Ben Zlama is much less worried about the greater horrors that are committed in the name of anti-Islam. S1 in fact, as I have shown earlier, he is an ambivalent participant in the DI scores of anti-Islam as his consciously chosen title Declaration D in submission clearly illustrates. But the problem of the name could be more complicated than I have H I to allowed. I and the context of writing on the prophetic message, Katibi investigates the reasons for his decision to write on it, and cites his brother's name, Muhammad, his father's name, Ahmed. One of the names by which the Prophet is also known, and his own name, Abdelkbur, as he was born on the day of A-Ida-Kabir, the major Muslim feast of Abraham's sacrifice of his son, as reasons that might have led him to write on these themes. 82 I in contrast, Ben Zlama, instead of reading H.I.S. own name into H.I.S. desire to work on psychoanalysis and Islam, shifts the blame onto Islam. He tells us that it is because Islam began to concern itself with us that I decided to be concerned with it, 1-7. Reading H.I.S. name into this equation, which Ben Zlama H.I. myself does not do, though he is remarkably playful in his books when dealing with words, names, their Arabic etymologies and three-letter roots, and their relationship to the unconscious, produces an interesting psychoanalytic eye interpretation of his DI discoveries. Ben Zlama, or Ben Salama as his name is written in Arabic, as two separate words, meaning son of Salama, not unlike the formulations of English last names, 
such as Johnson, which means son of John, or more relevantly Christensen and Christofferson, shares his patronym with Islam, since both are based on the three-letter radical SIM. Salamah means peacefulness and safety, which Ben Salam recognizes as two of the meanings of Islam.83 In this sense, one might consider that Ben Salama speaks also in the name of Salamah, his patronym, the name of the symbolic father who imposes the law and who says no, Lakens i.e. nam slash non du pair, which is also the name of Islam, but he speaks in it slash his name to produce a declaration against it slash him, against his own name and his own father, Salama Islam. His entire project is in fact to fight this Islam, poor combat per two, 84 the one Islam, the Islamist Islam, indeed, to kill it and replace it with a kinder, gentler father who does not lay down the law, namely, a liberal Islam, which Ben Salama spends considerable time wishing into existence. This contingent reading of Ben Salama's name and his relationship to Islam would address the Oedipal Rebellion, in submission, that he stages against Islam as the symbolic father who regulates desire and this me ghtb be read in relation to Ben Salama's ongoing and impressive attempts to rescue Hagar, the, grand, mother of the Arabs, from Islam's marginalization of her. Ben Slama's political and geographical location in France, like others of HIS cohort, seems to account consciously for his liberal commitments, it certainly explains his sense of shame for belonging to a group of Muslims with a questionable relationship to psychoanalysis, and HIS ambivalent rejection of his own patronym and d, more generally, his paternal lineage, in favor of a European, French, liberal psychoanalysis. It also contextualizes the kinds of critiques with which he wants to engage and in which he wants to insert his own. He H.I. myself pauses to assert that the issuing of his declaration H. Air in France, on this European continent that is being reorganized, obligates us especially and in many ways. Primarily, by the opportunity of being in a democratic space that wonders about its future and appeals to a democracy to come 85. This unwavering commitment to the liberal values of individualism, freedom, tolerance, and separation of the theological from the political 86 begins increasingly to function like religious doctrine for those intellectuals who uphold them, and, insofar as they do, can be likened to obsessional neurosis, just as religion was by Freud. I end this light, and as Freud described followers of religions, devout followers of liberal doctrine are re-safeguarded in a high degree against the risk of certain neurotic illnesses, their acceptance of the universal neurosis spares them the task of constructing a personal 187. Arab and Muslim intellectual migrants to Europe, in the geographical and slash or political sense, who are converted to liberal doctrine have the added and difficult task of self-othering, of repudiating Islam as not only religion, in order to I integrate a version of it I into the liberal Christian and secular notion of only a religion, which would make it tolerable to devout liberals. This liberal identity and the mechanisms through which it produces its others are taken as uninterrogable reference in Ben Slama's work and that of others like him. This constitutes a serious limitation of Ben Slama's over generally and can be productively read in a psychoanalytic way. Indeed, this might be useful for psychoanalysis at present namely to study the processes through which the liberal self is constituted by Europeans and by Muslim and non-Muslim intellectual migrants from non-European post-colonies. A more curious psychoanalysis would perhaps do well to undertake a study of the group psychology of liberal and secular thinkers more generally on the question of Islam in order to uncover the unconscious processes and mechanisms at play in the formation of their liberal ego, which in turn privileges this liberal reading of something they insist on othering as Islam. I in the meantime, the important question Ben Lama and Katibi posed I and the call for papers for their inaugural 1987 colloquium on psychoanalysis and Islam, namely, from which foundations and in relation to which specific problems can psychoanalysis enter I into a relationship with this other civilization without doing so in the mode of a cultural psychology or a pure transposition that would reproduce the avatars of colonial thought with regards to the matter of the psychic being. Is still in search of an answer and thus remains an open challenge. Point 88. M-A-L-E. Fem-A-L-E. Baby.
mother and baby nude male nude female landscape. A shorter version of this paper was presented as a keynote address on November 29, 2008 at the conference, Psychoanalysis, Fascism and Fundamentalism, sponsored by the London Freud M. Museum, M. Idlesex University, and the French Société Internationale des Histoire de la Psychiatrie et de la Psychanalyse. You unfortunately, I could not deliver the keynote in person because the British Embassy delayed my British visa while checking my fingerprints. Professor Glenn Bowman graciously read the address on my behalf. I was able to join in by telephone at the end of the session to answer audience questions. I thank Julia Barasa for inviting me to participate. I also thank Joan Kopchek for I inviting me to contribute to this issue of Umbra, A, since her invitation led me to beg I this project. I am most grateful to Otalal Asad, Lesia Rosenthal, and Neville Hode for their critical and engaged reading of earlier versions of this paper. I, the politics and ethics of psychoanalysis enter o Islam. Le fate pair car to news renvol a news memes. I I news renvoy de manière exacer bcek news meme vivons come sur France. Moi, I e fou me fate avancer, I e fou me fate refletcher, I e fou est mon maitre. The mad Friday gh10 us because they am irer ourselves. They bear witness, in extreme form, to what we, too, experience as suffering. The mad person helps me grow makes me think, is my teacher. M. Fuad Ben Chekrown, psychoanalyst. I said that Al-Nafs is the yeast, it is the fertile land that Shaitan cultivates. He cultivates desires, cravings, and longings, and with them blasting and bombs. From the moment of their manifestation they make an impression in the nafs, leave a mark, and set it ablaze. T. He L. M. M. CEK news de Krivens com me CE lu central, set exteriorite into me, set extimite, qui est la chose. Jacques Lacan 2. Julie 2008. An evening meeting in Rabat, at the office of a psychoanalyst, interlocutor, and friend of many years. The waiting room phi LLED during the day, people waiting, in pain, delusional, old and new patients, alone or with their families speaking Arabic, French, comparing experiences, offering or asking for advice, reading magazines as they wait. Now, the last patient having left, the waiting area has become a seminar room. Windows closed, still too much noise from the street, the air conditioner on. Sitting in a circle, the members of an informal seminar on psychosis and psychoanalysis that has been meeting in this office for 10 years, and in which I have been an I intermittent participant, a seminar that has now reached a critical impasse. The quandary is whether the group should dissolve, the host is calling for a pause of reflection, an interruption, a symptomatic registering of crisis, or instead file the paperwork to charter a new psychoanalytic association, taking on an active institutional role, both at the level of a psychopolitical intervention in the ever-growing zones of social abandonment in the Moroccan cities, particularly with the youth, and at the level of curricular initiatives in the medical schools. Three main questions circulated in the room, born of a troubled pondering on the responsibility of psychoanalysts at this time in history, and in the specific context of Morocco, the M. Idle East, and the Islamic world. The first question can be glossed as follows, what is the responsibility of psychoanalysts and psychiatrists in a society deeply fractured and internally hollowed by ever-growing inequalities and material and symbolic dispossessions, and by state violence and abuses carried on from colonial times well into the post-colonial present, which are implicitly encouraged by the political and economic requirements of an unqual global order? The first national survey of mental health sharply indicated that forms of despair had taken hold of large sectors of the population, and manifested themselves in psychopathological symptoms, hieroglyphics of pain that were also political inscriptions. Point three most of all, this despair showed in the unusually high rate of major depression across age and gender groups, 26% of the total population. Independent of methodological questions concerning the reliability of the statistics produced by the survey, 
the publication of the report had the effect of a catastrophic awakening. The initiator of this group had been on the board of the survey and had advocated the publication of the report, out of a commitment to the truth that might be produced by a disclosure of new MBERs, but, in a different sort of symptomatic disclosure, the survey was withdrawn from the public eye following heated reactions in the press. The image of the nation portrayed in the looking GLS of the survey was too hard to bear. The second question had to do with the collective realization of psychoanalysis growing marginality, and this precisely at a time when attempts were being made to institutionalize its public voice in Morocco. P. A. Andolfo And the Middle East point for this is how the discomfort in the room can be rendered, spoken in the specificity of particular voices, how to bring psychoanalytic knowledge, ethics, and practice to the fore, in a situation in which there was just a handful of trained analysts, little public interest, R-E-A-L-L-Y, outside of the francophone elite, and no resources that might enable young psychiatrists to undertake a personal analysis or a clinical supervision. Was the transmission of psychoanalysis 5 in this context, as the intergenerational and intercultural passing on of a debt, or a gift, possible, or meaningful, at all? What were the historical forms, and the available sites, in today's Morocco, for what Lakin had called an active listening? The third question had to do with the positioning vis-a-vis -vis what was felt as an interpellation from the field of Islam, the Islamic movements, and the sea change that this induced. For the seminar members, all of whom were confronted on a daily basis with patients who spoke their pain within frames inspired by Islamic vocabularies, the problem was, how to relate to the interpellation of Islam in a way that rejected a perceived general turn towards the diagnostic use of psychoanalytic concepts as a political mode of intervention into the socio-political field, and refused to participate in the construction of Islam as an other, opening instead a space of critique and self-questioning. What, they were asking, was the responsibility of a psychoanalytic ethic and practice in a context in which questions were raised, all the way to the level of the symptom, in the terms of another tradition, a tradition which, in a complex sense, was also the psychoanalyst's own, in vocabularies that could find no equivalent in translation, and more and more in theological terms. The seminar had started as a space where a small group of therapists presented difficulties and impasses in their clinical work, and read together on the issue of psychosis. It was also a space where some reflected on the persisting and overwhelming presence of healing practices that addressed illness as a manifestation of the harmful agency of demonic entities. The presence of those practices, dubbed traditional therapies in psychological circles, often a co-presence, since the afflicted pursued several therapeutic approaches at once, had been for psychoanalysts an interpellation that called for a reply, one that often, particularly in the context of Moroccan psychiatry, came in the form of an ambivalent rejection. 6. But there were exceptions. One of the seminar members, a Lacanian psychoanalyst, used to TELL of how, UP on his return to Morocco from training in France, feeling the inadequacy of an analytic practice of the UN conscious in the face of the organization of the symbolic at home, he embarked on a journey to visit sanctuaries known for healing the Mahdi. These places are marked as burial sites of saintly figures, where the sick and their families seek healing through the release that would come in dreams. I and his reckoning, sanctuaries were irks de parole in the Lacanian sense, sites where being could come to the fore in the revelation of speech, in the vision, and in the ear of death, J A I Ekut Dans Lay Sanctuaires, J A I Ekut Apu Press C E K J Ekut Dans Mon Cabinet. Moy, J E F A is I E Mort. Lux, I L S Parlant O Mort. I listened in the sanctuaries, what I heard is approximately what I hear in my office. As an analyst, I play dead, whereas instead they talk to the dead. The question of religion was an uncomfortable and central one for the group as I in general among secular intellectuals. In recent years it had supplanted the problem of traditional therapies, the magical cures of the jinns, as a source of anxiety related to an intimate strangeness of the home. But while traditional therapies, however widespread, 
were marginalized and EXCLUDED in the institutional life of the post-colonial state, assigned to the position of an intractable irrational residue that could never claim the place of an I interlocutor on an equal footing, the growth of Islamic movements had changed the terms of the relations HIP, occupying the public space, and directly challenging the authority of secular psychological sciences, and, indirectly, psychoanalysis. Our religion, and Islam in particular, had emerged as a problem for psychoanalysis, in Morocco as in other parts of the Middle East. This was at once an internal response to the spiritual political revolution brought about by the revival, and a chapter in the larger international context of the War on Terror. It should be noted that I international psychoanalytic associations, particularly French-based, have been I involved in recent years I in what could be described as a novel civilizing M. I. Shin I and the M. Middle East, one that is aimed at promoting a secular and cosmopolitan subject, immunized from the fascination of religion and the risks of theocracy. Point seven French cultural centers sponsored lectures, conferences, and seminars in Terra de Islam, and local analysts and psychotherapists were called in to participate, including the members of this group. Psychoanalysis was being summoned as a pedagogical rampart to counter the growth of Islamic movements, and Islamic selves, in the age of political religion, or to promote at least what were seen as more tolerant, critical, and open forms of Islamic practice. Eight, it is impossible to raise the question of psychoanalysis and Islam today, of the commensurate by LITY or possible translation of concepts and practices, in philosophical or theological terms. Without registering the political charge of the field within which the question has emerged, and without posing, at the same time, the problem of psychoanalysis reflection on its own politics. A recent work by Mustafa Safwan had been for this GR a source of inspiration. Point nine for in it Safwan suggested that the responsibility of Arab psychoanalysts today is the political one of addressing the subjugation of being working against the terror of states and of empire, colonial, and post-colonial, which through their regimes of domination and perverse organization of enjoyment disable the work of desire for the subject, and cripple the possibility of action, thinking, and critique. Falsifying the very nature of speech as intersubjective engagement. The profound fear of the people, a fear of the Leviathan which is our state, a fear that goes back thousands of years, and that is the most malignant vice of the soul. A fear that has corrupted the very function of speech, parole in our societies. 10. Continuing a line of thought begun in some of his earlier writings, Safwan argues that voluntary servitude and the disabling of parole are unrelated to Islam understood as the revealed message of the Quran. They have to do with the instrumentalization of that message by worldly state apparatuses. Oppression is the illegitimate rule of worldly sovereigns, who put their own person in the place of God, a place no human being can ever occupy as such, God is by definition the being for whom Lakin's assertion applies that every identification is an identification with a signifier. There is much in Safwin's line of argument that I should like to contest, from his discussion of vernacular language as an epiphany of the people, to his unproblematic espousal of the concept of democracy, and what is hard not to read as the voice of a conflicted Eurocentrism, from his idea of a necessary disjunction of the theological and the political in Islam, to his telescoping of history, which conflates realities as incommensurable as the 9th century Umayyad Empire and the colonial and post-colonial Middle Eastern states. Here, however, I want to follow the trace of HIS thinking on the responsibility of psychoanalysis, the sense I in which this addresses the questions raised at that evening meeting I in Rabat. In the last chapter of Pourquoi I e Monde Arabe en Est Pa Ibra, one too which takes the risk of writing against the grain of much psychoanalytic ink on contemporary Islam, Safwan discusses the questions raised by the M. Muslim brothers in Egypt, and by Hamas and H. I. Zibuha in Palestine and Lebanon. He suggests that, However complicated and fraught any assessment of the terrain might be, it would be an error to comprehend these realities as anti-democratic formations, becoming deaf to the fact that these movements are attempts at a re-symbolization, at moving against the subjugation of the subject.
they reinstitute forms of sociality with I in which a novel circulation of desire may become possible, with the emergence of a parole that may interrupt the tyranny of the state, and not just reinscribe the subjugation of being. If there is a responsibility of psychoanalysis at this time in history, it is that of a political critique, and of the exigency of a particular stance, which Lacan named ethical, the pursuit of lucidity, detromper, unluring, and of a movement across the limit that he pondered through the figure of tragedy. It is the responsibility to remain mindful of the pole of desire, and not work, as Lacan put it, in the service of goods, in their moral or perverse configuration, be they those of democracy or the universal value of human rights, or their perverse reversal in the enjoyment of the tyrant and those who exist in his shadow, or even the good of psychoanalysis itself, refusing to become a discourse of comfortable complacency, and the guarantor of the bourgeois dream 13. And I n as much as, for Lacan, remaining mindful of the pole of desire is also, necessarily, a matter of encountering the limit, risking to venture beyond the pleasure principle, where an angle of visibility can be attained from the living contemplation of one's own dis appearance, one could say, as Lacan knew where, that a psychoanalytic ethic necessarily encounters the limit of any psychoanalytic institution that has not subjected itself to a radical critique, in the realization of its historical contingency. Safwin's intervention runs counter to discussions, often originating in France, which relate the question of contemporary Islam to a debate on religion and violence vis a vis what is understood as a crisis of the symbolic I in late modernity, a crisis that psychoanalysts locate in the new psychic economies centered on narcissism. This is understood as a generalized regime of, deadly, enjoyment in the context of globalization, where the paradigm of addiction captures the new limit forms of the subject. In this Kal-El, at issue is the vanishing of a subject I and an excess of proximity with the impossible thing, a rig I and an termination of the drives, in a world in which the immediacy of Jaurasins annihilates the circulation of desire, one for and unleashes the destructive work of the death drive, no longer kept at bay by the symbolic deters of the pleasure principle. This is, however, not the only possible reading of the new psychic economies in the wake of the Lacanian thought of the thing and the death drive. In the second part of this paper I implicitly engage approaches of primary narcissism and melancholy, which have attempted to think the question differently, and in a close engagement with the Lacanian idea of the emergence of form at the limit of destruction. 15. When applied to the specific realities and history of M. Idol Eastern societies, the picture is further qualified in terms of the traumas of a failed modernity and a savage modernization that have rendered the subject vulnerable to the fascination of authoritarian projects of religion and ethno-nationalism, and to an even worse threat of destruction, the suicidal propensity of the system as SUCH. 1-6. This perspective is conceptually elaborated, as well as politically exemplified, in psychoanalysis and the challenge of Islam, where the Islamic revival is discussed by Fethi ben Zlama as a torment of the origin, in a psychopolitical plea based on an impoverished and instrumental reading of the complex realities of contemporary Islamic religious practices and thought. The torment of the origin explicitly invokes the torment of the grey Vadab al-Kabr in Quranic eschatology, and might be understood in the double sense of the torment of reckoning to which the soul is subjected immediately after death, and the agony of the MU Slim subject who is today tormented by the Islamic thing, ding. The Islamic thing in Ben Slama's reading is the murderous superego of a tradition, when this tradition aspires to be fused to its origin in a literal return, it is also an autodaph of the symbolic, engendering collective psychosis and self-destruction. The problem for Ben Slama is not Islam or religious subjectivity per se, except perhaps in what he sees as their failure. Point 17 The problem is the Islamic revival, which he traces in the writings of the Egyptians Hassan al-Banna and Sayyid Qutb, as the call for a literal return to the Islam of the Quran and the Prophet. Such a return, he claims, is delusional, psychotic and hallucinatory, in the psychopathological sense of the term. Psychosis is registered by a political incest, which abrogates the origin in the delusional form of a return to revelation, 
the delusional return GIVES itself as a journey backwards in time, all the way to a reinvagination where metaphor retreats, prior to the form of the origin. The return here is not traction, but retraction into the formless, where the function of the imaginary collapses, making the origin appear as raw flesh, as a collective organ, a mouth open on a bottomless political anguish one. 8. I end this psychotic folding of time, intersubjectivity dissolves, and in its stead appears the hallucination of a primitive body, a non-symbolic corporeality, as organic resurgence of the collectivity glued to the origin. It is a body tormented by violence, Benz Lama says, the violence of a du s absconditus, who has abandoned his creatures and lost all transcendence, becoming the agent of destruction, and sucking the life world I into the crater of the origin. Every L, and the question of hatred, are no longer associated with the problematic of aggression. Hatred, Benz Lama says, should in the context of Islamism be located at a more fundamental level, as a hatred of being, a hatred of life itself, including one's own. This is why, for Benz Lama, suicide bombing is the ultimate realization of this logic of annihilation, it is the system blowing itself up. Point 19. I end the end, the question of psychoanalysis reflection on its politics translates in Benz Lama's text into a specific political position, one that participates actively in the ideological apparatus of the war on terror as well as in the de-iscursive construction of its object. Point 20 This is authorized by a diagnostic act that dwells unreflexive of the capture of the analyst in the scene of the phantasm. It is a political position colored by the glimmering horror of an emergent thing, tell on dormer artificial slash imminent miss and somile, isles lam se revelite and sersot et devisaget ie mond un un eta somnambulique. Like a person who had been artificially put to sleep, Islam was waking abruptly, and disfiguring the world in its sleepwalking state 21. The Islamic revival is registered in the shadowy semblance of a monstrous awakening. It seems that, for Benz Lama, political Islam has become the psychoanalytic thing. Umbra, A, 76. Yet this reading should not be extended to the field of psychoanalysis in general, when it comes to the question of Islam. For the members of the Rabat seminar, the interpellation of religious faith is a call for reflection on something that implicates them directly, in their clinical practice, as an authentic engagement with the problematic of theological reasoning in the field of subjectivity. In their discussions, this reflection is central for registering the experience of madness, in the transference and in analytic theory, see the quotation in an epigraph of this text, as well as for cultivating an ethical attitude in which one risks one's concepts, and oneself, in the opening to other traditions, welcoming, in the process, the transmutations of psychoanalytic knowledge. Point 22. In a sense that is, I suggest, consistent with the inspiration of Lacanian thinking and practice, I see psychoanalysis as one, but not the only possible, discourse, one developed at the margins of European modernity, from the debris of minor or obliterated traditions, and in the form of a counter move. Point 23 Freud and Lacan's concerns with the questions of being, destruction, madness, and death are not solely psychoanalysis lot. If we take the psychoanalytic tradition as a critical opening to these questions, we see how it would encounter other vocabularies of being, alt eurity, and loss. At the same time, a psychoanalysis open to these questions is also one open, as Freud was, to the possibility of its own putting into question by the other, by the event of encounter, when the encounter touches as well at the limit of the intolerable, and makes appear the disquieting shapes of the thing. Only in this way can psychoanalysis remain capable of producing counter visions and counter moves. It is from this perspective that I offer an analytic description of the therapeutic practice of a Moroccan imam, not a traditional healer, indeed also not a Sufi, but an active member in the local Islamic revival in the Fu LL sense of this tradition's reassertion of a style of theological rezo ning and ethical practice. It is an anthropological description, based on conversations we have had over several years. It may offer, as a reply to Ben's Lama, the elements of a different reading of, 
and a different relation to, a set of practices that seek not a return to the origin, much less a delusional one, but instead aim at addressing the predicament of feeling and thinking in a context of social, political and spiritual crisis, and which do so through a confrontation with human vulnerability and unreason, through a concrete ethical engagement in the world, and through the task of critique. In my commentary in margin of the IMAMS discourse, halfway between the style of lessons and that of healing, I attempt to show how in the specificity of his practice he instantiates a mode of bearing witness that is at once personal and collective, acting at the level of the singular body, and of the unbearable pain of the community. This double movement testifies, I suggest, to a repoliticization of thinking, where the lament of the personal voice recapitulates and addresses the pain of a collectivity. Point 24, at a time when the atomistic individuation and instrumentality of suffering invalidate the possibility of any simple reference to the concept of trauma. 25 The Imam's reflections on destruction and melancholy can offer an angle from which to engage anew with the question of trauma in psychoanalysis. This is what I implicitly attempt to do in this text, within the limits of ethnography's resistance of the REAL, which necessarily disturbs the work of theory, rereading Freud and Lacan on the question of ethics and the death drive, as I also listen, on its own terms, to the discourse of the IMM. The IMM reflects on the nature of a drive to destruction, and on the question of evil, through the Islamic figuration of Shaitan Satan, as a heterogeneity and a struggle ever present within the community, a struggle which, fundamentally, is also internal to the nafs the soul slash self j itself. His sermons and therapeutic interventions are aimed at a transfiguration, at the possible repossession of what, reaching to classical Islamic theories of the passions, the su el, and the heart, the imam names an affirmative imagination su wherein ijabai wa. I end his d i scussion of anger, melancholy, and pain, he postulates a political and ethical work of the imagination, one that is capable of generating action in the mode of a traumatic becoming. It is a way of repositioning the relationship to the thing, of becoming capable of engaging anew in an agonistic of desire, in the surroundings of the experience of trauma and unbearable pain, of tasting it, and of dwelling around its borders, an encircling of the thing, as Lakin would say. Point 26. I, I. The battlefield of the NAFS. That is why when we ask what is beyond the barrier erected by the structure of the world of the good, where is the point on which this world of the good turns, as we wait for it to drag us to our destruction, our question has a meaning that you would do well to remember has a terrifying relevance today. Jacques Lacan 27. What follows points to the need of a sustained theoretical reflection on the instantiation of subjectivity in contemporary Islam, for it is in the field of theological argumentation and spiritual practice that questions of being, destruction, truth, madness, and ethics are today raised in the MU Slim world, and if one cares to L.I. Sten, it is there that some core preoccupations of a psychoanalytic approach, in the Freudian and Lacanian legacy, are today being addressed. But opening up to this possibility requires admitting a modern subject whose freedom and finitude, responsibility and praxis are articulated in relation to God, on a transcendental axis where the solely self must be trained and equipped, in this world, to become the addressee of divine discourse, and who simultaneously, on a different but interrelated plane, is ethically active in relation to others in a community. Point 28 This is a possibility a priori excluded in much psychoanalytic writing about Isla M, where the subject of psychoanalysis is posed as necessarily secular, a presupposition that runs contrary to Lakin's own thought. In the words of Adnan Havala, for instance, how to discern between divine knowledge and the knowledge of the UN conscious, as long as the NAFS, the psyche, has not been subjectivized, secularized, 29. My conversations with the Imam, I will call him just this, started in 2003, at FIRST in the company of a young psychiatrist, who had questions that found no answers at the hospital. The three of us sat in the reception room of the unfinished concrete building where the Imam lived with his family in one of Rabat's largest and poorest informal housing neighborhoods. Sometimes he invited us into his study, 
a small room on the roof, full of books, and with a narrow W mattress on the floor. Some of his key theological references were there, the resuscitation of religious sciences, of A.I. Gaza's slash I, and the commentary of I.B.N. Kuthir. It is there that he isolated himself to read, and that he received his patients. Several of the conversations were recorded, H.E. did not mind and actually encouraged recording, because, as he once told me, when he answered our questions he developed his knowledge in novel argumentations, and liked to keep a record of this, as well as of the Friday sermons he gave at the mosque in the neighborhood. Over the months and years, when I returned to see him alone, the psychiatrist had been transferred to a city in the south, our relationship changed somewhat. While I remained a scholarly interlocutor, he also introduced me to his family and to his life as a spiritual guide in the community, at the mosque, and in his counseling of young people. I met his mother and F.A. there, who lived with him in the family home, his wife and their five daughters, and noticed the way his mother took an interest in his sermons, and how she smiled at her son's attachment to a Dell laptop. The computer gave him access to a vast archive of texts in the religious sciences, Hadith, Fiqh and Quranic commentary, that, when the topic was relevant, he would pass on to me on a USB drive. It is in on that same laptop that we downloaded the conversations we had from my digital recorder. Sometimes a visiting patient would interrupt our talking, or a fri and, or relative would come and sit with us, and participate in the conversation. He was close to his daughters, and to his wife. Even closer perhaps after a long illness that almost claimed his life, an infection of the heart that caused him to have a risky open heart operation, for which he had to request financial help from his frens and his community, and toward which he put all the savings he had accumulated to begin a small business. His illness, and his operation, became a recurrent theme in our conversations, one from which he drew examples as a trial of pain, and put him at risk of despair. He did not see his illness as an initiation through loss, as many healers in Morocco and elsewhere see the origin of their charismatic gift. In line with his teachings and with the way he attempted to lead his life, his illness was for him a reminder of his vulnerability and a trial of patience, where the strength of his faith and his conviction, Al-Iman and al yaktun were both tested, and which provided a point of attachment during the hardest moments, in order to return to life. For him, his illness was an allegory of other collective trials that poignantly characterized the daily life of people in his community, extreme poverty, lack of work, lack of services, lack of the most basic forms of state-provided health care, and the faucity of dispossession, feeling disheartened, giving in to despair and melancholy, seeking refuge in the annihilation of drugs, and in suicide. The Imam practices a renewed form of Quranic healing and spiritual political practice known as Ilat Sharti divinely sanctioned healing. Point 30 As this has been variously formulated in the contemporary Muslim world, at issue is the turn to true Islamic healing and virtues, paired with the condemnation or exclusion of what is circumscribed as un-Islamic practice. I in Morocco, a configuration of indigenous healing practices aimed at controlling, defeating, or appeasing harmful spirits Ilaj al -Jin. The cures of the jinn is today subject to a theological critique as part of a larger move towards Islamic ethics and justice, and away from what, drawing on a classical register of Islamic theology and moral reasoning, is understood as heresy kavar or idolatry a slash shirk. The cures of the jinn, the old traditional therapies, are cures of depossession, staging a scene where the jinn comes to presence and speaks through the body of the sick. The role of the healer is to bring the jinn to presence, struggle to obtain its name, and make a pact with it, meeting its desire through an exchange often sealed by a sacrifice. 31 In this complex scene the world of jinns parallels that of humans, and healing is made possible by the healer seeking the intercession of Sultan al-Jinn the king of the jinns, and meeting the desire of the jinn. From the perspective of Islam these cures are a form of idolatry shirk, and as such they are heretical, for they contest the oneness of God. The Quranic cures I slash AJ Shar IJ often address similar afflictions. 
They do not deny the presence of the genoines are mentioned in the Quran, but avoid all forms of in intercourse or negotiation with them, and consider those who I insist on practicing the cures of the jinn as false healers, magicians who work in the service of Shada N. The difference is both fundamental and subtle, for the Quranic cures, while practicing a similar form of depossession, are ethi Kali and theologically based on the submission to the sovereignty of God, and on the notion of jihad a slash nafs the struggle of the soul slash self. While the vernacular cures see harm as an agency external to the subject, the Quranic cures locate shaitan, the figuration of evil, within the desiring nafs, as a heterogeneity then can never be resolved. 32. I end the conversations we had about the theological ethical framework of his therapeutic intervention, the imam made an explicit connection between his active investment in I slash AJ Sharti divinely sanctioned healing, understood as a renewed instantiation of the practice of faith, and a larger effort towards a political critique of the condition of the self slash soul in a state of material and spiritual dispossession, of subjugation by an oppressive state apparatus, and of utter hopelessness, at the limit of despairing life and trust in God. As I listen to our recordings once again, the vocabulary of disablement and affliction speaks eloquently for itself, a slash nakba, affliction, catastrophe, a slash yuz, despair, a slash dtq, oppression, choking, a slash zolm, oppression slash i injustice, in a theological sense, a slash kayaba, melancholy, grief, depression, a slash bit aja, inactivity, a slash dash uboc ya, gl um, a slash tasha um, hopelessness, pessimism, ajaza, spiritual or physical crippling, and more. Such are the terms that punctuate our conversations. The IMM spoke insistently in terms of a QUS gen, one that gave impetus to his work and shaped every aspect of his life. The question concerned the possibility of ethical existence in the vicinity of trauma and madness, and in the shadow of spiritual dispossession. He asked it at the intimate level of his encounters with the sick and the afflicted, Musiab, Martidi, from a place at the limit of Lifa and the law, a realm in between the two deaths, Lakin. HIS was a political and yet intimate calling which, the Imam once told me, was the reason why he chose to embrace the Lifa of a religious scholar and healer, giving up his career as a student of law at the UN University of Rabat. I bring his question up for debate, in the specific terms of the Imam's formulation as this reaches backward and forward within a complex tradition, by tracing through HIS words a reflection on subjugation and destruction that is taking place, on its own terms, in the field of contemporary Islam. In his seminar on ethics, Lakin addressed a problematic that may be read as related, if from a different place, and as engaging a specifically European tradition of thinking destruction and creation in between two world wars. Umbra, A. 80. One that culminated in Fru D.S. Scandalous formulation of the death D.R.I.V. At the empty center of Lakin's seminar is the chasm of the thing, at once source and termination of desire, sight of horrific visions and primordial projections, and of the ultimate ALDERITY of death. Lakin called the thing, Dosting, an original division of the experience of reality, the first outside and the first object, originally lost and impossible to retrieve, an intimate stranger, hostile on occasions, an extimacy, an externality, an unbearability at the core of intimacy, a crater that is also an original inscription around which the entire trajectory of the subject is oriented. In relation to the world of its desires 33. The thing, which occupies in Lakin's reading the place which in Aristotelian philosophy was assigned to the good and the arbitrary rule of the gods, is also, as Lakin tells us, the term by which Meister Eckhart referred to the soul, and which, as Kausapathomenon, wellspring of human passions, points to the fact of destruction, and to the radical question of evil as such. Such a thing, says Lakin, cannot be mastered or dialecticized, it can only be encircled. In our conversations, the Imam pondered the agency of destruction through a reflection on evil that is internal to the way the problem is posed in, contemporary, 
Islamic tradition, as this tradition is brought to apprehend the painful conundrums of contemporary life. He addressed a condition in which being is threatened with extinction, paralyzed, and in turn manifests itself in petrified forms of pain engraved in the human soul. 34 He called this condition, at once singular and collective, Tati Tqlnaf, a choking of the soul. Later in our conversations, he discussed its phenomenology as a destructive work of the imagination, in the encounter with an unbearable real. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Upon our first meetings the imam made it clear that he embraced the practice of healing and the persona of the healer differently than it was often understood in Morocco. While healing had traditionally been associated with a charismatic authority, the authority he claimed for H.I. himself was that of a scholar and a religious guide, a murshid, the person who aspires to be a healer al mualil if he wants to cure, must be a person who is entrusted with a religious task. A healer must be a learned scholar of the Quran and of the Hadith, or he or she must be a spiritual guide murshid, capable of giving religious advice. Spiritual counseling is a political act, which in Arabic is also called al-Naziha, a style of critique at once spiritual and political, which does not separate the two, but instead practices their reciprocal entanglement as an ethics and aesthetics of the self. It can proclaim an entire political order heretical, refusing to participate in it, as part of a struggle for the redefinition of the relationship of the order of God and the order of the world. 35 The spiritual counselor is also an exum plar, the incarnation of an example, an image, or idea, bearing witness to a life on the path of God, an always imperfect witness of an always imperfect life, fraught with struggles and pain, failures, and attachments, but one that attests 36 in its very struggles, to the moral and existential capacity to embrace life, as the imam often said, in an affirmative way, and to transform hardship and the experience of alienation and madness into a spiritual trial for the ethical life of the su -el. This is why the work the imam performed on hi myself is important, the way he came to inhabit his vulnerability, and the fact of accepting, as he repeatedly stated, the reality of contingency and finitude. The fact that one's life is i in the last instance beyond one's mastery and control, a realization that does not relieve human beings from taking responsibility for transforming their lives, he cited the Quran. 1311. Verily God does not change the state of a people till they change themselves. 37 Every loss, calamity, illness, small or big, testifies to the omnipotence of God, and as such summons the afflicted to bear witness to their faith, al mumin Musab, the imam repeated, citing a hadith, the faithful is vulnerable to suffering. The work he performed on himself was one of learning to overcome his fear, of the jinn, of human abuse, of terror, of violence, by surrendering to the fear of God, in the sense of takwe, the fear slash respect that also protects, and by seeing H.I. myself, in the phrase of A.I. Ghazali, from the point of view of the grave point three s submission to the sovereignty and mercy of God, as an awareness of one's finitude, and a deep knowledge, in this intimate sense, of what he calls the sharta are the grounds for the imam's recourse to what he calls his experience al tajrabah and his ability to recognize the singularity of situations, the way in which, in some cases, life can be once again embraced by the afflicted. In his practice as a healer, the imam attended to those who addressed themselves to him or were brought by their families because of severe psychopathological symptoms. In some cases it was their first attempt at a cure, but most often they arrived at HIS door after a long therapeutic quest across healers and sanctuaries for the mad, visits to psychiatrists, and in some cases after a hospitalization. He li stand, asked questions, always including in his address the family members who had come with the sick, for he saw sickness as a knot in a larger history of obliterated connections, proposed a cure that consisted of herbal remedies that he prepared himself and Quranic recitations, the practice of rukya, literally spiritual elevation, in which specific passages of the Qur'an bearing an effective relation with the person's condition are read to the sick. 
In some cases Quranic recitation led to a direct struggle with the jinn, al dollar br, strug gle, annihilation, and included the temporary unconsciousness of the person, whose corpse-like body became the stage for the manifestation of a demonic presence. It was a struggle fought with the sole force of the recited Quran, where all forms of relation or negotiation with the jinn, other than through the effective and terrifying impact of the divine word itself, were foreclosed. The Quranic utterance opened an eschatological space, a time of the end, and the voice of the healer materialized a prophetic intervention. I and the IMAMS words. If the healer has firm trust in God, sustains himself by God, he is devoid of all fear, he is not afraid of the jinn or of anything other than God. He places his confidence in the Quran, because the Quran is a miracle MUGZA, a miracle that transcends all human reason, and that descended on the Prophet. That miracle is overpowering for both the human being and the jinn, it has a force to subdue, to vanquish. For the Quran has a potent effect on the jinn Athrala al jinn, terrifies him Iyuki Yafu, throws him in a state of fright, this is inevitable. At the outset, in the Imam's analytic description, the work of the healer is that of a political spiritual diagnosis. The space of the cure addresses an affliction which is singular, but which is also a symptom that speaks of a collective conditio, and a history, healing, and the sickness itself, are a kind of bearing witness. The illness, the madness, decries the hypocrisy of a social LIFA devoid of care and equity, the violence of the state, and the rule of injustice and corruption. It is a deforming mirror that reveals a state of terror that has broken the subject. The event of madness is treated by the Imam as a traumatic awakening of the collectivity as a whole. Illness is not an individual condition, even though it affects a person in a singular way. It summons the collectivity in the mode of what Lakin calls a duji, an encounter with the real. The event of madness in the discourse of the imam, if read within a Lacanian vocabulary, is a wake-up kal-l, but not just a c-a-l-l from the world outside, the accident, the illness, even though it is that as w-e-l-l, it awakens the collectivity, and the subject, to something more real than our waking, 39 to the other r-e-a-l-i tie that is beyond the dream.40 what becomes manifest, says the imam, are the agency of Evil and the reality of destruction, Shada N, the Quranic figuration of the problem of evil, which work simultaneously at the level of the oppressive structures of the pharaonic state 41 and in the intimate struggles and intractable heterogeneities of the human soul self al nafs. The opening gesture is hence one of critique, which here takes the form of a proclamation of heresy tax slash r. The event of madness is also the disclosure of a system of terror, i injustice and abuse. The IMM describes and contrasts two opposed forms of sovereignty, i and what is at once a medi cal and a politico-spiritual diagnosis. On the one hand, there is the just sovereignty of God, to which human beings must submit, and i in which they find agency and deliverance. On the other, there is the unjust tyranny of the jinn, and shaitan behind the jinn, and the forms of government that resemble its rule, which subjugates and enslaves those who fall under its power by reducing them to a state of moral impairment. Through his discussion of sorcery sir as a prime cause of madness, the IMM describes a society at the edge of heresy, calling for the urgent need of spiritual renewal, echoing in the sense central questions and themes raised within the contemporary Islamic revival, from Sayyid Qutb to the Moroccan Sheikh Abdusalam Y.A. Sign. The entrapment he describes as the sovereignty of the jinn slash shaitan is I indeed of a very different nature from that found in the vernacular, spirit to possession cures. The operation of magic sir is both that of false healing and of the jinn itself. The world of the jinn mirrors the world of false healing, and it engages in commerce with it, as in the image of jinns who bring I and formation to the false healer. Eventually, the two together subjugate the subject and cause him to doubt the truth of revelation. I N H I S words, W H E N the healer has had the better O F the jinn, the person has in F A C T F A L and pray to the sultan of the jinn, who is now in command Yamur and can now count on that human, ins, as his subject, 
because that person is lost to the way of God Dalaj. Th at person is now a property of the jinn, and whenever the jinn wants him or her, the jinn can find him or her. 2. I end the discourse of the Imam, the jinn is a materialization of the risk of kafir, untruth, ingratitude, contestation of the oneness of God, Shaitan is ever ungrateful kaf dr to his Lord, Quran 1728-29.42 The scene is set of a world of I injustice and abuse, predicated on falsity, which is at once a description of theological failing, the risk of eternal damnation, and of political corruption in the mundane, historical world. The image of the jinns who bring information to the false healer is Ram I innocent of the Mukabharat, the infamous secret police, and its routine recourse to torture and assassination, in the secret basements of police stations. Echoes can be heard here of the actual RELI tie of torture and secret detention experienced by many youth associated with the Islamic movement in recent years. Untruth Qadhib, Injustice Zulm, and Oppression are the characteristics of the world of the jinn, they are also DI's positions located in the human Su'el. The prime cause of sorcery Sir, and hence madness, argues the IMAM, is allicral coercion, the absence of justice, the impossibility of an EQUI table recourse by the oppressed, as well as the condition of intimate terror and intimidation in which the person is thrown by that state of coercion, H human beings exist in justice Adami Wajo Di Alad. And justice is violated by way of coercion Ikral. The second cause of sorcery, and hence madness, is the envy al hasid generated by the desire to possess, the delusion of commodities. In Lacanian terms the event of madness shows. It reveals in an anamorphosis the apparatus of power and the violence of the state by disclosing the sovereignty of the jinn. Violence is manifest in the picture through the visibility of the illness. The event of madness awakens us to a deception, exposing something that was to remain covered, and enabling a different, eccentric angle of vision, one that is proper to dreams. The showing happens at the level of the stain, which necessarily eludes the field of ocular vision and bears witness to the annihilation of the subject. The event of madness in the D.I. scores of the IMM occupies in this sense the position of the skull in Lakin's famous reading of Holbein's painting The Ambassadors, where the insignia of wealth, power, and science are shown as reflected, from a certain angle, in the skull at the feet of the ambassadors, an anamorphic ghost pointing to the ruin of the whole. What shows in the discourse of the imam is the anamorphic ghost of the jinn. From its eccentric angle, madness makes visible the regime of the jinn, the metamorphosis of the jinn as shaitan and of the naf so ul as the site of a struggle. The event of madness, in other words, shows the obverse of the subjugation of the subject i and the everyday unfolding of social life, a waking life that the imam describes as a slumber of the su'el. At that level, Safwan says, parole can no longer engage, because the conditions for engagement are absent. Or symbolic engagement is impossible because the respect of such a contract would imply that the subject submits to becoming nothing more than a worthless cog in service to a machine which does not hide its intention to exploit or exclude her. 43 Sometimes, as Pira Alanier and others have written, reflecting on their clinical work with psychotic patients, madness is the only path open for the subject, and P. E. Opal said to be crazy, in the ordinary sense of the term, show us what was necessary to do in order to survive 44. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. In the discourse of the Imam the heterogeneity of evil is clearly at work in a double movement between the collective register of what might be called a prophetic diagnosis, anamorphic visibility, concerning the state of subjugation of the society as a whole for us, and the battlefield of the nafs, where the longings and passions are inspired by, engage with, and are transformed into the destructive force of Shaitan. I cite the Imam. I said that a slash nafs is the yeast, the effy real land that Shaitan cultivates and tills, but he does not cultivate grapes, figs, and pomegranates. He cultivates desires, cravings, and longings shaken and with them blasting and bombs. From the moment of their manifestation they make an impression in the nafs, leave a mark, and set it ablaze. The origin, the
cause, is Shaitan, he instigates, and terrorizes the nafs, but the nafs is the great enjoiner of evil al-nafs al, al by iso, it commands evil and calamity. It is not an external demon that strikes the person, but an internal enemy, a capacity for avil that is at once internal and external to the soul slash self. Behind the work of the jinn there is Shaitan, who is not independent of God, but is hima self internal to God's creation and volition. Evil, in this configuration, and in the understanding of the Imam, is not a negative force, but an ongoing ontological challenge. Unlike animals and plants, humans have the responsibility of choice, they are the site of a struggle, and can choose to follow God or Shaitan, the never-ending risk of every L, nested in the human Su L, in the cravings and desires of the nafs, marks the space of their specific freedom. It is in this sense that the Quran repeatedly says that Shaitan only has power over those who choose to follow -l -l his way, I had no authority over you except to call yo you, and you responded to my call. So blame me not, but blame yourselves, 1422.46. According to Ali Shartat's rereading of the dialectic of man and Shaitan, the human is a two-dimensional creature, composed of God, spirit, and clay, and needs both elements. Shaitan is not opposed to God as Evil is opposed to good, it is included in God's volition, and opposed to the spiritual slash divine part of human beings. The element of destruction is ever present, and is necessary for the human life form, and for the possibility of freedom, within man, Satan wages war against God, and man is their battlefield. This constant striving and struggle takes place in man's hidden being, until finally he chooses one of the poles as the determinant for his destiny. 47. What is important to grasp in this duality, and in the notion of struggle itself, is that the Imam is speaking of a positive challenge, the challenge of a radical heterogeneity that sets the rhythm and pulsation of a form of life, a form of life engaged with the risk of destruction. Evil in this sense is a revealing element, which at once dis figures the status quo, providing an always precarious, anamorphic, angle of visibility, and sets a flow of subjectivity in movement, in the punctuation of an ethical life. This resonates, for me, yet beyond the possibility of translation, with Lakin's treatment of evil and the death drive in his ethics seminar, where ethics is the precarious movement of a being at risk, suspension in a zone between two deaths and two modalities of destruction, one leading towards the termination of desire, and the other to submission to the law as a service of goods, to Antigone's assumed martyrdom or Crean's reinforcement of the law of the state. 48 For the IMM, it is only when the struggle subsides, when the nafs, and the heart, become inert, and are turned into stone, that ethical being ceases to exist, and all activity stops. This is what happens in acute melancholy a slash kayaba, sorrow, grief, depression, gloom, melancholy, the condition the imam calls tadi a slash nafs, soul choking. In a different context, pondering what to do, how to think, with and after the butchery of worldwar1, Freud resorted to the notion of a primary destructive drive and its radical heterogeneity. His thought on ambivalence, its ineluctability, and on the intimate enemy which is the death drive, can be read as an engagement with these questions. In his 1915 essay on war and death, Freud had identified a heteroaggressive propensity of the drives in a murderous displacement of self-destruction, and in the F.A. Illier to think, s. objectivize, one's own death as a radical exteriority. But in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, 1920, and Civilization and Its Discontents, 1930, he elaborated this as a radical ambivalence of life and death that manifests itself in the form of a struggle, a battle of giants. The battle takes place beyond the economic rule of the pleasure principle, in an intermediate zone between the possibility of regeneration and the elasticity of the drive, in its F.A. tall push toward inertia and death. In this sense, ambivalence and the struggle itself, can be seen as the circuitous paths of life against itself, in the radical heterogeneity of a risk and a certainty, which Freud saw as a return to the inorganic state, 
beyond the subject and beyond life, a radical exteriority that is always lurking and comes to be exposed in trauma. For Freud, and in a different sense for the Imam, the space of the struggle in the vision of death defines at once the possibility and the risk of subjectivity. The death drive is an existential, political, and ontological lesion at the heart of life, 49 which takes on the connotation of the theological concept of evil. It is in this sense that Tak Floor, at once internal and external to the soul-slash-self, can reclaim a space of life in the surroundings of destruction. There, on that border, a folding of the inside and the outside, of the soul with its intimate enemy, of the personal and the collective, is found jihad a slash nafs, a central figure of the agonistics of the su al, spiritual effort, or exercise, but also jihad, in the sense of war. To understand the struggle of jihad a slash nat solely in the sense of the refinement, or the perfectibility, of the soul reduces the stakes of what for the imam is an actual struggle, fraught with danger, and with the never resolved risk of an inassimilable loss. Point 50 ethical being is precisely that I intimate struggle, with a heterogeneity that can never be resolved, and with a violence that is forever lurking. Point 51, Antigone, Lakin tells us, was cold as stone, inhuman, because living, she was already dead. It is in her lament that she comes to life, in the vision of death, and having crossed the limit of eight, in her lament, her desire, visible and audible, moves us, the chorus, we who are caught in the slumber of the soul, to tears. It is not that she finds a voice in the proximity of death, or that she sings in her autodaf, but that in crossing the limit and looking back to her life from the place of the tomb, from the living contemplation of her disappearance, she is able to enter the site of a struggle. In its midst a certain listening becomes possible. Inhabiting such a struggle at the limit I end his practice with patience, and in a daily confrontation with what he described as the risk of the two related limits of Kufr and Madness Hunk, the Imam dwelled in a space from where, like a funambulist, he was able to negotiate the differential boundaries of the diagnosis, theological and medical, and listen for the vibrations of being, when the jinn speaks through the tongue of the afflicted. For as long as he could register the activity of a jinn, there was a space of life that could be reclaimed I in the midst and at the limit of destruction. While on one hand he offered an understanding of a slash hunk, madness, as a new ultimate inert state, fundamentally irreversible, and impossible to treat, because it is the last vestige of the destructive work of the jinn who has in the end damaged the brain, on the other he was able to address innumerable intermediate conditions in which the jinn could be here d, in which, as he put it, Key call fa slash jin n, the jin could be felt moving, working, in a process of destruction that the imam could still seize as a form of if.52. iii. soul choking pain, and the imagination. We should perhaps conceive of pain as a field, which, in the realm of existence, opens precisely onto that limit where it is impossible for a being to move, to escape. Jacques Lacan 53. Death cannot be understood by those who do not understand life, and life can only be understood through knowing the true nature of the spirit itself. A.I. Ghazali 54 We ll aware of the double-edged resonance of the concept of Amrad Nafsiwa, spiritual afflictions, a term that translates, in other contexts, as psychological and mental illnesses, the IMM argues that the maladies of the Su'el are not located in the body but are often manifested as or lie at the origin of physical illnesses. Amrad Nafsiwa are of demonic origin, but beyond the vernacular representation of harm in terms of jinns, as in the vernacular cures, they have to do in a fundamental way with the dialectics of the nafs and the work of the imaginative facul tie in relation to the trial of faith in the experience of despair, in the encounter with pain in the manifestation of the desiring self, and in the intimate struggle with harm. This has to do with what, drawing from a classical tradition of medieval theological thinking, in a Platonic and Neoplatonist legacy, the IMM calls the three powers, faculties, or drives that animate and endanger human life. The three forces slash drives kawa are that of anger kawa a slash gadabaiwa, 
sexual desire kawaii slash shawanawa, and the i intellect kawaii slash dash akliwa. Of the three, the intellect attempts to regulate the other two but hardly succeeds because the key question, the imam stresses, is not reason but faith. The imam points to the passion of anger a slash gadab, and the sentiment of grief a slash kayaba as prime causes of illness, a malady of the soul that also affects the body, and that can lead to madness, melancholy, or suicide. But while other classical Arab medical thinkers regard anger solely as a bodily affect that causes an imbalance i and the circulation of blood all the way to the brain, the Imam followed A.I. Ghazali in understanding anger as a passion of the soul that is both in the body and not, and whose imbalance is due to heedlessness of God and blind attachment to worldly possessions and pride, a delusion of mastery, in fact, and of the autonomy of the will. 1.55 Excessive anger and despair in the face of adversities are ultimately related. He says, To a failure to commit one's trust I and God, A slash yak from the certainty of faith and to inhabit one's vulnerability as a remembrance of death and God. For A.I. Ghazali however as well as for the I.M.M., anger cannot and should not be extirpated in human beings, it is ethically necessary to engender the virtues of courage and fortitude. I cite the Imam. La Takdab. Restrain from anger. It is anger and grefa slash kayaba that are the first cause of illness for the soul slash self a slash nafs. The Prophet only became angry when the Hutto d Allahi God's boundaries were violated. Hence the foundation, the root of everything, is faith and the certainty of faith al-Iman wa al -yaktn. If the foundation is strong we call it in our shara a slash yaktn, conviction, trust. When something happens, I and the world, I and your life, a, a calamity, a loss, you do not become angry. Faith and trust can contain the drive of anger. Our trust in God tells us, this is the power of God radar Allah. And my own volition is from God, eradity min Allah. He goes on to reflect on why people today are incapable of experiencing the ground of faith. What is happening today, in Morocco and other parts of the Muslim world, he says, is similar to what happens to people in the West, they want to be whatever they wish, but life, our LIFA span, is decided by God. They end up clashing with the real A-slash-wakeru, in other words, they dwell in illusion. They are HIT by REALIT and in the end become sick. They are overwhelmed by grief or despair. The I'm am psychosomatic and D spiritual physiological approach stresses at once the desiring SU LS risk of straying, A-slash, DA-slash A-slash, from the path of God, and from ethical existence, I and the context of contemporary life, the reality of exclusion a slash her man, dispossession, and grief, the temptation of evil, shaitan, as a struggle internal to the nafs, and the effective impact of the imagination, of images, on the heart. I and contrast to the privileged status of a slash dash the intellect in Western thought, in the I am reading the heart a slash kalb is the critical site. The heart is at once the center of feeling and the faculty of the imagination Tazawur, Takeyu, the metaphysical place of faith and connectedness with the divine and the organ that oversees the circulation of blood in the body. Effects first experienced, induced, and imaged by the nafs, the desiring su el, are transmitted to the heart. The heart receives those images and visions su wherein, and their impression or engraving sets the spiritual existential tone in the person, which in turn produces bodily effects by impacting the circulation of blood and the organs. In the IMAMS analytic description of this complex set of connections and relations, faith and imagination play a fundamental role. When the drive of anger comes to dominate the body musapra fta slash jism, in the heart and I and the flow the circulation of blood speeds up, becomes faster and faster in the veins and the arteries odd l of the person, and that human being comes out of normal, customary life y akraja a slash inzan and ma slash afi, comes out of the traced path, exits the real world a slash waki and this causes crimes to happen, or rebellion, or sin, the crimes may be theft, robberies, killings, illicit sex, or
gathering of wealth through falsity and usurpation. Faith a slash iman is the basis, when associated with conviction a slash yakti n. Yet there can only be faith, trust in God, if there is activity in the sense of humanly shared eth i cal action a slash ama, which is sorely lacking in a community mind by social exclusion, in just ice, and by a form of death in life. Or, in a related sense, faith and the authenticity of ethical action are inaccessible in a community where the intimate proximity of Islamic ideals has been lost, where there is no equity and where the power of commodities and the lure of consumption make vanish the call for the values of reciprocal help and support, the sense of justice, and the remembrance of death in daily life as the foundation of ethical action. In such a world, says the IMAM, the heart that receives the affects and visions of the nafs, I and its worldly desires, as well as in its incurable sadness and grief, is all too often no longer the heart of AMU Slim.56 It is thus that the nafs becomes prey to the whispering and the terror of Shaitan, and sends its harmful imaginings to the heart, visions of dissolution and destruction, of irretrievable loss. The heart is affected, and participates in destruction, until the self begins choking, all sense of life vanishes, and the person GIVES into destruction and self-annihilation, what is the cause of suicide a slash intihar? It is from the choking of the nafs tati tq al nafs. And what is the cause of choking? It is shaitan. Shaitan whispers in the ears of the person, you will die, death is your only perspective, and the human being chokes. Ta dytq al nafs, the oppression, or choking of the soul, is the result of an unbearable pain that paralyzes and sculpts in the soul and in the heart, as if I and stone, images of destruction that shut the door to all possibility of imagining a horizon, erecting the HIGH walls of a claustrophobic space. The Imam describes how Shaitan, the principle of harm at once internal and external to the human su l, oppresses and terrorizes the nafs of Shaitan Yastafzai slash nafs, and the nafs sends images of destruction, burning images, evil images, to the heart su wherein sa slash bayyatan, kabi hatan. Hence the nafs sends to the heart negative and hopeless images of the future, and the heart forms an image of life a world view, a gestalt as life burned, haim madrama, life destroyed, and starts imagining that nothing good can happen in the future, only oppression and disaster are foretold, that all there is pain and torture, a slash dash adhab, poverty and exclusion, dis possession and destitution, her man. Only that will be. And so that person unsan lives a burning moment, God protect us from harm from rising shaitan. And these images that the nafs receives in the form of a devi lish whisper, a slash waswas, colonize and murder the heart, which in truth is not the heart of a Muslim. For if faith is present in the heart, the person thinks slash remembers those images only if they are affirmative images su wherein ijabiya, if the heart is deserted by faith, the person accepts those images, welcomes them, and they set it ablaze. And choking, the oppression of the soul tati tq, instills terror in that person tati qb dash slash insan. And he can no longer aspire to something that might bring renewal, something affirmative, other than his own dying, and thinks incessantly of the way in which to bring about the limit of death. This is suicide. The maddening insinuations of Shaitan to the nafs derealizes the self, which loses its sense of g-arounding and connectedness to other beings, entering into delusion or sinking into a cadaveric loneliness that carries the presentment and the odor of death. The whisper seizes control of the nafs and murders the heart, in the double sense of causing it to lose trust in God in an experience of despair, exiting Islam and entering Kafr, and becoming mad, the whisper, Al-Waswas, is a Quranic figure re of madness. The hallucination and multiplication of loss in the feeling of melancholy is for the Imam the theological risk of despair, at the threshold of both Kafr and madness, when life takes the form the Imam says the image of a fatal concatenation of spectral losses sinking into each other and entering a space of radical doubt, epistemological quicksand, where the impossibility of trusting the other intersects with the apalimpsest of betrayals and spiritual murders.
eventually this leads to the annihilation of the soul, in this world and the other. Soul choking describes a world of aliving death, where the proximity with death is such that there is no longer a relation, death can no longer be imag i ned s7. In this configuration the imagination itself becomes an agent of destruction, in a soul snatching that doubles the torture a slash dash ad hab, his word of the real where dispossession, destitution, injust ICE and exclusion seem to be all the subject has ever known. It is a real where engagement can only be falsified, safwin, and where televised images of destruction and the routine instrumentalization of suffering, pain as spectacle, on an international and local scale, snatch even the possibility of recognizing an authentic expression of pa in, rendering the demonic circulation of images the sole theater where the nafs made will l, a theater of falsity. In the logic of the imam's description, I in this sense, the imagination turns into an agent of destruction because it is itself captured, snatched, by an in invasion of media images, images of a desire haunted by the commodity, by the sense of failure and impossibility, because its capacity for ethical work is disabled, and because, in the larger sense of the nafs worldly desire, the access to the enjoyment of the global and idealized commodities can only be experienced as a maddening lack. In the hallucinatory apparition of a fetish and its alienating effects on the suel, the soul slash self registers those realities, bears witness to them in its pain, i and the impression they make on the heart, but that registering does not lead to forms of engagement, to thinking, to ethi cal and political action a slash dash ama. Pain is internalized as a wound, incorporated as despair, and the imagination reinforces the subjugation of the subject, which manifests itself as a death drive. S8 the imagination, in fact, and this is a point to ponder also in relation to psychoanalysis, is the specific channel by which subjugation conquers the heart. The naf sends to the heart negative and hopeless images of the future, and the heart forms an image of life as life burned, life destroyed. There is no protective shield, no counter movement, no possibility of renewal. The IMM is speaking of an IN fraction, an invasion, the choking inst LLS terror IN the person, freezes the person in place, defining a zone where, in Lakin's phrase, being can no longer move cannot escape, cannot avoid the paralyzing impact, a zone in the shadow of death where the self exists only in a trajectory of annihilation. This is a theory of trauma, if the concept can be reclaimed in a different way, in dialogue with Freud's line of inquiry, and with Abraham and T. O'Rock's notion of the building and transmission of a crypt. S9. Soul choking is the imam's depiction of such acute melancholy, a melancholy described by some of the youth with whom I discussed this questioned in terms of another figure of despair, a slash can it, the melancholy boredom, loss of all hope, which empties the self, and sends it off into nothingness. We say of a person that, he or she fell into despair. A human being, when he falls into despair, all doors are shut for him, he can no longer see or distinguish anything, and abandons hi myself to drugs. Lag what J had, he has reached a limit. His head is full, he sees only one thing, hanging himself, his row, his soul spirit, does nt stay in place, is no longer there, he sent it off with the drugs. And as for what is on his mind, only one thing, death. This is a description of the vanishing of desire and the surrender of struggle. For struggle we had a slash nafs, in this vision of life and the soul, attests to the presence and activity of an ethical subject. I and the tradition from which the IMM is speaking, which for him is greatly indebted to AI Ghazali, the imagination Tazawur is the faculty that mediates the knowledge of the so uli and the world of sensible qualities. It is perhaps useful to recall that imagination here is not the faculty of representation, defining the contours of the world as a picture, where the subject is geometrically, constructed to occupy the position of a viewer, of a point of perspective. Point 61 in the understanding of the I am the soul slash self, in its different dimensions as al-nafs, al ro and al kalb desiring su-el, spiritual soul, and heart, is shaped by the impressions, 
alather if plural, then ather, traces, the imprints, of images. The soul is etched at the level of its capture, its propensity to delusion, its relation to cravings and desires instigated by Shaitan, but the faculty of imagination, in the effective way it impresses the soul and the heart, is also the medium of knowledge and transformation, opening to the possibility of ethical existence. Through an extension of the bodily senses, what might be called, folloing ai ghazali, an analogical sensorium, the imagination can enable a vicarious experience of aspects and dimensions of the world, visible and invisible, which lie beyond the immediate reach of the soul slash nafs. The role of the IMAGI native faculty in apprehending the experience of death, approximating its tasting, and in the pursuit of witnessing the divine in DREMs and other modalities of unveiling is pivotal for the possibility of an ethical life. Yet the same imaginative faculty can also accelerate the demise of the soul slash self, on a slope to delusion and annihilation, and away from the truth of revelation. Deprived of its grounding in faith, guarantee of reality and truth, the imagination spins out of bounds, and hallucinates, rather than apprehends or tastes, the reality of loss and death. It is perhaps for this reason that in oral poetry the imagination is referred to as shaitani, my shaitan, in its capacity to hallucinate presence in burning loss. Somewhat differently from the classical or Gnostic theosophy of Ajam al J the imaginal world, the imam approaches the imagination with the pragmatic understanding of a healer and a spiritual guide, listening to the singularity of pain, its un barabi lity, without normalizing its violence or its risk, and attempting to provide an anchor, and some spiritual tools, for those locked in the grips of despair. I n speared by Ai Ghazali, Qud, and the Moroccan Sheikh Yassin, his reformist vision repoliticizes the question of despair, and is less interested in the Gnostic or ecstatic aspects of the pursuit of witnessing through IMAGI nation and UN veiling. I instead, the IMM is concretely concerned with addressing the pain of HIS community, and initiating a process through which the NAFs might find grounding in faith once again and connect to a collectivity, and in the same turn, become capable of responding to a divine address. It is in this sense that the Imam stresses the concept of an affirmative imagination, Affirmative images su wherein ijabiya, fortifying resemblances shabahamaka wi, which he opposes in HIS work with the youth to the destructive impact of the images of oppression and choking shabahal dtq, images of despair shabahal ya, and to the picture of a world in which there can be no activity but only pain al alam, the messenger of God opposes despair, opposes grief. Islam opposes gloom a slash dash yabasawa, struggles against sadness. To day many Muslims, turning their faces in a petrified sadness, are pervaded by gloom. Beyond this struggle of images, where the spiritual guide fights on behalf of the melancholic soul with the spear of affirmative images, is the concern with enabling once again lama slash, the possibility of ethical action, activity, work, movement, and the fact of having a job, an active role in society, which, the IMM says, is the condition of possibility of faith, Iman Bido and Iama slash slash Amkin, he says, it is impossible to have faith without work. Activity, work, is the opposite of a slash bit j a inactivity, idleness, and in a concrete sense joblessness, it conveys lack of all value, and the fact of being inert. In his pragmatic reference to the affirmative force of the imagination and its relation with a slash Ama slash, Activity in the world, the IMM echoes the voice of traditional Islamic values in the pursuit of daily life, as well as Qutb's reflection on al ijiabiya the ethical responsibility of the person to hold an affirmative orientation to life as part of the obligation to bear practical witness to Islam 62. Yet fulfilling this obligation under conditions of hardship, such as those that characterize life in his neighborhood, as in many similar locations in Morocco and the MU Slim world, cannot be taken for granted. This is a point that for the Imam raises the question of the limits of ethical action in a society where the conditions for material subsistence and a life of the soul are not met, 
a society characterized by what Sheikh Abdel Asam Yassin called spiritual murder Tad al Manawi J.63 I in the midst of our discussion of imagination and the passions, the IMM cites a much debated hadith, kata a slash fakran yak dn kufran, poverty leads to kufr, it is closet o being kufr. Because, he adds, poverty causes exhaustion and hardship, disaster and ruin ya and i and yakin n, w a shaka n, w a kusran. In the words of Farid Isak, why o you cannot truly submit to God if you are under the yoke of hunger. Such submission is a form of coercion. The subjugation and annihilation of being is an ethical, but also a political question. Point 54. For the IMM, the two questions are related. Traumatic becoming is a form of awakening, not a consolation philosophy. For the Imam, a fuck utha slash nafs who deals with the medical spiritual afflictions at the limits of life with madness and maddening grief prior to the possibility of reinstating ethical action and bearing practical witness to faith, it is necessary to guide the nafs to reposition its relation to the experience of pain, and to the i.n. fraction that caused the soul to choke. It is a question of transforming pain, from a harbinger of destruction to an exercise for thinking slash remembering, an exercise where the bodily imagination plays a pivotal role. To address this point I will turn to A.I. Ghazali. Discussing the ethical importance of the frequent remembrance of death in everyday life, a s a practice of vision that unlures the nafs from heedlessness and loosen its greedy attachment to this world, a i Ghazali stresses that knowledge of death from the point of view of the living can only be indirect. While the task of the remembrance of death is to make an impression up on a person's contentment in the world, and to touch and break the heart, this can only be achieved in the form of a meditation on pain, by the intermediary of the faculty of the imagination, because pain is always, necessarily, singular, because it breaks me, and I cannot objectify it, I have anguish, but I am pain. Point 65 For AI Ghazali pain is a breakage, an intrusion, an infraction, and as such has a concrete, literal. A fee and I tie with death. For this reason, if we are to remember death, we must become capable of inhabiting, and tasting our pain. I and the language of psychoanalysis, as such untranslatable to this context, one can note that pain is beyond the pleasure principle and opens onto the field of the real. A.I. Gaza L.I. invites his readers to meditate on the death of their loved ones, because the emotional bond with them impresses the pain of their passing in my Su L, feeling the pain of their loss, I can come to approximate the feeling of my death. And yet my soul and my death are not mine, for pain a slash alum, in its very i n track tab i l i t y, is an imaginal bond of attachment, it touches me, cannot be displaced, but enables what a i Ghazali calls an analogical relation a l chi yes. It bears witness to something else, opens a connection, establishes a tie. In this paradoxical sense, and by the intermediary of the imagination, pain is relational, it bears witness, it is shahid, in the modality of a gift, a debt, a traumatic transmission. I feel slash know, my, self by feeling slash knowing the pain of the other through my pain. Point 66, this relationship, I and a Lacanian sense, takes place I and the real, beyond the reach of the symbolic. A.I. Ghazali invites his readers to meditate on how the departed have made widows of their wives and orphans of their children, how they used to go hither and thither, while now their joints have rotted away, how they used to speak, while now worms have devoured their tongues, how they used to laugh, while now dust has consumed their teeth. This meditation takes place through a skilled use of vivid visual images, the visualization of, my, body rotting, of the living present turned, or metamorphosized, into the temporality of the grave. The task is indeed pedagogical, but calling this meditation pedagogy reduces its intractability, its dramatic force. For A.I. Ghazali it is clear that imagining death means to become capable of undergoing its trauma, the UN bearable pain of separation, for it is separation itself which causes Pi N. 67. A bit later in this text A.I. Ghazali expl.i.kates the relationship of pain and death, 
in the context of tasting al doc Pain affects the raya, the spiritual so you l, just as death does. Hence pain and death share a common quality in the way the raya is affected by the violent infraction, and are related analogically. He invites people to meditate on their lives and on the way pain, through its concrete impact on the raya h, connects t-o-t-h-e su l-s experience of death. No, too that the extreme pain of death pangs is known in its fu l ness only to those who have tasted it. The man who has not tasted it may only come to know it Yarifoha by analogy al via the imagi nation with the pains which he actually experienced, or by analogy with the pains that can be envisaged through reasoning istidlat, via the imagination, by analogy with the violent states should it of other people during their death agonies. Concerning the analogy that bears witness for him Yashadulahu, and allows him to see, this is as follows, no limb from which the Raya soul slash spirit is absent can feel pain. When, however, the row is present, then the faculty which perceives pain is the Raya. Whenever the extremities suffer some injury or burn the effect makes its way to the spirit, which will feel pain, alum, in proportion to the amount that reaches it. The sensation disperses through the blood, the flesh, and the remaining extremities, so that only a certain part of it reaches the spirit itself. Point 68. A.I. Ghazali G.I.V.S. The example of a person pricked by a thorn, the pain felt, and the way in which the bodily pain is received by the riot. This pi n, he says, if we meditate on it, can move us to begin to taste another pain, not directly accessible to us, the pain of death pangs. If I inhabit my pi n, the pain of the thorn, of the limb, or of the loss of a freen d, if I do not flee from it, I can, the soul can, reach through the imagination a partial experience of the tasting of death. This can be only approximate, for it takes place from within the space of the living. When death comes, by contrast, the riot is assailed directly and entirely, the infraction is total. The pain felt do you ring the throes of death, however, assails the spirit directly, and engulfs every one of its fractions. The dying man feels h i myself pulled and jerked from every artery, nerve, part, and joint, from the root of every hair and the bottom layer of his skin from head to foot. For ai ghazali as we ll as, in a more pragmatic sense, for the imam, who is concerned with addressing the theological medical affliction of so ul choking ta di iq al nafs, the point is that inhabiting pain in this second sense, bearing witness to pain without succumbing to it, can engender an opening of the soul. Pain, in this sense, crosses a limit, beyond the paralysis of being, the impossibility of movement, lakin, it transforms. Such an opening onto death as a way of seeing and tasting is a different modality of melancholy from the closing up of the horizon, the generalization of the death drive in the affliction of soul choking. Inhabiting pain through the bodily imagination, connecting to others in that space, is both unbearable and expansive. And yet the two modalities are contiguous, like the topological reversal in the inside-out structure of a glove, Lakin. The unbearable remains can never be overcome. And the bereavement of acute melancholy always risks choking the su l, and making being inert. We should not forget the risk, the imam never does, the two related risks, in his reading and in his clinical practice, of al kufr and al humk heresy and madness. The question should resonate for us, as it did for Lakin, what does it mean for psychoanalysis not to forget that risk? What is it to treat a culture, to diagnose a religion. What protocols of explanation, identification, and prescription are implicated in formulating and answering questions of the kind, what went wrong with Islam? This is not an innocent question, one among many, and the reasons for its ideological ubiquity are not difficult to glean. But what are the stakes when the one who asks such a question is not an Orientalist H. historian, or an imperial pundit, but a psychoanalyst, or at least someone DRIing analytical insight and speculative authority from Freud or Lakin. I wish to explore here some of the parameters of intelligibility of questions relating to the putative maladies, impasses, or discontents of Islam, and of religion in general, as posed in psychoanalytic terms, 
terms which I hope to show are instructively and in GL ed with the history of political and philosophical formatting of Islam in Europe. Hopefully, such an exercise MIGHT not JUST serve as a critique of the conditions of possibility for diagnostic DI scours as on psychoanalysis and religion in general and Islam in particular, but as an investigation into something like the political UN conscious of psychoanalysis itself as a secular science and a secular clinic. More precisely, I want to inquire how and why. I in ways that are not necessarily faithful to the prescriptions and precautions of Freud or Lacan, a certain normative political notion of secularization oh, here not a synonym for atheism, has found its way into psychoanalytically inspired treatments of Islam, the Arab world, or the MIDDLAST. I in other words, HW a certain dislocated, maladaptive, voided subject has been more or less. Sir Petroplos Lie Redeared, Normative A.D. Congrant with The Institutions and Ideals of the Liberal Democratic Or, in A.I.L.N. Badlu S.P.R.L.N.C.E., Capitalo Parlamentarlan, State My starting point lies in the trope of P.Y.C.H.L.C. Subbalsislan, of subjection to the one, which psychologically marks out the subject of Islam as a fanatic or a fatalist, or perhaps a debauched despot. It is by contrast to something like a fanatical submission to the one, an excessive monotheism, that a form of Judeo-Christian subjectivity might be regarded as normative within psychoanalysis. Or, more precisely, the Islamic sub-JECT may be perceived as having MISSED or failed its secularization, the attenuation of the one which is affected by specifically cultic mediations, the trinity, the neighbor, and so on, which then carry over a de-isopated religious content into a disenchanted social sphere. I want to interrogate the protocols for handling concepts of civilization, culture, and religion, and their often ideological hybrids, within psychoanalysis, partly to consider the anti-political timelessness that is ascribed to these terms, especially when they are marked out as somehow pre-secular. Finally, I want to consider under what term psychoanalytic and philosophical discourses are capable of articulating the relation between politics, religion, and subjectivity without merely replicating or underwriting the very fantasies that perniciously structure our political and ideological space. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. I end his book The Jew, The Arab, A History of the Enemy, Gil Anadjar provocatively declares that just as Montesquieu invented Oriental despotism, so Hegel invented the Muslims. Kant's remarks on the iconoclastic religions of sublimity in the critique of judgment had asymmetrically brought together the Jews and Islam, the former, as Anadjar notes, as an ethnos more than a religion, the latter almost as a religion without subjects. By contrast, Hegel's conceptual placement of emaometans in the philosophy of history and philosophy of religion can be seen to inaugurate the perception of Islam as a politicized religion characterized by a particular type of subjectivity, which is precisely the subjectivity of fanaticism fanatismus. Before reviewing the parameters of this concept, it is worth parrying a possible objection, did not the Lumieres, and specifically Voltaire, author of the play Lefa Natizami, O you Muhammad i.e. Prophet, inaugurate the figure of the fanatic? On one level, if we take fanaticism as the antithesis of toleration, as the subject's habitation by a violent and monomaniacal religious unreason, this is true. But the concept of fanaticism forged by Voltaire is not religiously specified. That is why Muhammad, who is not himself a fanatic in the play, but the sexualized imposter and lucid manipulator of the human PROCLIVD to fanaticism and superstition, can serve as the substitutable avatar for Voltaire's Catholic enemies closer to home, a function that Islam as a whole can be seen to serve in a number of tracks from the period. The claim that Hegel philosophically invented Muslims as the bearers of a distinct type of fanatical subjectivity can thus be articulated with the idea that Hegel's conception of F.A. Natismus is in many respects discontinuous from Voltaire's F.A. Natisma, and, we could add D. Kant's Schwarmere. Possibly the most important shift in the passage of the idea of fanaticism from its Enlightenment figure, as violently intolerant religious consciousness, 
to its Hegelian F omelation. A passage. Hitch does retain some key elements such as a certain notion of the secular circumscription of the religious, for instance, is the fact that in Hegel fanaticism is articulated in terms of a mode, albeit a destructive one, of universality, and not merely as the arbitrary and unreasonable imposition of one particular set of beliefs and practices. Islamic religion and Muslim subjectivity accordingly appear in Hegel's writings as the carriers of a universal claim which bears certain important analogies with the forms of political subjectivity that characterize the historical and political phenomenology of European spirit. T. Ealingly, in The Philosophy of History, Hegel refers to Islam as the revolution of the East. To the content of this revolution is depicted in fiercely, or indeed excessively, universalist terms, a theme which is not absent, in a vulgar and combative guise, from contemporary paladins of the clash of civilizations 3. Islam destroyed all particularity and dependence, and perfectly cleared up and purified the soul and disposition, making the abstract one the absolute object of attention and devotion, and to the same extent, pure subjective consciousness, the knowledge of this one alone, the only aim of reality, making the unconditioned the condition of existence for I and such passages, which could of course also be regarded as apotheoses of the Orientalist treatment of Islam as a doctrinal and cultural monolith, Hegel accords to Islam a spiritual and conceptual dignity that is rare among European philosophers. Instead of burying it in the lascivious ornamentation of Oriental despotism, Hegel, in what may be termed a meta-religious register, depicts it as a high point of abstract thought. The Oriental principle, as he calls it, commands the destruction of worldly particularity and its spiritual elevation to the one, the one infinite sublime power beyond all the multiplicity of the world, whence Hegel's characterization of Islam, I and the wake of Kant's reflections on its iconoclasm, as the religion of sublimity s. In terms of the philosophical typology of religions, a practice which, as we shall see, is significant for evaluating the psychoanalytic approach to Islam, it is of interest that the Hegel of the philosophy of history presents the move from Judaism to Islam as a dialectical one, albeit a dialectical move which, by generating an abstract worship of the one, ends up generating a sterile impasse. Whence this dead end of Geist? The dislocation of God from the possession of a people is depicted by Hegel as engendering a universalizing personality, freed from ethno-national particularity. Point six, but Islam, if one may put it this way, takes universalism to far. I and Islam, subjectivity has worship for the sole occupation of its activity, combined with the design to subjugate secular existence to the one. Subjectivity is here living and unlimited, an energy which enters into secular life with a purely negative purpose, and busies itself and interferes with the world, only in such a way as shall promote pure adoration of the One Seven. The One, juxtaposed to all particularity, absorbs, and absolves, avoided subjectivity in what could be regarded as a process of the Fu-LL symbolization of the real and the concomitant disastrous realization of the symbolic. The subject of Islam, in this Hegelian image, is a subject without qualities or predicates. The metaphorical political consequences that Hegel draws from this are not without interest, rather than permitting a mediation of freedom within a differentiated social bond, Islam's politics of the one, which could also be revisited in terms of Badiou's concept of a passion for the real, entails that its only way to hold the faithful together is through the abstract tie of the one, which enjoins a constant expansion driven by a generic energy aid. This depictio n of Islam as a religion of the one permits Hegel to re-articulate, rather than to repeat, the standard tropes of European Orientalism. It is because of its purely abstract universality that Islam is basically expansionist and that its belligerent subjects can express such heroism, it is because of the insubstantial, inorganic character of its social compact that it easily slips into degeneration, and that its subjects can sink into such dissolute sensuality and corporeality when the passion for the one inevitably flags. Hegel thus encapsulates Islam within the idea of fanaticism, abstraction swayed the minds of the M.A. Hometans. Their object was, 
to establish an abstract worship, and they struggled for its accomplishment with the greatest enthusiasm. This enthusiasm was F.A. Natacism, that is, an enthusiasm for something abstract, for an abstract thought which sustains a negative position towards the established order of things. It is the essence of fanaticism to bear only a desolating destructive relation to the concrete nine. The reason for this depiction of Islam as an inherently fanatical religion is of course that the singular or concrete form of subjectivity, qua freedom, is absent, a freedom paradigmatically identified with the consummate religion of Christianity and its sublation in the modern state form. This might, of course, be regarded as an insensitive schematization based on the idea of a uniform Islam understood through the prism of an absolute and systematic difference from a Christian West O. As noted, Hegel does indeed bear an interesting, if complex, affinity with these Orientalist tropes. But the philosophical capture of Islam is not based sans phrase on the idea of the opposition between the rational, developed, h humane, superior Christian West and the aberrant, undeveloped, inferior Islamic Orient. Rather, the Oriental fanaticism of the revolution of the East is in many respects isomorphic to the fanaticism of the revolution in and of the West. If we turn to the 1824 lectures on the philosophy of religion, the view of Islam as the dead end of an excessive universality, and as a fanatical religion of destruction for and by the one, is complicated by crossing over, in terms of the crucial notion of abstraction, from the dialectic of religions to the political field. In a very significant passage, we are presented with the abstractive F.A. Natacism of Islam as isomorphic to the abstract egalitarianism of the French terror. In the Islamic doctrine there is merely the fear of God, God is to be venerated as the one, and one cannot advance beyond this abstraction. Islam is therefore the real religion of formalism, a perfect formalism that allows nothing to take shape in opposition to it. Or again in the French Revolution, liberty and equality were affirmed in such a way that all spirituality, all laws, all talents, all living relations had to disappear before this abstraction, and the public order and constitution had to come from elsewhere and be forcibly asserted against this abstraction. For those who hold fast to the abstraction cannot allow anything determinate to emerge, since this would be the emergence of something particular and distinct in contrast with this abstraction too. These lines could, of course, be taken as the matrix of the normatively liberal tradition of thought which, under the umbrella of the concept of political religion, casts a dark light on the seemingly de-differentiating universalism that affects all projects which seek to subject social mediations to the unity of an abstract principle, God or equality. Unsurprisingly, Hegel cannot be so easily enlisted. From the standpoint of Hegel's philosophy of history, and of H.I.S. understanding of the French Revolution in particular, we can indeed speak of a necessary and legi timid fanaticism, whose destructive and abstractive powers make you you olify it as a modernizing agent 3. But what of fanaticism gr aspied synchronically, in the context of the modern state? In the philosophy of right, fanaticism no longer appears as a necessary if truculent moment in the historical vicissitudes of spirit, but, now, arguably much closer to the thematic of toleration which motivated Voltaire's handling of the concept, it is featured as the pathological retention of a right over absolute truth and rationality that would trump that of the state. As Renzo Llorente has elucidated, even though religion and the state share the same content, and religion can accordingly serve as the factor that integrates citizens into the state, their form differs. Where the state provides a knowledge f-o-u-n-d-e-d -E on a determinate and differentiated form of rationality, thereby embodying the absolute in a concrete un versality that does not suppress but rather articulates particularities in their freedom and relative autonomy, the content of religious consciousness appears in the form of feeling, representational thought, and f faith 14. It is when the inwardness of religious doctrine seeks to trespass I into the domain of objective law, and the state's monopoly over it, when the communities whose doctrine remains at the level of representational thought assume a negative attitude towards the state, and their polemical piety, Hegel's term, brings them into confrontation with the state that the problem of fanaticism rears its head. 
fanaticism here denotes the attempt by a religious community to impart objectivity to their, representationally conceived, doctrine in defiance of the state 15. In holding fast to religious consciousness against the objectivity of the state, fanaticism repudiates all political institutions and legal order as restrictive limitations shranken on the inner emotions and as I and commensurate with the infinity of these ls. LT is a hatred of law, of legally determined right. 17 Religion opposes law and the state to the extent that, qua fanaticism, it seeks to impose, that is, to lend objectivity to, the self-sufficiency of a merely representational thought. As Llorente notes, this kind of fanaticism necessarily wills abstract representations, all particularizations proving incompatible with the essential indeterminacy of representational thought ls. Fanaticism here signals the repudiation of the state and its determinate articulation of society through law, that is, through a rational cognition or knowledge of differences which does not subsume individuality under an abstract absolute. I and imposing the formalism of its unconditional subjectivity, it directly contravenes the precondition of the modern state, which I involves the latter's superiority with respect to particular religious doctrines and communities. In other words, it contravenes Hegel's UNIK understanding of secular modernity. What is unique about Hegel's juxtaposition between fanaticism and the secular foundation of the modern state is the fact that this is not simply the question of immunizing society against the strife created by religious particularisms, as in Voltaire's Tereus on Toleration, for example. It instead involves a philosophical conflict between universalities which enter into rivalry once religious consciousness refuses its proper, and subordinate, place. We can now isolate a number of elements from Hegel's formulation of fanaticism which will be of use in the remainder of our discussion. To begin with, fanaticism identifies a politics of the one, of the absolute as an undifferentiated principle of action, which makes it at once abstractive and destructive. Its subjective and effective dimension is that of an enthusiasm for the abstract 19. A certain dialectical dignity may be ascribed to fanaticism as a moment in the development of spirit, as in the French terror. However, in the modern state, where the objectivity of law and the differentiation of society surpass and subsume religious consciousness in a secular polity, fanaticism, in the guise of polemical piety, appears as a pathology of both the fanatical subject and the fanatical religious community. To the extent that this kind of fanaticism is a challenge to the state, it is correct to note that religious fanaticism is necessarily political in nature, indeed, is by definition a kind of political fanaticism. 20 Echoing the resilient trope of Islam as a thoroughly political, and consequently expansionist, religion, Hegel's discussion of fanaticism in the philosophies of history and religion suggests that a religion of the one cannot but be a politics of the one. Accordingly, to make the connection to Hegel's remarks in the philosophy of right, such fanaticism is a negation of the modern politics of a differentiated state based on the subsumption of religious doctrine and subjectivity to a law that allows for concrete unity in difference. The task of the state is thus also to educate religious subjects and communities into the rational cognition and recognition of the objectivity of the law and the limits of faith. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. Though by no means deriving from Hegel's positioning of Islam and fanaticism in the context of the adventures of spirit and the apparatus of the state, contemporary attempts to delve into Islamic political subjectivities, and, symptomatically, political psychologies, can be usefully related to the complex of ideas that Hegel delineates under the rubric of fanaticism. T.O. Take a particularly pertinent case, Bruno Eschen's writings on the suicidal and apocalyptic strains of Islamism hone in on fanaticism as the key subjective determinant of new and aberrant figures of militant politics. Relying on previous explorations of the concept by Norman Cohn and Dominique Colas, Eshan also regards fanaticism as the subreption of the proper boundary between religion and politics, as a slippage from the religious to the political field 21. The fanatic, subject to a transcendent and otherworldly demand, is the antagonist of civil society. As a paranoiac, he repudiates all ALT 
and can only affirm his own unconditional belief in a seemingly unattainable transcendence through profanation, a pathologically enjoyable form of iconoclasm which you and Dermines the notion of a are elegion of sublimity, point 22 as Eshin writes, to exclude ALT eridi by carrying out purifying murders nevertheless implies that one feels attacked from all sides. This paranoiac closure stems from the fact that every ideal of the ego is confused with an ideal imag inary islamic we in absolute unity, the TAWHFD, the oneness of God induces the oneness of the Ummah, and thus the fusion into the one, 22. Point 23 It is this fusional ideal which for Ishan characterizes the contemporary political modalities of fanaticism in the Muslim world. As he notes, invoking an Arabic term with a serendipitous homophony with our theme. FANA. J means extinction in the one. J fanatics are thus all those who constitute the house, MFTHL bait, the temple of unicity. J the fanatic is truth and this truth is one. It animates, agitates, and arms him. He doesn't have to search for it in doubt, to construct it, to discover the true, to travel. He enjoys without delay or relay an I immediate certainty, which inhabits and possesses him entirely, propelling him forward. Violently. Gathered together, fanatics believe that they are the only organized servants of the all true, of the one whose insta umns they are. They hate those who ignore this and they want the world to bend to the law of the one who bends the universe to its necessity. 95. This abstract fury for the one seems to echo Hegel's phenomenology of the, Islamic, fanatic. But Ishan is not content with reproducing the classical image of fanaticism as the political religion of the one. He thinks that a psychoanalytic explanation is in order, and enlists to this end the concept of the death drive, as the psychoanalytic translation and explanation of the theological concept of FANA, but more specifically of the passage of fanaticism to the terrorist act, the death drive results from a SURF eat of energy IES freed by the failure of the containing capacities of representations. The surfeit of excitations leads to a rupture, the actor or agent, as Bourdieu would say, is emptied of his own desires. He is then the object of a movement of unbinding whose outlet is a war neurosis. 85.24 There are I interesting a fee and I ties between the overall schema you underlying this point and Fethi Ben Slama's view, in the context, it must be said, of a far richer and analytically more serious work, that psychoanalysis should perceive the emergence of radical Islamism in terms of the cesura of the subject of tradition and the unleashing of forces of destruction of civilization that directly follow. From it 25. Though Ishan's enlisting of the notion of death drive is too cursory to require much scrutiny, it is of interest that he places it at the crossroads between a speculative energetics, the surfeit of excitations, and an idea of representation which oscillates symptomatically between the imaginary and the symbolic. The theme that representations, or mediation tout court, function as a form of civilizing containment that the fanatic undermines is a staple of those discourses that regard fanaticism as the at once anti and hyper po elidical counterpart of the modern subject. 26 It is important in this respect that the religious fanaticism diagnosed by Hegel in the philosophy of right was upbraided for being a form of representational thought, or, we could hazard, an imaginary politics of devotion at odds. With the integration of politics and religion within the objective rationality of the state, such that M. Adiatio N. and R. representation are, for Hegel, not synonymous. By juxtaposing energetic excess and representational containment, Eshin grounds the analysis of political religious I. Insurgency, violence, and terrorism in the classic figure of the fanatic. This figure is characterized by a destructive and fusional passion and is to be understood by its negations, of the difference between religious dogma and civil society, the sacred and the secular, the self and the other, so on and so forth, and not by a sui generis relationship to a certain symbolic and imaginary repertoire. In this respect, it might be fruitful to consider Slavoj's ex-treatment of religious politics I in terms of perversion as an antidote to the tradition of fanaticism which regards political religious extremism simply I in the mode of its destructive anti-representational drive. I in his recent How to Read Lakin, 
Zizek, produces a commentary on Lakin's remark in Four Fundamental Concepts that IT is the subject who determines himself as object, I and his encounter with the DI vision of subjectivity in LIGHT of the letter to Ion HIRSI Ali by Buyuri, the killer of the Dutch director Theo van Gogh. 27 behind the arch I fanatical declaration by Buyuri, no DI discussions, no demonstrations, no petitions, only death will separate the truth from the lies, Zizek. Sees at work the pervert's tactic of displacing division upon the other, the pervert claims direct access to some figure of the big other, from God or history to the desire of his partner, so that, dispelling all the ambiguity of language, he is able to act directly as the instrument of the big other's will. 28. This is to be taken I and two asymmetrical senses, Buyuri becomes an undivided subject, an agent of God's wrath, by displacing D.I. vision onto his nemesis, her psi ally, inconsistent with herself, lacking the courage of her own belief s, and onto God, who sanctions the absolute separation between the true and the false. 29 This is why Zizek can use this GRIM vignette to lend credence to the suggestion that the fundamentalist, along with the liberal cynic one is on the side of knowledge, WHILE the MIL and atheist stands on the side. Of belief 30 it is worth underscoring the possible use of the paradigm of perversion against the tradition of fanaticism. The virtue of Zizek's Lacanian suggestion is that it does not treat the violent repudiation of secular standards of justification as the res ult of a pure negation of limits and constraints for the sake of an annihilation into the one. Rather than the abyss of interiority, Bouillery presents the unsettling case of an exteriorized zealotry, where division is not undone by fusion, but, on the one hand, through the stigmatization of a divided other and, on the other hand, through the submission to a dividing other. The pervert's presupposition that his acts directly implement the divine will also means that he need not be troubled by the kind of psychosis that is so often and so easily ascribed to the fanatic. The fact that the denial of DI vision is in its own way mediated by the other militates against the hypothesis of fusional fanaticism. In addition, the externalization of the pervert's knowledge also means that the common view of the fanatic is absorbed by his conviction, which is why his normal li fe causes such consternation, is untenable. Asterisk asterisk asterisk. While the paradigm of fanaticism, and of the psychic forms that allegedly accompany it, enthusiasm for something abstract, is entangled with the H.I. story of the philosophical and orientalist reception of Islam, let us not forget that Hegel christened Arabia das Reich de Fanatismus dash, it is also, despite its recent geopolitical fortunes, rather generic in its application. Indeed, in the philosophy's campaigns against fanaticism, the Islamic world could even serve as the tolerant FOIL for a denunciation of Europe's internecine religious strife. More recently, however, Atlantic discourse on Islam has joined a long-term concern with the Arab and Muslim mind with the constant reiteration of secularism as the key stake of the current religious and political crisis. It is this laborious political res ult of the history of Christendom that can allegedly explain both the civilizational subalternity of the Islamic world and its supposed rage. In Bernard Lewis's by now notorious terms, this is no less than a clash of civilizations, the perhaps irrational but surely historic reaction of an ancient rival against our Judeo-Christian heritage, our secular present, and the worldwide expansion of both. 31 The posited continuity between our Judeo-Christian heritage and our secular present is of interest if we are to think of the imbrication of historical cum civilizational narratives, disquisitions on theology and accounts of political subjectivation which pertain to the discussion of psychoanalysis and Islam. The question, to borrow the terms from a recent heated debate about the extension, depth, and coherence of the hypothesis about a Judeo-Christian, or Western, secular heritage could be posed as follows, is there a psychic Zonderweg special path which accompanies the secular Zonderweg of the Christian West, such that psychoanalysis would be compelled both to recognize its interiority to such a Zonderweg and its differential, or even normative, relationship to the Islamic subject? 32 were. The answer affirmative, psychoanalysis me ght phi nd itself invidiously burdened with the function of midwife of secularism, 
as an I institution that takes the parameters of acculturation, and of pathology, anomaly, and de-islocation, provided by Western Christendom and its secular inheritance as somehow normative. I want to explore this question of the dangers of secularizing the psychoanalytic subject, and of turning psychoanalysis into a secular clinic, so as to turn to a discussion of the distinction between secularism and atheism as they might relate to the politics of psychoanalysis. Or, to consider how the secular, besides being a political doctrine, as well as an ontology and an epistemology might also make certain claims on the psyche.33. Zizek's recent essay on Ben Slam is La Psyche Analyze I Eprivate I Slash Slam, A Glance I Enter the Archives of Islam, is a good place to start.34 I N his several forays I N to materialist theology and pow L I N E militancy, Zizek, far more than the likes of Badia for instance, has been mounting a trenchant re-articulation and defense of what, following Ernst Bloch, we may call L the atheism in Christianity and the Christianity in atheism.3 s in his polemical excavations of the non-perverse core of Christianity, of Christianity as the cipher for an ethico-political subjectivity founded on the inexistence of the other, Zizek has strived to produce a theory of the political subject couched in terms of a singular universality. In a number of texts, above all the puppet and the dwarf, this has taken the form of investigating the intricate dialectic between Christianity and Judaism, law and love, and extracting a materialist, a cosmic kernel from theology and subjectivation. But where, if anywhere, does Islam fit I in all this? 36. As Zizek H. I. Myself notes in a glance, Islam poses a problem for the teleologically inclined historian of religions due to its bothersome anachronism, it emerged after Christianity, the religion to end all religions, but also due to its misplaced character. 37 Islam occupies the geographical area between the Christian West and the Orient, and it impedes, much to the chagrin of Levi Strauss, for instance, the happy fusion of the two halves of human civilization. Zizek proceeds to accompany Ben Slama's excavation of the archive or the obscene secret mythical support of Islam, which locates it, rather predictably, in the symbolic and epistemological role allotted to the veiled Muslim woman, such that the ultimate function of the veil is precisely to sustain that there is something, the substantial thing, behind the veil. 38 It is worth noting about Zizek's recent interest in Islam that he has yet been unable or unwill linked to articulate the kind of philosophical, as opposed to merely ideological or sociological, encounter which he has staged with Judaism and Christianity. As it stands, what we have here is not a dialectical confrontation between Islam and the acosmic, psychoanalytic materialism advocated by Zizek, but rather a mere antithesis that gives rise to formal comparisons and does not affect our picture of singular universality in any lasting manner. Typically, where Islam is called upon, it is qua politicizing ethos or concrete form of antagonism, and not as a matrix for potentially emancipatory forms of subjectivation. This mere antithesis, whereby Islam is not the precursor of the Christian matrix of singular universality but another universality, which notoriously turns both Judaism and Christianity into its unknowing precursors as the subordinate religions of the book, stems from the anachronism that Zizek himself indicates at the start of his review essay on Ben Slama's book. As we already saw with Hegel, Islam is in a sense out of sequence, an anomalous and excessive universalism which ignores the ability of tri Unitarian Christianity and its state to integrate, which is to say differentiate I into appropriate spheres, the political and the religious, thereby shutting down the path for the secularization of political authority and social power. In Hegel, as in Zizek, this absence of secularization, or conversely, this fanaticism of the one, is also linked to the suggestion that the singular or concrete form of subjectivity, qua freedom, is absent from Islam. Such a vision of Islam as the abstract universalism of the one does turn into the non-dialectical counterpart of a Christian atheism of singular universality, all of whose tropes, d-u-l-y inventoried by Zizek for the sake of an ethics and politics of the act and the exception, sacrifice, incarnation, a split, impotent God, 
the theology of the Trinity, seem absent from the ideational repertoire of Islam. At this point, Zizek. Might indeed agree with the Italian judge, who, faced with the protest of a Finnish mother who wished to have the crucifix removed from public classrooms, described it as a symbol of secularism. To be more precise, the legacy in Zizek of Hegel's treatment of Islam as the religion of fanatical universalism is to confuse the methodological atheism of psychoanalysis with the normative narrative of secularization, which stipulates that without passing through a set of specifically Christian theological, historical, and psychic figures, trinity, incarnation, absurd faith, and so on, the subject cannot attain its modernity, configured herein as its barred, dislocated, and voided status. But for all of its avowed atheist aims, not properly de-istinguishing a refusal of transcendent agency and cosmic holism from the historico-philosophical epic of a Christian Zonderweg risks consigning psychoanalytic discourse on religion to a parochial and culturalist defense of our Western legacy, and eventually to nonsensical demands that Muslims go through their own reformation, or the LIKE. The result of such a secular strategy and teleology is almost invariably to enclose the other in religion all the better to expel him from politics 39, turning social struggles and geopolitical strategies into matters of a vaguely defined culture and even more vaguely defined mentalities, which no quantity of psychoanalytic sophistication can really sunder from the colonial tradition of inquiry into the native's mind. The idea of transforming psychoanalysis into a secular clinic aimed at diagnosing the phantasmatic impasses that prevent Arabs or Muslims from becoming the properly pathological subjects of modernity rather than fanatics stuck between crumbling tradition and fear of West Oxification, a temptation which is present, for instance, in Ben Slama's otherwise important and searching book, leaves itself open to the accusation that psychoanalysis might constitute yet another stage in that cunning of Christianity which has often taken the name of secularism. As Anadjar has written, Christianity actively disenchanted its own world by dividing itself into private and public, politics and economics, indeed, religious and secular. And Christianity turned against itself in a complex and ambivalent series of parallel movements, continuous gestures and rituals, reformist and counter-reformist, or revolutionary and not so revolutionary upheavals and reversals while slowly coming to name that to which it ultimately claimed to oppose itself, religion. Munchausen like, it attempted to liberate itself, to extricate itself from its own conditions, it judged itself no longer Christian, no longer religious. Christianity, that is, to clarify this one last time, Western Christendom, judged and named itself, reincarnated itself, as secular 40. Christianity I invented the de-istinction between religious and secular, and thus it made religion. It made religion the problem, rather than itself. And it made it I into an object of criticism that needed to be no less than transcended. 41. T. A. King such a Christian secularism as both H. I. Storically and psychically normative hampers psychoanalysis in a number of ways. In A.D. Isastris Amphiboli, it ethnicizes and culturalizes the unconscious by presuming that one can gain insight into the psychic disturbances and political difficulties of individual Muslims by postulating fantasies that take place at the level of the religious text itself. This textualism, which presumes that something pertinent can be directly gleaned from a theological text about social practices and individual blockages, is of course one of the primary tropes of the Orientalism explored and de-isected by Edward Said. But it also neglects the fact that, aside from being intensely variable for biographical, political, and conjunctural reasons, the relation between individual and group psychology is never a question of expression or emanation, of the kind that Mar D. I. scours is on the Arab mind and the like. As M. L. Aden Dola has perspicuously indicated, in Freud, the unconscious is neither individual nor collective, an individual unconscious depends on a social structure, whereas a collective unconscious would demand a defined collectivity, a community to which it would pertain, but no such pre-given community exists. The unconscious takes place precisely between the two, in the very establishment of the ties between an individual, 
becoming a subject, and a group to which s slash he would belong. Strictly speaking there is no individual or collective unconscious, it intervenes at the link between the two. 42. But neither Islam nor Christianity, especially not in today's uneven and conflicted capitalist world, constitute social structures, and it would seem entirely spurious to fancy that one can draw political lessons from treating them as such. That they still provide copious phantasmatic material is not in doubt, but taking their unity and consistency as given and then proceeding to I investigate the vicissitudes of political subjectivation on the basis of their theological and textual traditions is devoid of any clinical or scientific basis, and can only add to the deeply ideological and analytically barren resurgent civilizational discourses that have accompanied our recent geopolitical conflicts. I in this historical and political context, it would be far more useful, rather than treating theological narratives as immediately present in the personal and political unconscious, to consider the power and impact of specifically political fantasies. This is the immense value of Alan G. R. Osricard's The Sultan's Court, a book which demonstrates that psychoanalysis, instead of prolonging the fallacies of civilizational or culturalist thought, can enact a profoundly dialectical and historically astute critique of the fantasies that structure our political discourse. In Grosh Richard's work, The Relation Between Texts, for example, M. O. Antisqueu and the Tales of Travelers to the Orient, and Fantasy, as we ll as the inscription of cultural alt within the unconscious, never takes a fallacious expressive form, of the kind that would allow one to turn to the Quran to grasp the fantasies of contemporary Muslims in a discourse devoid of dialectic and mired in analogical reasoning, which would permit, for example, speculations about political authority in the Muslim world based on theses about the forms of paternity in Islamic theology. In Gro Richard D., it is the manner in which the fantasy of the others, anti, politics structures our own, in which the beliefs in their beliefs allow us to believe that we don't believe, which is key. Fantasies of cultural contradictions rather than the psychic expressiveness of theology or culture are the object of a psychoanalytically informed critique of ideology. Here, it is worth quoting at length Dola's acute interpretation of Grosh Richard's study. The fantasy, useless as a tool to explain its object, can shed LIGHTUP on its producers and adherents. It projects onto the screen of this distant other our own impasses and practices in dealing with power, and stages them. Point 43 The subject who is pinned to this fantasy does not have either to believe or to renounce him herself, one can delegate one's belief and one's renunciation to others, the despots no less phantasmic subjects. This is the handy and comfortable aspect of this fantasy, as a European subject, I don't have to pawn my own belief and offer any sacrifice, others do it for me, the fantasy takes care of it. I believe that they believe. One can believe by proxy, it is enough that one extends one's belief only to someone who is supposed to really believe. The subject supposed to enjoy is thus complementary to a subject supposed to believe, the one relies on the other. So we do not naively believe in the despot's enjoyment, all the panoply of the Sira Glio, and so on, it is enough that we believe that somewhere, I and some distant Asian land, there are people who are naive enough to believe. An immediate belief in the other and its enjoyment would probably entail psychosis, so this delegated belief can maintain my subjectivity, and at the same time it enables the belief to bypass censorship and retain practical effectiveness. My unconscious belief is preserved by being delegated, it is repressed by the mediation of a proxy. So the phantasmic mechanism can trap the subject by enabling him or her to retain freedom, disbelief, and autonomy, in sharp contrast with Asian slavery and blind subjection. Point 44. T. A. King Dola's argument further, we could suggest that, especially when it attempts to delve into the tangible ed web of politics, culture, and religion, a psychoanalytic critique operating with the category of fantasy must work with the principle that a political or religious fantasy is always a fantasy of the other's beliefs, and indeed about the other's fantasies. What is more, as the adventures of Oriental despotism reveal, 
the very idea of the other's unified culture or religion is itself a fantasy which allows us to entertain the belief that our own position is consistent and unified, in the case explored by Gro Richard D., the position of a liberal polity entirely purged of slavery and blind subjection. This is not to say that the other is a kind of screen, behind which lies some kind of numinal kernel, what Muslims really think, but that the study of political fantasies reveals the way in which, non, relations with others structure our own fragile identifications. Not a dialogue between civilizations, but the fantasy of the other's self-enclosed civilization allows us, and them, the false security of belonging to one civilization ourselves. This is especially so, when this civilization is the one which regards itself, as in the recent craze for Judeo-Christian atheism or secularism, as being unique in having transcended the organicist constraints of traditional civilizations, cultures, or religions, and of truly being the culture that one has rather than the culture whereby one is had, to borrow a distinction from Wendy Brown. A relational political model of fantasy, of the kind proposed by Gro Richard and Dola, can serve a potent critical function, whereas an expressive civilizational model, which would entertain our fantasy that we can have insight into the other's collective political UN conscious through a study of theological texts or myths, does not, indeed it risks generating proxies which merely give succour to self-satisfied political fantasies of autonomy and liberality. It is such a relational political model which set hints at in Freud and the non-European, where he writes of Freud's profound exemplification of the IN site that even for the most definable, the most identifiable, the most stubborn communal identity, for him, this was the Jewish identity, there are inherent limits that prevent it from being fu llyi incorporate into one, and only one, identity. 45. It was in fact said himself who proposed a defense of a huma nist secularism which did not leave it open to the possessive secularizing philosophies of history which are so prone to pontificate about our, Christian, legacy of atheism, toleration, liberalism, and so on. Said referred to Vico's Veramel Factum principle, the secular notion that the historical world is made by men and women, and not by God and that it can be understood rationally according to the principle formulated by Vico in New Science, that we can really know only what we make or, to put it differently, we can know things according to the way they were made 46. Against Anna Jar's suggestion that secularism translates into the cunning of a Christian imperialism, 47 it is important to defend the idea, crucial to Freudian psychoanalysis, of secularism as a kind of methodological atheism, a practical, materialist and naturalist inquiry into trans-individual behavior and psychic structure which, to paraphrase Althusser, would strive not to tell itself stories. Against the comforts of culturalist discourse, which would more or less surreptitiously advocate for the superiority of one set of fantasies or myths over another, Freud's depiction of the religious illusions that respond to human helplessness and constitute the process of human civilization, takes a salutary distance from the Christian concept of religion attacked by Anajar, and from the apologetic narrative of Christian secularization that undergirds it. Rather than the question of proper distance or differentiation which dominates much of the DI scores of secularism, and which is often an ill-disguised way of raising liberalism to the status of an eternal truth and exalting its current territories to the status of lands of freedom, Freud's, both radical and disenchanted, Enlightenment perspective centers on the possibility of emancipating humanity from illusion, not merely giving it its proper social place, or worse, denouncing the illusions of others to better justify our own. In this regard, whatever other problems it may raise, Freud's generic use of the category of religion, quite distinct from the one which allows Lacan to acerbically designate Christianity as the true religion in Letrium de la Rieslashigen, for B has the great value of breaking with the prejudicial parochialism of the culturalist discourse about religion, which always implies a choice about which religion is better, more emancipated, more civilized. Much less respectful of religion, Freud's generic approach also shows a salutary indifference to the specific forms that religion, or indeed illusion more broadly, takes. When he writes, in a short text from 1907, 
that one might venture to regard obsessional neurosis as a pathological counterpart of the formation of a religion, and to describe that neurosis as an individual religiosity and religion as a universal obsessional neurosis, 49 Freud, showing his fidelity to a radical and materialist enlightenment, is shifting the register to an anthropological discourse about the structures of belief. Such a methodological atheism is not devoid of a certain metapolitical discourse, embodied in Freud's sympathy for a dictatorship of reason, for the slow, geological progress of the, scientific, intellect as a social force.50 but more importantly for our purposes, unlike a psychoanalytically inflected theory of secularism or Christian atheism, it is not generative of further political fantasies, illu zions of autonomy, or cultural superiority. The slow, patient struggle against universal obsessional neurosis is free of the dubious religious cultural partisanship of those who believe that certain illusions have an emancipatory function which makes them superior to others. When it comes to matters of religion, the traditions of Kantianism and German idealism run the risk of wedding psychoanalysis to a constricting narrative that turns every one of its concepts merely into a secularized variant of Christian theology. Freud's far greater closeness to the intransigent reductivism of 18th century materialism, his allegiance to the radical enlightenment, makes him a far surer and less biased guide in tackling the relation between psychic and religious life without propping UPMYTHS and fantasies, and smuggling the consolation of religion you enter the guise of unbelief. If the methodology of psychoanalysis is atheistic and scientific, it cannot allow itself to serve as the vehicle for the interminable secularizing of Christianity, or for the depoliticizing study of cultural religious fantasies supposedly expressed by individuals in distant lands. Believing by proxy, believing in Tihi others' belief, in his fanaticism, is no substitute for the laborious struggle against our illusions. Discussions concerning the nature of being are fairly commonplace. The real has many names, idea, atoms, the void, God, nature. Philosophy provides us with a wide range of variants. Appearance, perceptible forms, has less prestige, and today it is the relationship between the real and appearance that has been deprived of intellectual focus, obliterated, rejected, foreclosed. Whether we consider the ancient belief in a hidden truth to be vital stll or privileged shallow signs, what is absent is the question of the beautiful revelation, in the presence of a body, a landscape, or a painting, of the infinite effects of a power offered and refused. We no longer ask for appearance to be apparition or for an imminent real to be associated with any appearance. Yet, this has not always been the case. Once, forms were perceived as epiphanies. The gaze deciphered them spontaneously. No meaning was assigned to them but rather the power that multiplies meaning, disturbs it, transfigures it. This was the world of the work of art. No doubt it was intimately associated with a theology that rejected the deis appearance of the uncreated in the created. This platonic aesthetic, although overshadowed by late modernity, is not exhausted, but it has considerably altered the definitions of what it causes to appear, as it has that which causes it to appear. The Phi Lmten by the Iranian filmmaker Abbas Kiarostami is a good example of this aesthetic of the idea, conceived according to the terms of the present moment. For this to be possible, the following conditions must be met, there must be an image in which light is corporeal and spiritual, a scene that conveys the essential or hidden meaning, a questioning of the messianic schema of history. These are necessary conditions. To them must be added the following, which is absolutely essential if the Phi Lm is to be contemporary, the messianic figure, reconciling the H Iden and the apparent, the light of the created and the night of the uncreated, must be improbable, lost, forsaken, or hopeless. All of these conditions are satisfied in Ten. I have in Mind a woman's body bent beneath the weight of destiny, Folloing the long, too long, pathway of prayer, an epiphany of desperate expectation. I end the final scene of this subtle Phi Lm, a woman, about whom we know only that she is awaiting an answer from the man she wants to marry, tells her well-meaning friend that he has broken it off. 
and FOLL owing the banal words of condolence offered, her only, but shocking, reply is to unveil her shaved head. Beneath this unbearable sign of mourning, which alone authorizes the abandonment of the veil, her face is transformed. And the abandoned woman utters these simple words, I would prefer it if he were here. Who is it that she would prefer were there? Her unreliable fiancé. The Hite and Imam, the one every Shiite awaits, the messianic figure hoped for in the despair and infinite mourning of his departure? The man for whom the woman, who has lost everything and who is not very pious, will pray at the grave? As it ends, the film leaves us devoid of any response. For the response is that he is a man of flesh and the perfect man, and that apparition has ceased to be, twice, the real has fled and its apparition has dissolved, Epiphany is dead. And without it there is no salvation for this woman with her shaved head, or for contemporary Iran, or for those watching the film. This cinema, entirely devoted to the most profound rehabilitation of the link between apparition and reality, between the uncreated that will be and present creation, this cinema of spiritual sensibility, makes me think of another film, no less admirable, but situated in the very different space of Christian messianism, Julian Duvivier's The Sinners. Here, too, the perfect man must save a creature of L-I-G-H-T from a closed, infernal world. In this case he assumes the features of a young electrician, Serge Regini, who, across an apocalyptic landscape, battered by torrential rains, searches for a woman whose angelic face converts the inmates of a reform school to their own angelic nature. Unable to recall the words of a conventional prayer, these lost women improvise their own, one made of their own words. In a punitive world that extends to the limits of the sensible world, Juvivier's film makes present, reveals, all the terror and beauty that may be forthcoming, guilty flesh, criminal desire, the purity of the creative imagination, an obvious reference to Peter Ivetson, love and unlikely salvation. To these films we should add Hitchcock's inimitable V.E. Rodigo, all of them signs of the intrepid endurance of an art that reveals the destiny of epiphany. V. E. Rodigo, a woman's face, a body, and its fetishes, the G.R.I. suit and tightly wound bun of hair, they all collude to unhinge the dumbstruck hero. Of course, it is not inconsequential that the face belongs to Kim Novak, a face that makes it impossible to determine if she is a bitch or an angel, the most vulgar or the most celestial of apparitions. James Stewart's eyes, and all we really see of H.I.M. are his eyes, recognize the body beneath its new appearance, entirely foreign to the woman he loved, as if the real remained, imperious, within two contradictory presences, in which it trembles. We are present at the death of this apparition, through the awkwardness and longing of the man who so desired it, and we are contemporaries of that death, the death of Epiphany. Jam it! The face compels no respect from the perceiver. Rather, the presence of the other, that odious double of myself, ordinarily provokes the most extreme violence. Through the lengthy discipline of custom, we have managed to refrain from striking, from humiliating that afflicting face, which withholds its desire but orders us to forget, for its own benefit, something we would gladly accomplish. Fortunately, Morality has nothing to say about the face of others. When it is possessed of D.I. Good Nighty, it changes the raw material of the soul into a thing of beauty. Morality teaches that we conduct ourselves wisely rather than submit to a rule that would hold for all reasonable beings, for it does not arise from the conformity of our reason to itself but from the love, so essential and yet so rare, we feel for the lost dignity of our body and our freedom. It therefore encounters its limits in the inherent corruption for which universal legislation is no more than a popular nostrum. When morality demands to take precedence, it masks the infinitely richer experience of apparitions, through which we are invited to determine our loss or our salvation. We no longer turn our gaze toward the living world, the discrete space of epiphanies. Civilization beg ins when we see, directly, in all its splendor, the manifestation of the uncreated in the created, the apparition of the divine dawn beneath the features and in the static movement of a woman's face, in which the world's flowering is condensed. 
courtesy, and its parade of joys and pains, is worth infinitely more than any so-called law, respect for which would burst forth from the contemplation of a face. It is this the Orient understood, substituting the aesthetic of epiphany for the tedium of ethical precepts, or, rather, forging an ethics born of aesthetics itself. This too is the supreme function of art. As long as art existed, it lived to compose the beautiful and the sublime. Ever since Kant, we have claimed that the work of art engenders the sentiment of beauty, the subjective agreement of our faculties of understanding. Each of us, in the presence of a beautiful work of art, is said to be able to experience this agreement, without however expressing it as a concept. But the most powerful works of art do not comply with doctrines of this sort. They provoke us, invite us to make judgments that do not involve taste but understanding. And those judgments are ours alone, because the apparition opens the door to our singular world, encourages us to visit the space of our own substance. This is the lesson of Proust, beauty pleases singularly as a concept. The apparition allows us to see that this world we are is an infinity of worlds, containing an infinity of organisms, demons and marvels, palaces and abject ghouls, which are also worlds. And the infinity of those spaces terrifies us. Apparitions terrify or exalt, they possess the power of the infinite, the freedom that discovers its revelators in the IMAGI nation and the senses. This is the sentiment of the sublime, as the fugitive passerby is sublime, fugitive, because a queen, wrote Proust. Classical beauty is an exercise in the sublime, but it was romantic art that made epiphany commonplace. With the setting of the romantic sun, the question arose concerning the death of epiphany, as if it did not already contain the sign of its own di's appearance within itself. Because today we have, to use Hegel's overly precise expression, entered the time of the death of art, summarized in the Rico L. -L action of display, we worry about the transhistorical life of epiphanies, which resist that death, and which would justify those two great elements missing from modernity, love of the real and beauty. Epiphany requires appearance, nothing more than appearance. But nothing less, either. A surface, as elimpid as the heartbreaking movement of Rachmaninoff's fourth concerto, where the soul folds in upon itself before the calm and trembling presence of death. The D.I. Chevelled hair in sentimental education restores an impossible life to visibility, brings lost beauty back to life, appears. Destiny has completed its work, time has concluded D, but in the severed lock that is offered, subsists everything that might have been, if the epoch hadn't been one of betrayed revolutions, failed loves, and the prose of the modern world. Flaubert was the great novelist of the sunset of epiphanies. They are ablaze in Carthage but fade in Frederick's fragile and mediocre hands. Baudelaire, in one of his condemned poems, Le B. I. Jau, brings together incarnation and manifestation. This Catholic, unromantic, poem assumes that God is made of flesh, and the flesh of woman in the moment of love, the moment when the body vanquishes the Sue L. Passion and resurrection of the body. Through his genius, this incarnation symbolizes through apparition. Apparition decrees that the uncreated that manifests itself not be confused, in complete union, with the corporeal mirror in which it is made visible. The woman's body is that of the whore, the most appropriate symbol of God's sublime debasement, it is the body of splendor, the rose that reflects beauties that lie beyond the visible. Epiphany flows before my eyes clairvoyant and serene, and undoes the contemplation it makes possible. The Orient, as understood by Islamic thought, was the place of the rising sun, which Sarawardi called Ishraq, Oriental illumination, corresponding to the sun of being when it rose, which he compared to the west of shadows. The west is the substance of bodies charged with night and death, opaque blocks of real non-being. On the surface of the body, of its recalcitrant matter, the LIGHT of archangels is reflected, from which the light of souls arises. Thus, the dead body is transmuted into a mirror, animated by the lights of the uncreated. Aesthetic religion is the contemplation of forms, which do not simply govern the body but are its angels, 
and guide the contemplatives I far from XILE. This is sufficient to split the universe into two opposite regions, night and day, and for the work of art, fulfilled in the growth and flowering of the body, to bear witness to war. In the apparition, there is nothing calm or peaceful, unless there is agreement between matter and spirit, between the density and the capricious and unfettered nonchalance of epiphany. Matter. To day, we can say it is that which chains the body to the prose of the world, and strips it of any reflection wherein we might find an opportunity to escape ourselves, to recognize our exile I and the shameful habits we pick up from the most controlled pleasures, from the playful mastery of powers, made more intense through our acquiescence, and through the peace they procure. Separation, the L-I-G-H-T of desire when it strays, the instantaneous perception of a face from beyond during an accidental encounter, the back streets of love, these are what might yet show us the provenance of beauty's forms. Splendor is humble and sovereign and, it wants only a rose, a woman, no matter which, contingent, to present the absolute that suddenly condenses in them and empties us, as if our factitious unity, that of the body of death coiled in its mortal conviction, were to sink like sand in an hourglass. The earth is populated with epiphanies, no thing is a thing. Heidegger asked the question what is a thing? And he taught us that it is not an object subject to simple noetic seizure, it does not attest to its presence on the profane horizon of utility. We are too joined to this regime of the useful because we no longer see something detach itself from the spatial and temporal order. Heidegger, while fully doing justice to Kant's extraordinary philosophical gesture, and the inexhaustible pages of his transcendental aesthetic, nonetheless pointed out the blind spot that was the source of the difficulty. Kant's genius was to demonstrate that space is I intuition. But who is the subject to whom we assign space as a pure intuition? Is it sufficient that it is a human subject whose being is insufficiently determined? Departing from Heidegger but FOLLOing a pathway he cleared, we are oriented by the conviction th at such a subject, establishing the intuition that is space, is apparition itself, the indissoluble unity of uncreated appearing and its manifestation within the limits of a world, of a monad of existence. The moment of eternity illustrated by the solitary tree, the tortured vine root, requires an ascesis of the gaze. To understand epiphany, we woe uld have to suspend any alteration of sight, anything that causes it to drift toward other things and envelop them all in a single universal world, it is necessary to escape the world. I know what this Baudelarian and Barshian anywhere out of this world suggests in the way of nonsense, sordid utopias, and lunar beyonds. The true meaning of that anywhere is here below, here and now, when its essential, infinite, power is released, its implacable metamorphosis, which leads it to the self, to its highest degree of uncreated reality. Things are not of the world, they form an indefinite series of highly singular substances, incomprehensible to the understanding that fixes them, as they move and are guided toward their root in the heavens, which is the heaven of the arts. This is what Sarawardi was trying to say when he claimed that every R-E-A-L-I-T-I has an angel, was the manifestation of an angel, air, water, F-O-L-I-H, earth or sky. A woman's face, her furtive body concentrate all the things of the world when they are no longer things but apparitions. What is a woman? One who allows woman not to exist but to reveal herself, not in fantasy but in creative and truthful imagination. Imagination is not what a vain people believes. It does not produce images freed of all intel liable constraint. It is the power of limitation, separation, of determination of the infinite in the finite. Tragedy lies in the conflict exposed within this finite apparition, whose real sense is the infinite that it reveals, and whose imaged sense will be its sensible form, with which we nourish our fascination and our belief. Epiphany par excellence, woman, fortunately, doesn't dictate any laws. She is triumphant, worthy of herself, which is to say, unworthy, a figure of treason and revelation, conjointly preceding any duty and succeeding any worldly legislation. She is both epiphany and body of death. Outside this axiom, 
in which Occident and Orient meet and clash, there is no truth of desire, other than the possible, which, as Buddhali said, must be left to those who love it. She raises her hand to the horizon of intermediary worlds, to the horror and happiness of the uncreated. Earth is populated with epiphanies. Starting from the core of apparition, every perceptible body suddenly metamorphoses into epiphany. The manifestation of the body in the mirror is intensive joy, qualitative power, and terror as WELL. The H. Iden source of the apparition is the essence of the uncreated, which envies its own expansion. It prevents stasis, presence. Epiphany is infinite expectation, aleatory expectation, the contingency of the street corner, the opening door, the faithful thing of L.I. to Lime Port Ants. Expectation that doesn't expect anything, Blancott said. Epiphany doesn't respond. Such is the Orient, the unanswered question. Epiphany is order arising from the essence of the uncreated, and the transgression of order, the conjunction of two voices when the manifestation of the UN created is released from its own unity to free the power, the infinite freedom of the unamable essence. In what is, essentially, a novel of epiphanies, our Lady of the Flowers by Jean Jennet, we read. One of them, when questioned by a detective on the boulevard, Who are you? I am a thrilling thing too. The face is terror, it doesn't command respect, doesn't echo the law. The face defeats the gaze that tries to grasp it by multiplying the clichés. Thus Albertine, who are emended me of a cake on the top of which a place has been kept for a morsel of blue sky three. The essence of the face can be grasped through the game of creative imagination that leafs through and collects the layers. Gazes intersect, that of the epiphany, that of the contemplative, and behind those perceptual apparatuses reside two celestial continents, two orients, one revealing itself to the other in misunderstanding, which is the higher understanding. TWO sites of desire that fail to come together, like those traveling skies for they pass one another, rub shoulders, but never meet. The certainty of the encounter is the imaginary of epiphany, relentlessly threatened by the terror of the misconceived. The real of epiphany is always that through which everything was lost. But this loss is the jubilation of the epiphany, which requires the greatest spiritual strength. T. Error and peace, the too intense presence of the body must be understood. Whenever there is movement, it becomes that fleeing light our hopes lack and which establishes hope. When it vibrates and remains, or when it rests in loving calm, the eternal moment is without hope. Psychology, that scourge of the modern age, has tried to domesticate signs, the jumble of lost or incomplete forms where desire is tabulated, the desire whose provenance is the UN created. Desire is never am I staken, it knows that beneath the adorable name fetish, like those NAI offerings made by the humble to the idols that satisfy them, there is a trace of the absolute, the complicated curve of a shoulder, the heartbreaking, willowy arm, the blue veined hands that fail to harmonize with the rest, because of which the rest is nothing but the unlikely sum of what it finds unacceptable. The small swift hands, the perfect shoulder, the body free of corruption, hair that reflects the azure sky when it is night, the vanished sun, and the night itself still illuminated by distant stars. T.O. name apparitions as so many divine names, those that are revealed, except for one, and it is the one we don't read that we unveil along the orb of a hip, at the moment the eye closes. Especially to love the impossible color of skin, which is never a primary color, never an identifiable hue, never blended with artifice, but incomplete symphony. Weight of eyelids over the blue and gray eyes of the actress who makes life worthy of the luminous stage of the semblant, how can we ignore you, before whom we lower the gaze that you lash to its suffering? For psychology semblance is a curse. Better that it prefer the truth, the stoic lesson of loving only what depends on us. It claims that we are subject to death, that we love fate, and prefer elucid sorrow to unruly joy. But fate is epiphany and its train of errors and falsehoods, those higher truths. This would be victory at the moment of conclusion, when the perishable body G.I.V.S. way to the Sue L., the true body, 
the soul that will have ceased to endure the astonishing innovation of days. Not the insignificance of presence but the unfortunate peace, that endless tribulation wherein sensibility metamorphoses into true intelligence, when the body that reflects the L-I-G-H-T from within dictates the only reasons to live, desire and war. Happiness is not the opposite of sadness, as ethics taught, it is sadness, and sadness remains happiness, so mingled are they that all the lessons of the masters are shattered. Epiphany is the promise that will not be kept. It is, wrote Claudel, not happiness but that which comes in its place. The division of midnight answers the division of M.I. Day, the star-filled night and its parade of saintliness. But Claudel knew better than others the irreplaceable virtue of what substitutes for happiness, the unique viaticum. Epiphany is the apparition of terror, for beauty is ignored at the very point at which it appears, expansive, it overflows itself, and at the boundaries of the body there are flames not visible to the naked eye and which make the son of the good so dangerous. Emanations that correct the reassuring circle, events so numerous they pass us by, those minutes of a woman, separating her from us and uniting us to her. Such is redemption. Not acknowledging respect but reconciliation and the simultaneous loss of the absolute. The generosity and admiration and astonishment with which Descartes, the knight of good conduct, began to speak of the passions, all assume epiphany, the union of two opposites in astonishment, of two ill reconciled enemies, redemption and terror. Descartes wanted to conjure the excess of astonishment and heal the princess of Bohemia by offering her the remedy for terror known as conversation. Passion became Italian theatre, the only one, it is true, we are able to love, in which the cominatory of desire has taken leave of madness. But epiphany, bursting forth haphazardly in our lives, does not spare us. It requires some other space, the deranged boulevard on which to disappear. The intimacy we have I and this world derives from our senses. We see, we taste the world we don't really confront, because it is not an object for us, as long as we remain pure subjects of contemplation. The world is primarily the union of the perceiving subject and perceived bodies. If we intensify the perception of the world and the perceived world, we arrive at the threshold of active imagination, when our senses have more strength and less matter, when nothing restricts the forms of our sensibility. True imagination is a higher sensibility, not the fantasy that composes pale reflections of colors and physical forms. Epiphany takes place in this more intense world. It is not immaterial but turns its very form into spiritual matter, and that is why its features are unique. At the bottommost rung of sensibility, in the profane and habitual UN universe, a body is always lessened by its participation in the species. We see an individual reality, which reminds us of the universal abstract, the rational animal, the featherless bipped. We fail to establish the singularity that would be the true intelligible reality, free of the silhouette we have available to us. We make use of it, which is why the image becomes camo n, interchangeable, generic. S. But when we support IMAGI nation in its agreement with true intelligence, we accede to the sensible of the unique. The indefinable oneness of an existence I illuminates the spirit which communicates to the senses this perception of the uncreated, of the generative hearth from which the L-I-G-H-T of the existent draws its power. Thus, epiphany is made visible in subtle flesh, it reaches our senses and concentrates them in the intimate secret of our act of existence, in the physical and spiritual knot of our faculties and our weaknesses. Epiphany speaks to our secret, it is our secret revealed. And this secret is the uncreated that we ceaselessly create, prophets of the word deposited within us. Such is the rose that rises from the M.I. Neacher, Venus being born for Bodicel L.I., into a vision whose miracle is less the purity of her face than the twinned, contrary movement of the gaze and the excessively slender neck. With her disconcerting, serenely unsettled gaze, Venus contemplates nothing of what we are, no object of the environing world. She dreams with open eyes, or sees before her what is within her, with intelligence she contemplates her secret, which the Platonist calls idea and which is now epiphanized in her objectless gaze, an otherworldly gaze, 
existing only in the soul of the world, a gaze in which our own secret is measured, the joyful sorrow of the singular love in which we abandon our animal tunic. She sees the beloved within, the point toward which the motions that you are ge us toward being are directed. Thanks to Rusbihan backslash I of Shiraz, the virtuoso who preceded Hafez in the art of condemnation, in the practice of love that strives to support condemnation and loss before divine law and the reasonable customs of mankind, we learn to recognize weakness and strength in epiphany. It restores to our ally Fay the interior drama of the uncreated, which is the drama of love, and therein lies its strength. It does so through the unexpected interplay of fissures, like a crazed wall, a frozen lake that cracks beneath our steps, a fault in the rock, it doesn't change the forms of the play of love through the harmonious curves of geometry but by the inveterate succession of catastrophes that no intelligible function I integrates. Such is its frag I L I T Y. Epiphany is the nonsense of the uncreated. The real is in its essence eternal dramaturgy, it wants to be known, it wants its own infinite desire, it is will and power. This assumes some other than the self, for whom it becomes manifest, and the perceptible reality of epiphanies presents itself to the gaze of this other, ourselves, in the guise of love, so that an answer may be given to the infinite desire of the UN created real. Creation, the universe of forms, has no foundation other than this initial lack of the real in the face of its own plenitude, which justifies the expansion of beauty and majesty. But the uncreated wishes to be loved only by the uncreated, to preserve its shaky unity. That a gaze originating in the other might come to rest on its manifestation, and jealousy, a jealousy as I and finite as its power, might provoke its retreat. Therefore, epiphany is the simultaneous presence and erasure of the uncreated. The drama of the real, unable to realize the union of the lover and the beloved, is reflected in the dramaturgy of human love. And the reverse is true, any disturbance of love in the approach of epiphany is a symbol of the disturbance of you and created unity. For this reason, there is one and only one love, and it is not possible to you and join, through the force of law, the mortal love of a woman from the immortal love that probes the uncreated. This lesson, Rusbihan's lesson, lends its solemnity to the deadly and indifferent episodes of love affairs, as it did to the art of the novel, which was, for Orient and Occident alike, their recital. For the wound to heal, epiphany must be perceived by a gaze that becomes the very gaze of the uncreated, it demands a metamorphosis of the subject in the fugitive unity of lover and beloved, in the moment of epiphanic joy, before the tempest of separation. The subject of the vision becomes the lover of divine sovereignty. Just as he serves God, he submits to the desire of woman, whose sovereignty is expressed as much by the shocking debasement of behavior as in the intolerable caprice of apparition and disappearance. The primordial pact concluded between man and God in response to the question Am I not your Lord? is not a contract, in the way a perverse contract can be, but a foundation of existence. God appears to the one who answers yes to the question of Rekag and Izanki posed by the uncreated. TOC the uncreated appear in the created assume submission to the uncreated that appears. This logic of man's creation, as the holy book of Islam the Maitis, serves as a model. Thus, the final dereliction of the blue angel does not prosaically illustrate the bourgeois theme of the woman and the patsy, but the destruction of self that is the only escape from the drama of the uncreated, for it is the uncreated itself that is annihilated in the suffering and brilliance of crazed laughter. Rusbihan clearly situates the lover in the in-between between separation and union, and there is no place where I can flee to or fi and de refuge or cry. Knowledge of absence through absence itself, absence manifest at the moment of the most intense presence, the there is, donation, like a manifestation of withdrawal. A woman needn't be far away for her to hollow out the void of separation, but she must be there at the desired moment. The inevitable misfortune arises from the fact that the uncreated is reflected in the mirror of the woman's body and that it is impossible for the subject of the vision to distinguish the carnal mirror from the fugitive epiphany. The mirror breaks. The subject cannot support the flight of epiphany, which dissolves, 
just as the image disappears from the mirror's broken fragments. He cannot know that other mirrors, an infinite number, reflect the beauty of the uncreated. Divine jealousy overpowers him, becoming its own obsession, and Epiphany proclaims that it was the unique, the manifestation of the unique, when the body's dark mirror falls into ruin, intolerable ruin of love, the remainder we do not know what to do with, memory, letters, instruments of pleasure, l-i-k-e the empty bottles that confront our drunkenness. He is left with signs whose only meaning is the pillage of his heart. During this trial, the subject prepares to become the witness of contemplation, which in Arabic also means a martyr, he is the martyr of being. The uncreated watches in him. It sees and what it sees is disaster, where it exists through its own tragedy, where the unique suffers eternally from the unique. Thus, Rusbihan's central axiom is verified, it is in the book of human love that we must learn to read the rule of divine love. Oh! That young, tender, M. Iscavus, charming, L. Iveli, impulsive, heretic. The gaze of epiphany is a wink filtering through the eyelids, which loses consciousness at the moment of its illumination, prelude to the swooning of the heart of the witness. Naturally there is a union, which Rusbihan assigns to the lover's state of perfection. But union is not the calm repose of disposition, of testimony. The uncreated wishes to remain Hiden, protected by 70,000 veils, and its withdrawal is immediately reflected in the repulsiveness, the Hideous experience of an epiphany that is changed into a demon. The horrific then bursts forth. Horror is consubstantial with the experience of epiphany. It is less a question of the disappointing behavior of the beloved than of the very root of love. The UN created repudiates itself. It falsifies the game, breaks the pact by which it gave into sight. It lies. This repudiation is also its negation, through which it withdraws through its own revelation to the unknowable point where it no longer wishes to be known other than by itself. In the mirror of epiphany, this is expressed in the varied features of the denial of love. Henry Corbin interprets this pure negativity in the language of Jacob Boma, the abyss of divine wrath. At the center of the epiphanic form is a domineering violence, referred to by the Arabic slash car, sovereignty, anarchic aggression, despotic power, the sabers sweep during a raid. The witness places his neck upon the leather block of the condemned D, Epiphany is invited to the damnation, here below and in the beyond. There are words, in Rusbihan, that allow us to grasp what he means by becoming the player of the strange, I myself, without myself, am the lover of myself. I continuously contemplate myself, without myself, in the mirror that is the existence of the beloved. So, then, who am I? We can abandon to their fate those who will classify this as narcissism, who are aware, from the beginning, that in this affair of mirrors and apparitions, there is nothing other than the mirage of the self, and the enticements of the imaginary. They speak from the point of the modern world, the one that invites Epiphany to die a natural death, to return to the dusty universe of the ancient world. They are only too right, for our world is especially characterized by this death, by the ban on any vision of the uncreated, because the uncreated is no longer. At best, woman is the definitive embodiment of the generalized prostitution that the perfected atheism of the modern world sacralizes in the form of universal commodities. Psychology takes responsibility for theorizing this collapse, and for alerting us to narcissism, the resistance reality cannot bear. Rusbihan is certainly not modern. Who says one? the uncreated itself, the ultimate subjectivity from which every revelation, that is, every imagination and every sensibility springs, the source of things. The imagination is truthful, for the one who imagines is not primarily the witness. Imagination falls upon him, grabs hold and occupies him with its forms, which are the epiphanies of the uncreated. It embodies the intelligible, extracts its portrait. The uncreated is the lover of itself in the lover's unstable ego, in the interplay of the mirror that binds him to the beloved. Without me, for the uncreated subject is other than the self, 
it escapes any constancy in its oneness. It is infinite, which does not mean total, unless totality is itself the infinite, forms repeatedly overflowing their source. Human love is divine love itself, to the extent of veridical imagination, and the witness in turn experiences this void of the self, this loss of self hollowed out by the delectable apparition. When the beloved appears, it is without me that I am myself, who loves me, which is to say, who loves that other truth of myself, far from the dialectic that nonetheless does not fail to get involved. Soon there will be a me and a you, me and her, and the struggle for recognition. Rusby Han grasped the moment before this struggle, this split. The coincidence of subjective unity and distress, a presence and a nothingness without resurrection. Not the process of a passion that overcomes itself through resurrection but the passion of the subject when it is nothing but the torment of the self. The love that precedes the history of mastery and servitude, where mastery is so complete, enjoyment so perfect that they at once become loss. This great tribute to the self should be read as apprehension of the primordial abyss. The man who behaves as a master will never be one, wrote Kojawi. The lover's desquamated ego does not behave as a master, and as for the beloved, epiphany prevents her mastery from entering the game of recognition, this is the moment of unity, the moment of separation, of the irrational void. To express the approach of the eternal fiancé, Rusby Han can find no other Quranic verse, no other phrase than the folloing, there is not one among you who will not reach at hell. Your Lord has made this incumbent on himself, 1971. Epiphany, the lover's personal Lord decides nothing other than his hell. Here, any economy of narcissism or the death drive would be laughable. God is hell. Such was the truth of woman, of epiphany, and it is this hell we wish to know nothing more about. Point six. The modern age destroys epiphany, suppresses the phenomenon, the apparition. There is no trace of the uncreated in the imminence of the object, for the advent of the bartered body has consecrated the death of the UN created. It is not so much a question of the death of God as the death of the uncreated. The death of God is an event situated in the logic of I incarnation, passion, and resurrection. It enables apparition to preserve its theophanic power by turning its mastery into fecund servitude, or unconditional obscenity. The death of God culminates in the dead God's assumption in the rags of Madame Edwarda. It is the moment prior to absolute knowledge, Madame Edwarda went on ahead of me, raised up into the very clouds. The room's noisy unheeding of her happiness, of the measured gravity of her step, was royal consecration and triumphal holiday, death itself was guest at the feast, was there in what whorehouse nudity terms the pig stickers stab seven. The scene of absolute knowledge in Georges Sahel's story takes place in the vicinity of the Port Saint Denis in Paris. It responds to another reference to the very beautiful and very pointless Port Saint Denis, the one that appears in Nadia. Breton is the traveler who crosses Paris until he reaches the archway, where the anxiety of the improbable encounter with the apparition arises. I wo uld like to make palpable the divergence between apprehension and its universal signification, Breton is an heir of Rusby Han. He makes the Port Saint Denis the emirer on which the image is deposited, he is haunted by epiphany, by woman, whose body signifies nothing other than the unlikely mirror of the icon. The disreputable quarter is a place of apparition, situated in a world of semblances. Breton Stll belongs to the time of epiphany, whereas Baudelaire is no longer familiar with apparition, but the embodiment of the absolute, the coincidence of the corporal substrate and the icon, by which no icon floats above dark matter any longer but alone, matter made spirit, spirit entirely made flesh, she was entirely black, simply there, as distressing as an emptiness, a whole aid. Anxiety isn't not encountering epiphany but being absolute knowledge itself, which is self k knowledge in the void, now complete, of any form. Without suspecting it for an instant, I k knew that a period of suffering was beginning. Death reigns in the whore who is God. The Port St. Denis is no longer the space of vision but the place of Calvary. Thus, 
the woman of the Occident is substituted for the woman of the Orient, the whore for Epiphany, the God on the cross for the God they did not crucify. In the presence of Epiphany, destruction and immortality were simultaneous events, now, in the face of incarnation, there is no further buffeting between annihilation of the ego and immortality through annihilation itself. Presence is no longer that of the revealed uncreated but the immanence of the dead God, it was as though I were born aloft in a flight of headless and unbodied angels shaped from the broad swooping of wings, but it was simpler than that. I became you and happy and felt painful lly forsaken, as one is in the presence of God 9. Epiphany swoons and dies with the triumph of a fu lly realiz mechanism, the only full realization that Christianism supports. The theology that insisted on the distinction between the two dimensions of the revealed, the divine nature of the uncreated and the feminine nature of Epiphany, necessarily succumbs to the theology in which these two natures are united in the body of the whore. Thus woman doesn't exist, to borrow Lakin's well-known proposition, which precisely matches the equating of God and the whore. We would need to evoke the varied I inverse epiphanies found in Buddhalese heroines, with their incarnate names, such as Dirty in Blue of Noon. These are radical negations of epiphany. But this criminal trial, in the sense of the court scene that concludes with the pronunciation of a death sentence, is not the final moment. The final death of Epiphanes is fool vile led, unrelievedly, when Messianism itself races toward the wasteland d. Zero in place of passion, the brothel, the door open to the night, there is the neutral place, the empty bar when the last GLS is raised. I in place of Ophelia and her kingdom of visions, we find the derisive double of the bartender, depriving Hamlet's renascent Platonist of his own words. In the poem that ushers in the 20th century, to which that other program of our nostalgic nothingness for Christ, Apollinaire's Zone, exactly corresponds, we read. Hurry up please it's Timmy. Gunaite Bill. Gunaite Lou. Gunaite May. Gunaite. T A Tau Gunaite. Gunaite. Good night, ladies, good night, sweet ladies, good night, good night. I N Eliot's L I N S. We can read the melancholy of the present. Now begins the impossible morning of Epiphany, there is nothing to prevent the feudal I M A G I N A R I. For Epiphany, the fruit of voracious imagination, suppressed the imbecility of the imaginary. It paralyzed the imaginary circumscribing the face of the beloved woman. There was no fantasy surrounding this unique apparition. Now love understands what it is that breaks upon the real event of I integral imminence, the empty glass abandoned on the corner of the bar, all the events that make up the body of the woman and time and the incorporeals attached to that body, are no longer events of the soul that loves but signs of the death of the uncreated. The whore is now without sin, indifferent, deprived of any relationship to the uncreated, to the originary freedom of the real. I see waters replace the ocean of lights, far from the so ul's true ambience. The beloved ceases to be the generative core of the world. The subject is no longer shipped off to Epiphany's exquisite prison. The world of semblance yields to the imaginary world, where the one who loves is no longer a body and soul arranged within an order that escapes them, but where the alley of love awaits the dawn of street sweepers. The time of exchange has come. The new man is no longer the man of incarnation and passion, any more than he is the man of platonic eros. He is a monad of non-existence. How can we compare the trans-historical force of apparitions to the injunction of the present when the only question that would free us, the messianic question that Kiarostom I.S. film asks, where are you? Is stifled in our throat? Translated by Robert Bonan No. I. The N E C E one Y of N E O Platonus M. The event O F T H E Great Resurrection is the culmination O F history. I T fulfills, in the eyes of the Nazari Ismaili, the destiny of man in both supernatural time and the time of nations. B U T This perfection is also a liberation. The appearance of the Resurrector releases his faithful from the obligations of the law I in order that they may experience an entirely spiritual existence which is the truth of the paradisiacal state. It would be, 
in our view, inexact to perceive this liberation as exhausting itself in the simple disappearance of constraints. Perhaps we would be gravely mistaken in opposing the Kiyamat resurrection period to the Shanat period, as if the one would be content to efface the bonds that the other had imposed. Certainly, a liberty is substituted for a constraint. But this liberty is not exhausted in the power to do what had been forbidden. It projects those who adopt it into another space and confronts them with another logic, another theology. The resurrection is the experience of liberty, not simply because it effaces the law, but because it manifests the divine essence. The Ismaili of Alamoti experienced the power of their liberty in the contemplation of the divine unity, finally stripped of its sails. Their joy, their exaltation, and ultimately, the new obligations imposed UP on them by their completely new existence. This whole set of behaviors and feelings belongs to the greatly varied history of the forms of liberty. It is important that these feelings, this elation, the weight of the fallen chains, the rectified body which abandons the ritual gestures of obedience, this set of features in which one of the rare and beautiful moments of liberty is recognized, it is important that all of this was experienced in the encounter with the One. The unity which, in being contemplated, liberated the men gathered together in this confined community was primarily concentrated in the figure of the Lord of the Resurrection. But, beneath this face, the feeling of liberty really depended upon the presentation of divine unity. This is why we are UN able to truly comprehend the messianic act in which this manifestation took place without seeking recourse to its metaphysical conditions of possibility or, more precisely, to the ontology that is implicitly staged by such an event. Thus, we must now ask ourselves what the divine essence must be and how it must be thought in order that the sudden emergence of its unity in the shape of man, or of a man, may be intelligible. This interrogation is all the more legitimate given that the Ismaili thinkers themselves did not fought ilto expressly found the messianic act of the resurrection upon a theology and cosmology which formed an impressive metaphysical edifice. It is rare to see such a close correspondence between a rigorous philosophy and a historical experience of liberty. Ismaili philosophy underwent many successive developments, and it is not our intention to summarize or even evoke them here. It suffices for us to question two of the most prominent theoreticians and show how, not without differences, they bring us closer to the real UP on which the experience of Alamoti can be founded. These two metaphysicians are thinking on the horizon of Neoplatonism. There is, on the one hand, Abio Yakuob al Sijistani, who, following the Persian pronunciation, we will call Sijistan L, and on the other, Nazaruddin Tosi. The first is a de, which is to say, a Fatimid missionary. The second is a witness to the Fa'el L of Alamoti. They are situated, respectively, at the beginning and at the end of this history. Despite their profound lexical or doctrinal differences, they are connected, and their choice here is justified, for the purposes of understanding an event that Sijistani never knew of, and that Nazaruddin commented on as a fa it accompli, by a common passion for the ontological foundation of the particulars of their faith. I would like to draw the reader's attention to this fact, which I find essential, if there is any moment in the history of Ismailism that strongly resembles the proclamation of the Great Resurrection, it is certainly the end of the 3rd 9th century. As we briefly recalled in our I introduction, those we called al karamita the Karmishans, were awaiting the return of the Imam Muhammad b. Ismail. They made themselves feared through their tremendous military incursions, and made themselves hated by the majority of the MU Slim world when they removed the BL Axtone from Kaaba. And yet, it is in the intellectual milieu of the Karmishans that Sijistani's master, Muhammad b. Ahmed al Nasafi, composed his Kitab al Masal. He completely reformed Ismaili theology by introducing the Neoplatonism which became the henceforth obligatory frame for the metaphysical thought of Ismailism. It strikes me as highly suggestive, then, to see this time as combining an exigent quest for the day of resurrection and the abolition of the law, a tragic experience of liberation, 
and the adoption of a Neoplatonism that makes possible an intense meditation on the One. Sejastani's treatises, saved from the disaster in which H.I.S. Master's works perished, are the most proximate to this tragic experience of the Ormishans, even if Sejastani is, for his part, a da'f faithful to the Fatimid branch. His treatises are not far, in their existential tone, from the pages of Nazaruddin Tosi, which are tributaries of the experience of Alamoti. They express, in effect, a similar concern for the messianic act and for its causes lying in the ontological structure itself. It is no less suggestive to note, in these two cases, the following philosophical fact, in order to problematize a messianic event, whether it be a fervent premonition or already experienced, it is necessary to interrogate the nature of the one, the nature of the procession of existence existence, and also to interpret the messianic event according to the laws of engendering the multiple from the one. Why was this theoretical schema so necessary? It seems to us that there are two simple enough reasons for this. First and foremost, the Neoplatonic schema of the one and the multiple permits the one to be situated beyond any connection with the multiple wherein it would be totalized or counted as one. The one is thought beyond the unified totality of its emanations in the multiple. On the other hand, freed from any link with the totality of the existent existent, and situated beyond being slash adra, the one can signify pure spontaneity, a liberty with no foundation other than itself. In this way, the sudden messianic appearance of the resurrector will be founded I and the creative liberty of the originary one, thus, I and the necessary reign of the existent, the non-being that results from the excess of the one will be able to mark out its trail of light. But, conversely, this creative spontaneity will also explain the creation of the existent, the ordained and hierarchized formation of universes. Just as much as with the unjustified lib erdi, the one will be able to justify the procession of the intelligible and sensible, and the gradation of the spiritual and bodily worlds. Avoiding dualism, all while thinking the duality between the one and the order of being which it in terrupts, conceiving, on the other hand, of the unity of order and creative spontaneity, all while preserving the dualist sentiment, without which the experience of messianic liberty was impossible, this is what Neoplatonic thought offered to the Ismaili. The key to such a theologico-political structure is the concept of the imperative, or command, a slash amn. By borrowing it from the lexicon of the Aran in order to I introduce it into the Neoplatonic schema, the Ismaili thinkers made more than a simple theoretical modification, and constructed something better than a philosophical and religious syncretism. It is thanks to the concept of the imperative that the free spontaneity of the one founds the messianic appearance, and it is thanks to the concept of the command that universes can be founded I and the same primer dil divine unity. Command and imperative, an imperative whose underside is the command itself, such will be the concept that we will have to situate. The Ismaili conception of an unsayable liberty, which is to say a real liberty, depends up on it. It is within the imperative that the unsayable is knotted to the real. The great resurrection of Alamoti was the historical experience of this imperative. Human liberty was experienced as the expression of the originative unstoratrous spontaneity and unconditioned liberty of God. The abolition of legalitarian religion, the culmination of H.I. story, the super-existence sure existence at the heart of a living community in a state of spiritual resurrection, the extinguishment of ancient obligations and D.I. visions, and the sole duty to recognize e. the exigency of divinization, the proof of an event wherein the infinite becomes accessible and is made into the very soul of life, such are the facets of a freedom that is quite strange for us. The Ismaili experience of liberty is not the discovery of the autonomy of consciousness or the political rights of the individual. It is the feeling of a different and powerful idea, liberty is not a moment of being, and it is even less a piece in the game of the existent. Liberty is not an attribute, but rather a subjective affirmation without foundation. Liberty is not a multiple effect of the one, but it can be nothing but the one, d is connected from whatever network of constraints it engenders or by which, on the contrary, it would come to be seized. Liberty is the experience of this non-being of the one, 
through which the one inscribes itself in the universe of both being and beings you aidant as pure alde writing. But, in order to support such a schema of liberty and the one within the thinking of the imperative, the Ismaeli needed a religious vision of the world. The experience of liberty is not made possible here by the distance man would impose on God. On the contrary, it is identified with the manifestation of the divine essence, with the imperious condition that the divine essence be beyond being. The liberty of the men in the experience of Alamoti was this revelation, taken seriously, that the first real, the foundation of all reality, is not itself a reality. The foundation rests on no foundation. Indeed, this is what is proper to foundation when considered in its essence. But that it eludes its own status, that it frees itself from itself, from what remains in it of an originary g around, or from a point that is attributable to some reality, this is the radical gesture of Ismaili thought. The presence of the Lord of the Resurrection demonstrates the infinite void of the deity. That which the Platonic sage contemplates in the ecstasy to which he was unable to lead his companions in ancient slavery is, here, what a communitarian LIFA would like to make into a permanent exercise. That which scintillates beyond all naming will have, for the time being, to await the great day of the communitarian ideal in order to be named. The Ismaelian's experience is indissolubly linked to the religious vision of the world, because this vision alone permitted them to encounter the one beyond being. Thus, it is not in spite of God but in combat with the UN nameable unity of divinity, with the unsayable of divine liberty, that the Ismaelism of Alamoti offers us the spectacle of a superhuman attempt at liberation. In order to be unburdened of the ordinary constraints in the subjugated town, the Ismaili community identified its way of LIFA with the expression of the divine imperative and the infinite liberty of the principle. By bringing themselves closer to God rather than breaking away from Him, they attempted to overcome the law of this Godi, which, in any case, said nothing that was not desired by God, who in the form of the Resurrector was henceforth made more manifest than He had ever been under the aegis of the law. Let us ask ourselves what kind of face this God must have had that they wanted to be so near to, to the point of deciphering it in the H.U. man person, naming themselves Mukaraban, those brought near Rapro CMS? It is in order to respond to this question that Neoplatonic thought became necessary very early on for the Ismaili. This was not a chance philosophical dressing up, the kind of coding that some scholar would put on a pre-constituted theology, but rather a restrictive schema without which this theology would not have been able to clearly think through the messianic event and its consequences for subjective LIFA. Without this schema, there is no subject, no proof of liberty. Only a Neoplatonic conception of the One, structured around the powers of the imperative, could allow the Ismaili to free God from all attachments to being as well as beings, and to think Him in the dimension of the infinite. But, conversely, this Neoplatonic schema can overturn itself and become the complete order of reality. Humanity can then be thought of as the manifestation of, and privileged receptacle for, the imperative. It can devote itself to a fate other than one of submission to some supreme being, the exemplarity of creative spontaneity and primer dil divine origination. I in consequence, h humanity would have to pay the price that this liberty carries with it, another type of submission, no longer to being or some figure of beings, but to the order originated by the pure act with which it had identified itself, thereby turning the spontaneous liberty it had discovered into an infinite obligation. It is this movement of liberty transforming into its opposite at the very moment of its appearance, and this movement of an obligation identified with liberty at the moment of its imposition, which we will now attempt to understand. Abu Ya Kubish BQB. Ahmed al Sij Istani, or al Siji, is one of the most important Fatimid Ismaili authors. Helived during the middle OFTHE 4th 10th century. According to S. M. Stern, he must have run the Jastra, or mission territory, of Khorasan, following the death of his master al Nasadi after having been I in charge of the Ismaili organization in Rai, where the deities of Mosul and Baghdad were under his command, 
3.2 he was, without a doubt, still alive in 360-970.3. The work of this high-ranking dignitary cannot be overestimated, and his study is absolutely indispensable, because he is our principal source for the Ismaili philosophical doctrines of the 4th-5th century 4. We do not intend, however, to examine him as a historical source. Through the FOLLOing reading of one of his treatises, THE Unveiling of Hidden Things Le Devo Ailment de Choses Cassius 5 we hope simply to highlight the metaphysical approach that was born out of the fusion of Ismaili theology and Neoplatonism. We also hope to demonstrate the co-NCFUAL edifice it constructed, emphasize the ontology that supported it, and situate the central role played by the imperative in this ontology, or, more precisely, henologi. I indeed, the metaphysics of the creative imperative during the time of Alamut retained the power it had acquired during the inaugural phase in which Sijistani played a foundational role. Of course, we will see modifications and inflections, but we can only judge them on the basis of the completely radical henologi that we shall now try to present. We are proceeding according to a guided reading of the unveiling, but not without mentioning Abu Yaqub's other texts when it seems necessary, and not without lamenting the absence of a collected study on such a crucial author. The unveiling of hidden things is composed of seven chapters, which are I in turn divided I into seven investigations. The first chapter is entirely devoted to showing the true nature of God, or rather, to demonstrating that he has no nature, that he possesses no being, and that he does not belong to the domain of existence with whose being he does not identify. The second chapter, I in memory of the primordial creation, is on the topic of the I intelligence, which is the primordial originated slash I N S T or primordia. The third chapter deals with the second creation, the universal soul, whose constitutive members are human so ULS. As logic would dictate in this procession, after the soul comes the third creation, nature, whose examination occupies the fourth chapter. The fifth chapter is not about a distinct stage of creation, but it explores the world of species, which is internal to nature, the world of the nativities, the world of the three kingdoms, mineral, vegetable, and animal, as we ll as the laws governing the relations between these species and the individuals that comprise them, it is an elementary treatise on physics. The sixth chapter concerns the fifth creation, the prophecy, and the cycles of the prophetic mission. It concludes with an important meditation on the special function of Jesus, the son of M. A. Re. This meditation transitions into chapter 7, in memory of the sixth creation, which deals with the resurrection and its authentic meaning. This resurrection supposes a resurrector who completes the last cycle of the supernatural history of humanity. This is not the topic of only the last chapter for, in truth, its veiled presence supports all of the theses that touch upon the resurrection. If Sijistani is able to do without a completely deployed imamology here, it is because he will have questioned it in the exegesis of Jesus' role, since the function of the Prophet Jesus is defined by the esoteric me honoring of the resurrection. This outline leaves nothing to surprise. At first sight, it is composed of three unequal parts, a first chapter dedicated to the unity of the Creator and the unsayable principle of all reality. Four chapters, then, explain the procession of the expressions of the imperative, which is to say the divine word, the I intelligence, the soul, and nature. Finally, two chapters speak of the prophet and the resurrection, which is to say that they speak about the exoteric, religious law, apparent reality, and the esoteric, role and effects of the Imamati. I and truth, three implied structures allow us to discover the I intrinsic order here. A, a first structure clearly isolates the first chapter, dedicated to the principle, from the six other chapters, which are all devoted to one aspect or another of creation. The total number of chapters, seven, is homologous with the seven cosmic cycles, the seven imams of each cycle, and so on. But the number six is no less charged with meaning. It is, Sijistani tells us, a perfect number, and from this we are led to understand that the six periods, of the cycle of prophecy, from the age of Adam to that of Muhammad, 
each in its own time, produce the spiritual forms, the perfection of the call, de what, of each period's prophet, and the perfect proportion given to HIS message by the QAIM, without which the component parts, of each period, exceed the N number 66. The procession of the six creations, the I intelligence, the so UL, nature, the natural species, the prophet, and the imam, is, thus, isomorphic with the succession of the cycles corresponding to the six major prophets, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, and thus with the history in heaven, which determines the earthly history of humanity. This homologation, governed by the number six, repeats itself as follows, the six days of creation, the six energies, movement and rest, matter and form, space and time, the six sides of a volume in space, the six parts of man, two hands, two feet, the back and the stomach. Just as the seventh part of man is the head, in which all of creation is summed up, so too must the first chapter bear upon the one who governs the body of creation and makes it live unto the imperative. b. But we can still discover a second structure, this time organized as a function of the preeminence of the imamate, which isolates and emphasizes the figure of the Messiah and the theory of resurrection. In fact, while still preserving the unique position of the principle, it is possible to read the first six chapters as the exposition of the procession, from the one beyond being up to the prophet and the imam. There is an obvious continuity at the heart of the set formed by the exposition of the principle and its expressions, while the seventh chapter reveals the meaning of this set, the destination of the procession, the universal conversion of being which is only made possible by the efforts of man. The generative source of universal eschatology is the paradect man, for whom the act of being is merged with his resurrection. This eschatology responds to God's call to his creation, and it transmuts the whole universe into a paradect mirror of the one. Sejastani's book is thus a bipolar one wherein, depending on the point of view, either the first or the last chapter gives meaning to everything, like two poles reflecting one another. See, finally, the third structure. There is nothing strange in the fact that a rupture is produced following the long-awaited procession of the I intelligence, the soul, and nature. We are no longer talking about one or another of the immaterial hypostases, but rather two integrated figures, who are indeed external existence but ones who, in order to live, need to become flesh in this physical world, the prophet and the imam. Indeed, we must remember the similarity that our author has pointed out, in the book of Springs Lever de Sources, between the Christian cross and the profession of faith in Islam.7. Let us recall what Sijistani emphasizes there, a structure with four terms, four supports of unity. The two spiritual prototypes, the I intelligence and soul Aslan, and the two foundations on earth, the prophet and the imam, Assassin. They are divided up thusly, the imam is likened to the foot of the cross, while the piece of wood extending from it is like the I intelligence, the left arm of the cross is homologous with the soul, and the right arm with the prophet. These four terms exhaust the invisible and visible, celestial and earthly, principles. In his prologue, Abio Yakuobi insists upon the intention that guides him, it is a matter of refuting the masters of perdition who liken the creator to the created s. They believe that they are able to speak of the unknowable, of divine IP Sati, and think they can define its essence by enumerating its attributes. They attribute an essence to God. Such is the association they make between the creator and the creature, community in the possession of an essence. But the true attitude consists, on the contrary, in stripping God of all essence. The only legitimate knowledge Savo, are rests upon this fully assumed unknowing inconnaissance. Knowledge, henceforth, concerns the hierarchized degrees of creation, the angels, men, the resurrection, the totality of universes, and the infinite richness of the existent. But the condition of such a science is precisely the unscience inchance of that which does not figure as an object of knowledge, the principle. The pretension to know God in the way one knows a thing has the correlate impact of an eg allegiance in the exploration of worlds, of numbers, and of beings. 
Sijastani's Isma Elism is, all told, the experience of a non-knowledge non-savo, are and the production of a multiplicity of knowledges. Savoirs. Non-knowledge is the foundation of knowledges, just as the one is the originator of existence. I in accordance with these necessary and legitimate knowledges, see Jastani Gives men the ethi cal duty to become consubstantial with gnosis, as the movement of the fire is inseparable from the fire itself. 9. I I I, the problem of divin e essence. The Tawhid is an attestation, the recognition of what exactly the unity of the Creator consists in. We must, consequently, understand what the One is, not as one number among others, but in that which absolutely separates it from the chain of numbers. Our analysis will excise everything from the One that contradicts its power. To this end, we must remove from it the property whereby existence possesses an essence. The technical term, which Islamic philosophy will trivialize when it comes to designating essence, is a slash dat. So, for Avicenna, it is the term that best renders the general idea of what a thing is, in a profound and intimate manner, but without considering it from a particular point of view. 10. The word a slash dhbt in Avicenna's work will gradually take on the clear meaning and univocal usage that it will retain in the subsequent history of Islamic philosophy but it will never be the sole designation for the essential being of Agiv in reality, all the more reason why it is not yet in its standard usage with Sijistani. In order to say that essence is excluded from the Creator, he makes use of the notion of Riti Riyad, or Thing Ness Chosite, Chizi in Persian. The concept of Thing Ness for him is, first of all, strictly equivalent to that of essence, Thing Ness names essence, but in a slightly different manner than the word a dhbt. The latter term puts the accent on the innermost center of a thing, on what the thing under consideration truly is. Essence, a dhbt, is the response to the question what is existent. In Greek, ti to on. It is what Aristotle calls the tist, as the determination of wissa. This is why when one speaks of essence, one is inevitably led to enumerate certain attributes, to explore properties, to verify differences. This is also why a theory of essences leads to a theory of genres, of species, and of individuals, since essence is never defined any more precisely than as taking part in a certain order, due to inclusion in a collection. A theory of essences opens outward to conclude in a doctrine of classification. Of course, Sijastani refuses the proposition that God, conceived in his extra-essential unity, possesses attributes, that he is subjected to an order, and that he would be the supreme term of classification. The Persian word chaize, l-i-k-e the Arabic word a slash dhbt, names essence quite well. But let us be carried onward by the semantic charge of the word thingness. What is a thing? It is an existent, but not just any existent. It is the existent conceived as an object. It is what one can hold, manipulate, or contemplate. It is the existent, such as it is placed in the universe according to a certain configuration. To say that God has no thingness is to affirm that nothing in him can be made graspable, manipulable, or observable in the manner of a stone, a statue, or some other thing. Which, consequently, is to say that God has no objectivity, that he is not an object, and that he can only be a subject. Rather than insisting up on essentiality, the very concrete term thingness insists upon the petrification of being. The thing succumbs to a certai and configuration, which is a limitation on it and a determination though which the spontaneity of the real is debased, until it is life did up in beings. Essence, conceived as thingness, is the character of that which is apt to constitute itself in the real in the mode of the thing. Henry Corbin wrote in a note in the book of Springs, IT will concern particularly the Shayaya, Chizi in Persian, literally, Riti, an abstraction derived from Shay, thing, R-E-S, which, precisely because it results from an operation of abstraction, presupposes the operation of the intelligence. Thingness is infinitely concrete, 
since it always falls under something that it is possible to grasp, and it is infinitely abstract, when understood as the essence of the thing. It becomes a pure abstraction of the mind which will define what characterizes the beings that one might encounter in the world of creatures. Knowledge determines the reedy of the thing, it isolates this essence on the one hand, and leaves the fact of being fate d'etre, the esse, as a remainder on the other. The residual thingness, then, indicates this fact of being rather than participation i in an order, which is the determination at the heart of a classification. Thingness is not simply the source of possession, intimate to this reality being conceived, the unified source of qualifications and modes, a permanence solidly contained within a hierarchy, an antic mastery. It is, rather, the fact of being something, the fact of being presented in being as an effectuation of the esse. The thing, qua thing, is distinguished from the other than self not primarily by its characteristics or attributes, but by its singular position, its sturdy configuration. It has a certain shape, it enters I into the universe through the fracture caused by its act of presence. This is why Riti, thingness, is just as much the act of existing as it is essence. It is the passage from the one to the other. By denying that God possesses a Riti we are led to remove essence from him, but we also remove the act of being and presence. Even if the Ismaili lexicon sometimes represents the one in terms of a philosophy of presence, the radically of Ismaili thought excludes the possibility that God is the presence of himself. Every time Sijistani says simply cheese, the thing, he also intends al-wajad, which in Arabic means existence or the act of being. Thingness is this act of being something, of undergoing the passage I into the existence, within the being proper to the thing, of some I intelligible essence. Riti is the fact of being, essence as the effectuation of the esse, joined with an existor. It is usia as much as it is to the ti, as well as stist. The thing, the particular exemplification of esse, is thus indissociable from the existent, it is indissolubly knotted to its act of being too. Sijastani barely differentiates here between essence and the concrete existence since it is not important to de-istinguish that which exists from its essence, but rather to carefully de-icern the solid knot of being and the existent, which constitutes the thing and its thingness, from that which is no thing and possess no thingness. This poses a lexical problem for Sijastani. To designate the one, the focal point, separated from all things and deprived of all thingness, irreducible to being, Sijastani finds nothing better than the same Arabo-Persian term DHBT, by which the tradition will later designate essence. Henry Corbin thus translates it by the in itself slash and soul. We must here hear the real of the one, itself I are reducible to any res, to any reality. We will learn, in the explication of the concept of I intelligence, that this is nothing other than reality, which is to say, the first originated being. Ismaili thinkers thus differentiate between the real AHD reality, a difference that is designated by the terms DHBT and Chizi in the first chapter of the unveiling. Only the one is separated from all of the things by which we designate that which is created. 13 Let us remark once again that the term TCHFZF has this important connotation, to be a thing, which is to have limits. Yet the notion of the LIMIT comes from sensible knowledge. The existent is first presented in the physical form of its surfaces, of its sides. Let us not neglect this aspect of Sijastani's apophatic reasoning, God is not a thing, he has no limit, because he is not subject to bodiliness, understood not simply as the fact of being a body, but more generally as the fact of being figurable. Point 14 The real is the infinite. At a time when the cosmos is a closed-off world, where the idea of an infinite actually existing in the universe seems to be a contradictory representation, it is within the one that the infinite, which is not the indefinite, finds its abode. The one is pure infinity, without foundation, or rezo n, and this is why it possesses no thingness that could deprive it of this i n phi n i tude. i n the same movement, the thought of the one repudiates both thingness and the membership of the divine names and their attributes in the essential reality of the originator. 
To situate God beyond being is to exalt him over and above his own names. Conversely, to free the divine real from the determinations in which its own attributes would imprison it is to differentiate it from everything that can be presented as a being, or even as the essence of the existent. Sharastani summarizes this reasoning extremely well when he writes that the primitive Ismaili said of God, We say that he is neither an existent, nor a non existent, he is neither knowing, nor ignorant, he is neither powerful, L, nor powerless. And the same goes for all attributes. For, truly affirming an attribute of God would mean that he and the other existents share the modality that we would say belongs to HIM, which is a CMI Lati 1 ism 15. In a slightly different style, this is also what we read in the Brothers of Purity, God is the originator of existence, no existent precedes him in being, but the outpouring of his generosity causes all reality to be. That is to say, the real of the one consists entirely in this generosity and infinite power of effusion, which is the Ismaili form of freedom. God sets the supreme Limit at the top of the hierarchy of existence, which implies that divine unity is outside of all limits, and that it, itself, is not the initial limit. God is the real of pure origination and he is constituted entirely by his imperative, which brings into being both the pen and the well-preserved tablet, the intelligence and the soul, corresponding, respectively, to the throne and the Corsi.16. It is therefore equivalent to say that the one is radically distinguished from everything that can ever come into being or, on the contrary, that it is entirely indistinct. It is even through its own indistinction that it exceeds the universe of the existence. That it is beyond any naming is understood in two ways, the one, the divine Real, does not lie in the names that it receives, and on the other hand, no name is capable of receiving it. The one is rebellious to all signs, it is unlocalizable, by the eminence of its condition and the force of its domination, it surpasses everything that marks the network of causes upon which the Crete Ural world depends. Reality, for its part, is always marked or de-extinguished by names, while the one is exalted beyond distinction itself. When we designate the one by particular namings, we are incapable of conceiving its super-existence. The name of the one is the name of the indistinct. 1 7 This is why the authentic attestation of the unique is the negation of attributes, whereas the affirmation of attributes is the renouncement of the Tawhid. 1 8 The origin of such a negative theology is not a mystery, it has to do with Neoplatonic philosophy. But what philosophy, and what sort of Neoplatonism, are we dealing with here? In order to respond to this question, it would be necessary to establish LISH an exact history of the transmission of Hellenic schemas to Ismailism, yet this is precisely where we are left to conjectures. Nevertheless, we are not left entirely in doubt. I will formulate the FOLLOing hypothesis, the Neoplatonism which irrigated Ismaili theology, such as it will have been reformed by Al Nasifal and Abu Yaqub Sijistani is of Plotinian allegiance. It doubtlessly benefited from the dissemination, more or less contemporary with the reform in question, of the so-called Theologi of Aristotle and other texts coming from the Enneads. We know that the Theologi is a highly coherent montage, made up of Plotinian treatises assembled by Porphyry in the order of the final Enneads. Is Porphyry also responsible for the original assembly of the Theologi? Was it initially translated into Syriac, then from Syriac into Arabic, ULT Mateli to be revised by the philosopher al -Kindi, 19 This work has always played a decisive role in the formation of the metaphysical systems of falsafat, notably I in imposing or confirming the schema of a procession of the intelligence, THE so UL, and nature, starting from the one. And yet, indeed, this is also the schema adopted by our Ismaili reformers in the 4th-10th century. TWO critical revisions of the Theologi exist, a shorter 10-chapter version, and a longer 14-chapter version, known to the West I in its Latin translation. I in a well-known article, Mr. S. Pines, working from fragments published by the Russian scholar Borisov, 
demonstrated the proximity of this longer version to the theses of Ismailism. Ismaili theology situated the originating function of the word, or divine imperative, between the one and its emanations, the intelligence and the soul. Pines found this same pairing of the one and the imperative in Barisov's fragments. The word plays a decisive role there in the engendering of the I intelligence. But this vocabulary of origination and the word, of the imperative and the sovereign speech of God, is not Plotinia N. It intrudes on the Plotinian schema in order to accentuate that which concerns the liberty of the principle, and to incline the whole ontological schema towards the meaning of this liberty. If it is accepted that this is found in one of the versions of the The Logi, then it must necessarily be concluded that this is due to a mutual influence of Arab Plotinism, transmitted under the name of Aristotle, and Ismaili theology. On the one hand, this confirms that the Ismaili adoption of the doctrine of the One has its origin I and the spread of Plotinism. On the other hand, it must also be supposed that this adoption was not simply passive, but that it led in turn to considerable modifications in the image and doctrine formed out of a procession of the intelligence and the soul, beginning with the fact, which was fundamentally new for Hellenic thought, of the word or imperative point 20. Could it be suggested, F-O-L-L-O-ing Pines, that the long version of Aristotle's theology was itself the fruit of a work heavily determined by the theological reform of radical Shiite thought? Starting from a Plotin I and Vulgate attributed to Aristotle, could the long version, or its Arabic equivalent, have been rewritten? Could the role of the word have been emphasized in a general movement of thought in which Ismailism played, to say the least, a stimulating role? I in other words, if Ismailism received the definitive structures of its theology from Plotinism between the 3rd 9th and 4th 10th centuries, is it not this reformed Ismailism which, in return, by virtue of mutual contributions, through exchanges we have no trace of, except for just a few conclusive effects in a few texts, could have filtered the Plotinian contribution and determined its appearance according to its own ends? With Nasir Ekosrav, we see that the Greek sages are called upon to found the authentic doctrine of the One, and to be in harmony with the Ismaili Tawhid. 4. Procession and Genesis Thingness is the fact of substances, it is the distinctive feature of existence. They come into being I and the natural world through the effect of a genesis. Sejastani carefully distinguishes between procession, which only applies to eternally originated beings, the I intelligence, the soul, and genesis, which is the process of engendering existence that are composed of matter and form. But it must be remarked that the Greek concept of protos, procession, is itself transformed. Properly speaking, the intel eligence does not proceed from the one, but is originated by the unsayable and free act of the word, that is to say, the imperative. The su el, in turn, is originated by the mediation of the I intelligence. There is a procession of the soul starting with I intel eligence because a mediation exists between them, but it is only through a convenience of language that we say there is a procession of their pairing. Nothing could be effused from the one other than the imperative, the originating act itself. As for Genesis, the Greek Genesis, its equivalent in Arabic is certainly the term a slash talid. Sejastani performs an audacious exegesis of the Quranic verse which denies that God had a son or that he himself had been engendered, a verse which is a refutation of Christian dogma. By transposing this refusal of the Tald and Genesis onto the level of ontological speculation, Sejastani demonstrates that the one could not belong to the universe of substances, where everything derives from a Genesis. Furthermore, because it is not originated, being itself the originator, the one escapes the two types of engendering that are possible for the existent. It follows that being and essence are excluded from it as well, cheese and chise, the fact of being and essentiality, the characteristic of existing things, the thing understood as the act of existing and thingness, or even as essence. Point 21. Let us ponder the significance of this exclusion, of this Ismaili refusal, the one is not, and we must remove from it that which institutes beings in their being. Is this to say that the one is not real? Not in the least. The one is real because it is not. 
or, better put, it is the real by virtue of that which deprives it of essence and existence. We will see that everything which exists is a moment of the intelligible or an expression of the I intelligence, which encompasses the totality of realities, the perfect and complete set of essences. These multiple beings are unified by the I intelligence, which is itself originated by the real of the one, in this case, the originated one, and no longer the originating one. But this one, which achieves the primordial origination of the intelligence, is not. Being begins there where the first originated thing surges forth I into being. In this way, to surge forth into being and to surge forth as being are one and the same origination. Out of the one, which is nothing, and does not exist, being itself comes to be in the form of the universal reality of beings, that is to say, being and its intelligible manifestation I and the intelligence. This whole of reality is everything, all beings, but it is also the place where being exits from the unsayable, where it was in no way in supply of itself, where it was not in potential. Being comes to be in the very movement wherein beings are originated by the one which is not. The one is prior to being. But it is, just as well, totally immanent in the being it originates. If it transcended the I intelligible being of that which it first originated, then it would be another being. The one is not another being, it is not the being of beings which would be other than the beings whose being it is if n est pa i et de i atent ki si right otra k slash atent don't if est i et ver. The one is other than the being of beings. Thus, it is not localizable with respect to being or beings, but the one is rather the unbound force of that which is not bound by being, within the originated which depends upon its non-existent origination instauration non-atent. Its result is necessity, its root is liberty. Universal reality, the I intelligible universe, therefore depends upon the inexistence of the one. It is because of this inexistence, not sutured by the one, but liberated I and being by the inexistence of the one. Totality is always a deterioration, a weaker expression of the liberty of the one, a manifestation in which the one, succumbing to being I in order to effuse it, constrains itself to the translation of the unsayable, that is, the universal. But the ordered set of the multiple moments of the I intelligence, of reality, is unified by that which resists all unification, by that which only allows itself to say one with the immediate stipulation of not existing, of not being seized by the register of being. This must be insisted upon, the one is the foundation of reality, but if it is ontologically prior to being, and if it modifies all being with its originative liberty, then it is not present to the beings that it originates. Just as it does not transcend beings, neither is it the quiet presence of being or the scintillating origin of everything. Being alone is capable of residing, of lying near itself, in the presence to self of that which is. In the one, there is not enough being for a presence to take place. Intelligibly universal reality depends on the absence of any place, on the absence of the one, of that which is able to hear itself, it depends on the one as absence, the absent one, the absence of the one. But in every hypothesis, the absence of the one is not merely the other side of its presence. For the Ismaili, this void at the heart of being, which supports the eternal origination, is more real than the reality that it originates. Their ontology, it seems to me, borrows the instruments necessary for thinking the opposition between the real and being from Plotinism. It is within the mutual play of these two poles that the fate of man and the necessity of the messianic event is going to have to be thought. It would therefore not be fitting to compare the reality of the intelligible, which is the most eminent there is, which includes within itself everything that can lay claim to reality, and the real of the one. This real is not more eminently real than the I intelligence. Intelligible reality is, on the contrary, reality par excellence, the unique reality, the unifying sum of all realities. I in this way it is real, absolutely real, being. Conversely, the one is not absolutely real, it is even more so not the absolute of the real, it affirms the real, through which the absolutely real is originated. This real, prior to reality, 
is that through which reality is endowed with its necessity at the moment it is originated in being. I and the origination of reality, the one which is not bestows the mark of it is so up on that which is. It is the cause of existentiation, not I in such a manner that being anticipates what comes to exist, but in that the existence originated by the one derives from the non-being of the one. This existence nullifies the unsayable by passing to the act. This origination is the real of the one. This real is independence, it is liberty on two accounts. The one is free in itself, and it is liberty in the act of origination. It is free in the real that constitutes it and in the operation actualized by this real, for there is no ontological difference between its real and the originating operation. The one is the liberty of being, a liberty which is real because it does not exist, because it does not proceed from the one in the manner of that which exists. Liberty does not proceed from the one, but it is the one I and so far as it is pure origination. Everything that will proceed from this liberty will come into its own proper necessity of being, and will freely express the one of super-essential and super-existent liberty. In order for this originary liberty to constitute the one, several degrees at the very heart of unity must be carefully de-distinguished from one another. Thus, we turn here to the Neoplatonic gradation of the pure one, the one which is, and the multiple one. This gradation corresponds to the first three hypotheses of Plato's Parmenids. It is clearly present in Ismaili thought, as is borne witness to in the text we would now like to analyze, it is a short chapter of uniting the TWO wisdom's lever reunison slash es du sages, a text by the great philosopher Nasir Ekos Rav.22 as in the rest of the book, Nasir Ekos Rav wishes to show the convergence between Quranic ontology and the legacy of Greek wisdom. He places the question of the one under the authority of Pythagoras, the master of the arithmetic eons. Pythagoras held, essentially, that the formation of the world is subject to numbers. The numerical hierarchy GIVES the law of the sequences proper to existence. Point 23. This Pythagorean reference is both classical and important. I and truth, it signifies that Platonism is the true ontology since it is certainly the doctrine of the one and the multiple elaborated by Platonism that we find attributed to Pythagoras here. But it is not unimportant that it is attributed to a mathematician, to the mathematician P.A.R. Excellence. Nasir Ekos Ra probably intends to establish a homology between existence and numbers, not insofar as numbers are the hidden essences of things, this is certain nly the case, and we can find numbers, in order, at the heart of the G are a dual realities of universes, but primarily insofar as being best expresses itself in mathematical language. The truth of being is a matter for the mathema.24. Let us examine, first and foremost, the cardinal thesis of Nasir Ekos Rav, the origination of the universe in being comes from the 125. Origination here is Abtida. It is not the act which engenders being and bestows up on it a presentation i n beings, but rather the fact of the universe being originated, being produced in existence. It is the universe's essential property of possessing being, or of having come into being. The universe, a slash m, owes this property to the one. Thus, the one is, prior to being, the g iver of being and the cause of the existent. It is precisely to justify this point that the Platonic schema MUST make use of the numerical chain. The origination of the universe in being is the adduction of the multiple starting from the one, because universal reality is characterized as such primarily by the way it is put into the multiple, mutakathar in this reality, matter represents pure I and consistency, while the limit res ULTS from the way the forms submit the inconsistency of this indefinitely divisible matter to unity. MUL typicities are the points of tangency between the one and the pure multiple. But if it is true that the universe avoids slipping I into inconsistency due to the incidence of the one in the form of each species and each individual, then it is no less true that this formal unity is a determination, or even a limitation. In a first sense, consequently, the one causes the universe to pass into existence because it determines the forms, 
where each form is an expression of the one that puts a limit on the I and consistent proliferation of the material multiple. The forms are hierarchized, and this hierarchy finds its reason in the numerical order of the expressions of the one. Conversely, it will be no less true that the one existence its existence yea the world, un universal reality insofar as it is universal, which is to say insofar as it rightfully exceeds all limits. Certainly, the universe is physically closed. It closes up the space contained in the sphere of spheres. But it is mathematically indefinite, l-i-k-e the numerical chi n. At this precise point, we are confronted with a problem whose solution I do not see as being simple or univocal, does it suffice to say that ancient and medieval physics did not accept the infinite in actuality, that they always respected a certain image of the closed world, in order to prohibit the infinite from exercising its power within the models that authorize the representation of physical realities, 26 or, put differently, does it suffice to recall that ancient mathematics does not accept the idea of an infinite numerical set I n actuality, and does not define the number by the infinite, I in order to then conclude that the ontology relying on a theory of numbers misrecognized the power of the INFINI. Certain distinctions should, without a doubt, be respected. On the one hand, it is accurate to say that each number is a limit, that the one is that which determines, and that the number is the finishing stitch on the proliferation of the multiple. It is not the zero that engenders the series of numbers, but the one. The number, therefore, is not conceived of as bg ining with the term designating the empty set, but always as the reflection of a certain plentitude. It would not, however, be completely accurate to understand the one simply in the role of a limit. We must consider that the one situated at the origin of the multiple chain suffers from an internal size Zion. It does not stop assuming the function of a limit at all levels of n numerical concatenation, a finishing stitch put on the multiple, but it also engenders the multiple as multiple. It is indeed the one that is responsible for the fact that the chain is interminable, that numbers can always be engendered, up to the very point of the inconsistency of matter. This rebellious inconsistency within form is itself the ultimate effect of the power of the one. Nowhere is this power exercised with more mastery than at the heart of the inconsistent multiple, where, nevertheless, no trace of the one is any longer discernible. The one is the infinite power of engendering the multiple, which is given adequate representation and expression only in inconsistency and the void. How can it be denied that there is something in this ontological perspective that exceeds the strict definition of the one as limit, as unifying one? How can it not be seen, consequently, that there is something like a theory of the zero in the Platonic tradition of the one, which is ignorant of itself? In our opinion, Nasir Ekos Rav is thinking through the two functions of the one that are thus paradoxically linked, he is trying to think them together, by hierarchizing three concepts of the one that uphold, respectively, I and consistency, the power to engender, and the power to unify. The paradoxical nature of the one manifests itself, first of all, in the asymmetry of relations between the one and the numbers. In Nasir Ekos Rav, this asymmetry is expressed in the vocabulary of liberty. This shows its importance for us. The one is lacking and monk no number, it is sufficient, it is free. If the numbers did not exist, this would in no way prevent the one from existing, whereas no number would have come into being if the one did not exist. Point twenty seven the I N finite power of the one is compensated by the inexistence of the pure MUL tipple, or rather, the identity between non-being and the pure MUL tipple. The two poles toward which the existent tends, themselves external to the system of being, are thus nothingness through the excess of the one, the one is not a number, it is not linked to the chain, and nothingness through the inconsistency of the pure multiple, the numbers linked by the chain are not the one. Stll, the word nothingness is deceptive. This double polarity is that of the creator and the universe, of originative liberty and originated multiplicity. Origination, then, will be the adduction of realities in being, through which the two positions of absolute solitude will be abandoned, the one outside of the numbers, the numbers outside of the one, 
this is unification, or the formation of the chain. The one is conceivable in its non-connection with the chain of numbers. On the other hand, the inconsistency that dooms the multiple to non-being is the material of unifying origination, the chain of numbers is actually engendered and the world really exists. Therefore, a new concept must be supposed in the one, that of the one connected to the numbers. Nasir Ikosrav, citing someone he calls Pythagoras, says that this one is the cause of the numbers. The universe is numbered, and it is a substance which is indefinitely divisible into parts, mutages. This divisibility is the implication of the multiple in the one. Consequently, the numbered universe's adduction in being is the production of the multiple by the one, 146. Let us return to the question of the nature of the one. That it is not a number like the others, that it is not even a number, caught I and the regime of being and beings, this is what is attested to I and its originary position, if one imagines another arig I and prior to the one, it must still be thought of as the one. On the other hand, the one cannot be divided and cannot be weakened in the way that numbers can be divided. This indivisibility of the one into diverse parts is the condition of its real power. It engenders a divisible multiplicity because it is itself indivisible. I in another way, this shows that it is not linked to the chain it engenders, and that it is not connected to the numbers, all of which nevertheless express, to some degree, the power of the one. Nasir Ikos Rav does not say, then, that the one is, or even that it possesses a being which is superior to all representation. He tells us that the one only holds up in the real, that it is the real, Qaimast, 14-15. The one is not existent, Maoyodi, it is not existence, Wojod, but it is subsistent, Chuim, or more rigorously, it persists outside of the unreal and affirms itself as the pure real. The universe of being does not begin with the one, which is real, but fro m the one, whose infinite power subsists outside of being in such a way that being will express it in the infinitely divisible effusion of the multiple. The two concepts of the one that have already been elucidated are, respectively, the concept of the real free from any connections, whose only representation is I n inconsistent matter, and the concept of the one connected to the numbers, whose representation is the universal chain of numbers concentrated in the unifying one. This duality is expressed by Nasir Ikosrav in the FOLLOing pair of concepts, there is unity, Wahedat, and the one, Wahid. In Persian, this pair is, Yeki, Yeki Yamutakathar, which corresponds exactly to the one and the multiple one, 147. Let us consider the second concept of the one, that of the one connected to the multiple chain of numbers. We can no longer think it in dependently from this jot in. There is no subsistence outside of the relation to that which it unifies and engenders. The one does not possess any real. It is, then, no longer the real. To present this connection between the one and the multiple to his reader, Nasir Ikos Rav is constrained by his philosophical tradition to make use of a very questionable model, the pair formed by essence and its manifestation. Unity, according to this concept of the one, is henceforth connected to the multiple one. Unity, thus, is by way of the multiple one, just as the multiple one is by way of unity, they need each other as black needs the essence of blackness, as soft needs the essence of softness. No softness without its manifestation in that which is soft, no blackness outside that which is black, but conversely, nothing is soft but by participation in the essence of softness. The multiple one is the universal participation in unity. This is the universe of unified reality, because it is the universe of participation. The chosen model has the advantage, at least, of making us understand how participation, the major difficulty of Platonism, only finds a solution on the level of the multiple one, 147. The Fu LL procession is set forth in the FOLLOing way, real unity, the one or multiple unity, multiplicity, and the multiple. Nasir Ikos Rav calls origination, Ibda, the adduction of the emuldipal in being, through the mediation of multiplicity. 
The origin of this origination is the Mabdi, the originator, the one who is the cause of the multiple one, one five. The result of the primordial origination is the first being, hast e a wa. This does not translate to, the first being atent. It is rather a matter of that which is originarily produced i n being, o f that which i s, in the same movement, t h e i integral s u m o f beings, and the being o f beings, hast. In its turn, this phi r s t originated being, the i intelligence, engenders the universal soul. The intelligence is the dyad, since it is the one which is, the one manifested in being, connected to being. But prior to this multiple one or one which is, we find the originator, the one of the origination. Thus, to conclude, the various concepts of the one are declined in the folloing manner. First of all, there is the one in its pure real, yet fiamad, superior to unity itself. Nasir Ekos Rav opposes this real of the one to the unity connected to the multiple. But in the very interior of the non-connected one, he distinguishes more delicately still between the real of the one and the unity of the one. The pure one and unity thus constitute two d distinct concepts, to which origination and primordial origination thereby correspond. Origination is no longer the connection to the multiple, but the engendering of the one that will be connected to the multiple, and from which the multiple one will proceed. Therefore, there is a third concept of the one, the one of origination. The pure one is the originator of unity, which excludes the possibility that it could engender the chain of multiples or unify it. It is the real in its pure independence. Unity, originated by the pure one, engenders the one connected to the multiple, but which is not itself the multiple one. Finally, the one connected to the multiple engenders the multiple one, which is to say the dyad. The dyad, the universal intel intelligence, engenders the three, the universal soul, which engenders the four, the universal matter. We are saying here that the one is not itself the multiple one, although it is the originated one. On this point, Nasir Ekos Rav's text is not clear. On the one hand, it certainly asserts the anteriority of the one and its superiority, even though it is the origin of numbers, with respect to the chain that truly begins with the two, the dyad of the I intelligence. But on the other hand, one could defend the thesis that this chain includes the first originated term, the superior limit of origination, which can only be the one connected to the numbers. It is in this sense that the one which is already sees duality appear within itself, 148 to 149. But let us remember the essential point, which is the tripartition of the concepts of the one. The pure one, absolutely real and non-connected, is a hot in Arabic. Unity, or origination, is wadat, and the one that enters into connection is wahid. Origination expresses the paradoxical nature of the one, it unifies the multiple, but it is rebellious to any connection to the multiple, it imposes the one upon the pure multiple, but it is beyond any unification and it liberates the infinite power of the real within each determined form. Reality becomes coherent through this origination, but it is also the superior power through which the right of the real, the unsettling inconsistency of origination, can establish itself at the heart of this same reality. Unity, Wadat, divides the one, Ahad, by the one, Wahid, all while ensuring the origination of the multiple one. Beyond the one there is the real one, the pure one, which is the subject of no procession, the factor of no determination, but is the unsayable liberty itself. This deduction can help clarify the following reading of Sijastani's first chapter. This chapter is presented, at its base, as a commentary on the first hypothesis of the Parmenids, what will there be of the one, if the one is one? Let us recall the consequences that the Platonic dialogue draws from the examination of this hypothesis. If the one must be one, it will not be a whole, it will be figureless, it will be nowhere, it will not be subject to movement, neither immobile nor moved, it will be neither identical to itself nor different from itself, neither similar nor dissimilar, neither equal nor unequal, it will not be within time, in short, 
it will in no way participate I in being and it will be absolutely unsayable. Point 28. These consequences are presented extremely precisely in investigations 2 to 7, the absence of figure and the exclusion of totality are demonstrated, in the second investigation, through to the negation of the limit. Point 29. The fourth investigation excludes place, the fifth forbids time, and the sixth refutes being. The seventh investigation demonstrates that the negation of all attributes must redouble the negation of this negation, the creator is non-existent, a non-thing, and not non-existent, and so on. Sijastani holds the line separating the agnosticism, tatil, that removes any real from God, and which hypostasizes it in that figure, which is tll the nothingness of all things, from the assimilationism, tashbi that confuses God with one existing R-E-A-L-I-T-I or another. Indeed, we find here the Platonic approach which desires that the one be neither identical nor non-identical with itself. The third investigation plays a special role. It first deduces that the one possesses no attributes, by virtue of not being a substantial being. Sijastani does not renounce the classical problem of divine attributes and their relationship with divine essence. Divine attributes do indeed exist, but in order that they might exist they must express the qualification of created being. And yet this created being, immediately originated by the principle, is none other than the intelligence, or first substance. Thus, he is permitted to speak about divine attributes and to say that they exist, on the condition that he makes them the predicates of the first manifestation of the principle in being. But this leads us to shift the emphasis of the problem of the relationship between the divine essence and its attributes. The problem loses all meaning on the level of the one, but it gains all of its meaning on the level of primary DILI originated being. The key to this theoretical procedure is indeed the concept of origination. The principle, the one as the subject of origination, is al mabdi in Arabic, the originator. This is the only suitable name, for it does not designate any particular essence of the one, but rather the operative power of which this one is eternally the agent. The originator of being possesses no form that could be known. It is highly significant that Ismaeli thought tightly co and joins these two themes which would seem to a priori excludio ne another, the originator is distinguished from all existence and from being itself because the originator is free of any form. But on the other hand, insofar as it is free from possessing a form and deprived of all essence, the originator can concentrate its real into the pure giving of forms, into the originative operation. This is the manner in which Nasir Ekos Rav reasons, everything that is known, all reality, possesses a certain form, since knowledge is defined by the representation of forms in the soul, Tazawari Nafs. An existing reality that would possess no form would be unknowable, yet form, being, and reality are intimately bound together. This shows that reality requires a giver of forms, a confirmator, musawir, that will itself be free of any form. I in effect, if the confirmator itself possessed a form, it in turn would need a confirmator, and so on, ad infinitum. If it is necessary for an ultimate confier matter to exist, then it must be deprived of form and unknowable. The first cause of all real formations is rebellious to knowledge. 30 The primordial one is thus quite without essence, without form, without thingness. Confirmation of this does not derive from the negative approach, an apophatic approach to the one. It is not only in its unsayable solitude that the one repels form and distinction it is also in its originative activity. Essentially, we are understanding the one here as the originator. If it is without form, then it is certainly necessary that its operation, origination, ibda, should have no connection with originated reality. No connection, no community of essence, is produced between what is formed and knowable and the confier matter itself, between the multiple one and the pure one. I indeed, this is why we previously distinguished three different concepts of the one. The pure one insists in its real, outside of all thingness, this solitude expresses itself in the unity which is capable of originating the universe of forms, outside of any connection. And the connected one will, 
in turn, express this primordial origination of being through the pure one, which is paradoxically free of any link to that which it originates. In this way, the pure one has no other property than this totally free operation of origination, from which follows the existentiation of forms. It is inferred from this that the primordial origination of reality takes place without mediation, Mayanji. Only the realities already originated in being, the Su L, the I intelligence, and the body, are linked and engendered by the mediation of one another. By being, properly speaking, nothing, the real of the one cannot be submitted to this generative law. Origination is not the procession or emanation of realities, with the one FOLLOing from the others, and all FOLLOing from the first reality of the universal I intelligence. Origination is the surging forth of REALIT though the immediate operation of the real of the one, it is the imperative which causes being to surge forth as the atemporal event of itself.31. The originator is recognized through the I intelligence because it is the effect of its origination, and because the attestation of the unique is, for the I intelligence, the attestation of primordial origination. This origination is what causes the universal reality to be, insofar as it will express the one. On this topic, let us cite a long note by Henry Corbin. Never lose sight of the fact that the mob, the principle, the originator of being, is not the first being. It remains super being, hyperagios, beyond being and non being, or rather, beyond non being and non non being. The first being is essentially the made to be fate edra, hast card eh. The mob cannot be a being, it is the to make to be fair edra, hast carden. Hence, the first being atent is the first I intelligence, the primordial originated, protoctistos, the first of the cherubim. That which the philosophers call a slash hacked a slash a wall would therefore be on the level of this first being. The double negativity produces a metaphysical gap that must be accounted for if one confronts the cosmogonic schema of the philosophers and that of the Ismaili Theosophs.32. We were saying earlier that primer dial origination is not procession. In truth, the difference between them will be accentuated by the theoreticians of the reformed Ismailism of Alamoti, due to the exaltation of the functions of the divine imperative. But in Sijistani, things are less clear. I and so far as it is the to make to be, the principle is not de-istinguished from the imperative and from origination because it is the one, the generative center of all existence, and it is so directly, without mediation, or rather through the mediation of the two substances of the I intelligence and the Su L. We could say that T high S principally is on the one hand imparticipable, and on the other hand that it is the imperative or divine speech typifying this imparticipability. Origination, meanwhile, is the monadizing activity that gives its infinite power to the I intelligence. As Proclus writes, I and commenting on the analogy between the good and the sun in the Republic, F or as we refer the sensible emulditude to a monad uncoordinated with sensibles, and we think that through this monad the multitude of sensibles derives its existence, so it is necessary to refer the intelligible multitude to another cause which is not conumerated with intelligibles, and from which they are allotted their being and their divine existence. 33. V. The logical timi of the attestation of the one. The originative principle is what the I intelligence knows through its very act of being, in such a manner that the knowledge it possesses, through the very act of its being, of the principle that originates it is the knowledge of the ipsiety of that principle. Thus, it is not the case that there is neither existent ipsiety, nor inexistent ipsiety, outside of that which is revealed to the intelligence through its very act of being 34. Let us come back to the structure of logical time implied by why this text. What is it that constitutes the ipsiety of the one, its effective real? It is not, we know, some essence which would belong to it, independently of all of the other essences. In order for the one to adopt an IP sati, an act must take place. The effect of the act constituting the IP sati of the one is to impose the one UP on the real, and to make the one into this real prior to all reality, through which that same reality will be brought into existence. The effect of the intelligible act, which turns out to be the IP sati of the one, 
is indeed to consecrate the ontological priority of the One. But this act is not the doing of the One. It is an act of knowledge, or better put, of authentic attestation, and consequently it can only foll out from the truth operation WHICH constitutes the being of the first I intelligence. And yet, this I intelligence is right foll why you understood as subsequent to the one, since it effuses the one without mediation. I and so far as it is absolutely unsayable and deprived of phi p sati, in the way in which it is deprived of all essence, the one is this real which by no means accedes to being, even by way of the truth. It possesses nothing that could identify it. In order to accede to the truth of its unsayable ipsiety, that is, in order that it be accessible to unknowing incanescence 35, within the completely negative approach which determines, at the very least, the truth of its real, it is necessary for the act of the intelligence's cognition to take place. This act is itself paradoxical, since it does not recognize the positive essence of the one, which possesses no essence at all, but it experiences the extra-essential real of the one. Thus, when it is recognized as truth, the real of the one is always already the effect of an act, as a very first determination. It might seem to be a vicious circle, the one would proceed from the I intelligence, which would proceed from the one. But this circle cannot be closed. The one, beyond its own truth, forbids such a closure. The figure representing the truth, as in the case of the great thinkers of Hellenic Neoplatonism, will very appropriately be the spiral. Originated from the point of the UN sayable by the pure act which effuses the real of the one, the first intelligence is converted to the one though an act of knowing which truly posits the ipsiety of the one. But between the pure unsayable and the real one that is henceforth a stab li shed, between the pure one and the real unity of this one, there is a distance which is itself unsayable, the distance that separates that which refuses any act from that which is already seized by an act in its very refusal, which is nevertheless established even if only as a pure constituting. The one is known as constituting, it is participated in as imparticipable. Here we have well in hand the illustration of the paradoxical nature of the one. The one must be real so that the I intelligence may proceed from it, but it is from the I intelligence that the one receives the attestation of its unsayable truth. This dehiscence of the one, which is the operation of its primordial origination, is immediately originated. The act by which the I intelligence knows the unsayable in no way plugs up this division, but on the contrary it expresses it and reproduces its mirror image. This reproductive structure in mirror image is essential to isma elism. Let us retie n, for the moment, that what is being thought here will never be the quiet presence of being, but rather the anticipatory division of the one. This mirroring effect cannot, in our, opinion, be interpreted I in any other way than the following, the whole of intelligible reality affirms the real of the one and manifests its own particular exigency of the paradoxical one. As for the one, it always anticipates that attestation up on which it nevertheless logically depends. This is why it is able to see the di vision we are di discussing as anticipating its unitude, it is submitted to the power of the two. The one owes the naming of its truth to an intellective operation, which is the fact of the first intelligence, the first to effuse the one. Simply to say the one is to be situated downstream from the one, as if the paradoxical one were scanning the real and marking reality with its touch, when this reality begins to be deployed on the level of the universal intelligence, and only there. Conversely, the emergence of all R-E-A-L-I-T provokes, at the moment of its coming into being, this touch of the real, which it will then attest to in its own act of existing. The touch of an inconceivable and unverifiable real, beyond all naming, upstream or downstream from itself. Naming will always be inadequate to the one, because it is naming. Naming always comes belatedly apreku. But with the one, we can just as well say that all naming is adequate, because it is its own naming. The one only exists, then, to the extent that it is named by the first intel eligence, and the naming adheres to the form of concrete reality wherein the one scans and comes to leave its mark. Thus, 
it certainly seems to us that Sijistani, and the whole of Ismaili thought along with him, makes a clear distinction between the real and reality, this distinction will be taken up again with vigor by Nazaruddin Tosi and the theologians of Alamoti. The real is typified by the paradoxical one, whereas reality is organized on the level of the being and non-being that structure the forms of the existent in accordance with the first eye intelligence, from which the hierarchy of universes will proceed. The real is purely causative, it causes intelligible reality to exist. Reality receives this touch of the real from the one, which will have two I interdependent and contradictory effects, on the one hand, the unity that engenders order and coherence, the pyramid of the species, the regularity of cosmic movements, and the numbers that determine all things, from personal destiny to the cycles of prophecy, on the other hand, the one effect slash EFFET on that creates the event of the resurrection, that exceeds any numerical chain and subjects the coherence of reality to the experience of a real ally birdie, in other words, it transfers reality onto the imperative. TRA translated by Michael Stanish Anal Chemical Ecstasy in Remembrance of the Three Magi Iranian films are an exotic experience for audiences accustomed to Hollywood-dominated cinema. Not JUST for obvious reasons, but because the obvious, the foreign locations, customs, and people, everything we actually see on screen, is produced by a different distribution of the visible and the I invisible and an alien logic of the look. One of the most spectacular heralds of Iran's 1978-1979 Islamic Revolution was the torching of spectacle. Movie theaters, I and one horrific case, with the audience still in it, were set on fire and incinerated by fundamentalists. Fittingly, in this respect, Komei and I spoke, in his first public appearance as Iran's new leader, not only of his intent to restore the authority of the mullahs and to purge the country of all foreign influences, eastern as well as western, he also broached the question of cinema directly. As might be expected, he vehemently denounced the cinema of that vile traitor, the ousted Shah, as a center of vice, but he refrained from banning cinema outright as a wicked modern invention. 4. Khomeini Rico GNized immediately the value of cinema, the possibilities for mobilizing it in the service of his grand scheme to re-educate the people in the ways of Islam. Post-revolutionary IRN witnessed, then, not the tabooing, but the flourishing of a heavily subsidized and officially promoted cinema, though one strictly regulated by the M Ministry of Culture and Islamic Guidance, which explicitly forbade the smallest signs of foreign eye influence, such as the wearing of ties, the smoking of cigarettes, and the DRIN king of alcohol, and so on, and, more importantly and more globally, any infraction of the Islamic system of hijab. In its strictest sense, hijab is a veil or cloth covering used to obscure women from the sight of men to whom they are not related, in the widest sense, it is the entire system of modesty that demands the concealment of even the contour of a woman's body, which is always in danger of being revealed by her gestures and movements. Indeed, hijab seems to be motivated by the belief that there is something about women that can never be covered up enough, that surreptitiously bears itself even beneath her clothing. Thus, the precautionary task of VLING is buttressed by architectural design and rigid social protocols that further protect women from exposing themselves and men from being exposed to the sight of them. The impact of hedge of regulations on cinema was massive.24. It was not just the figure and movement of the woman that required veiling, but also the look directed at her. Strictures against the eros of the unrelated meant that not even religiously sanctioned forms of erotic engagement between men and women could be represented, since filming made women vulnerable to the extradigitic look of the director, crew, and, of course, the audience. Thus, the look of desire around which Hollywood-dominated cinema is plotted had to be forsaken, along with the well-established L.I. Shed system of relaying that look through an alternating pattern of shots and countershots and the telling I insertion of psychologically motivated close-ups. Besides restricting narrative situations and tabooing the most common style of editing, the system of modesty also obliged any filmmaker committed to maintaining a modicum of realism to shoot outdoors. Although, in real L.I. Fay, 
IR on I and women need not and do not wear headscarves at home, in cinematic interiors they were forced to don them because of the presence, once a guy n, of the extra look which exposed them to the view of unrelated men. But incongruous images of headscarves in scenes of family intimacy were more than unrealistic, they were oftentimes risible, and filmmakers thus tended to avoid domestic scenes as much as possible. Ult Mattelli, then, it was I N Terriority that was the most significant cinematic casualty of Hejab. Iranian cinema came to be composed only of exterior shots, whether I N T H E form of actual spatial exteriors, T H E improbable abundance O F rural landscapes and city streets, hallmarks of Iranian cinema, or in the form of virtual exteriors, interior domestic spaces in which women remain veiled and secluded from desire outside the reach of any affectionate or passionate caress. The challenge facing all IR on I and filmmakers, then, is to make credible and compelling films under this condition, namely, the censorship of interiority, the taboo of intimacy. Revelations of American torture of Iraqi prisoners at Abu Ghraib brought to LIGHT an abusive reaction to the Islamic system of modesty. It turns out that the Arab mind, a book first published in 1973 and reprinted only a few months prior to the U.S. Invasion of Iraq, got into the hands of pro-war Washington conservatives and became, in the words of one academic, the Bible of the neocons on Arab behavior. Of SPECL interest to these conservatives was a chapter on Arabs and sex, which argued that the segregation of the sexes, the veiling of women and all the other minute rules that govern and restrict contact between men and women, have the effect of making sex a prime mental preoccupation in the Arab world 3. It was this sort of speculation that was responsible for planting in the heads of calculating conservatives the idea that shame would be the most effective device for breaking down Iraqi prisoners psychologically. According to a report I and the new Wyoriker, two themes emerged as talking points in the Kopjek. Discussions of the strategists, 1, Arabs only understand force, and, 2, the biggest weakness of Arabs is shame and humiliation. I and brief, shaming was chosen as the method of torture precisely because the torturers believed that Arab culture made the prisoners particularly vulnerable to it. This belief was nourished on the banquet of that crude and, one would have thought, thoroughly discredited sociological division of the world into guilt cultures and shame cultures. The distinction classifies guilt as an affect characteristic of advanced cultures, whose members have graduated to the stage where they possess an internal principle of morality, and shame as a primitive effect characteristic of cultures forced to rely, for want of such a principle, on the approving or disapproving gaze of other people to monitor morality. I will focalize my criticisms by offering my own curt and contrary thesis, the affects of shame and guilt are improperly used to define kinds of cultures, what they define, rather, are different relations to one's culture. I use culture here to refer to the form of life we I inherit at birth, not our biological birth, but our birth I into language, all those things, family, race, ethnicity, sex, we do not choose but which choose us, the entire past that precedes us and marks our belatedness. The manner in which we assume this inheritance, and the way we understand what it means to keep faith with it, are, I will argue, what distinguish shame from guilt. Distancing herself from the dubious correlation of affects with stages of cultural and moral development, Eve Sedgwick offers an alternative to the neoconservative view of shame as she reflects on her own experience of it in the aftermath of another violent confrontation between America and Islam, the attack of September 1st 1. Sedgwick tells us that she was suddenly overcome by shame whenever she happened, post 9-11, to catch a glimpse of the void that occupied the site where the TW in TO wears once stood. Point four. this example is striking in its uncommonness, for the circumstances that give rise to her shame are not the sort one usually associates with it. This is, however, Sedgwick's point, shame is not occasioned, as is usually thought, by prohibition or repression, by a look of condemnation or disapproval. It is a response, rather, 
to a rupturing of the comforting circuit of recognition and social exchange that ordinarily defines us. The absence of the T.O. wares, the demo elation of the edifices that stood as Eichel 1s of the reinforced invulnerability of the U.S. and as landmarks by which new workers used to orient themselves in the city, signal the point of a rupture. Witnessing their absence, Sedgwick experiences a loss of familiar coordinates, a fundamental disorientation. It is in this context that she describes the blush of shame as the betraying blazon of a ruptured narcissistic circuit. 5. Shame always res ULTS from a sneak attack, an upsetting of expectations that wounds ego identity. Yet what is odd is that this wound is not accompanied by a simple feeling of isolation, of being separated from society. This is the second important point. Sedgwick describes the paradox of shame as a simultaneous movement toward individuation and toward uncontrollable relationality, or social contagion. Point six that is, alongside the feeling of a disconcerting and often searing self awareness, shame is marked by a kind of group sentiment, a feeling of solidarity with others. I in an effort to I interpret this often remarked paradox, Sedgwick insists that the shame she felt after September 1st one was not for herself, but for the missing T.O. wares. That is, she I interprets her social s element as a feeling of shame for or on behalf of something other than herself. But this is a mistake, for it G.I.V.E.S. shame an object, here, the destroyed T.O. wares. Strictly speaking, however, the symptom shame for is a solecism, one feels shame neither for oneself nor for others. Shame is intransitive, it has no object in the ordinary sense. To experience it is to experience oneself as subject, not as a degraded or despised object. I am not ashamed of myself, I am the shame I feel. Giorgio Agamben makes this point clearly when he designates shame as the proper emotive tonality of subjectivity and as the fundamental sentiment of being a subject. 7. And indeed, indeed, Sedgwick herself points in this direction when she describes shame as the sentiment that attaches to and sharpens the sense of who one is, noting, and this is a crucial qualifier, that this sentiment of self also consists of a feeling of not being integrated with who we are. BL and shame one encounters oneself outside the self, engaged in society. Let us put aside for the moment this inquiry into how we in the U.S. understand or misunderstand shame and look at it from the other side. Turning back to the Islamic system of modesty, let us take a closer look at the Phi LMS of Abbas Kiarostami, one of the most important and best known directors to make films under this system. What gives the neoconservative association of shame and hedge of its legs, of course, is the fact that both involve veiling. In the modesty system, as with shame, a curtain is always drawn, looks averted, heads bowed. On first approach, it would seem that no director is more in tune with the hedge of system than Kiarostami, for his is a cinema of respectful reserve and restraint. This reserve is expressed most emblematically in his preference for what can be described as discreet long shots. Especially in moments of dramatic eye intimacy, a skittish suitor's approach to the girl he loves, the meeting between a man who impersonates another and the man he impersonates, Kiarostami's camera tends to hold back, to separate itself from the action by inserting a distance between itself and the scene and refusing to venture forward into the private space of the characters. So marked is the tactfulness of his camera that Kiarostami sometimes seems a reluctant filmmaker. INLIGHT of this overall filming strategy, one sequence from THE Wind will carry us, 1999, stands out as an aberration. Its protagonist, Behazid, a documentary Phi LM maker, has traveled to the Kur Dish village of Sayadara with his crew to film the ceremony of scarification stll practiced by mourning villagers after someone from the village dies. In the sequence in question, Behazid, biding his time as he awaits the imminent death of MRS. M. A. Lek, the village's oldest inhabitant, amuses himself by attempting to purchase some fresh milk from Zenob, a young village girl and the fiancé of a grave digger he has befriended. Hamid Dabashi, author of a book on Iranian cinema and normally a great admirer of Kiarostami, 
excoriates the director for the utter shamelessness of the sequence in which, in Dabish I's view, an Iranian woman's privacy and dignity are raped by a Boorish Iranian man, whose crime is all the more offensive for being paraded before the eyes of the world. Point nine. This is what Dabashi sees, Behazad descending into a Hidan, underground space, penetrating the darkness that protects a shy, unsophisticated village girl from violation, and aggressively trying to expose her, despite her obvious resistance, to the light of his lamp, his incautious look, his lies, and his sexual seduction. Anxiety and the inexpressible flavor of the absolute. Davishi's disdain for Behazad is heavily informed by HIS assessment of the protagonist as merely a Tehrani interloper adrift in rural Iran. This reading of Behazad's puzzled and sometimes combative disorientation. A disorientation he shares with many of Kiarostami's protagonists, who are almost all screen doubles of the director, is a common one geographically and culturally displaced, the modern urban sophisticate finds himself at a loss amidst rural peoples and traditions. One is obliged to note, however, that it is as much the peri-urban character of these rural areas as their pristine primitiveness, notably eye and decline, which catches Kiarostami's eye. Cell phone reception may not always be good in the villages, but new telecommunications systems are already being installed and the sight of random television antennae and satellite dishes atop thatched roofs assure us that no one in this part of the world need miss a simulcast soccer game. Regarding the traditional ceremony of scarification, for example, we learn in the film that it has been retrofitted, turned some time ago into a means of advancing oneself on the professional ladder. Whenever a relative of one of the bosses dies, the workers compete for the distinction of being the most loyal mourner, exhibiting their self-scarred faces and bodies in hopes of impressing their bosses and being rewarded with a raise or promotion. Incipient capitalism is here in bed with traditional culture, exploiting rather than eliminating it. This abbreviation of the distance between Behazad and the villagers does not exonerate his insensitive behavior, but it does suggest that we need to look elsewhere for a more accurate explanation of his disorientation, which goes deeper than the narrative alibi implies. Like other Kiarostami protagonists, Behazad behaves, I will argue, less like a rootless or deterritorialized modern man than like one who has been uprooted from his modern unrootedness to experience himself as riveted to a culture, a land, an ethnicity that remains inscrutable and that he tries to understand, without much success, by engaging in a quasi-ethnographic exploration of them. That modernity melted everything solid into air is an exaggerated claim, but it was expected that it would at least soften all that had once been solid to the consistency of clay, to render everything, including the subject, infinitely pliable. Contrary to expectations, however, supposedly malleable modern man found himself stuck to something, something tore him away from the free-flowing current of modern life. It is as if a drain hole were inexplicably opened in the modern world, lending our fleeting temporal existence. The inexpressible flavor of the absolute and giving rise to an acute feeling of being held fast a. Oh. That this riveting or re-territorialization is a confounding fact of modern life and no mere theoretical abstraction is evidenced most emphatically in all the stubborn outbreaks of national, ethnic, racial, and religious loyalties at a moment when such loyalties were expected to be dissolved by the deterritorializing thrust of global capitalism. We know that modernity was founded on a definitive break with the authority of our ancestors, who were no longer conceived as the ground for our actions or beliefs. Yet the undermining of their authority confronted us with another difficulty, it is as if in rendering our ancestors fallible we had transformed the past from the repository of their already accomplished deeds and discovered truths into a kind of holding cell of all that was unactualized and unthought. Suddenly it was the desire of our ancestors and thus the virtual past, the past that had never come to pass or had not yet been completed, that weighed disturbingly on us. The theorization of this unfinished past was focused I and the West around the concept of anxiety. If it seemed necessary to come to terms theoretically with anxiety, as it did to Kierkegaard, Freud, and Heidegger, among others, this is because this affect bore witness to an altered relation to a past now conceived as incompletely actualized. The assumption that modern man would become pliable, 
to market forces or even the force of his own will L, rested on the belief that the break with the authoritative past placed a zero in the denominator of our foundations, rooted us in, or attached us to, precisely nothing. But anxiety, the affect that arises in moments when radical breaks in the continuity of existence occur, belies this assumption, subjects find themselves, rather, to be not without roots, which is significantly different from feeling rooted in the past, to a race or ethnicity that is transparent to us. For what is affirmed in the experience of being riveted is nothing that can be objectified or personalized as one's own twelve it is, rather, the experience of being attached to a prehistoric other that it is impossible to forget, even if, in being without attributes, it offers us nothing to remember. Point 13. It has been observed that anxiety often overtakes revolutionaries immediately after revolutions, and seems not to free but to paralyze the hand that would draft a new constitution. What accounts for this curious phenomenon? While many psychoanalysts were insisting that anxiety was an effective response to loss or abandonment, Freud reasoned that this could not be so, since the proper response to loss would be mourning, not anxiety. Like Freud, the philosophers mentioned maintained that anxiety is not dependent on any actual condition, albeit one of loss, but rather on a condition that is not. Kierkegaard offers a clarifying illustration of the difference, the feeling of anxiety is not captured, he says, by the complaint, M. Y. God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? But rather by the entreaty, what you are going to do, do quickly, 14. Anxiety is not the experience of a loss that has taken place, it is the experience of some impending event, the anticipation of something that, WHILE connected to what precedes us, has not yet happened. It is the looming of the unknown, the awakening of a possibility whose contours are indiscernible. In other words, the break instituted by modernity did not render the past tota lly dead to us. It did not abandon us to a solitary present divorced from the past, but handed us over to a present that felt overpopulated, not, as is usually said, because of the increasing density of cities or our bombardment by an increasing number of new stimuli, but because we seem to be parasitized by an excess that refused to disclose itself to us. Anxiety is the feeling of being stuck to an excess that we can neither separate ourselves from nor lay claim to, a being tied to a past that, not having happened, cannot be shed. Our implication I and the past thus took on a different complexion. 4. While formerly a subject's ties to HER past were rigidly binding, they were experienced as external, as of the order of simple constraint. One had to submit to a destiny one did not elect and often experienced as you and just. But one could, like Job or the heroes and heroines of classical tragedies, RAIL against one's destiny, curse one's fate. With modernity this is no longer possible. The god of destiny is now dead and we no longer inherit the debts of our ancestors, but become that debt. We are unable to distance ourselves sufficiently from the desire of our ancestors to curse the fate it hands us, but must, as Lakin put it, bear as Jaurisance the injustice that horrifies us 1s. Jaurisance, roughly equi valent to fru ds libido, names our capacity to put ourselves forward and determine our destiny. Yet unlike libido, it characterizes this capacity as something we cannot possess and thus as horrifying g, a monstro us otherness that is not at our disposal, but must rather be suffered. If we think once more of the revolutionary whose hand is paralyzed by anxiety, we will see how closely Lakin's account hues to Freud's account of anxiety. If, stricken by anxiety, my hand goes on strike, refuses to write, this is because it has become saturated with libido, gr if by jaurisance. My hand behaves, Freud explains, like a maid who, having begun a love affair with her master, refuses to continue doing her household chores. Point 16 I and the moment of anxiety, one loses one's taste for or dinary, routinized life, cooking, cleaning, all practical I and tourists, it is this automatic way of LIFA that is paralyzed by anxiety. This analogy is, however, as Freud H. I. myself says, 
rather absurdity, insofar as it fails to account for the real situation of the maid, who, while torn away from her mundane duties, is now bound to a terrible, inscrutable master, her own libido, or potentiality. Elsewhere, Freud will dispense with the analogy and define anxiety more straightforwardly as fear of one's own ebido why as with Melville's Bart Levy, the Scrivener who goes on strike, refuses to write, we are struck by the i enveloped refusal, I would prefer not to, the preference or clean amen, the flash of potentiality that will not you enfold itself, but that manifests itself only as a tension-filled paralysis. Kiarostami's protagonists exhibit a paralysis of this kind, one occasioned by their inability to comprehend the desire of their ancestors and thus their own place in the very culture to which they nevertheless maintain a feeling of anonymous belonging. One of the primary locations in THEWIND will carry us is a cemetery to which Behazid continuously repairs to pick up a stronger cell phone signal and where Yusef, a gravedigger, continuously digs, remaining thus underground and invisible throughout most of the film. We surmise that the purpose of his efforts is ultimately the installation of a telecommunications tower, but since Mrs. Malek is on the verge of death, the digging simultaneously hints at preparations for her funeral. That a burial ground would become the site of telecommunications efforts bespeaks an anxiety attendant upon the loss of any clear signals issuing from a past that remains inscrutable. Eventually, the earth beneath which he digs caves in on Yosef, who has to be dug out. But the unsteadiness of the ground is not unique to this film, it is a constant in Kiarostami's work, where the salient characteristic of the earth is its unsteadiness, it is always caving in, buckling, quaking. Point 18 The ground in all his films seems ungrounded, hollowed out, or more precisely, catacombed. While earthquakes are a difficult geographical fact of life in Iran, Kiarostami's continuous reference to this datum in HIS films turns it into a fact of another order, no longer just an UN compromising truth of the terrain it becomes a cultural fact the meaning of which cannot be unearthed. Like the past buried in it, the G-around turns out in Kiarostami's world to be active and shifting, an unsettled affair. It is as if the past itself were under construction in his films. In The Wind Will Carry Us, it is not only Yosef who remains invisible to us throughout the film. several characters, 11 by Kiarostam is count, remain out of frame and thus UN scene. Asked by an interviewer what these curiously insistent visual absences signify d, Kiarostami replied that the film is about beings without being 19. In Where is the Friend's House? 1986, Being without being, that is, being that is not, but which, remaining unrealized, perplexes characters by affixing itself to them, assumes the form of a notebook which a young schoolboy is certain is not his own, though it appears in all particulars exactly like HIS. He spends the majority of the film trying unsuccessfully to return it, mysteriously deciding I in the end not to give it back to its ostensible owner. Effectively, the notebook has no exclusive owner but becomes the bond between the two students. INTASTE of Cherry, 1997 the anxiety-provoking element fails to take the form of a putative object and instead infuses the film with a perplexing textual opacity. The film follows a middle-aged man, Mr. Batty who has no discernible reason for discontent, far from it, and yet spends the entire film trying to find an accomplice to his suicide, one who will promise to cover him. With twenty shovels full -l of dirt and double-check to make sure he is really and truly dead. From this we suspect that Mr. 8 Addy I is bothered by a fear of being buried alive. It is as if he were trying not simply to kill himself, but to extinguish some surplus of self that does not respond to his wishes and thus impresses him as capable of surviving even his death. Speaking I in an I interview about T.A.S.T.E. of Cherry, Kiarostami offered this comment, the choice of death is the only prerogative possible. Because everything in our LIVES has been imposed by birth. Our parents, our home, our nationality, our build, the color of our skin, our culture too. Though Mr. Batty I has no personal complaint, the thick presence of militia, 
the oppressive evidence of poverty, and the dust of industrialization visible in the urban perimeter through which he drives suggest choking. His suicide is thus readable as an attempt to escape the suffocation brought on by a world where one's identity is laid down by authorities who leave no room for freedom, no chance to choose what form one's life will take. And yet, if that which is imposed on us by birth is as enigmatic as Kiarostom is phi lms tell us it is, then the rigidity of a life laid out by law must be read as a means of dodging a more primary experience, that of anxiety, which is stirred in us by an encounter with our capacity to break from this rigidity. Point 21 What Mr. Batty I cannot abide is being riveted to the inscrutable desire of his ancestors, imposed on him by his birth into a culture that appears radically heteric lite. It is the incomprehensibility of unrealized being, of his own potentiality, which suffocates him. He seeks through suicide to escape not the actual restrictions his culture imposes, but the overcrowded space in which he finds himself bound to its unreadable imperative. The Effective T-O-N-A-L-L-T-Y of Capitalism My reason for L.I. and jaring so long on anxiety is this, shame only becomes comprehensible in relation to anxiety. Fundamental to both shame and anxiety is the sense of being able neither to I integrate nor to divorce oneself from a strangeness that is closer to oneself than one's jugular vein 22. So similar are these affects that Lavinas, in his early work on escape, differentiates them only by the tiny hiccup of hope that is present in anxiety and dashed in shame. Like others, including Freud and Lacan, Lavinas characterizes anxiety as a kind of state of emergency, a signal or imperative to flee, to escape the alarming strangeness that grips us. It is only when this imperative faces the impossibility of success that anxiety turns dejectedly to shame. But where Lavinas takes it for granted that it is the hope of flight that fades I and shame, I W I L L argue that what D.I. sappears is the imperative of flight. While many Lacanians claim that anxiety is an exceptional affect, much like respect for the moral law in Kant, Lacan H. I myself called it the only affect. I prefer to merge the two by approaching anxiety as the stem cell of affects, which is transformed in situ, in different social theaters, to produce guilt and shame. The society of others serves a civilizing function not, as is usually said, because it tames primitive animal instincts, but because it colonizes our savage, inhuman jaurisance. You unable to tolerate being alone with this inhuman partner, we find in the company of others, in society, some means of mollifying the anxious sense of our estrangement from ourselves. This point prepares us to approach again the distinction I made at the outset between shame and guilt as two different relations to our culture, or as we can now say, two ways of distancing ourselves from the stifling sense of foreignness imparted to us by our own culture. The unctuous aggressiveness XHIBI'd by Behazid towards Zenob is only one episode of his generally insensitive behavior. As he hangs around Sayadara waiting for MRS. Malek to die, he occupies himself not only with bothering Zenob, but also with trying to take photographs of villagers who cover their faces and command him to put his camera away. The film clearly indicts him for his rudeness and indiscretion, but in what precisely do his crimes consist, and why do the villagers not want their pictures taken? If every subject as alien to herself lacks a proper image of who she is, why is Behazid's attempt to offer the villagers photographs of themselves counted as an act of rudeness or malice, rather than one of kindness? One of the villagers in life and N. Othing more seems to respond directly to this question when he complains to Farhad, the Phi LM director protagonist of that Phi LM, that the images of the villagers captured by his camera make the villagers appear worse than they are. IT is not the taking of photographs per se, but these particular photographs that are the problem. Behazid and Farhad travel to the villages to document, to archive phenomena on the verge of disappearing. Their mission is to capture a world in the process of being lost, people about to die or presumed to be buried in rubble, ritual practices and ways of life on the edge of extinction. The imminence of loss, of death, licenses the rudeness of the photographers, justifying in their minds their indiscreet attempts to snatch from loss, from transitory, fleeting life, something lasting, 
images that can be stored in the memory banks of their culture. But it is not merely the race against time that powers their rudeness, for these nosy archivists believe they confront an additional obstacle in the villagers themselves, who refuse, they assume, to disclose to them the IN formation they seek to record. In other words, what these Digitic Phi LM directors disregard while making their images is the jowerescence of the villagers that renders them incomprehensible to themselves. These colonizing directors want to pry from the villagers secrets that are not theirs to de-isclose and thus to claim for the light, for the order of the visible, every dark, h hidden thing. Is because its obscene rudeness not of the same sort as that made scandalously evident in the Abu Ghraib photographs? The problem is not simply that the photographers in each case invaded the privacy of those whom they photographed, it consists, rather, in the same obscene denial that there is any obscene, any off-screen, that cannot be exposed to a persistent, prying eye. The ultimate crime of both series of photographs, the source of their malicious abjuration of respect, is their assumption that the photograph subjects have no privacy to invade. This is the bottom line, the point on which I am insisting, privacy cannot be invaded, cannot be penetrated, either by the subject or by others. At the dawn of the 20th century, Nietzsche expressed his scorn for that century's characteristic and misguided belief that it was possible to see through everything. Point 23 He protested the lack of reverence and discretion that fueled his contemporaries' tactless preoccupation with de closing and unmasking everything. Nothing is so nauseating in the believers in modern ideas, he scoffed, as their lack of shame, their complacent impudence of eye and hand with which they touch, lick, and finger everything. 24. This frenzied desire to cast aside every veil, penetrate every surface, transgress every barrier standing between us and the real thing lying behind it installed in the modern world a new sort of beyondness, a new untouchable, one that is in principle there for the grasping, even if I in actuality it is always out of reach. This secularized sacred, which inspires a new, modern desire for transgression, does not originate in a belief in the existence of another world, but in the belief that what we want in this world always lies just behind some roadblock preventing our access to it. This new beyondness is held in PLAs by a definable structure, that of guilt, which must be understood not in its limited, psychological sense, but in the sense I proposed above, a specific form of relation to one's own culture. Agamben offers in passing a broader definition of GUILT in line with our own, in Homo Sacer, he defines the cipher of this capture of LIFA in law, that is, the cipher of biopolitics, as guilt, not in the technical sense, but in the originary sense that indicates a being in debt I and culpa esse, which is to say, precisely the condition of being included through an exclusion, of being in relation to something from which one is excluded or which one cannot fully assume 25. It is the phrase being I in relation to something one cannot assume that first catches our attention, because it happens to be the one Lavinas uses to describe anxiety and shame, the complex feeling of being riveted to an inalienable and opaque surplus of being. Agamben sets Lavinas's phrase alongside an apposite one of his own, being in relation to something from which one is excluded. The latter phrase absorbs and slightly alters the former and thereby defines guilt as a transformation of anxiety. Like anxiety, the feeling of guilt consists in a feeling of being unable to coincide with oneself by integrating the troubling surplus of being, in guilt, however, this inability is no longer experienced as being stuck to an inalienable alienness, but as an inability to close the DI stance that separates us from something that excludes us. How does this transformation come about? How does one become excluded from a part of oneself with which one cannot quite catch up, rather than attached to what one cannot ask you me? We find our answer in the Freudian theory of guilt, in the paradox of the superego, which punishes obedience with guilt, that is inextricable from the paradox of ego and cultural ideals, which we are simultaneously enjoined to alive up to and forbidden to attain. Faced with the unbearable opaqueness we are to ourselves, with the unassumable excess that sticks to us, 
we unburden ourselves by allowing the ideals set up by society to become blueprints for our identity and action and to thereby provide us with some clarity. Through cultural ideals, the question of what it means to belong to a culture is silenced and replaced by mesmerizing cultural goals that gather awestruck subjects. But because every ideal is sustained by a prohibition against attaining it, we are always in debt to them, always in arrears to our ego and cultural ideals, which insert us into our culture precisely by excluding us from its inner sanctum. The very prohibition slash exclusion that binds us to these ideals also invites transgression. What is forbidden lures us with its unattainability, if only we could summon the courage to disobey, the fortitude to step over the line. In short, ideals are the source of that secularized sacred deplored by Nietzsche, the just beyond reach that ignores the impenetrability of one's own as well as others' self-opacity. What was hidden and paralyzing is now tantalizingly close and urges transgression. The ego and the ID presents an argument about guilt profoundly tributary to this one. There, Freud writes that reflection shows us that no external vicissitudes can be experienced or undergone by the id, except by way of the ego, which is the representative of the external world to the id. Nevertheless it is not possible to speak of direct inheritance in the ego. It is here that the gulf between an actual i individual and the concept of a species becomes evident 26. I understand this no direct inheritance in the ego as sanctioned to treat cultural inheritance as libido or jaurisance excited by the brush with ancestral desire. This inheritance can only lead to anxiety, however, and so must go through the external world, through society, if it is to be accessed or unfolded in some way. The meandering root of inheritance leaves its mark in the fact that the subject is never completely absorbed into her culture, but is always slightly misaligned with it. We have yet to see what this means for shame, but for guilt we can now see that it entails a drive to attain what can never be fully acquired and a sense of exclusion from some sacred core of being. With regard to the question of photographic images that is raised in Kiarostom I.S. films, we can now add the following, if these images make their subjects look worse than they are, this is because the photographs taken by these digitic filmmakers hold the order of appearances in this day n. For them, appearances are always only a nuisance standing in the way of truth, they lack the dignity of the true. In the wind will carry us, the fault lies not only with Behazid, but also with the villagers who scar themselves to attract the attention of their bosses. These villagers seem to have bought into the capitalist belief that there is nothing that is not ripe for exposure. They, too, have begun to acquire that immodest, capitalist taste for what C.S. Lewis referred to as a very cheap form of frankness 27. In this light, the Islamic system of modesty, with its volatile disdain for the modern passion for exposing everything, its loud protestations and rigid protections against the touching, licking, and fingering of everything, would seem to offer an important antidote to the global immodesty fashioned by Western capitalism. The system of modesty undeniably targets a worthy enemy, but the question before us is whether it adopts effective measures against its target, whether it succeeds or fails to protect the subject's modesty. With this question in mind, we return to the fresh milk sequence in The Wind will carry us to determine if it deserves the tongue lashing Davishi gives it. Scenes of Shame as Behazid descends I into the subterranean chamber, the catacomb, where he will catch UP with Zenob, we are invited to wonder, what sort of place is this? One need not know anything about villages in northern Iran to know that not even here do people milk cows in pitch black underground caves. This is no ordinary or actual location, no touristic glimpse of some of Iran's exotic landscape, it is rather an example of visionary geography, a liminal space defined in Islamic philosophy as the place from which new forms emerge. Point 28 After Behazid crosses the threshold, the screen goes black for several long seconds, as if to mark the absolute separation of this from the other spaces in the film. Holding on the black screen for an uncomfortably long time, Kirostami also allows the depth of the blinding darkness in which Zenob remains enshrouded to sink in. From the bright sunlight outside, we pass into a place so luminous that nothing stands out against it, 
a place phi ll ed with a light so i n tense that nothing i n it is distinguishable from anything else, a place of pure exposure, of dazzling blackness. While the screen is still black, the voice of Bihazit inquires, is there anyone here? Answerable in the negative, this question is more profound than it might first seem. For there is in fact no one here in this darkness, no I, only the am I laking of a cow, the gerundive form of the action Zenob is performing substantivized, lacking any subjective support. In Being and Nothingness, Sartre describes a scene that is in many points similar to this one in The Wind Will Carry Us. A voyeur, crouched before a keyhole, peers through it intently. At this point, there is nothing but this pure act of looking, peering through a keyhole, the act that totally absorbs the voyeur. Point 29 The voyeur himself is not present. He is precipitated out from his act as a subject only at the point when a sudden rustling of leaves startles him and phi lls him with shame. The voyeur appears only as the experience of shame, as shameful I in the precise sense. It is only when he senses his being looked at by the gaze of an indeterminate other that the voyeur acquires a sentiment of self. The sentiment of self and the experience of shame are synonymous. The scenes from Kiarostami and Sartre are similar, then, in that in each the gerundive form of an act, milking a cow, peering through a keyhole, indicates the absence of a subject, whose emergence will be marked only later by the arousal of shame. The apparent di similarity between the two acts may make my analogy sound tenuous, however, and so I will address this di faculty by focusing first on the scene of peering through a keyhole. What does Sartre say about it? Surprisingly little. In fact, he seems remarkably intent on refraining from drawing too much attention to the act in which his peeping tom is engaged when I interrupted by the gaze. This polite inattention is partly explained by the fact that Sartre does not want to distract from his point that he is not speaking of shame in the civic sense, as he says. By this he seems to mean that sense in which, having already entered polite society and learned its rules, one is disgraced by being caught breaking one of them. Sartre is concerned, rather, with a more fundamental sense of shame as that feeling that attends the I insertion of the subject into society, his sudden immersion in a world of others. This insertion into the social precedes all measure and every rule by which a subject might find himself judged. It is not, therefore, the nature of his act, the fact that it is one of lascivious looking, that causes the voyeur shame, but the fact that the gaze makes him suddenly aware of the presence of others as such. There can be no denying, however, that there is something more going on in Sartre's refusal to utter a peep about this peeping. Plainly, he is sanitizing the scene, scrubbing it clean of sex. Less discreet, Lakin returns to the scene precisely to highlight the presence of sex in it. It is not by chance, he unblinkingly observes, that shame catches the voyeur in a moment of desire. He does not reject Sartre's argument that the gaze of the other does not judge the act of the voyeur as socially unacceptable, nor try to stop it by prohibiting it. But to deny the censoriousness of the gaze is not to deny any relation between it and desire. Lakin's point is just that, rather than condemn or prohibit, the gaze enflames desire, shame is a sexual conflagration 30. Excising sex, Sartre produces a chaste reading of the shame scenario, which he turns into a pathetic drama wherein an abstract and sovereign act of looking is forced to confront its anchorage in the vulnerability of its bodily foundations. The rustling of leaves functions as a kind of index finger that picks out the voyeur, rendering him painful lly conspicuous, a body too much in a scene where he thought hi myself bodiless and un observed. The emperor of seeing is suddenly brought down, reduced to the dead weight of his body, his body as object. Sartre trades the censoring function that is usually ascribed to the gaze for an alternative function, limitation. In HISI interpretation, what the gaze exposes is the subject's finitude, it reminds us that others as such set limits on our freedom, impede our actions and get I in the way of our plans. The body exposed by shame is thus nothing more than a figure for this limitation of my freedom, it is a body that can be hurt by others, that remains ever vulnerable to all that is external to and opposes it. 
From this point we can begin to measure the consequences of Lakin's opposition to Sartre's sanitization of the scene, which is stated in the FOLLO encounter insistence, IT is not the annihilating subject, correlative of the world of objectivity, who feels himself surprised, but the subject sustaining himself in a function of desire 31. If it is not the subject who experiences his freedom as limited by auth ers who experiences shame, then neither is the body at stake in this experience the stupid, delimited object Sartre imagines. One problem with the latter's reading is that it fails to capture the squirminess of shame, which is more clearly evoked in Kiarostami's sequence by the camera's exposure of the cow's udders as they are being milked by Zenob. It is not the body as figure of limitation, but the body as figure of one's nakedness that is exposed by shame. The nakedness of the body is not, however, a simple function of its being unclothed. As is attested in Kiarostam I S seen and by the obsessive fears that, at its extreme, haunt the hijab system, which visualizes in the clicking of a woman's heels the place where her legs join her body, and in the cadences of her voice the softness of her skin, one can remain naked beneath yards of clothing. As we will see, the dialectic of shame as to simple opposition, naked slash clothed or exposed slash concealed. For now, we can say that the body's nakedness is a function of its sexualization. Sexualized, the body is vulnerable not, as I in Sartre's version of the story, to other subjects, but to the savage otherness of its own libido. The sexualized body is one whose boundaries have already been breached, one that has suffered an irreparable and constitutive hurt. Lakin's reintroduction of sexuality into the Sartrean account of shame paves the way for us to reconnect shame to anxiety, while re-examining Lavinas's argument about their relation and the question of cultural inheritance they raise. Although Lavinas does not explicitly conceive the surplus that rivets the subject as libido, his argument does broach the question of racial inheritance, and sexual pleasure does emerge in his discussion at the point at which shame is introduced. 32 Lavina's argument is that, while pleasure promises escape from anxiety, shame testifies to the inadequacy of sexual pleasure, which proves incapable of delivering on this promise. Earlier I left hanging the question of the validity of this argument about shame's di appointment. I return to it now by taking a look at one more scene of shame made famous by its theorization, I refer to the scene Agamben introduces in Remnants of Auschwitz to flesh out Lavina's theory of shame. Originally recounted by Robert Antelme, the scene concerns a student from Bologna who is arbitrarily picked out of a line of students by an SS officer and thereby marked for execution. 33 Remarkably, the unfortunate student does not question his selection nor persist in looking over his shoulder in hopes of discovering that it was someone other than he who had been selected. No, the pink flush of his cheeks signs his recognition that it is he who has been designated and that he will not try to escape this fact. The dead certainty that accompanies anxiety sticks, too, we see, to shame. This common sense of certainty may in part be what leads Lavinas to nearly conflate the two effects, with the small distinction that shame is certainty more emphatic because more fatalistic. Not only do I know beyond doubt that I am that, that which rivets me, I also know that there is no escape from that. Th it is that. The reddening of the Italian student's face would seem to blurt out an I am here, a resigned surrender to the fate handed him by the SS officer. But is that really the end of it? Does the sudden surging up of the question of pleasure in Lavinas's discussion of shame not betray a disavowed recognition that some difference is being overlooked? Is Lavinas not guilty, in short, of the same error as Sartre, of de-eroticizing shame? The heat and GLO that suffuses the face of the one shame telegraphs this eroticization and their error. On the elementary level of description there is a common distinction between anxiety and shame that we must now consider. While anxiety manifests itself in an impulse to flee, shame is manifested in an impulse to hide. Lavinas's argument depends on our reading this transformation of the impulse as necessitated by the defeat of its first manifestation, because flight is hopeless, all I can do is try to hide. But this is not the proper way to read this transformation, which depends, rather, on an alteration of my relation to that which anxiety desires to escape. 
To test this hypothesis, we need to take a closer look at the relation between exposure and concealment, which may be said to substitute for the anxious relation between paralysis and flight. Although the relation is usually assumed to be sequential, exposure coming first, followed by the defensive attempt to conceal, the pink cheeks of the student from Bologna raise questions about this assumption. As much as his blush broadcasts his presence, it also seems like the lowering of a shade to shutter or shield him from view. It is as if in his very exposure, his very visibility, he were announcing his disappearance from view, his retreat. If blushing, the most common visual manifestation of shame, is critical to understanding it, this is because this affect has a special relation to sight, to the gaze, in contrast to guilt, in which the relation to the voice is what matters. Even when it is a sound that occasions shame, the experience of it is one of being looked at, submitted to a gaze. This is how it happens that the question of shame intersects the question of the image in Kiarostam I.S. Cinema. What shame seeks is the same thing Kiarostami, as filmmaker, wants to create, an image that is capable of capturing the reflection of what has no image. Be attentive, for here is where the detour through anxiety repays its costs. Those who dispense with this detour are precisely those who end up regarding shame as a passive suffering of exposure to a look against which only a pathetic defense is available, cowering beneath covers. Exactly what does the gaze expose? This is a question about which there is far too little reflection. It is easy to accept the description offered above, shame erupts in response to a rupturing of the circuit of communication recognition, as supplying the FOLLOing answer, the gaze exposes a different, less flattering image of ourselves than we previously held. But this is clearly a mistake, for what the gaze makes visible is that very thing that has no IMAGE, that unassumable, opaque surplus of self that anxiety wants to be rid of. In shame, however, the inalienable alienness that attaches itself to me no longer threatens me with its suffocating overpresence, but comes to define the intimate distance that constitutes my sense of interiority, my sense of myself as subject. I have from the start been trying to define shame as a sense of self. It might be helpful at this point to turn this strategy around by defining the experience of self through shame. Philosophers have taught us that the self, or subject, can never be experienced as a coincidence of the self with itself, but is experienced rather as the gap or void that forever separates me from myself. The void left by the destruction of the TWINTO wears would thus conveniently serve to represent Sedgwick's feeling of shame as a feeling of self. But while this account is not altogether incorrect, it is anemic. We look to psychoanalysis, then, for a more robust account of the same experience, and begin to locate it in the proposition that the subject's inability to coincide with herself stems from the fact that, her, libido or jaurisance appears more like something that attaches itself to her than something she is. The various affects of anxiety, guilt, and shame make plain a further inadequacy of the bald philosophical assertion that the subject experiences herself as void. For not every, but only one particular, experience of the gap separating me from myself offers an experience of self. In anxiety, the gap is felt as an overwhelming and paralyzing opacity, I and guilt, ASA and exclusion from myself. HOW can the experience of MY non-transparency TO myself be anything but a negative one, as these two, a pending annihilation or continuous failure, are? How can the gaze? That causes shame expose, make visible, the jaurisance I cannot assume without making me transparent to myself? What is the experience of self to which shame holds the key? Imagine a young girl sitting contentedly at a soda fountain with her po lite, well-to-do friends, sipping a milkshake as she looks distractedly into the mirror behind the counter. Suddenly the image of her mother, who has just ambled into the drugstore, appears in the mirror. It is a ridiculous image of a preposterously festooned mother, seeing it, the daughter burns with shame. 34 If shame is the experience not of some object, and the girl does not therefore feel shame for her mother or for herself, but is rather the feeling of self, how is this truth exemplified in the scene? 
Why does the appearance of the mother's image cause shame? It is unlikely that the reflection in the mirror would have caused shame if it had been that of a stranger or an acquaintance to whom the girl was indifferent. It matters that there is a strong bond of love connecting the daughter to the mother, without this there would be no shame. Something about the daughter that is normally hidden is exposed in the scene, but it is not that this silly woman is her mother, nor is it that she is more like her mother than her fine manners and tastes have so far let on. What shame exposes is her love for her mother, though to state it this way is not yet to capture the feeling precisely. The daughter's love for her mother has been fully evident before this event, to others, and to the daughter herself, just as the interest of Sartre's voyeur in what is happening on the other side of the keyhole is evident. But these experiences of love and intense curiosity are, up to the moment the gaze appears, consumed by the objects on which they are lavished and the actions they entail. The moment of shame arrives when the subject who loves or peers intently through the keyhole makes herself visible to herself and others as a subject, as the one who loves, is curious, desires. The subject sees herself as desiring, as actively submitting to the passion of her attachments. It matters less what incident occasions the feeling or what else the subject is doing at the time, what matters is that, at the moment the gaze appears, the subject experiences herself as engaged in active submission to some passion. T.O. put this in terms of the proposal I made regarding the psychoanalytic invigoration of philosophy, this experience of self as subject is the same one philosophy describes, an experience of the void that prevents me from coinciding with myself, understood now as an encounter with Jaurisance. I in contrast to the feeling of being parasited by a crushing presence or punishing superego, However, this feeling is one of enjoying one's jaurisance. It may at first seem surprising that the experience of oneself as subject is not one of pure activity, but one of passivity, or the assumption of a feminine attitude, to use Freud's terms, but this is the description of the experience of self that shame makes available. One of the finest illustrations of this psychophilosophical point is found in Joan Riviere's justly famous case study. Point 3s The unnamed patient is a woman who constantly battles anxiety. Curiously, this does not manifest itself as performance anxiety, a political activist with a strong intellect and oratorical skills, she frequently delivers public lectures. Her problem is a post-performance anxiety that befalls her after these speeches, which she deals with through compulsive ogling and flirting with men from the audience and through the phantasmatic production of scenarios in which she submits herself sexually to black men while plotting against them. Revere contends that the woman's anxiety is aroused by a fear that she will be caught eye in possession of something, the phallus, that is not rightly hers, but has been stolen from her father, and that her defense strategy is to pretend not to have it by concealing her possession of it. We know that anxiety is caused by a surplus that one feels is not rightly one's own, but that surplus possesses the subject, not the other way around. It is obvious that this woman wants desperately to make an appearance, to exhibit herself on the public stage in order to escape the oblivion anxiety threatens, but her public speech-making seems inadequate to the task. The reason? Alienating herself in her professional role, she disappears I into it, there is no remainder, no subject left over. She thus resorts to a different strategy, making herself visible in shameful scenes of degradation or the performance of demeaning tasks. That these are not scenes of simple passivity is evident in her plots to turn these men over to justice or to escape them. It is quite apparent that she is pulling the strings in these scenarios, actively passive within them. A number of other questions spring from this, let us return to the fresh milk sequence, readable alongside the other scenes of shame we have looked at, and approach them from there. A simple village girl and a minor character I end the narrative, Zenob moves about her world without any particular self-awareness, absorbed by everyday chores. I end the intimate grotto-like space in which the scene is set, however, a space associated with burial, you unforgettable ancestors, and the pressure of their desire on her, she is foregrounded d, drawn out of herself. It is not because it's impertinent look that d disturbs her, she is relatively indifferent to him and his bad manners. What interrupts her complacency, 
her full absorption in the world, is the erotic poem by Forup Farakzad that Behazad reads to her as part of his bungled attempt at seduction. From the interior of the poem, the gaze emerges and is even explicitly mentioned, the earth slash screeching to a halt. Something you and known watching you and Mel beyond this window 36. Visibly fascinated by this poem, the red-robed Zenob is not entirely exposed, for this would render her simply passive, but rather exposes herself, an active passivity, as desiring. It is important to re-emphasize this distinction to prevent shame from being reduced, as it too often is, to a retiring shyness, even though some have correctly observed that this affect often manifests itself as a bold candor, in candid acknowledgments of the libidinal eye investments that ravish and surprise why another point not to be missed, once again, is that this feeling of submission to one's own jaurisance, which appears to us as something that attaches itself to us, is not a solipsistic experience, but only arises in connection with an investment of one's jaurisance, its attachment to objects, in a way that allows Zenob to appear without losing herself in her appearance. How to appear without disappearing into our appearance? This is finally the question we must answer. Think of the extreme poles of shame scenarios. On the one hand, the first horrified sight of the death camps by liberating armies, which was said to have aroused shame and thus to have forced witnesses to look away. On the other, actions of love and extravagant generosity, in response to which Nietzsche once said, nothing is more advisable than to take a stick and give any eyewitnesses a sound thrashing 38. Why do we avert our gaze and feel shame in response to the inhumanly awful and the exquisitely beautiful? The first answer lik Ely to be offered must be de-iscarded, for shame involves no taboo against looking or touching. Tod I distinguish this affect from guilt requires us to refuse taboo, which is uttered from a beyond in order to protect a beyond, any say I and the matter. Declaring something untouchable, out of bounds, taboo not only creates a beyond, a sacred zone set apart from us, it also incites, as we noted, a counter imperative to transgress the boundaries excluding us from that sacred place, to touch, finger, penetrate. With our look all it would withhold from us. Stll, we cannot deny that shame often betrays itself in an averted look. The averted look is not, however, a sign of obedience to a stricture against looking, but of the appearance of a new opportunity to look, inward. It is as if our attention were directed not to a parallel, transcendent space, but to an oblique one slightly detached from visibility, the space of a self into which we could withdraw from the scene that engages us. This simultaneous relation between exposure and concealment now needs to be formulated. In contrast to guilt, which introduces through prohibition a di vision between the sensible world and an ideal one that transcends it, Shame operates without recourse to prohibition, ideals, or a heterogeneous realm outside the sensible, it operates, in other words, entirely within the sensible realm of vision, introducing there, within the visible, a division or slight separation of the visible and invisible. One could describe the experience of shame, in some, as that of witnessing oneself hiding, as the sense that one has ducked behind one's appearance. Between the appearance and what remains invisible no eye interdiction intervenes, nothing is prohibited from appearing. It is a question, rather, of an appearance that permits something to disappear. What is it that thus permits me to de-isap here? What allows me to camouflage myself behind my visibility? That very thing that has dominated the scene while avoiding analysis up until now, the gaze. Sartre brings it into focus and makes a breakthrough in conceptualizing it. The gaze, he says, cannot be matched to an actual pair of eyes, it is not locatable in a person. The gaze has no bearer, belongs to no one. If, feeling a gaze rest up on me, I scan the subway car to try to pin it on some suspicious looking person, the experience of the gaze will evaporate at each point on which my accusation alights. There is a phantasmatic dimension of the gaze that suggests it cannot be contained within an intersubjective dialectic. But, in the end, 
Sartre does not follow up on this suggestion and thus the apersonal dimension of the gaze serves in his account merely to enhance the power of the other by effacing HIS limits. The fact that I cannot attach it to the actual eyes of an objectified other GIVES the gaze all the more power to objectify and limit me. This is a point Val Luto N, the legendary producer of horror Phi LMS, well you understood, do not show the horrible thing directly embodied in a perso N, for this will only have the effect of attenuating the threat. Lakin reads the phantasmatic dimension of the gaze differently. There is no warrant, he argues, for Sartre's placement of the gaze exclusively on the side of an adversarial other. Detached from every observer, it is detached, too, from the voyeur and not only from the other. It is as if, through participation in the social or public field, the voyeur were lent a gaze by which he is permitted to see H.I. myself appear. The gaze lends the subject the exteriority or detachment necessary to look back and see the one thing he was unable to see, his own appearance. What this recurvant gaze sees, however, is not merely the subject's emergent image, but the detachment that permits it to emerge. My image is my disguise, my veil, it enables me to appear in public while preserving my privacy. I n a gesture of sleazy flattery, because it tries to establish some silly points of coincidence between Zenob and Forup, the leading Persian poet of the 20th century. There is absolutely no sign, however, that Zenob is interested in being like the poet. What I and Tirist Zenob is dissimulation, the possibility of which is opened by the poem, the possibility of being able to present herself in public while remaining concealed. Unlike anxiety, shame is not a signal to take action, it does not cry out for cover. It accompanies an action taken, it is the feeling of having found cover in the folds of one's appearance. Not I am here, but I lie here disguised. And 5.5. Officer may order me to step forward and I may obey by presenting myself before him. But to experience shame in doing so is to stand a little to the side of one's appearance and to remain there, undetected. M.A.K. no mistake, I can H.A.V.E. no shame or shield apart from my appearance, for my interiority or self-intimacy is not a primitive condition but the recurvant effect of a certain form of publicity. If one takes anxiety as the subject's primitive condition, one sees that the gaze of the other, the gaze I borrow from the other, from the space of the other, does serve to limit, not my freedom, but my devouring, limitless libido. This is not inconsistent with my earlier point that the gaze enflames desire. The paradox of libido uncovered by Freud is that some limitation or obstacle is necessary, not to prevent it from spilling over into public space, but to raise its tide, to reduce it to the measure of desire. Limitless, libido can only be felt as a danger to my publicity, to my emergence into appearance. The gaze is, however, a factor of limitation, it frames el libido by objectifying it slightly, setting it at a minimum di stance from me. Through contact with the external world, I meet with an obstacle. The gaze registers this obstacle by sending my look, like a shuttlecock, back toward me, it sees me as part of the world, but does not censor or judge. In fact it acts as a prophylactic to protect us against any all-seeing censor. The point is often made that censorship does not merely negate but is also productive. Without the Hayes Code, for example, no one would ever have known the Elubitsk Touch, just as without hegeb regulations, Iranian cinema might not have blossomed as it did. This flat dictum has never seemed satisfying to me. It is not simply censorship that produces great works of art, just as it is not every obstacle that raises the tide of libido. We know from our D.I. discussion of ego and social ideals that that there are some obstacles that can never be overcome because acts of transgression only fortify them. For censorship to be productive there must be some recognition that the censor has a blind spot and thus some positive belief that the order of appearances is neither fully transparent to the censors or any other look, nor simply a realm of illusion and distortion and thus an inappropriate vehicle for the truth. The gaze looks back at me not only at that point where my look encounters its limit, but also where it encounters a fissure in the world or in the sensor's eyeball. 
I look at the place where the TW in TO wears once stood or I enter the eyes of an 5.5. Officer and I encounter not just an obstacle to my look, but this fissure, this blind spot of the other, from which point no destiny can be foreseen, not mine, not anyone's. For even if this moment marks the hour of my death, it is the accident of this death that shame highlights. My destiny finds harbor I and my appearance and remains undisclosed, even to me. A final point about the fresh milk sequence in Kiarostami's film. While I have attended only to the digitic unfolding of shame I and it, it is clear that a sense of shame pervades not only the digitic situation, but also the audience's relation to this situation. Extremely di scumfitting, the scene does not allow us to sit unobserved in the darkness of the auditorium, but forces us to experience our own uneasy, hidden presence on the scene. A gaze looks out from the screen and I envies us to feel shame. The final quarrel I have with Davish I's outraged response to the sequence is that it declines Kiarostami's invitation, it refuses shame by instead expressing shame for or on behalf of Zenob, as if to distance Davishi from the experience itself. I repeat my initial proposition, there is no such thing as shame for. There is only shame, the experience of submitting to the gaze oneself. There are no spectators or witnesses to shame, one is always interior to the experience of it. Yet there is no denying that the gaze wounds, it severs the subject from herself and causes her to submit to an experience whose disturbing complexity is not adequately captured by the terms pleasure or enjoyment. What happens, however, when one resists and tries through an alternative view of shame to defend oneself against the experience of it? In this case the gaze will be perceived, as in Sartre, as coming from without, from an annihilating other, and as falling on some poor others who are made to feel shame. From a safe distance, unaffected by its wounding, I will experience shame only secondhand, on behalf of these others. This is not, I would argue, a scenario of contagious socialite, but of a false, self-protective chivalry. I have placed this DI discussion of shame as a provocation at the point of conflict between Islam and the West. One of the most heated and defining debates of that conflict centers on the forced wearing of the veil and the hijab system generally, which are met with violent condemnation in the West. The debate has thus far been too narrowly framed and ought to be broadened, I suggest, on the basis of a proper ontological understanding of shame. This understanding will raise serious challenges to both sides of the argument. The recurrent image in the wind will carry us of Behazid running about, trying to pick up a better signal for his mobile phone, brings to mind the historic debates over wiretapping I and the US. During these debates, it was argued that privacy was not localizable in a delimited space that might then be ruled out of reach to the state, but was rather attached to the subject and remained inviolable no matter where a citizen might be, in public or in private space. This argument exemplifies the ideology of freedom on the basis of which the West opposes the hijab system and regards itself as superior to the Islamic world and its doctrine of submission. Yet the belief that the subject has property in the self, property privately held, is clearly untenable in the face of shame, which counts on publicity to dispossess the subject of that which it can never assume as property. On the other hand, the chivalry of the Islamic State can only strike one as a defensive posture, and raises the question whether the state's interpretation of submission is as radical as it needs to be or simply an avoidance of its deepest implications. In any case, we owe this entire speculation to the modesty system's strict regulation of cinema, which, by obliging filmmakers to film mainly exterior spaces, set Kiarostami the task of demonstrating that interiority is not only compatible with, but dependent up on, the existence of an all-exterior world. Fevi ben Slama and the Transladi on. Of the impossible in Islam and. Psychoanalysis, Nathan Gorlick. As evidenced by a number of contract ibiotions to the present issue of Umbra, a. La psychanalyse I Eprive de Elslam has elicited a multitude of critical reactions since its 2002 publication, many of which circulate, however implicitly or inadvertently, around one, perhaps unanswerable, question, what is Fevi Benzlama doing, 
1. The first and longest chapter of his book is quite clearly an attempted political intervention into the social and cultural crisis precipitated by the relatively recent global emergence of Islamist activism, especially in North Africa and the Middle East. Ben Slama Argues here, and with enduring relevance despite the few years separating us from the event of the book's initial publication, that we cannot hope to appreciate the dynamics of this increasingly powerful set of DI scours is without attention to the economy of enjoyment through which its ideologies are propagated, without, that is, attention to the methods by which Islamist ideology attempts to treat a new set of collective disturbances whose prevalence throughout the so-called Islamic world indicates an upheaval in the order of the signifier and an attendant terror before a suddenly untethered chowerisance. Subsequent chapters provide, in various forms and with reference to a number of historical, theological, literary, and philosophical objects, an exegetical rereading of the foundational narratives of modern monotheism, a metapsychological analysis of the Islamic unconscious and the historical truth to which it bears witness, an exploration of the ways in which Islamic philosophy seems to resonate with some key axioms of the Freudian discovery, a series of meditations on the positively ontological problem of sexual difference and the place of the feminine in both ancient and modern Islamic thought, and d, to an extent, a critique of Western chauvinism and the quotidian peculiarities of ethnocentric misrepresentation. These di spirit, diverse and often competing threads of analytic concern may perhaps be consolidated within a larger question, itself occasioned by the appearance of Robert Bonanno's thoughtful English rendition of this difficult text, namely, the question of translatio n. How, Benzlama asks, can psychoanalysis, whose decidedly European and essentially modern origin seem to have grounded it, since its inception, in a certain beyond of Islamic intellectual H.I. story, be brought to bear U.P. on this other, often antagonized or antagonistic, monotheism? How might a Freudian intervention illuminate the mechanisms of repression at work within this onto theological tradition, a tradition whose position relative to the recent history of the West in many ways resembles what Freud called the other scene, prior to its articulation as the UN conscious, shrouded in darkness, marked off as a kind of forbidden zone against which the tremendous intellectual, political and moral energy IES of the European Enlightenment continue to define themselves. How will psychoanalysis survive the translation to another language, another history, another symbolic order whose structure may or may not accommodate its meddling guests' eccentricities without a good amount of spirited resistance. This last question may best characterize the stakes of Eight Islam's argument, since it suggests that the task of the translator involves more than the simple, if uncomfortable, interposition of one field of knowledge onto another. As Ben Slama himself asserts, and as the double entendre of the book's original French title, Lost, alas, in translation, suggests, to stage the encounter of psychoanalysis and Islam will require an openness. Dialogues. To the inevitability that, once the dust settles, neither psychoanalysis nor Islam will be the same, the work of translation is a bidirectional effort through which both psychoanalysis and Islam will be forced to confront the distinct challenges that each poses to the other, without any real GU guarantee that either WILL succeed in setting itself aright with respect to its opponent. Given the ethical and political exigencies of the contemporary cross-cultural confrontation between East and West, the precarious footing on which this difficult, perhaps impossible, mediating project rests cannot be understated. TOO aggressive and insistence upon the founding axioms of psychoanalysis risks reducing the intricacies of Islam, its internal DI visions and HI historical specificities, to an easily manageable and thus essentialist narrative, as if the complexity of the problem could be distilled into material for another case history, appropriated as yet another trophy to which psychoanalysis may refer as evidence of its universal applicability, too proud an adherence to the framework of analysis risks. In other words, its unfortunate mutation into one more DI scores within the canon of modern ethnocentrism. At the same time, however, too much timid hospitality toward the other that is Islam will resemble the simpering position of the hyper-tolerant multiculturalist, 
who listens politely and accommodates difference with du biases since any truly meaningful or transformative encounter with the otherness of the other was always, actually, completely out of the question. Both hazards, of course, engender much the same result, the further immunization of psychoanalysis and Islam from the positive contaminating effects that each may entail for the other. The failure of this project, once initiated, will therefore denote much more than a mere MISSED encounter, it may inadvertently contribute to the further ossification of, on the one hand, an ignorant and self-satisfied Western chauvinism and, on the other, an increasingly pervasive, dangerous and theologically grounded xenophobia operating under the banner of Islamism. We need hardly be reminded of the profound representational and material violence to which either tendency, and their basic incommensurable ility, give rise. We might here recall Freud's late contention, in analysis t e reminable and interminable, that psychoanalysis is one of three impossible professions to and this for at least two reasons, first, because the transferential relationship through which the progress of the analysis moves is always working toward its own undoing, toward the analysand's realization that there is no subject supposed to know, the condition of possibility without which no analytic work would be feasible is the very object against which that work opposes itself. Second, the task of the analyst is intrinsically impossible because the zero point of absolute truth toward which the analysand's energies are directed will never appear in its full LL presence, something always remains, some trace in the form of the symptom, the dream, the fantasy. Ben Slama's work bears UP on both of these impossibilities, not least because the conceptual problem of the impossible serves as a constant refrain within his work. In the first place, the challenge of Islam demands that the ear of the analyst be capable of attuning itself to unexpected dimensions of human experience, modes of subject formation, and orders of what Freud called historical truth. From the outset, this unfamiliar material asks, by its very nature, for an intervention on the level of an analysis, while also implying, precisely because of the acuteness of its novelty within the analytic scene, that the subject supposed to know must admittedly know very little indeed. As to the second order of impossibility, the vanishing point beyond which lies the end of analysis, Ben Slama's book positions itself from the outset as a mere prolegomenon to any future. Metapsychology, as a series of provocations, partial interrogations, exploratory critical adventures and constructions. In short, psychoanalysis and the challenge of Islam only attempts to inaugurate the analytic relationship, to suspend the impulse toward solutions and to establish the terms of this absolutely vital confrontation within a rubric that both resists closure and at least attempts to evade complicity with the reductive and violent manifestations of either one of its objects of concern. A generous, and perhaps responsible, reading of this text, one that recognizes this dynamics of the impossible in hearing within its Venturaus balancing act, must therefore suspend the impulse to pass final judgment upon the question of just how successfully Ben's Lama has managed to maneuver through this critical, cultural, historical, theoretical, theological, ethical, aesthetic, political, and anthropological minefield. Otherwise, the reader may fixate upon only those elements of Ben Slama's exploration that appear at first blush to be contradictory or insufficient, and will dismiss his work, as Joseph A. Massad has done in a most exemplary fashion, as a presumptuous exercise in Western liberalism, as a project of disciplinary, universalist, and therapeutic assimilationism, as a modern European avatar of American cultural imperialism.3. Such vituperative criticism may follow from the assumption that Ben Slama's critical idiom is decidedly European, the two primary discourses here employed, those of psychoanalysis and deconstruction, do, after LL, continue to resonate with the authoritative voices of their, supposedly, French and German intellectual forebears.4 but Ben Slama's work, both here and elsewhere, compellingly demonstrates that it is just this assumption to which we must commit our greatest theoretical energies, he and others, most notably, perhaps, his principal interlocutors Freud and Derrida, as well as Christian Jamet and Edward said, 
have shown time and again that the dichotomy through which the Islamic philosophical tradition and its European counterpart are held in total distinction provides an analytic lens that is by no means sufficient. The effect of an encounter between psychoanalysis and Islam jeopardizes, through the very discomfort to which it gives rise, the self-assured identities of either party, causing the cultural and historical terms through which they have both been rendered intelligible, to themselves and to each other, to tremble with disquieting intensity. Contrary to Massad's conclusion, then, it seems difficult to imagine a more radical interruption of the ideology of Western liberalism, even and especially if the language with which Ben Slama levels his critique of Islamist ideologies and reconstructs the historical foundations of Islam is steeped in the discourse of European critical thought. I indeed, one can scarcely imagine the enduring critical importance of psychoanalysis without this fidelity to the inconsistent, the difficult, the contradictory, and the UN certain. Such, after LL, is the problem of the impossible, and it is a problem toward which the considerable majority of Ben Slama's book is directed. The more immediate approachability of his thoughts for our present time of war and death may tempt readers to excise these explicitly political concerns from the larger body of the text, but to do so is to promote a profound misapprehension of the stakes and direction of his work. Inasmuch as Islamist activism concerns, for Ben Slama, a false re-articulation of the originary myth of Islam, it is this last problem to which he dedicates tremendous critical effort and through which the radical importance of a psychoanalytic reading comes into Fu LL view. We need only be reminded here that the trajectory of desire is, for psychoanalysis, always a quest for an origin, and that this quest finds its limit, moreover, only in death, since the lost object toward which the subject of desire orients H. I. Myself never really existed in the first place. The whole of Lakin's thought impresses this upon us. For psychoanalysis, then, the repetition of the failure to actualize that primordially lost origin is an essential symptom, since it points to a foundational truth whose privileged position within the subject's UN conscious resides precisely in its obstinate resistance to the logic of the signifier, in its refusal, that is, to reveal itself under the harsh light of reason or within the field of the representable. What Ben Slama's intervention thus brings to a larger consideration of the problem of Islam is a critical attunement to the unsaid and the unsayable, a sensibility to the foreclosed, forgotten, or repressed elements of Islam's founding narrative, and a consideration of the ways in which these unacknowledged, intransigent kernels of the real continue to disturb the symbolic logic governing its modern-day institutions. The quest for the invisible origins of monotheism is not, of course, without precedent within the discourse of psychoanalysis, and Ben Slama is entirely right to find within Fruity's astoundingly brief treatment of Islam in Moses and monotheism not a critical deficit, but rather a provocation, an injunction either to consider or to displace Freud's suggestion that Islam's origins comprise only an abbreviated repetition of a primordial blueprint forever engraved in human history by J.U. Deism's originary violence. Point five. This is why the task of translation is far more than a transposition of one system of thought onto the cultural terrain of another, and why Ben Slama does not hesitate to take Freud at his word when the latter admits that his expertise is insufficient to complete the inquiry into the history of religion. Point six. The radicalism of Freud's thought does not, in other words, dissuade Ben Slama from finding for his predecessor a definitive place within a shared intellectual heritage whose general position toward Islam has been, I and the best of times, unjustifiably dismissive. But it is all the more important, for just that reason and, to acknowledge and assume the challenge Freud installed, if only parenthetically, within his final work. Let us return, finally, to the enigmatic question with which we began this brief consideration, what is Fethi Ben Slama doing? His writing certainly poses a challenge to what is called Islam, particularly I and its recent engagement with the politics of representation that has become thoroughly I and vested I and an I and increasingly globalized economy of jaurescence. It is absolutely essential, though, that we tend to the vital distinction with I and the discourse of psychoanalysis between O N T H E O N E hand, A N intervention on T H E level O F the imaginary and, on the other, 
one that assumes as its object of concern that which will not reveal itself within the representational field of which it is nonetheless constitutive. Attention to this distinction indicates that Massad and others have Judged Ben Slama's work by remaining, more or less, on the apparent surface of the text, within the field of the imaginary. From this position, their censure may be entirely justified, though it cannot approach the more profound importance of Ben Slama's intervention. Psychoanalysis and the challenge of Islam does not raise its explicitly political protestations by simply demanding that Islam re-articulate itself within the equally violent accommodationist discourse of Euro-American modernity. Instead, Ben Slama's text instantiates a refusal to accept any narrative that would claim a purchase on the originary truth of human being, and illustrates, at the same time and with profound acumen, that even the very logic in which HIS work is engaged, the logic of the UN conscious, may encounter its own limit in the form of a challenge, a test, a resistance, or a refusal whose name, with all that it implies, is Islam. Act of State, A Photographed. History of the Occupation, 1967-2007. Ariella Isole. Act of State was published as a post-exhibition book for an exhibition by the same name, curated by Ariella Isole. The exhibition was held in Tel Aviv in June 2007, the date of the 40th anniversary of Israel's temporary occupation of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank and was shown later in Ferrara in September 2008. The book and the exhibition that preceded it include hundreds of photographs taken mostly by Israeli photographers during the occupation between 1967 and 2007. The pictures and their accompanying texts are organized in two parallel columns, a timeline and thematic lines that interrupt it. The accompanying text, written by Azouli, is not a regular curator's text. It goes beyond the accepted format of a separate forward that serves to caption each and every photograph. Mostly it is a non-theoretical, narrative text that mixes facts, questions, and reflections by a method of what Azule calls political imagination. The book as a whole gives an enormous amount of information about the history of the occupation and the routine, day-to-day -day life of the Palestinians under it. This information unfolds in a unique way, based on the theory of the gaze that Azule developed I in her book, the civil contract of photography one the intent is to glean more and more details from the photographs and respond to the people photographed, whose constant presence demands us to act upon our minimal civil duty and political imagination and not to abandon them to the vast horror in which everything I and them is etched in that low resolution that says, I can't look at this or we can do nothing, 26. Azule does not surrender to the urgent rhythm of wars or operations that simulate a short-term reality and a present, however horrific, that will end in a ceasefire. Instead she shows how an unbearable reality of long-term oppression is created and constructed when emergency claims are checked and left unheeded. This reality was created slowly, but from the beginning motifs could be seen that would pave the way to the impoverished existence and invisibility of Palestinians which would be brought to the brink of catastrophe. These motifs, such as the endless waits that would have to be endured in order to cross checkpoints on the way to work, the demolitions and military break-ins of Palestinian homes, arrests without indictment, referred to as administrative detentions, harassment by Jewish colonialists, the shackling of hands and blindfolding during arrests, detention camps, separation fences, wounded children, bereaved mothers, all accumulate in the book and constitute a thematic thread that runs parallel to the timeline. The whole of Act of State is constructed in a way that refuses to surrender to Israeli visual consciousness. Azule does not place a large number of photographs around dates of the two intifadas, the Palestinian uprisings of 1987 and 2000, for example, nor around various Israeli operations, alongside a few representative images of routine life in between. She presents, rather, a steady continuum of photographs that describe the relentless advance of the oppression. This continuum relies not only on images of horror, but also on a gaze that exposes the unbearable routine, which Israelis consider reasonable. This routine has a face, a temporality, 
concrete practices. The photograph of a house demolition in Imwas, Yo Sefoma N, 1967, 57, for example, dating from 1967, sabotages the immediate, laconic explanation which the common Israeli spectator gives himself, that this house is the home of a terrorist or of someone who has built it illegally, by failing to secure the necessary, thog h, i in fact, impossible to obtain, construction permits. This photograph, depicting a house demolished during the expulsion of an entire village fated to become refugees, is displayed alongside other photographs of house demolitions in 1983 and 1988, it thus emphasizes the way in which the dispossession of Palestinian homes has been part of Israeli policy since the dawn of the occupation. The strong feeling of continuity in the book is created by at least two parallel modes, one fills in holes, in images that reflect the continuity of oppression year after year, photograph after photograph, of a daily routine that becomes more and more catastrophic as it deepens its hold over those who are submitted to it. The second mode breaks the timeline by means of a thematic line. This line serves to remind us, for example, that house demolitions did not begin as a reaction to the first intifada, but preceded it. This practice of demolition has been present in the very infrastructure of the occupation since the Palestinian transfer in 1948, through 1967, and UPTO this very day. The theme LINE, then, undermines the usual H-I-Store-Eichel narrative that defines Israeli actions mostly as a response to the sudden escalation of violence by Palestinians, which must be stopped. Speaker. Still, with Oma N's picture of I'm was, the reader, accustomed to reading exhibition catalogues, expects to find a QUACI transparent text stating what is most obvious in the image, a caption-like description such as bulldozer demolishing house in I'm was. Contrary to this expectation, however, Azole opens the photograph to questions and directs our gaze towards a blurred figure nearly disappearing among the trees behind it, who reviews Yosef Oman, 1967, on the way east Im was. Is the man on the right, watching this bulldozer demolish a house? Does he hope that the pause in the demolition will make the driver or his superiors reconsider their action and stop it? 57. This diversion of attention away from the action itself enables us to turn our gaze towards the blurred presence of a witness that becomes part of the destruction procedure. The reader slash spectator is not permitted to remain complacent and removed from what is taking place in the photograph. The IN formation Azoulay provides is not encyclopedic IN formation, her archive is both public and personal, an open archive. After viewing this photograph, for example, I ran a search on Imwas, it turns out that the village is one of three in the vicinity of Latrun, Imwas, Valu, and Sait Nuba, which was a part of Israel after the war of 1948. In 1967, using the opportunity created by the war, the state expelled the villagers from their homes and destroyed all three villages. I realized how intensely charged every image and word in act of state is when I moved on to the next page, Yosef Oman slash on the way east, 1967, 59, and saw a photograph of a refugee family from Imwas, slowly making its way through the pastoral hills. Even without any detailed information about the situation, one is arrested by Azoulay's words, p perhaps at this point they have yet been spared the knowledge that their Imwas home has been demolished. Even if they had been given more time to pack, they could still not have taken more of their belongings with them. Only a donkey, a sheep, some blankets to survive the nights, a few objects bundled in a large sheet, and much love in order to survive the EXPUL Zion with four girls and a baby. This text is very brief, its tone telling pensive, nearly laconic, its restraint reinforcing the intensity of the emotion it contains. Alongside the previous and FOLLOing blocks of text, it slows the reading and transition from photograph to photograph and the gaze that seals itself. Against seeing, the experience in itself of being overwhelmed by images or helplessness, slowly relents as the information gathered by the gaze of the curator-author accumulates. 
on the top of the double page that deals with home demolitions, 56, two photographs break the timeline. One of them is Rachel Hirsch's picture Salada Refugee Camp, Nablus, 1983, 56 three children and a woman, their mother, are seen on the roof of a building overlooking the skyline of a Salada refugee camp in Nablus. In her accompanying text, Azule leads us again beyond the conspicuous desolation and the family smiling into the camera, the same barrels used here to demarcate a children's playground served the army at the time to seal houses. They were filled with concrete and placed in LINS to form a blocking wall, 56. The technical information about the barrels scattered across the roof accumulates in a manner different from the detachment with which we are accustomed to hearing about the technical practices of the occupation, or, as is usually the case, the way in which we do not hear about them at all. The answer to the question that Azule took the trouble to ask is now situated as a part of the human condition depicted in the photograph H, the seemingly simple question, what are the barrels doing there? Why are they filled with gravel and concrete? Makes visible an aspect of the lives of those seated there, who look rather relaxed and not as if their situation invited such a blatant question. And the answer reveals some part of the routine of the erection and demolition of Palestinian houses, of ongoing and renewed refugee elife. The play of children is no longer separated from practices of military occupation, and the refugee camp is no longer something unimaginable, an alien space that could be referred to in sanitized terms such as target bank, as it often is in the Israeli press and media. Through the textual elitering of the artistic and the archivist historical fields, Azole. Rachel Hirsch, 1983, Salata Refugee Camp Nablus. Achieves a unique combination of text and image that joins the anonymous figures in the photograph and the reader viewer in an active encounter. The speaker's act stems from the realization that t he sense of an announce, a photograph, in this case, can neve are. He found in the photograph itself, but is always caught in an infinite regression of announces where a new one is required to express the sense of the previous one. Two the sense then must be littered with statements, even when these attempt to appear neutral. Here, freed of the belief that the meaning of the photograph is self-evident to its viewer, Azule exposes numerous layers of the visible in a voice that reveals its inconclusiveness. Duration TWO photographs of a shepherd boy engender a discussion of another dimension that exists in the book, the dimension of duration. In slightly different photographs, Dorit Hirschkovit Slow Tyasser Checkpoint, 2006, 330 and 588, one can see a 1-4 year old boy sitting on the ground blindfolded with a rag, his hands restrained. From the details of the accompany text, one learns about the paradoxical situation of the boy who grazes his sheep daily, he has crossed a border the existence of which he was unaware, for in their defense strategy, the outpost commanders set new borders every day in order to prevent monitoring by the locals. The pages between the first appearance of the photograph of the shepherd in the thematic line and the second appearance in the timeline enable one to sense the length of time that passes as the boy sits nearly dehydrated, hands shackled, unaware of what he has done wrong. We experience this duration as the time of our own reading, which projects across hundreds of photographs describing people waiting, in LINS at checkpoint for hours on end, in pre-dawn hours daily, whenever crossings into Israel happen to be open, in administrative detention without indictment or due process of law, sometimes for years, or next to a detention FACILITY without knowing where one son or husband are, waiting for physicians from various aid organizations to arrive at besieged villages. Palestinian time, which is not regarded by the Israeli regime as a respectable resource, permeates photographs throughout the book, reflecting this nerve-wracking routine of daily life, and receiving here a rare kind of visibility. Act of State confronts the Israeli concept of the occupation. It does this not only through the hundreds of photographs it assembles, not only through its unique manner of captioning and its el curatorial text, but also through the combination and structure of its material, which emphasize, among other important issues, 
the continuity of the oppression and the specific temporality of the catastrophic reality of millions of people without rights. The book offers its readers slash spectators the possibility of inserting themselves into the chain of annonces of acts of state. If one can imagine a future in which it will be possible to process past crimes in a museum or in a kind of constitutional court of justice, such as in South Africa for example, Act of State certainly builds the path towards it in its sharp resolution of seeing, in its multiple ways of telling. A.D. Isarek translated by Tal Haran. The Odd One in, on Cum D.Y. Alenka Zupinsik, Cambridge, MIT Press, 2008, 240 pp. The Kantian Philosophical System, A.S. as we L.L. known, hinges U.P. on the D.I. vision between, natural, phenomena and, rational, noumena, and upon the UN bridgeable chasm forever separating the two. Human species belong to nature as finite beings, but at the same time they are only free as rational beings, and the rational order will admit of absolutely no exception to the state of affairs. It is here, just where Kant's system concludes and at the point upon which it most I insists, that Alenka's open six book on comedy, and psychoanalysis, the odd one in, begins. Thus, the philosopher to whom she refers in her opening pages is, quite rightly, not Kant, but H.I.S. successor Hegel, who, among classical philosophers, valued comedy and the comic spirit most highly, 1-3. Hegel, of course, never kept unbroken what Kant left intact. In his Phenomenology of Spirit, Comedy appears only after spirit is achieved, our consciousness reaches reason via self-consciousness, and reason materializes itself into the, natural, world as its spirit. Spirit could be a community's master discourse, its habits, morals, or ideologies, but at the same time, since it is its own reason materialized, consciousness can also reappropriate it or proclaim its illusory character. I ends up in six words. Consciousness comes to know that it is itself the source and the derive of that absolute spirit which, from a certain point on, appears to it as its unattainable beyond, its other, 1-5. At this stage of consciousness, we may assume a distance from spirit and freely criticize its authority, but it is precisely after the spirit is revealed to be merely a product of our consciousness that comedy becomes an issue. According to Zupinsik, we live in an age of Biomorality, the fundamental axiom of which states, a person who feels good, and is happy, is a good person and, a person who feels bad is a bad person, 5. We all know now that the other does not exist, and that nothing is infinite, universal, or transcendental, but this knowledge of our finitude and the other's incompleteness, as such, has acquired an imperative status, we must be satisfied with OU and it yud, which has now come to occupy the position of the master signifier in human life. Although the, Kantian, metaphysics of infinity, and of transcendence might be undermined by our consciousness's s sublation into spirit, we are also witnessing the rise of what Zupinsik calls a metaphysics of finitude in which, often with a distinctively pathetic ring to it, finitude appears as our, contemporary, great narrative. Yo you are only human. Give yourself a break. Nobody's perfect. 48. Comedy is thus conceived, generally speaking, as the subversion of the metaphysics of infinity by this new metaphysics of finitude. For example, a buffoonish baron who presumptuously claims his superiority as an aristocrat slips on a banana peel and falls into a puddle of mud again and again, the baron's aristocratic ideal is reduced to a base physical reality, and the failure of his ideal superiority makes us lag age. The individual, the concrete, the contingent, and the subjective are opposing and undermining the universal, the necessary, the substantial, as their other, 27. According to this general conception, comedy levels off the universal, gods, morals, state institutions, universal ideas, with concrete phenomena, no matter what symbolic significance he has, the baron is also a man, who is subject to the same pathetically finite order as the rest of us, 30. 
This version of comedy thus fundamentally disallows any access to the transcendental. Yet Hegel's phenomenology provides us with a different notion of comedy. Because it is precisely after the section on spirit that comedy comes into view, comedy is something that only happens after the subject has become conscious of the function of spirit, at which point transcendental authority is undermined. The metaphysics of finitude has its own dialectical significance, but it is never enough in itself since it also transforms human finitude I into a master signifier, into a new idea of universality. Accordingly, the metaphysics of finitude must be followed by what Zupinsik calls the physics of the infinite, which she holds to be the true comic spirit, 50. While comedy, as the physics of the infinite, might abolish older ideas of metaphysical universality, the point is that comedy generates its own universality, and gives it a concrete materiality. Far from annulling universality by material reality, comedy lets its own universality work, without at the same time losing its universal status in the very work itself. In other words, comedy is the universal at work, 27, emphasis in original. This concrete universal is succinctly demonstrated by the comedy joke with which Zupinsik concludes her book, a joke from the arsenal of the old Yugoslav Bosnian jokes about Mujo and Heso. Heso is describing to Mujo his adventures in the Sahara. I'm walking through the desert. Nothing but sand around me, not a living su l, absolutely nothing. The sun burning i in the sky, and my throat burning with thirst. Suddenly a lion appears in front of me. What to do, where to hide? I climb a tree. Wait a minute, Mujo, yo uve just told me that there was nothing around but sand, so where did the tree come from? My dear Heso, you don't ask such questions when a lion appears. You run away and climb the first tree. 217. I end this joke, Mujo's idea of the tree, which is merely the product of a certain ideology, makes us laugh not because it is undermined by physical reality, but rather because it is R-E-A-L-I-Z with all its universality, which does not allow of any exception, the tree is always there for us to climb. The most common view of comedy states that the reduction of one's ideal into reality is funny, and yields laughter. According to Zupinsik's ARGU meant, however, it is precisely the ideal sudden incarnation, with all its universal functions intact, that makes comedy possible. In this sense, we might say that in an age dominated by the metaphysics of finitude, comedy, and, following the terms of Zupinsik's argument, psychoanalysis, still takes the UN universal, the infinite, the absolute, or the other seriously. Insofar as the physics of the infinite itself risks establishing yet another metaphysics, and here we may note the frequency with which psychoanalysis is accused of fallow or phallogocentrism, the task of both comedy and psychoanalysis is twofold. On the one hand, they must materialize the absolute at the level of phenomenality because consciousness already knows its purely illusory character and fundamental incompleteness. At the same time, however, comedy and psychoanalysis must create their own absolute, otherwise, the lack in the absolute as such would become a new master signifier. In both comedy and psychoanalysis, the absolute is neither forgotten nor restored, we do not have to believe in the tree in the middle of the desert, which is impossible, but we must nevertheless remember that the impossible really happens. I in other words, comedy and psychoanalysis both thrive on the point of this double injunction, but it is precisely because of this doubleness that their tasks appear to be unattainable. In our age of biomorality, the absolute or the other is revealed to be split and incomplete, and the split other as such has become our new grand narrative. Yet, Zupinsik argues, this is by no means the whole comic story, 122. Comedy is indeed triggered by the knowledge that the absolute or the other is not at all perfect, but this split of which we have just become conscious also betrays a singular connection and unity, which is quite different from the perfection and completeness of the other that we had originally assumed, 122. The split names the relationship between the terms that the split itself divides, and comedy plays up on just this ambiguous unity, 
this short circuit both dividing and uniting the other. The short circuit, however, is not located between the finite and the infinite, or between the split and the whole, FOLLOing the logic of the object A, Zupinsik argues that it produces the two sides of the relationship, which are thereby linked in their separation, it is an intersection which is generative of both sides that overlap in it, 21-4. It is not a point at which the transcendent, which has been inaccessible from the finite, intrudes into the finite, but rather it is the moment at which the finite as such fails to complete itself or to become metaphysical in its completion, this failure paradoxically and oddly binds the finite together. When this short circuit takes place in comedy and makes us laugh, it appears distinctly unrealistic, like H. A. So's tree in the middle of the Sahara. And yet, we cannot help noticing that there is something very real in comedy's supposedly unrealistic insistence on the indestructible, on something that persists, keeps reasserting itself and won't go away, lik a tick that goes on even though its owner is already dead, 49. The short circuit appears as something mechanical or indestructible, for, when the absolute or the metaphysical, whether finitude or infinity, fails to become itself, or to complete itself, what becomes manifest i n comedy is not how such a metaphysical absolute affects us, but the fact that it does so, and that it does so all the time, 195, emphasis in original. Comedy, that is, repeatedly highlights the fact of the absolute's functioning in all its oddity, and not an individual's experience. Of it, 195. In comedy, the crack in the absolute's finitude also assumes the form of a link, which can occasionally strike us as mechanical, 118 here, finally, the comic absolute appears with its full function. This explains why, mechanical, repetition can yield laughter or, more generally, surprise, when the comic absolute appears, we are surprised not by its absence or malfunctioning but by the very fact of its functioning. If there is such a thing as the lack in the other, we can encounter it only when and where the other surprises us with all its essential otherness and absoluteness, with all its functions in perfect working order. What is repeated in comedy and makes us laugh is the others functioning as such, therefore, in comedy we are usually surprised by things and events that we, at least roughly, expect, 210, such as the tree one climbs when chased by a lion. Thus comedy's surprising discontinuity paradoxically consists in its continuity, and this discontinuity is the very stuff of comic continuity, 137. Zupinsik refers to Lakin's example of repetition in Seminar 11, in which the child desires to hear the same story again and again with a consistency in the details of its telling. The child demands the textual sameness of the telling, which is in fact impossible, but it is not the failure in the repetition of the same that the child wants to see. In the repetition, the sameness or the oneness of the story is undermined and revealed to be imperfect, but nevertheless something is realized, it is precisely through the imperfection that the one generates its surprising unity, which the young subject wants to see again and again. What Kant has left intact is thus made to work, the short circuit between noumena and phenomena may be impossible, but the impossible really happens. Zupin 6 The Odd One in Brilliantly shows that it is precisely UP on this impossible I intersection that comedy exuberates. Hiroki Yoshikuni Desiring Arabs Joseph A. Massad, Chika Gio, UN University of Chicago Press, 2006, 472 pp. Terrorist Assemblages H-O-M-O-N-A-T-L-O-N-A-L-L-S-M in Queer Times Jasper K. Poor, Durham, Duke UN University Press, 2007, 368 pp. Joseph A. Massad is a reluctant follower. While Edward said advanced a vigorous critique of Orientalism, he was perhaps willfully blind to issues of gender and sexuality. A grateful inheritor of that tradition, Massad returns to Orientalism to explore questions of gender and sexuality in Desiring Arabs. HIS project is twofold, he both creates an archive and interrogates the pressures and circumstances under which other archives are constituted. He is careful to anticipate his critics, 
rejecting nativisms of all persuasions. I indeed, he writes against a Western nativism which has as its telos the civilizing mission of an evolutionary progress culminating in the Western subject position, 42. Seeing sexual desire and modernity in Arabic literature solely through this lens denies his title half its meaning, Arabs are the objects of desire, not desiring subjects. Masid is most fluent and engaging when reading literature, and fiction functions as a fertile space for desire in his reading. He not only situates texts in context for an English-speaking audience, translating many of H.I.S. Arabic sources, but he also offers readings within the context of contact zones, to use Mary Louise Pratt's term. Lenses turn on one another, affecting both how societies view one another, and in turn themselves. Massad peels back discourses that are in turn competing and complicit in their power. Dimensions He is careful with HIS task, aware of the self-discursive truth claims of the archive as well as the necessity to perform the work of the archive. It is in detailing the historic shifts in the critical and popular reception of such writers as the medieval poet, Abu Nawaz, that the reader feels the weight of the work, the accumulation necessary for the archival project. Yet in other places Massad appears wearied by such detail, as when iterating the ways in which modern scholars have appropriated Abu Nawaz's work in order to read the sexual practices of Arabs and Muslims throughout history. Abu Nawaz's poetry then becomes a cipher for civilizational anxiety and seditious practices. And while non-Arabic readers looking for queer theory may find the level of detail and sources unwieldy, this text marks a probing intervention in Arabic literary studies. It is at the intersection of both the nation-state and masculinity in crisis that Masad's text meets Jasper K. Poor's T-Errorist assemblages, homo-nationalism in queer times. What both books bring to recent scholarship is an indictment of what Masad terms the gay international and Poor labels the queer white patriarchy, a borrowed term. Masad assails the gay international for its self-styled savior complex, imposing a prescriptive and condescending homosexuality that demands Arabs unquestioningly foll out its circumscribed behaviors. If you are not the right kind of homosexual, according to these gay crusaders, then you must be oppressed. Massad counters this do-good human rights discourse with not a small amount of irony, while the pre-modern West attacked the world of Islam's alleged sexual licentiousness, the modern WEST attacks its alleged repression of sexual freedoms, 37, emphasis in original. This combination of willful violence and a self-proclaimed specialist status also disturbs poor, who critiques the U.S.S. sexual exceptionalism, a position that leads to what she terms hominationalist M, the coming out of American empire, too. Where Massad's work is intent on subverting a linear telos, writ western and hegemonic, Poor offers De Luzian assemblage as a way of engaging with current discourses on nationalism, terrorism, and on belonging. She frames her project in terms of a regulatory queerness and the ascendancy of whiteness, which brings about as yet undissected assemblages of race, gender, class, nation, and religion. Poor explodes previously accepted versions of what it means to live in the U.S., through timely discussions of Abu Ghraib, the turban, queer activism, South Park, the decriminalization of sodomy, and biopolitics. Unfortunately she fails to unpack many of her terms, leaving the reader floundering in a sea of signifiers, struck by both how fast and how often terms pop up and are then dropped. It is as if she were making intricate installations out of fascinating ideas, setting them aloft and letting them hover without subjecting them to the kind of critical interrogation required for sustained flight. These books together compose a good beginning for the unpacking of Western hegemonic discourses, but at the same time the central notion of queerness is ill-defined in each. Both texts suffer from terminology that remains UN clarified. Massad's third chapter, Reorienting. Desire, the gay international and the Arab world, speaks to Poor's work on this issue. Massad connects the universalizing tendency of gay rights and the prevailing U.S. discourse on human rights, which has global designs, to white Western feminism and its missionary task, 16161. 
Poor also dedicates space to interrogating those American feminists who would purport to save Muslim women. This is a welcome gesture. In gender stu dies post 9 slash 11 and is not stressed nearly in a gauge. The Gay International then acts as a self-appointed missionary movement, headed mostly by Western white males, whose problematic and imperialist discourse produces homosexuals according to Western definitions, where they do not necessarily exist in actuality, 163. Massad's point holds, the Gay International serves to write the discourse, transcribe the stories, find native informants, and when there are none to be had, replace the informant with a non-Arab voice, the ubiquitous IN stand expert. Furthermore, the Gay International seeks sites of pleasure in the Arab world, and thus must make a space of what it calls freedom and act there accordingly. This is the reorienting desire on the part of the Gay International, the hegemonic gays slash gays I insist, s, on both conforming to defy an ition set by another, which would appear to be the opposite of a queer agenda, itself an oxymoron, and then saving those who cannot conform, and condemning those who are not out enough in the public space. Massad's focus is decidedly male-centered, and while sexuality and desire are posited as flexible categories, gender remains fixed in the work in a way that does not seem problematic for him. That is, he proceeds as if we all know what we are talking about when we say, with or without scare quotes, male and female, or gay, homosexual, penetrate d, penetrative, normal, deviant, masculine, heteronormative, same-sex contact, effeminate men, homosexual encounter, the sexual desires and practices of Arabs, saphist. Notably, his use of many male feminists takes place in the absence of any theoretical J justification of the category. Both Massad and Poor provide footnotes alerting us to what they leave out. Massad offers. For example, because most of this L.I. territory deals with male homosexuality, my comments are L.I.K.Y.'s concerned primarily with that issue, 163, and 7. One wonders what most means here, in terms of the exclusion of female desire. Does the literature not exist, or does it not interest M.A. Saad? Poor scatters the term queer about L.I.K.E. so much bird seed, and does not convincingly define it, resulting in a male same-sex focus with token forays into a discourse on lesbians. Her defense of terminology, I use the terms gay and lesbian in conjunction with queer to demarcate important differences in positionality, yet I also want to suggest that some queers are implicated in homonormative spaces and practices. This seems straightforward enough. She continues, I and the rest of the text I use gay as shorthand to include lesbians, I use the term homosexual when it is an appropriate differentiation of subject positioning from heterosexual, and I use the acronym LGBTQ, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, intersex, queer, to signal organize in G, activist, and other collective contexts. This acronym, however, does not include two-spirit identity, among other formations. We cannot expect single terms to perform all the work we want or need them to, and so she notes the inadequacy of all of these terms as well as the fact that the attempt to mediate this tension is precisely symptomatic of the problem of specificity, poor 230, FN9. Perhaps this is queer acting itself out, always towing a margin that is one step beyond the discourse itself, refusing fixity. But this, too, seems too easy. There is a difference between terminology that refuses specificity, and terminology that is allowed to stand for whatever the reader brings to it at any given moment. Making an intervention in queer theory requires that one situate oneself somewhere in terms of previous debates, whether or not one intends to stake one's claims there. So if for both writers, QUE means male, as does gay, then it is only masculinities that seem to be in CNSLS. Poor identifies terrorist masculinities that HINGE on inadequate bodies, failed and perverse, these emasculated bodies always have femininity as their reference point of malfunction, and are metonymically tied to all sorts of pathologies of the mind and body homosexuality, incest, pedophilia, madness, 
and disease, XXIII. Both queerness and pathologized masculinities, do these terms collapse into each other, seem to turn on the female body. Poor's analysis looks for queer in the US. The site of a sexually exceptional discourse. Like Orientalism's desire for defy nation and a timeless Arab and Muslim world, Poor contends that the lens of the gay I international, and she cites Massad's term in her book, is the locking mechanism of the gays, the brown male in the US can be either terrorist, queer, or not gay. So the brown male in the AMU slim world is not gay I in the right way, and must be at turns liberated, fixed, and stabilized in his sexuality. Massad's gay I international is at the forefront of what poor CALLS homo nationalism. This is where a gay hegemonic discourse does the bidding of the nation state, in order to exert a proper patriotic stance after September 1st 1. Certain homosexuals then become sanctioned citizens by virtue of disseminating a nationalist, conservative, US agenda across the world, all in the name of liberal human rights discourses and a particularly harmful missionary position. Since the war on terror rights narratives of exception it then requires incorporation of some, though not all or most, homosexual subjects, poor 3 to 4. Through a combination of fantasy and suspension the U.S. nation-state forges ahead. The script for the U.S. war on terror prod UCES the terrorist as a queer, non-national, perversely racialized other, poor 37. Queer becomes white, and non-white can only be heterosexual, which narrates an impossible space for the non-white queer. This sets UP poor's MU slim or gay binary. Both desiring Arabs and terrorist. Assemblages offer exciting and crucial I interventions into the discourses of queer theory and the current monolinguistic and monocultural pathologies at root in much of the noise that repeals D discussion and debate I and the U. STE remenology issues persist in both works, which cannot be set aside for larger arguments as they are integral to the claims. Massad's book would benefit from more EXPLICITI investigation of what is at stake in the rise of the gay I international. His conclusion to the chapter on the gay I international is chilling, its missionary achievement may result in a straight planet, 190, emphasis I and original. He ends on a hopeful note, however, willing his archive to post spaces of description and desire that emerge and are not subject to Western discourse. Poor's right e.g. performs her politics, queer times recolra. Even queerer modalities of thought, analysis, creativity, and expression I in order to elaborate UP on nationalist, patriotic, and terrorist formations and their imbricated forms of racialized perverse sexualities and gender dysphorias, 204. Both texts are innovative sites for li and jaring questions, Questions that make us as readers reflect on to comfortable subject positions, citizenships, media consumption, and reading practices. Megan McDonald. Reviews. WHY are the Arabs not free? The politics of writing. Mustafa Safwan, Hoboken, Wiley Blackwell, 2007, 106 pp. Why are the Arabs not free? The politics of writing by Mustafa Safwan is an important, unsettling book. It provides both an understanding of the roots of chronic despotism in the Arab world and a framework for analyzing the factors that motivate and sustain it. In an attempt to uncover the ground of M. Idle Eastern despotism, Safwan turns our attention away from the wealth, OIL, and poverty, water, characteristic of this land and I instead redirects our gaze to another, perhaps far more for M. Idle, barrier to democracy, namely, the political suppression of vernacular Arabic. Although Western states were the first to commit flagrant acts of injustice on the individual and collective levels, in their colonialist enterprises, 30, Safwan regards the problems of the Arab world as mostly unrelated to Western influence and the tension stemming from it. I and another move that breaks with conventional wisdom and thus fortifies this work of great courage and intelligence, Safwan rebuts the charge that Islam is to blame for the malaise of the Arab world because, as why are the Arabs not free? Demonstrates, 
religion as such is not antithetical to progress. Classical Arabic, which Safwan considers a dead language, the medium of PBIC communication and education and the official language of the Arab world, is very different from the language spoken on the streets. But this difference is more than one of mere accent or dialect, in extreme cases, Arabs from neighboring towns may have difficulty understanding each other. Safwan examines the complex interactions between the two forms of Arabic that coexist in everyday life. Ald focuses on the political and de religious changes wrought by this situation. Because the sense of self is deeply tied to one's mother tongue and the mother tongue of most Arabs is not classical Arabic, the only acceptable language in the majority of contexts, the institutional divide between classical Arabic and the demotic produces a profound cut within the Arab sense of self. In response to this division, Safwan calls for recognition of the legitimacy of Arabic vernaculars, though he does not promote a di save vowel of classical Arabic. Although Safwan's proposal replacing, but not abandoning, classical Arabic with demotic, is both well argued and worthy of the type of debate that one hopes will follow, I would not be at all surprised if his book is censored. The tremendous prestige classical Arabic enjoys among both Arabs and the Muslim world I in general, God spoke classical Arabic, simply cannot be ignored, nor can the standard by which knowledge of the grammatical language is generally considered a prerequisite for all truly devout Muslims. And WHILE I applaud Safwan's project, I am nevertheless certain that the Arab public currently exists in a state of relative apathy, a mere shadow on account of the fact that no Middle East ruler will ever accept the teaching of the vernacular Arabic in school as a language just as grammatical as classical Arabic. Children with L.I. terror talents end up constituting a class whose members are linked together by a linguistic narcissism, as were the scribes, 93. The natural thought processes of these children are, of course, suppressed from an early age, their lib edenal energies directed towards attaining vertical mobility and entrance into high culture. The language question raised by Safwan is inextricably linked to the possibility of a democratizing potential within the vernacular itself. Recall that, in Europe, Luther's Protestant Reformation and the Renaissance set in motion a linguistic movement away from Latin and towards the vernacular. As Latin was desacralized, popular, Loyalty began to shift from Rome to the developing nation-states, thus displacing the political status of the church. According to Safwan, the formation of guilds, spread of commerce, and humanist education must be traced back to the innovation provided by the vulgar tongue. The 13th century, Safwan writes, witnessed this new phenomenon, the replacement of the bishop and the priest by the teacher as a commentator on doctrines and texts, authorized by an independent institution, 42. And adds in regret, T. Hings took a different course in our part of the world, 42. I and the Arab world, political fences are also linguistic ones. Because the majority of people consider the Quran the word of God, the agency that U.L. Timoteli determines exact contextual usage, God, is unconscious. Writing in a liturgical language, with no native speakers, is not only directly associated with the rise of the Islamic Empire, but also with those claims to divine truths advanced by the imaginary Islamic Church that has held a monopoly over direct access to the literary heritage of the Arabic community by anointing itself the protector and arbiter of the language. By admitting declassicized Arabic into domains formerly reserved for the privileged few, classical Arabic may very well follow the same path as Latin, threatening, we can only hope, the political eye and theorists of the rulers, along with their phony reign, the breakdown of L.I. terror barriers and, U.L.T. Mattelli, the democratization of desire and autonomy that will F.O.L.L. out from a fortified bond between the spoken and written forms of the language. Although Arabs have kept their mother tongue alive in both home and community life, they are raised to regard it as second fiddle to classical Arabic and consider it unworthy of being either taught or written. Failing to realize that it is not their language that is inferior but the state of subordination that produces this mental stagnation, Arabs are taught to reckon their mother tongue a denatured form of the original, a form insoluble to proper thought. As Safwan makes clear, 
this is not a linguistic, but a social and political problem. This subordination was further aggravated by the attempt of Pan-Arabism to elevate classical Arabic to the position of a super-regional language. As the chief element I N forging, in all senses of the word, the Arab nation, a project aimed at producing a unified mythical past, classical Arabic did not contribute to a national rebirth, but instead led to a rapid M.I. scarriage that today finds itself in a state of menopause. Although Pan-Arabism, or, as I would like to refer to it, Pharaonic Mesopotamism, did not realize its socialist aspirations of unity, liberation, and socialism, this bankrupt ideology's conceptualization of linguistic unity succeeded in mandating classical Arabic as the chief fetish language of the whole Arab world. Its use in vacuous political propaganda denied plurality, eliminated all that had the potential to either question or undermine the political authority or legitimacy of Pan-Arabism, and produced a depersonalized sense of existence for those it supposedly represented. By that time, the Catholicized Muslim clerical establishment Hati, unfortunately, lost hold of the public and missed an opportune moment for the nationalization of the colloquial. With the aid of anti-demodicist secular elites, the continual reinforcement of imperial Arabic, the language of liturgy and administration, became the central political project in forging Arab unity, one nation, one language, knotted together by fantasies of an idealized past. The successes of Pan-Arabism are to be found in its promotion of a linguistically homogeneous society, this is a misnomer, without speakers that guarantees the continuity of a Hegelian class system in which classical Arabic, a marker of supernatural prestige, is used by a minority class of educated elites and an even smaller number of ruling elites. At the time, any attention to everyday idiom was considered a conspiratorial scheme of the imperialist other to undermine Arab unity. The irony, of course, is that some of the colonial powers did, in fact, encourage the locals to codify the vernacular. An additional problem noted by Safwan is the very absence, or poverty, of those terms commonly associated with politics in the Arabic language. Let me illustrate this with an example, there is no word in Arabic for politics, as it is understood in its English sense. The word siyasa, now used as a synonym for politics, initially meant whipping stray camels into line. Safwan's final chapter, The Fraud of the Islamic State, indicates that such words as government or state are wholly absent from the Aran and that the word Republic Yomuria was first translated into Arabic by the French of Napoleon. It seems to me that recognition of Demotic Arabic as a language in itself, free of any dependence on classical Arabic, would amount to a much needed confidence in embracing a new Arabic identity. Arabs should recall that the orphan prophet spoke I and the language of the common folk and delivered an anti-aristocratic, communitarian message in his mother tongue, Aurishi Arabic, I in order to subvert the supposed difference between authority and audience. If he had suffered from an inferiority complex, he would have chosen to deliver the message in Hebrew, the language of HIS ancestors, or Aramaic, the lingua franca of his time. Arabs should also recall that, as Safwan points out, succession, or caliphate, does not extend beyond M. Mohammed, he who brought absolute closure to monotheism. Any entity that anoints itself successor to Mohammed, be it a person or a state, betrays the teachings of the Aaron and is, strictly speaking, be blasphemous. We must bear in mind the events that unfolded after Mohammed Sdeadh, a Babylonian form of Islam reinforced slavery, aristocracy became the system of governance, and Islam's authentic message was mutilated, becoming el idol more than a tribal, dynastic contest in which the competitors sought to construct the greatest temples of worship to a false gl ori and rob all and sundry in pursuit of accumulating the greatest treasuries. From that day forward, the Aran was used by the sultans to exploit and enslave their subjects. When love is absent from one's mother tongue, so too is desire. It is this linguistic exile from the mother tongue that led the great, contemporary Arabic poet Obani to entitle one of his poems When Will They Announce the Death of the Arabs? The international irrelevance of the Arabs finds expression in the following couplet, 
half of our people are without tongues, what's the use of a people without tongues? The old word is dead, the old books are dead, our speech with holes like worn out shoes is dead. And it is further underlined by the closing stanza of another poem by Oban I. O long lived one, we vow never to seek a share of your rule. O long lived one, we vow never even as to look at your throne, O long lived one, go on lashing, as many of the people as you wish and killing as many of your subjects as you wish, and fuck as many of your slave girls as you wish, we only have one wish, spare us the words, and spare us the letters. Safwins why are the Arabs not free? Constitutes a deeply disturbing challenge to the Arab world, a challenge that, though it will be deeply unpopular, nevertheless warrants a profound respect for its analytic insight and penetrating cultural analysis. Its difficult reception should not, however, temper the force of its ad drs because none but those who are addressed by Safwan, that is, the Arabs themselves, are capable of bringing democracy to their societies, and this demand can only be met once the state adopts an accessible language, open to all, as the official language of education and administration. This will, no doubt, lead to neurotic transitions, symptoms at least partially attributable to our linguistic narcissism and the shattered hopes generated by 100 years of humiliating experiences. The responsibilities of progressive, secular I intellectuals in the Arab world are not so much to speak truth to power because, as Safwan points out, rulers do not ally stand in that part of the world, today, this applies to the world I in general, but instead to disentangle themselves from this very narcissism and begin writing in a living language so that ideas become accessible to all, thus providing the condition of possibility for the destruction of the authoritarian regimes of Egypt and Saudi Arabia, as we ll as the foreign protectorates of Jordan and Iraq. According to the Aran, Safwan writes, the distinctive mark of Islam is that it is a religion which did not institutionalize itself, unlike Christianity, it did not equip itself with a church, 94. And yet, the Islamic seminaries of religious authority were modeled on the Vatican, with the supreme guardians of morality today issuing edicts from Ayazar, the MUFTI of Egypt, Najaf, Ayatollah Sistani of Iraq, and Um, the supreme guardian Khomeini of Iran, dealing with absurd ties such as how long one's pubic hair should be. In order to build an inclusive community, the chief identity marker of the 21st century must be the respective local languages of the Arabs, languages of and for the people, and fertilized in the womb of the mother. But such a combative project will require dissent, as implied in the following joke related by Safwan, what's the difference between a language and dialect? The former has an army and a navy, 14. If a merger of both norms is deemed appropriate by the other, a war may be prevented. Linguistic plasticity, it must be remembered, is possible when hot spots, or black holes, can accommodate targeted integration through either a horizontal or a vertical transfer of word units from one variant to another, and this even holds for IL legitimate transpositional events. So long as Arabs perceive language as subject to evolutionary changes, such as expansion, contraction, and redundancy, similar to that of biological genomes, this change will not be a compromise, but part of a Darwinian enhancement of the genomic plasticity of language. After Safwin's Why Are the Arabs Not Free, there can be no more ambiguity, the language question in the Arab world is not a merely grammatical one, but essentially political insofar as it is the language of the government, not the people. As it has always been. Sai. Keith A.I. Hassani. The stickleback may ignore the top model but will attack any of the lower ones because the red underbelly acts as a stimulus to aggressive behavior. After Tinbergen, 1951. Young herring gulls peck at the bottom model most frequently. Reviews. Fevi Benzlama is a 2 ni Shion psychoanalyst who lives and practices I in Paris, he is also professor of psychopathology at Paris 7, Jusseru. He is the founding editor of Intersignes, a French journal of psychoanalysis and culture, and the author of numerous books, including La Nude Breezy, Ramsey, 
19S5, on F. Ishan Trublant, editions de L. Ob, 1994, and Declaration de Insumission, Flammarion, 2005. HIS seminal work, La Psychanalyse et I Eprive de l'Islam, Flammarion, 2002, translated into English as Psychoanalysis and the Challenge of Islam, will be published this spring by University of M.I. Nasota Press. Keith Al Hassan I has a BA in French and a PhD in Molecular Biology from Monash UN University in Melbourne. While conducting research on the molecular mechanisms by which bacteria cause disease in humans and developing genetically engineered vaccines against bacterial pathogens, he is currently in training as a Lacanian analyst. His interest in M. Middle Eastern politics is long standing. C. Christian Jamet teaches philosophy I. N. Paris and is the French translator of numerous texts by Islamic philosophers and poets. A former student of Henry Corbin, he is also the author of La Logique d'Orientaz, Henry Corbin et la science de Forms, Suil, 1983, and editor of Henry Corbin, L. Hearn, 1981. He co-authored two books with G.U.Y. Lardria and is sole author O.F.L.A. Grande Resurrection de Alamoti, Verdier, 1990. Recently his book, T.H.E. Act of Being, T.H.E. Philosophy of Revelation in Mullah Sadra, was translated and published by Zone, 2006. Joseph A. Massad is Associate Professor of Modern Arab Politics and Intellectual History at Columbia UN University. He is the author of Colonial Effects, The Making of National Identity in Jordan, Columbia UN University Press, 2001, The Persistence of the Palestinian Question, Essays on Zionism and the Palestinians, Routledge, 2006, and Desiring Arabs, University of Chicago Press, 2007. Stephanie Pondolfo is Associate Professor of Anthropology at UC Berkeley. Educated in Italy and the U.S. She has LIVED an extended part of her life in Morocco, where she conducts research and participates in intellectual debates. She is the author of numerous essays on subjectivity, trauma, and Islam and of Impasse of the Angels, Scenes from a Moroccan Space of Memory, University of Chicago Press, 1997. Her forthcoming book, The Knot of the Soul, focuses on the experiences of trauma and madness in the context of psychiatry and contemporary Islam. Her anthropological works you unfold at the I interface of psychoanalysis, Islamic thought, and local healing traditions. Mustafa Safwan, an Egyptian psychoanalyst who practices in Paris and teaches in various countries, translated into Arabic, among other works, Freud's interpretation of dreams and Shakespeare's Othello. One of Lakin's first students after the war, he is the author of numerous books on psychoanalytic theory, including La Sexualite F. E. Minin and L'Echec du Principe de Plaisir, L. E. Champ Freudian, 1976-1979, and L. E. T. R. A. N. Sfert E. T. I. E. Desir de I. Analyse, Suil, 1988. Several of his books have been translated into English, including Four Lessons of Psychoanalysis, other Press, 2004, and Why Are the Arabs Not Fre, The Politics of Writing, Wiley Blackwell, 2007. A.D. Isarek is a writer and the editor of VHT, a prose series published by Wrestling, T.E.L. Aviv. Her books, Seven Matrons and Internal T.O. Urism, were both published by Yediot Aranat, Tel Aviv, in 2001 and 2006. Alberto Toscano teaches at Goldsmiths College, University of London, and is a member of the editorial board of Historical Materialism. He is the author of Thet Eater of Production, Philosophy and Individuation Between Kant and Slash Hughes, Palgrave, 2006, and the translator, most recently, of Alain Badiou's Logics of WORLDS. His book, F.A. Naticism, the uses of an idea, is forthcoming from Verso. There is a certain lack of precision in the contemporary use of the psychoanalytic concept of writing. Lakin clearly seeks to differentiate the function of writing, elocrit, from writing as written, elocriture. 
This distinction is difficult, even problematic, but also crucial to grasping the stakes proper to each. Psychoanalytic criticism is often concerned exclusively with the written, the text, literature, the book. This criticism has and will indeed continue to produce profound and unforeseen results in both criticism and psychoanalysis. But this issue seeks to address the function of writing in its psychoanalytic specificity. The purpose of doing so is twofold, first, to re-establish the function of writing by carefully marking out that which fundamentally differentiates it from reading, speech, the letter, literature, and all of the other terms with which it is so readily fused and confused. The second purpose is to explore the mutual gain at stake in the encounter between this function of writing and the act of criticism. Put differently, this encounter poses the question of whether it is possible to elaborate a psychoanalytic ETHICS of writing which would clarify our subjective position, and therefore our responsibility, as psychoanalytic critics, in all of the vicissitudes of our engagement with the function of writing and the written. Confronted with ever-intensifying demands to put it in writing, the exploration of such an ethics becomes all the more exigent. Following Gödel's incompleteness theorem, we are aware that any consistent logical system, which Laka n, not unproblematically for our purposes, characterizes as nothing but writing, that proposes to justify its own truth must contain a statement which cannot be justified and yet remains true, there is a lack. Accordingly, when we seek to redress a lack in something like a constitutional document, psychoanalysis seems to confront us with a choice, first, to write more, to displace the absent center by accounting for it with an amendment, a supplement. This bears witness to a certain palliative repetition, which seeks to pave over the quicksand in the hope that this time, finally, the ground will remain firm for the crossing. But, on the other side, the side beyond the pleasure principle, Freud and Lacan alike discover that the jaurescence at stake in this lack is the jaurescence of repetition, of the absent center. Therefore, the more radical choice is to write in order to actively preserve this absent center and to transmit, through the symbolic, that which is fundamentally recalcitrant to it. The possibility of navigating this terrain is precisely the task of this issue. We invite submissions that address the aforementioned topics as well as any related topics, including the FOLLOing, Lakin's statement in Seminar XX that Everithi NG written derives from the fact that the sexual relation cannot, itself, be written, the relation between the Freudian technique of dot construction and critical speculation, the problem or verifiable LIT in analysis, criticism, and politics, the modern conjunction of the act of foundation and the foundational document, the role of truth in criticism itself, as opposed to the role of truth within the text, the locus of writing in the psychoanalytic clinic, the interweaving of writing and repression, or by extension, a properly psychoanalytic conception of writing under persecution, writing and slash as repetition, especially in psychoanalysis relation to deconstruction, the functions of logic and counting in relation to the limits of psychoanalytic criticism. UMBR, a journal of the unconscious is currently seeking articles that add DRS such issues. Submissions should be 1, 500 to 6,000 words in length, may be emailed as an MS Word document or mailed on DISK, and must be received no later than December 3, 1, 2009. Please send all submissions to